Hello everyone, we're back for another one of these. It's another one of these. Oh my god, what? Oh, what? It's another one of these. Let's go. <gasps> Guys, no thank you, just posted another one of these. Are you serious? Another one of these? Yeah, he posted another one of these. Now also available on no thank you .neocities.org as well as YouTube with the backwards no thank you channel. It's another slice of life podcast. Ladies, gentlemen, everyone else, we're here. We're doing it. It's crazy. It's wild. Settle in. You're about to have the time of your goddamn life. While I explain to you, completely mundane, ineffectual, random, non-thought-through, half-baked, meandering, aimless, wandering, boring, grey, typical, everyday occurrences, and thoughts. Hello. And welcome back to the Slice of Life podcast. Welcome back to another one of these. You know, before we get into the meat of this episode, uh, I want to address something from the previous episode. Now, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here. Before I uploaded it, I went back and listened to the first, like, ten minutes or so, just sort of skipping through. Just to sort of remember what I said, because I was interested. And I was telling the story about the me and my mates guy. The, the proper punk guy. And while we're listening to it, I realized something I've never thought about before, which is that it's kind of a mean-spirited thing for us to have done, right? But, like, if you look at it in a certain way, it's kind of like we're mocking the guy's accent. Um, which is why I don't think I'll do this anymore, because I never really thought about it like that. And now I think, like, this guy's, you know, he's down as luck, he's a homeless guy. Uh, probably an immigrant from some sort of Eastern European country, didn't expect his life to end up like this. We probably shouldn't be mocking his accent. Probably kind of a fucked up thing to do. Just didn't really think about it like that until just we're listening to it just then. Which is on me. It's kind of, you know, should have been more aware of myself. But I do want to say something, which is that this guy, I didn't mention this in the story, but this guy was an asshole. He tried to steal our shit while we were talking to him. Multiple times, actually, twice, he tried to steal our shit. He said a bunch of racist shit about Jamaicans when he was talking about the Jamaican stuff. And I know that because he dropped the N-bomb. So, look, I don't feel that bad. <laughs> I feel bad for him. But also, at the same time, he was being very rude to us the whole time. I said he was talking shit about us. Uh, he tried to steal our shit, uh, my friend's bag and our beers. Uh, like, he, it was very weird, he just sort of kept trying to take it and get up and walk away, and we'd be like, hey, hey, what are you doing? And he'd come back and sort of keep talking to us. It was very strange. Uh, and then he, yeah, he just said a bunch of racist shit about Jamaicans. Uh, so, you know, don't feel too bad for him. And I shouldn't be mocking his accent, but also, at the same time, guy's an asshole. I'm leaving to go to the airport in about 45 minutes, so... Yeah, I don't know. My flight keeps getting delayed. Very annoying. It's been delayed twice now. I hope if it gets cancelled, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. I mean, I guess it's not a big deal. I can just go home and then come back the next day. I'm sure, but it sounds like I'll have to do... I, I imagine in a scenario like that, you have to deal with a lot of bureaucracy. But I'm overestimating. There's no... There's no... There's no... There's not been any indication that it's going to be cancelled. They've just delayed it twice. I don't know why, but whatever. Fuck, I was going to say something. What was it? I remember now. Linux. And BSD, I guess. BSD flavors. And, but we'll just, call, we'll just say Linux. I don't think... <coughs> I don't know that it's necessarily a good idea to actually show Linux to, like, normies. I think Linux is best for, like, either com people who are already familiar with, like, computer science, know what they're doing. But actually... So people who work with, you know, with, like, Linux servers at their job all day, people who are, like, sysadmins and stuff, probably the last thing they want to do is come home and have to deal with more Linux bullshit at home, if that's their job, you know? I've seen people talk about this. Like, they don't want to deal with this. A lot of them use, like, Mac OS and stuff, because it's just reliable, it just works. They don't want to deal with it, it's already their job. 
um, <clears throat> I think, really, if you, like, you know, if you're a, a, a normal, ordinary person, you go to work, you have, you go, go out every weekend for drinks <laughs> with your friends, you know, normal people, not hickey meat degens like us, um, <clears throat> you know, if you just install Linux Mint or something on your home computer, it'll probably be fine, right? You'll, you'll probably just use Linux Mint. But every once in a while, something's going to be weird, right? Like, audio's going to be weird, or Wi-Fi is going to be weird. Something's going to be weird like that. So one of the traditional Linux things that gets weird is going to be weird. Um, and you're just going to find it annoying, because you're not, you don't have time for this, right? You're not, this is, you, you already have hobbies, you have friends, you have stuff you'd rather be doing. I think that's the true Linux experience, is something breaking, and knowing that you have the power to fix it, and then going out of your way and spending a day researching, reading documentation, reading Stack Exchange conversations and all of this stuff, and finding the answer and fixing it yourself. That sense of satisfaction is what it means to be a Linux hobbyist. And I think that's the true experience. And I think that's something that's only valuable or really viable for people who have a lot of free time because they're like neats or you know no i think that's the point now i still think it's probably not a bad thing to try and get more people onto linux just because for two main reasons any market share taken away from microsoft and apple is a good thing and uh <clears throat> the more people who use linux the more software gets developed for linux which is better for everyone. But that's because that's a selfish reason, right? Like, in reality, are these people going to have a better experience? I don't know that they are. Because in, really, they're not going to have the true Linux experience, which is installing Gen 2 or, <clears throat> you know, finding some obscure thing that you particularly want to do or writing your desktop unnecessarily. You know, like th these these sorts of things, writing some very specific script, bash script to do something that, that only you want to do, memorizing 50 key binds uh, that you write yourself, you know, these sorts of things. That's that's the true experience. That's the the essence. That's the point. I don't think most people are going to really find that to be fun or useful. Most people are going to go out of their way to avoid that. They don't want to go messing with stuff that might break, right? Because if it breaks, that's their computer gone. Not really worth it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that you can't really get the full Linux experience unless you're like a kind of a degen neat or have just enough free time that this is like your hobby. Or, <clears throat> you know, if you're just a really experienced like sysadmin you, or something in, in your job and it just happens to be your passion... Or not even that. Like, to the point where nothing's going to break because you already know how everything works. Or if something does break, you don't have to look it up. You just fix it because you already know. Right? Like, in that situation, it's probably okay as well. <clears throat> I'm in Estonia now. Um, there's a dog here. He's. I'm recording my, my podcast. My podcast. Uh, there's there's a dog here this time. He's cute. Um, Delta Smite's here. And uh, uh, my back hurts because there's nowhere to fucking sit in this place that isn't uncomfortable. There's one chair. <laughs> there's this bed. But the bed is not as comfortable as my bed. I'm very bed-pilled as a sitter. I'm very much a, a guy who's who's chilling on the bed most of the time. And I just stack up pillows behind me. And normally that's fine. But the bed here, I'd forgotten, is like fucked up, man. It like tilts towards the back. And then the, the backrest, or like the headrest, whatever you, like the, you know, the thing that's at the head of the bed. It has this like... I don't know what to call it. It has this like out outcropping, which which is extremely uncomfortable. Um, so I'm not really sure 
how to like make it so that there's a comfortable orientation of pillows here. You know what I'm saying? Oh, let's do some comment responses. Uh, okay. YouTube. This looks like an interesting... Yeah, this looks like an interesting video. Let me add this to my watch later. I just got distracted. But, okay. Let's go to my channel. Looks like I've gained some subscribers. That's strange. Why would anyone subscribe? Um, <clears throat> okay. Comment responses. Hi. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. We're still early. Uh, you want to listen to this on, on No Thank You Don't Neo Cities? Okay. Uh, where are we? Comments. Oh yeah. Don't worry about that. Um, okay. We got some pot- some comments on the previous episode. Um, thank you, from Vajradara. You're welcome. Neko Veronican says, "This is bonus. This is bonus. Is that simple flips reference, or just saying that? I don't know. This is bonus, Mark? Bonus. Jesse Capel, blood. Yes, thank you. Sven, C S two E X, says." Was food even that calorie dense back then? I feel like rice probably sucked even 50 years ago. It always looks really weird in old movies. Um, this is in response to me trying to ask this question about why all of the depictions and documents of how much people ate in the Middle Ages uh, show them eating just like obscene amounts of calories, like up to 4,000 cal- calories a day. And... But the answer that people normally give is just that they were much more active. But even people who are very active, who are like professional athletes these days, they often talk about how like eating that much food is the hardest part of like being of their training. Um, and so like and like how they have to force themselves to eat that much food. So like how come people back then, even if they theoretically were doing that much exercise, which personally I doubt, I think it was probably less. Like how were they keeping up with all that? Anyway, um. I, I I don't know. I, I don't think that the calorie density would be the problem, right? Like, I mean, a, most of what you're eating is grain. A, a grain is made of starch no matter what, you know? In fact, uh, people would have probably been eating more calorie-dense grains because they weren't eating white grain. They were eating it with the husk on and... Um, like brown rice, brown wheat, you know, or rye. And uh, the, 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 there's sort of, that's where, that's where all the oils are. That's where all the fats are in, a, in a, a grain. So you actually get more calories. That's why if you've ever noticed like brown bread is more calorific than white bread because it has, it has all of these oils in it, um, which is supposed to be good for you, but I don't really know that much about it. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So I would imagine the food was, if anything, I mean, aside from that, a grain is a grain. Like, it's basically just a nugget of starch. I feel like it can't be, if it's the same size by weight, you know, it's then it's the same thing. Am I, unless I'm missing something. It does, I do agree, though, that rice looks weird in old movies. Um... So maybe I'm not, maybe there's something that I'm, maybe there's something to that that I'm not aware of. Um, okay, I'm going to skip that because it's just too long. Uh, Kanai says, most people who are obese aren't just eating a lot. They're drinking sugary sodas, fruit juices full of sugar, and eating highly processed artificial foods that didn't used to exist and wreck their metabolism. Loads and loads of disgusting stuff regularly. I don't know about that, because I'm fat, and I don't... Well, I guess I do eat artificial processed foods, but I don't eat... I don't drink soda, and I don't really drink fruit juice. And highly processed artificial foods are very demonized, but... um, I'm skeptical as to how... it, It depends what you mean by that. You know, like there's a, 
like food is food at the end of the day. Uh, like for example, take like a chicken nugget versus a chicken breast. It's still chicken. It just because it's reconstituted. Like if it has some sort of preservative added to it, or maybe some sort of you know MSG or something, and it's just sort of ground up chicken, maybe the cheaper cuts. But you you know people would have eaten that stuff anyway, or turned it into a stock. Like there's not really any. Yeah, it didn't used to exist in the form of chicken nuggets, but people still ate similar stuff. Um, and in terms of processed foods, I would be willing to bet people eat fewer processed foods these days, if you mean with, like, added chemicals and stuff. Because, in the well, maybe that's not necessarily true, but, like, in the past, if you wanted to preserve a food without refrigeration, you had to do a lot more to it, right? You had to... Like, the bacon people will have eaten in the past, or the preserved meat, or the preserved fish, like, was heavily salted, heavily smoked, and heavily cured, compared to these days when we expect our bacon to be kept in the fridge. You don't need to cure it as heavily. You don't need to salt it as heavily. You don't need to smoke it as heavily. And all of those processes are harmful. So in terms of meat, I feel like people are probably eating... I mean, you you don't typically like go around eating salt pork, for example, which was like a super common form of meat for like every social class until the invention of refrigeration. And that salt pork is very heavily salted. Um, so yeah, I don't know. But then again, there are obviously preservatives and stuff that exists now that didn't used to exist. Um, and I'm sure some of it is not very healthy. But, yeah, I think when it comes to, like, processed foods, the real problem is when they're just, like, stripping off, like, I'm like for example, the difference between, like, white and brown bread, where, like, or, or like, whole whole foods, right? Like, not in the, the, the meme term of that shop that's called that, but in terms of, like, actually eating the whole of a food instead of just, like, I just buy the, the kernel instead of the, and I leave away the, the husk with all the fiber in it of the, the, the wheat grain or something like that. If that's what you mean by processed, then in many cases, yeah, you're probably right. It is probably unhealthy. Anime Sama says, fell asleep at three hour and woke back up at hour nine and you were still talking about cheap food items. I think about it a lot. <laughs> I think about cheap food items. What can I say? Laganos 2K um, says, links a timestamp, where I said, I'm retarded, and then the anime in the background said, hi hi, which is pretty funny. Uh, Big Pink 7721 says, you can actually check when you added shows to your Mal, edit on list or show page, history next to episodes watched. That... I, am I having a, a, this is a, I, I think I understand, oh, okay, I, for some reason that sentence was very hard to, to read, edit on list or show page, history, next to episodes watched, let me try that, okay, um, so, Let's say, let's go to, go to my list and let's pick a, I don't know, Aria the Animation. Okay, next to Episodes Watched, I don't see history. This is the show page. Oh, I have to go edit. Okay, okay, I see. Edit details. History. Oh, history, I see it. Huh. I watched episode... It doesn't... Oh, okay. I guess I watched it in on 08, 06, 2018. Huh. Neat. Well, thank you for that. Um, Big Pink. Mellow Kyla says, Banana Discourse Take? Um, Kyla. What? The fuck is banana discourse? <laughs> what the fuck is banana discourse? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? 
What what could there possibly be discourse about bananas? What are you 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 need to get off the internet sometimes. I know I'm one to talk, but banana. I'm gonna Google banana discourse. Is this just something you've made up? I really hope it's something you've made up. Speech banana. I don't think that's a thing. I think this is just. I well. I don't think that's what we're talking about. It's like some sort of linguistics term. Okay, I'm just gonna, you're gonna need to clarify what the fuck banana discourse is, because I, I don't know what it is. Is it which end do you eat it from? Is it how, how ripe do you like your bananas? Are these, are these the discourses? Those are the only things I can possibly imagine caring about when it comes to a banana, how, how ripe or, or green it is, right? I like, I like mine probably slightly riper than the average person, but not like black, black, you know? I, 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 but yeah, I, I can't stand green bananas. If that's what the discourse is, then there's my take on that. Uh, and I eat it monkey style. Uh, Artecos says, one day your ThinkPad will be so power inefficient you'll be forced to switch to RTX 7080 in order to keep up with your power bills. How is that possible? How can a ThinkPad become more power oh you're saying just like as the parts degrade or something i suppose so i suppose so it's possible but one of the advantages of a thinkpad is that they're repairable so ideally these things could happen um yeah okay that's all the comments i have on the last episode so r slash place is going again. No, I've ignored it every year up until this point, but for some reason I feel compelled to go this time to actually participate in r slash place. So I looked around, uh, like I I don't know how long I was after it started, but I think I was pretty like pretty close to when it started. Um, so I looked around for just like you know stuff I'm interested in. Uh, there's a little TF2 logo in the in the side, and there's a little Half Life logo on the side, right near each other. Um, there's also a CS:GO area. So those, and then there's a there's a Union Jack. Those would probably be the ones I'm most interested in. There's also oh, there was a Yuma Nikki. The Yuma Nikki has been destroyed by Denmark, or is that Poland? I can't tell. I think, I mean, I assume that's Poland now. I thought it was Denmark because, okay, well, whatever. Uh, the Yuma Nikki has been destroyed by Poland, so, uh, fuck Poland. Um, oh, hey, look, there's a little Cornwall flag. Rare. The rare Cornish flag. There are two Palestinian <laughs> flags as well. Oh, did one of them get destroyed? No, it's still there. God, I... Here's here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. I fucking hate these flag people. What has to t- what has to compel you? I mean, I understand, right? Like, you draw a flag because most flags, not the Union Jack with its weird diagonal lines, but most flags are just block colors. I mean, that not also not the the Canadian flag, but most flags are block colors, easy to coordinate, easy to recognize. And, you know, if you're not in a community, then you're just like, I, I see the French flag, I put the blue, I put the white, I put the red, aha, we helping out, you know. Uh, or the, the, It's always, I mean, right now it's the French, the Germans, those are always the big ones. The French have a massive territory this year. I don't know what the fuck they do. Like, they're so coordinated, I don't understand. How is it even possible? Ce n'est pas possible. Ce n'est pas possible. Sacre bleu. Le flag de la France. De la France, I mean. Or whatever. Anyway, so I'm looking around and I'm thinking like, yeah, a little nice little uh, Half-Life logo, a little nice little uh, TF2 logo. Probably just, you know, but add, but those are already, already done. There's nothing for me to add there. So what am I supposed to do? And I keep going around. I'm like, oh, DGG for life. Destiny logo. 
Now, I went through a Destiny phase, but I kind of stopped watching Destiny because he he got really into this like red pill debate stuff, where I just really don't fucking care about that. I just couldn't care less about that stuff, so I sort of stopped watching him. But I'm like, well, this is like. Oh, that. Speaking of which, there's my uh, my cooldown is up. Um. But yeah, I, I see this Destiny logo. I'm like, yeah, this is relatively big. Uh, needs some help. You know, it, it's like kind of getting erased. I don't really care that much about Destiny, but you know, fuck it. Let me go ahead and check if Destiny is like live doing this. So I go to Destiny.gg, which is a website. And, uh, one second, I, the, I gotta put something in the oven. Alright, well, I'll, I'm not gonna tell you the long version of the story, because I'll try and shorten it. So I go over to DGG, there's a guy who is, like, orchestrating the preparation for when Destiny is gonna, gonna arrive on stream, gonna start streaming. So the guy, he's orchestrating it, so he's drawn the Destiny logo, DGG for life, and then he's, like, trying to take some area to be under Destiny control by just coloring it in blue. Except that he's been doing this for like hours at this point, or like at least over an hour. It's been like, like he's been slowly expanding this blue territory for a while. Problem is, it's just blue. They haven't drawn anything yet because he doesn't want to like start draw, start a project before Destiny gets on stream, right? So it's like, they're just coloring in this big square blue. And it's a pretty relatively big square for like, I mean, it's one of the, it's the bigger, it would have been the biggest community that wasn't a country at the time. Um, which, the, while he was doing it, I mean, he was just doing it to keep people entertained, to like, hey, go invade this part, go invade this part, whatever. But the second it was happening, I was thinking to myself, this is fucking stupid. There's no universe where Destiny Stream is big enough to keep all of this territory. And the fact that it's a big blue block with nothing else... Is just inviting people to come draw here for themselves. If some someone joins, and he's like, "Oh, where where should we go?" Well, there's a big blue empty place right here that doesn't have any art on it. It's like he should have just put some art down immediately, even if it was shitty, just to, to be like this space is claimed instead of a logo in this corner that's small and then a big blue square, which is a really obvious thing to do, right? Like at least in my opinion, didn't happen obviously. Then just as Disney starts streaming. Literally, the biggest Spanish-speaking streamer in the world <laughs> does exactly what I thought would happen. Claims this area. So now, I guess this is what I'm doing today, is just ha engaging in some stupid r slash plays internet war between Destiny, who, frankly, I don't care that much about, and this Spanish streamer that I've never even heard of. Um, and honestly, it's just shitting the whole place up. Because all, all the... All the Spanish guy wants... At least Destiny's got, like, art that he wants to make. A little guy with a heart. His little DGG guy. It's it's a kind of a logo. This is neat. The Spanish guy, just, just fucking drawing some shit. Just, like, ugly black shit everywhere. For no reason. I don't know, man. It's, it, the, this whole thing could have been avoided if, before the stream started... This guy had just, like, claimed a smaller section. Or drawn some placeholder art. But I guess that... You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm down to accept that this is funny. I'm down to accept that this is... That, that, you know what? There's people who are drawing bad apple in real time. Or I guess not in real time. But, like, they're doing an animation of... The Toho community is making bad apple. Which is... Epic, in my opinion. Uh, oh, actually, before I ever, before I did the, I was like, you know what? I don't care about the destiny. So I just, I just uh, contributed to Rainbow Dash. I was just like, oh, there's a, there's a pixel wrong in Rainbow Dash, and I just fixed it. I'm not even a brony. I don't even care about MLP. Uh, I just think Rainbow Dash looks cool as a character. <sighs> man, what a weird fucking, what a weird fucking situation. The internet is a weird, weird place. But, uh, yeah, I don't know what to say. I feel like I had something to say. Oh, yeah, the whole point of this I was going to do is, like, people who draw flags, flags is dumb. 
if you draw flags, like you're pathetic. <laughs> and like I respect spamming shit that's just like m- noise more than flag, because flag is like I want to be a part of something, but I'm so uninteresting as a person that the only thing that that like I can identify with is my country of <laughs> origin, even though I'm on the internet where any particular interest I could have will have, you know, something. Like, I bet, if I if I really wanted to, I bet I could, could, like, somehow get the No Thank You Discord to, like, keep a tiny corner alive as a, as a pixel. Like, I bet it, it, it's possible. Like, somewhere in this massive Ukraine flag, like, down in the corner of a Ukraine flag, if we were just, like... Four blue pixels or four white... I don't know. Some, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's room for this sort of thing. You could easily do it. But apparently I'm not doing that. Instead, well, instead I'm just doing this Destiny thing that I don't really care about. But fucking whatever. Here I am, I guess. We're going to do some more comments. Oh, I'm a uh, podcast. We're going to respond to some more comments. Uh... Account 2792 says, There are sites with higher file size limits than Catbox. Pomf Lane La can take up to a gigabyte. You can make this five times longer if you upload it there. I really liked the frozen pizza segment. You talking about cooking, talking about or cooking food is the most Nietzsche K part of this channel. Also, thank you for that term because I've always thought slice of life sounds really stupid. Well, don't thank me. Thank the nation of Japan. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I I know there are. Fi- I, I I know about Pomf. Don't well. I think it used to have a different name. Am I crazy? Am I thinking of a different website? I might be thinking of a very different website now that I think about it. Um, yeah, let's move on from that very swiftly. Uh, but yeah, I I imagined that there were fire hosting sites that I could have used other than, um, you know, other than Catbox. But I could actually get it now that I've like done some more tests with Audacity's compression. I think I'm I, I'm I'm pretty confident that I can compress a twelve hour episode down below the two hundred megabyte threshold, um, and host it on Catbox. If I want to, uh, if I can't, then I'll use uh, maybe Pomf Lane or or something uh, instead. But I'm pretty sure I can get it below the threshold, and it still sounds fine. Like if you listen to the version on my website, it sounds completely okay to me at least. Um, I need to clean up the sounds sounds page. Like something about it, it's too busy. I think it will look better once there are more episodes of the podcast up. Um, cause right now obviously there's only one, so it looks a bit weird, but I think it would be nice to maybe have this set out in columns or, um, maybe I just need to have a podcast tab and, or a podcast page and then a music page. Um, but I don't plan on really hosting any music on my website for now. Uh, so... Yeah, I think I should just change this to be, change the page to be called podcast, um, or like SOL cast or, or something like that, or just cast, cast sounds good, uh, maybe I just do that and then get rid of all the stuff about the music, because there's just a paragraph there that's not really necessary, although it's redirecting people to my band camp, which means they might give me money, uh, I'm not sure. The Bandcamp follow button. Honestly, I just like the Bandcamp follow button. I just kind of wanted to put it somewhere on my site. And at first, I don't know if anyone actually noticed this because it was only up for like two days while I was uh, changing stuff. But it was on the front page of my site um, for a little bit. Uh, But then it was like, well, I already have the Bandcamp link in the links section on the front page, and, um, it looked a bit too busy, didn't really work for me, 
so I took it off and moved it over there. But I'm not sure if I, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I don't think it's really directing any traffic over, first of all. And secondly, I don't think it matters that much. And yeah, the site is supposed to look cool, first and foremost. <laughs> That's not true. The site is supposed to be functional, first and foremost. Yeah, I, I, I'm not happy with how the sounds page looks like right now, and I will need to change it at some point. Um, but yeah, I just, I just need to think it through a little more, see what I'm going to do with it. Uh, Kyla says, um, there's something incredibly endearing about saying, pardon me for ranting for so long at 6.02.11 in the eighth installment of a podcast series where every episode is 12 hours long. Uh, excuse me, this episode is only 10 hours long. Um, look, I do my best to be entertaining the whole time. I I, I think that there are some things that you, you people uh, probably aren't super interested in hearing about. <laughs> so I, tr I try and keep my rants at least mildly entertaining. You know, maybe something that might be relevant to you. I'm not just going to come in and complain about having a bad game of TF2 for for 20 minutes straight. Okay, I do do that, but I'll try and not go over the 20 minute threshold. By the way, I can see on my analytics that uh how far are we into this? We're about 36 minutes in. Uh I don't know if I've truncated the silences on this recording. I probably haven't. Uh, but yeah, we're about 36 minutes in. And according to my analytics, um, most of you have stopped watching. Uh, most of you stopped watching about 20 minutes, 22-ish minutes into these podcasts. So we're actually only in the real denpers now. Now I can talk about whatever I want. As if there's like some edgy thing that I've been keeping from talking about. Ah yes, time to time to start talking about my uh, takes on the the. I don't know if like how edgy I'm allowed to be on YouTube. Um, it's weird that I've had two videos like pop off. I don't know what to do about this. The gum base video is still growing, like. I keep I keep thinking it's going to plateau. I thought it was going to plateau at 2,000. Then I thought it was going to plateau at 3,000. But it, it just, like, it keeps getting new bursts of viewership. And now I'm pretty sure that, that the Half-Life video is actually going to plateau at around 3,000. Um, yeah, because it doesn't show any signs. of Like, it looks like it got recommended to a whole bunch of people, uh, like, in the first day. And then sort of stopped. Like, it just sort of plateaued. Like, if you if I look at the graph, I don't know how to describe it to you, but it's like, it, it gets uploaded, then, like, basically instantly, vertical line shoots up to about 2,500 views. And then just sort of, like, there, and just instantly plateaus once it gets there. Like, I mean, it's kind of weird how much it plateaued once it got there. Like, it looks extremely artificial. Because it, like, it looks like suddenly YouTube rec started recommending stuff. And then it, or then like after an hour of recommending, recommending it to people, it suddenly realized it wasn't a good idea and stopped doing it. And it's just sort of, I mean, it'll probably still grow slowly over time. But um, yeah, I don't know. Whereas the gum base one, if, if I look at the curve on my analytics... The gum base one is a much more natural looking curve. Like it, it looks more like a. Uh, well, it's not actually that natural because it gets to about. What is this? Thirty two days in, maybe thirty three, thirty four days in, like around that time, around one thousand two hundred, one thousand three hundred views. There's a sudden second wind uptick. And it's kind of been carrying on that second wind uptick ever since. But the, the line is still going up. This was a stock. I would I would be faithful. I would be I would be uh, hopeful <laughs> about this stock. It's a it's a pretty good video. It's not amazing. 
Uh, but yeah, I had a, a couple of other ideas for videos, short ones, but I don't intend to turn this into a real YouTube channel. We're doing degrowth, remember? I made my, my untitled Denpa vlog. I suspect that the, the every TF2 format explained video is just going to like very slowly. I, did I already say this? It's going to very slowly accumulate views over like a course of years. Uh, so like I don't think it's the video that's going to pop off. I think it's just going to like be, be something that's like genuinely useful. <laughs> that's the idea. Um, yeah, it's weird. It's weird that the podcasts do well. Like why do people listen to this? Well, I guess it's it's content. It's good background content. That's the idea. I hope that some of you, like, fall asleep listening to this stuff. I know at least one person does, because you commented about it. Uh, you know. Bit of good falling asleep content. We do like some, some falling asleep content over here. I'm, I'm, I'm normally, uh, these days, Northern Lion is my falling asleep content. Doesn't get better than that, honestly. But sometimes... Sometimes he'll shout. Sometimes he'll go, he'll go like, what the hell? You know? He, he, he goes like, what the hell? Yeah. Okay, that's <laughs> not quite right. I don't think he laughs like that. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know why I, I don't know why I just made up a, a wacky laugh for Northern Lions have. He just laughs like a normal person laughs. I, don't, <laughs> I just invented a, a character trait for him that doesn't exist. I'm pretty happy with the fact that this is on my website now. Because that's the goddamn problem with the small internet. Is that it's all this, like, text-based stuff. But there's very little, like, pog tent. Like, we're all... The problem is that, like... There's a... I, in this issue, I'm more of a centrist, I suppose. Like, I don't... Like, I think when it comes to, like, multi-user spaces, like forums, b b you know, message boards, the th the, no one says message boards anymore. You notice this? No one says internet message boards. I need to bring back that terminology. You know, all of that stuff. And, and uh, quote-unquote, social media. Uh, wait, what was I going with this? Right. I think that sort of stuff, where it's like you're interacting, you're talking to other people, you don't really need to do much other than, like, some basic moderation and, like, good site design. Like, it's already entertaining enough to just talk to people, you know? Like, you can go on a dead forum, and, and like, not necessarily dead, but, like, slow as fuck, and still have, like, a good time talking to people, even if it doesn't, like, take up much of your time, which might be a good thing. But when it comes to the single tenant, you know, small websites, simple stuff like that, go for Gemini stuff, you know, you know, the sort of thing I'm talking about, the single tenant, small web stuff. Um, much of it is quite informative, but very little of it is like entertaining. And even if it is like, it's almost all text and sometimes pictures. And it's like, I can be informed, like, I can be actively learning, like, and I'm not just talking about, like, learning the le epic Reddit factoids, I'm talking about, like, actually, you know, you know, reading someone's well-researched, thought-out blog post, or not that, <clears throat> you know, reading someone's amateur blog post. Um... Like, that's cool. That's chill. It's chill, but it's chill for, like, two hours a day, you know? I'm a, I'm a fucking, like, neat... I'm not gonna spend 16 hours a day doing that. I need stuff to, like, fill up that time that is more like pog tent. And some of that can be playing a video game, but you need, like, background content to be, to be playing video, ideally. And that's why I'm very happy with the fact that I can host these on my website now, because... Uh, I just feel like it's doing a service. And when I eventually get around to mirroring my site on Gopher and Gemini, 
um, which is a massive fucking pain to do manually, because it's already a pain to have to, like, go through manually update the the uh, the RSS every time I make a blog post or, or upload a podcast, um, or make a, yeah, or whatever. It's kind of a pain to, to do the RSS manually. I'm sure there's some way around this. I just don't know what it is. Uh, but like having to update every, having to upload something separately in three different places via three different protocols is going to be annoying, and especially because no one's going to use the Gopher and Gemini one. Like, let's be honest here. Let's be actually honest with ourselves. I don't think anyone. I don't think there's going to be a single person. Maybe one person would consistently use a Gopher or Gemini place. And it's probably Jelaine. But I don't know what's happened to Jelaine. They've kind of disappeared. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened to that person. Anyway. Yeah, okay, I've got enough stuff to say. Okay, am I crazy here? Or, um... Okay, so you know Ben 10. Uh... Like, am I crazy or did they, like, really fuck up the merge opportunities with Ben 10? Because, like, if you're making a kid's show, you you got to have some marketable piece of plastic crap that you can get kids to buy. And it's normally going to be action figures or dolls or whatever. But if you're Ben 10, you've got the Omnitrix. It's exactly like the Kamen Rider belt. It's the exact same concept of a thing. It's a transforming hero plastic piece of shit that kids can wear to pretend to be the guy. Except you look at the common Rider belts that get released, and they are fucking, firstly, sick, okay? Like, go back and, or, I don't know, you don't have to go back, but just go look at them. Like, they all are really cool. And secondly, they look exactly like the show. They are careful about this. Is this because Kamen Rider has adult fans and otaku fans who will actually complain if it's wrong? Is Ben 10 didn't? Possible. I also think it's just a matter of the company actually caring. But obviously they put out Omnitrix toys. But I got the, on the first Omnitrix toy, I think in like 2006, 2007 or something. And it was fucking shit. It was dog shit. There was two that I that I that I that existed as far as I could tell. There was the original one and it sucked because it was like like they just fucked up. <laughs> like instead of having I mean you look at the show, it doesn't look the same, first of all. It looks close enough, I'll allow it. It doesn't really look the same. But then like on the dial, he turns the dial and the different aliens show up. And then he goes, he slams it down and he transforms, okay? That's how Ben 10 works. As the one thing you know about Ben 10 is that's how it works. And you look at the Omnitrix in the show and the alien takes up the whole space on the dial. But the toy fucked up. It had this, like, tiny little window, like, really small, tiny little window on the toy where the little picture of the alien would show up. It didn't look anything like the show, and it looked terrible. It, it just looked bad. Even as a kid, I remember getting it, and as much as I played with it and enjoyed it, because my imagination could make up for the, 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 you know, the shittiness of it, I remember playing with it and being like, this fucking sucks. Like, it's fucking... How, you know, the alien is this in this tiny little window. The, the silhouette of the alien is in this tiny little window instead of on the whole thing. So then I guess they tried to remedy this because they released another one called the Deluxe Omnitrix. Now, I didn't. I don't think I personally had this one. I think my friend had this one. And I, I think, because there's no way my parents would have bought me a second Omnitrix. I've already had one. So it's, it must have been a friend that had this. And this one, they put a little LCD screen in it to try and make up for this fact. that the, Like, to try and fix it so that the alien would actually show up bigger. It still didn't look anything like the show, but it was closer. But I remember you would slam it down 
and the bit that moves wouldn't even fucking move. It would move like 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 three millimeters downwards. It was completely unsatisfying. Like you know, the whole point of the the show is he like slams it down, and and the the top bit goes in, and it, it looks cool, and it, it makes a cool sound. And again, like you look at the Carmen Rider belts, right? And they they all have these cool moving parts that slot in and move around and flip out and make sounds and lights and stuff. They couldn't even fucking manage it. Like, it didn't move. The one with the LCD screen, when you pushed it down, it, like, barely pushed down. It was incredibly unsatisfying. Like, I don't understand how they fucked this up. Did they fuck it? Like, on what side was this fucked up? Was it the toy manufacturers not giving a shit? Or was it the show not thinking through how they would make a toy out of it? Or both? I don't know. But either way, I remember being very disappointed with the selection of Omnitrixes. We need better... Maybe they made better ones for some of the later series. But they I... Didn't. They didn't? Um, at least from what I could tell, they just fucking sucked really How did they fuck it up so bad? I don't fucking know. Like, come on now. Try harder, Bandai. I'm thinking about how I rewatched Fight Club in one of these previous episodes and just thinking about stuff in general like many of the memes are sort of like pointed to factors that point to the decline in people's standards of living as there's been this wealth transfer to the small group at the top of the economy it just across all Western countries, but especially in the US where it's like, you know, a lot of media is from and stuff. Um, it, like the, a big example of this is like, oh, you know, when the Simpsons first started airing, the Simpsons family was supposed to be, you know, sustained by, they were supposed to be an average middle class family sustained by a single income. And yet the house that they live in seems like absurd that someone would just, you'd be able to own that house on a single income these days. And that wasn't even that long ago. Um, And I think Fight Club is another example of this. And really, what I'm just thinking about is a lot of media from the 80s and 90s, which present uh, this... I don't really know what to call it. Uh... But it's a very different critique than than is happening now, you know? Like, the general critique now, people have forgotten the older critique. The critique now is like, well... Or maybe I should say... Sorry, I'm kind of... Kind of bumbling this, kind of bungling this, kind of kind of messing this up. In terms of presentation, I didn't really think it through before I started recording. Like, like you look at, like, Fight Club. So in Fight Club, there's this big scene where he, like, goes through all of the meaningless crap in his apartment. He talks about how you, you, you buy things you don't need to impress people you don't like or whatever the fuck. Uh, right? Like, there's this a big critique of consumerism. And there are, you know, like, American Beauty is also kind of in this vein. There's a lot of media from the, the 80s and 90s, which is, like, I'm a pretty doing okay by society standards, middle class you know, guy, and yet, I'm also, like, absolutely fucking miserable, and none of this stuff has improved my life, at all, um, and now, like, that standard of living has all but disappeared as the middle class has been eroded, or it's, like, disappearing, and many people are, you know, yearn for that sort of thing, like, if only my problem was that I had enough disposable income that I kept buying useless shit. Yeah, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. But my question is, like, is it actually worse? Or are we just fucked no matter what? Like, this is my contention. Is that I I think people have just forgotten that actually it also sucked in the 90s and 80s when you were going to be middle class and miserable. Now you're working class and miserable. 
you you know people who that had these soulless cubicle jobs they weren't exactly happy about it people living in suburbia surrounded by neighbors they never talked to or they hated buying useless shit like people weren't happy about this situation and you can go and say well clearly then there's a deeper problem which is like capitalism and capitalist alienation and like you know in reality the best way to solve the problem isn't just uh, like may- maybe this is the critique that you get out of it, right? Like it's not just about wealth inequality; it's also about uh, you know having some. I don't really know, like a deeper meaning in your life, versus just just owning stuff, like in the sort of community sense. Um, but my 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 contention is this: that I I think that we're just fucked. I think that we are just un- incapable of feeling happiness and satisfaction. Uh, and I think I'm going to give you a unique perspective here I haven't heard anyone talk about. Because this doesn't seem to have been how it was in the past. Like, people who were doing okay were just doing okay. They, were do- they, they weren't miserable in the same way that this, that same sort of class of people is presented as miserable in that media. Um, what is it, like, Gen X media, I guess? Um, I think it's the Flynn effect. It's, it's a corny thing to say these days to the point where no one says it anymore because it's been, it's been relentlessly mocked to, to point this out. And yet, it is also a very well understood and robust scientific fact, which is that Smarter people, people who score higher on intelligence tests of all kinds, are also more likely to have depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, just to be kind of fucked up. And it's also true subjectively through, like, literature. Like, there was some quote I read that was like, the last hundred years of literature have really all been getting at the same point. Which is that, like, once you have an IQ over a certain level, life is just miserable for you. Um, And I I think, you know, it's not even a matter of I think this is true. People, the reason it's mocked to say this is because it comes off as, like, braggadocious. It comes off like you're saying, oh, woe is me, I'm so smart. It's, it, you might as well be walking around saying, talking about how tough it is to live with a gigantic penis. (laughs) You know, like, oh, okay, tough. You know, you're so, oh, I'm so cool and it hurts, right? But it's also, this is a fact. Like, you can look it up. This isn't, this isn't like some meme. Um, But my, my contention is this, that it's gotten to the point where, um, due to modern society just demanding more of people and access to education being more like widespread than it ever has been in human history in the west um and just the the, just like environmental factors like this right so like people have much better nutrition and health than they have in like certain parts of the past obviously it depends what how far you go back or whatever but especially compared to people who are living through wartime rations or post-war depressions um during world war one and two You know, like, there are many fewer childhood diseases. There are many environmental factors in terms of health and nutrition that would increase your development of your intelligence. Plus, we have much more access to uh, information and education, even in ways that you might not think about it. Like, uh, you know, there have been many... uh, like, Like, people in the past weren't exposed to media in the same way that people are exposed to media these days and not even just like right now these days but like over the past like 100 years you go from people who have nothing to like newspapers and telegrams and then like movies um and the the, the invention of mass media mass communication television all the way to video games and to computers 
And the amount of, like, people don't think about it. And to be clear, like, I don't think stuff like reality TV shows or TikTok necessarily play into this. But even they, so to some extent, I think, are more complex forms of media than, like, do you, I don't know if this makes any sense, but it's like, it's, it's training your brain, um, especially, I think, movies, video games, literature, these sorts of things that require some level of thought, like, active participation and thought when, while you're doing it, uh, um, and even, like, social media to some extent, even if these algorithms are, like, very addictive or whatever, they are still forcing you to form opinions on stuff, like, constantly. That's all, that's actually all they do. You scroll Twitter, it shows you stuff you disagree with to try and make you angry so that you interact with the app more. Um, <clears throat> and the, their algorithm's pretty decent at it. It's okay at it. Um, it. It works well on a lot of people. It works, yeah. Um... And so, like, suddenly you're forced to, like, form opinions and th think through arguments, you know, in terms of video games, you're forced to do, like, micro-problem solving, even, like, you know, a lot of people play competitive games these days, but even the, the non-competitive games, so the games that, that, that we might consider to be sort of brain-rotty, like, like Call of Duty or something, like, even that... It requires you to, like, navigate a 3D space in a way that you would never have been required to do. It requires you to, like, have all sorts of understandings of game sense and precision and hand-eye coordinate. You Like, what I'm saying is just our environment, and this is only in terms of media. I haven't even brought up jobs. The jobs that people do these days require a much increased level of higher thinking, higher reasoning than than they did like you know at the dawn of the industrial revolution or before the industrial revolution like even if you're doing a mindless soulless cubicle job you know like this is just the, a, a fact like to inter in order to interact with the world in order to drive a car in order to do your job in order to enjoy media you're required to have this higher level of reasoning and this pushes people to be smarter over time. This is called the Flynn effect. There are many different causes for the Flynn effect. This is just one of them. As I said before, there's also nutrition, development, like, you know, developmental health in terms of, like, you know, what sort of food you're eating when you're a baby, the environment you're being brought up in. Because, like, um, if you're being brought up in a time where there's lots of stress, trauma, you know, from war or famine or disease or something like this. Uh, it stunts your development of your brain. You, you, you'll be stupider when you get older. Um, but m many of us grow up in peace times and times of abundance with access to healthcare and food and education and all of this stuff. Point being, there's also other factors, most likely. But there is, you know, people's IQs are going up. People's, the average intelligence you need to survive in the world is going up. And I think that this has just caused a, a critical mass of people, like more and more people, to pass this threshold to the point where living is miserable. Uh, and that, that it doesn't matter if you're... it doesn't like, As long as you're not starving, because obviously starving is worse, or being homeless is worse. But even then, I mean, maybe this is a crazy thing to say. Maybe, that's, maybe I don't agree with that, actually. But you know what? I'm going to take that back. But, uh, yeah, starving is worse. I was, the thing I was about to say was that, like, if you're homeless in a big urban center and you have a nice tent, you know, if you're not, like, literally sleeping on park benches, if you're not, like, in physical danger, it's not that bad. And most homeless people don't sleep rough. Remember this. Most homeless people are, like, couch surfing on friends' couches and stuff like this or sleeping in hostels. Uh, rough sleep is actually a small percentage of homeless people. People forget that. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's why uh, I, I think, like, there's there's a, a lot of prejudice against homeless people, um, which is really prejudice against mentally ill people, because 
the people who end up on the street sleeping rough generally are like you know have schizophrenia or some sort of like severe mental health problem because most homeless people just like don't sleep on the street because they have you know some other means of finding a place to rest for the night but sorry I was kind of a it's a kind of a tangent the point being I yeah I I don't necessarily know I mean obviously I'm not against uh, a, a, a better wealth transfer and that there are things that you can do to improve the world but I'm also kind of blackpilled about it where I'm like you know there is there is stuff that is an annoyance every day that makes your life worse every day like car dependency you know like it doesn't if the if if you're doing well and you're middle class in the the, the 90s but you live in suburban hell you know, just your built environment that, you, that you're surrounded by is going to be making your life actively worse every second. And that is, that is a fix. That is something that's very fixable. Like, everyone, you've all watched not just bikes videos, right, by now. Everyone knows that, like, mixed-use urbanism, everyone understands this. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, the, the, you think people, like, in London weren't feeling the same way at the same time? like, which has a great public transport network, they were. Every, everyone's just, just kind of miserable all the time. And I think you can you can make these improvements, but ultimately it's, a, it's, a, it's the, the human part of us. <laughs> That's the place of the, the, you can't really solve the problem until you solve the problem of, of humans. Yeah, go read uh, The Conspiracy Against the Human Race. I should reread that book and become truly black pilled. Well, it looks like a whole new anime season started without me even noticing or paying any attention. No idea when that happened, but, you know, oftentimes I do my watching the first episode of every show thing, uh, but I'm not really in an anime watching mood right now, so I'm just going to live react as I go through on my anime list to just, you know, look through what's what's coming out if there's anything interesting. Uh we got Jujutsu Kaisen, I don't care. Mushoku Tensei, I've stopped caring. Um I honestly th- I thought the first season was like okay. But then like when the second season came out, like the second part I uh just stopped watching. I watched the first episode and a half and I realized I just don't care and I stopped <clears throat> Zom 100 uh, Zombie ni naru mother ni shitai uh, <clears throat> Hyaku no koto sorry uh, bucket list of the dead this looks Unique in a trash filled apartment, 24 year old Akira Tendo watches a zombie movie with light, lifeless, envious eyes. After spending three hard years at an exploitative corporation in Japan, his spirit is broken and he can't even muster the courage to confess his feelings to his beautiful co worker Otori. He stumbles into his landlord eating lunch, which happens to be another tenant. His whole city swarming with zombies, and even though he's running for his life. Okay, I um. Bug Films, a studio I've never heard of. What does it look like? Let me watch the PV. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not super interested in that. It could be good, though. Horiyama Peace. I think this is, like, some adaptation of I don't even know what Horiyama is I've somehow completely missed this show Horiyama looks like something like a sort of seinen romance thing not my sort of thing Bleach I don't care Masamune kun no revenge R okay so I guess that's all the like Okay, so I, I normally split anime into three, like every anime season, the, the shows can be split into three sections, and it's always like this without fail. 
that like as you go down in the Mal reviews, you start off with the uh, like quote unquote good shows. So like uh, your Jujutsu Kaisen's, your Oshino Ko's, you know, the stuff that's popular franchises with normies. And that's normally going to be the first like five shows. And two of them are going to like, like a few of them are going to be sequels. And then some of them are going to be like popular manga, seinen or shonen manga adaptations, sometimes like novel adaptations. Then you get to the next section, which is normally like your, your, these days, like your not okay, your light novel adaptation type stuff. Your th- things that are, are going to appeal to high schoolers and younger. So like, you know, your, your isekai power fantasies, your harem shows, these sorts of things. The slightly more niche, but still like kind of normy stuff. And then you get below that. And that's where you get just random shit, and that's normally where the good slice of life shows are. So, uh, <laughs> let's find it. Skidako ga Megani wo wasudeta. The poster looks interesting of this. The girl I like forgot her glasses. I'm just gonna skim this, I can't be bothered. Go hands. Let's fucking go hands. Wait, is this the show I saw get memed? Is this the fucking show I saw get memed on Twitter for having bad animation? I don't know, maybe. Uh, Kage no Jitsu Ryoksha ni Naritakte second season. Uh, I've never heard of this, so skipping that. Tashi no Shawase no Kekkon. Um... <laughs> This is probably retarded. This looks like something that'll be popular on with this certain people on Twitter. Fantasy, romance, historical. I mean, maybe this is okay. There's just not. I'm not the target audience. Kanajo or Karashima's third season. They're still making that. Bungo Stray Dogs fifth season. They're still making that. Liar, liar. It only has the etchy tag. Um, and, uh, oh, it's a uh, No Game No Life ripoff. That's weird. It has a sh- it has a low rating. Um, honestly, <laughs> the top of you. Welcome to the world of No Game No Kakaguri. That's very funny. So it's just a splop, a, a a random plot of No Game No Life and Kakaguri. But it could be, you know what, if it's an average Echi Harem series, I don't mind, because I personally support the continuation of average Echi Harem series in this world. I think that they're, they're, they're kind of like, you know, beetles or something. Like, most people aren't going to care about conserving them, like they would care about, like, conserving, you know, fucking white leopards or, or pandas or some shit. But if you actually look at the ecosystem, the... The, these like sp- some obscure species of beetle going extinct would cause a cascade of extinction events across the whole ecosystem whereas some random pan- like pandas going extinct wouldn't really matter but that's what the public cares about it's hard to get the public to care about some random species of beetle that's my opinion about mid-tier harem ecchi shows they actually form an important base in the ecosystem Oh yeah, Hatarako Mao-sama's second season. I watched that. I liked the first season when I was like a million years ago. Nanatsu no maken ga shihai suru. In this world of magic, there exists da da da. Okay, this is this is your Chuni show for the year. Veroni Kenshin. Veroni Kenshin. Strange. Um, Jutsu wa ore saikyo deshita. Um, okay, so it's a isekai, we're now on the isekai level of the dungeon, with a, hold on, let me, let me look at the PV for this, because I want to see the character designs. Okay, he gets reborn as a, ba- oh, he's, is he a baby for the whole show? No, okay. He's not a baby for the whole show. Oh, we got a lolly character? Uh, honestly, this looks like the exact sort of mid. You know what? I'll add this to my plan to watch. I, I like 
like binge watching these very mid five out of ten um isekai shows but it but the, someone in the comments said the show is actually a slice of life in disguise just with some fantasy and isekai aspect so if you like slice of life with full-on brain dead comedy anime this is for you if you come from an action package with adventure and drama this isn't for you i mean honestly i feel like i'm a good judge of shows from just just seeing how they look because that is exactly what i want so i might watch that yumemiru danshi wa genjutsu oh my god genjutsu shugisha why have i why do i know that word oh from the realist hero that one the the fascist isekai <laughs> um wataru shoji who is deeply in love with okay who cares no even can it be this in Oh, some stupid rom-com. Oh, it's a it's a misunderstandings rom-com. Okay, this is going directly in the trash. And now for the show that the only show that I'm actually was aware of this season, which is the vending machine isekai. I'm hella watching the vending machine isekai because it's a fucking vending machine isekai. Like, you, I'm, I'm, of course I'm watching it. I don't care how bad it is. It's a vending machine isekai. Um. Dark Gathering this looks like the second Chuni show of the season. Yeah, this is the uh this is going to be the Chuni show. Okay. Yo, what the fuck? The the top of you, the first line of the top of you is this show is such an abysmal artistic failure. You'd think it was directed by Ikuhara. Why is Ikuhara catching strays out here? I mean, Look, I'm not the biggest fan of Ikuhara either, but you didn't need to fucking there was no reason to do that, man. Holy shit. Um AU Kyoshitsu. By the way, I'm not using the reviews to really judge shows because as I've complained about many times, the top mau reviews are easily manipulated and not a very good judge of like how a show actually is. Um Classroom for Heroes. I mean the for some reason the poster looks like something from 7 years ago. But the actual show doesn't look like that. I guess the art style's a little this looks very cheaply animated. Yeah, this looks terrible. Demon Lord Acad Magical Academy uh, overpowered protagonist Echi tag harem tag I mean, it's what you expect from this kind of show. I don't think you're going to see anything new there. But that doesn't mean it's bad. Again, the the mid-tier um magical school, magical high school anime is it, it, the same niche and ecosystem as the mid-tier isekai or the mid-tier or whatever. Undead murder farce. The end of the 19th century a vampire's wife is murdered and the detective known as the cage user is he's holding this okay um yeah this is let's acknowledge that this is not made for me uchi no kaisha no chisai senpai no hanashi that could be cute this show looks cute Okay, first cute show. First cute show spotted. Holy shit. Oh, uh, this is going to be this is the wrong kind of cute show. This is the this is going to be the cute show for the redditors. This is the like Ozaki senpai. This is the the fucking Komi san Watanai Watanabe of this season. It looks cute though. It's not bad. It's just not they don't go hard enough is the point, right? It's not It's not true moe slice of life. It's just one step below that to allow for Normans to enjoy it. But uh, maybe I'll still watch that. I- I'll have to see what I read about it as the as the episodes go on. Shinigami Bochan took uh, some second season of something I don't know about. Oh wait, I actually did watch the first episode of the first season of this. Level 1 Dakado unique skill hold like shit how many fucking guide aku do you can you put in one title level 1 ichi dakado unique skill the psycho this 
um, overworked working from a black company, reincarnated in another world, it was level fixed at level one, but unique skill to create a cheat light item that shouldn't exist, maxed out his stats. I mean, this tells me nothing about this fucking show. This is just like, describe a generic isekai. Okay, let me watch the PV. Holy shit, this looks bad. This is this is so badly animated. This is just a slideshow. Okay, this is that's too far even for me. Help. Um how, they just need to make less anime. Like please make fewer anime. There's too goddamn many. Um Help. Well, humanity celebrates the... Def- okay, yeah, we're definitely deep in the uh, isekai section of, of this season. Three months later, tournament, something, something, four heavenly kings, demon king. Okay, yeah, this is this is just not for me. I don't think. Yeah, we're skipping out on that one. Next, Ryzen or Atelier. This looks like a mobile game adaptation from my from the vibes. Story of something, who cares? Rowboat, mainland, fantasy, alchemist, t- adventure fantasy. Oh, it is a mobile game adaptation. How did I know? <sighs> yeah, this looks bad. We're skipping out on this one. God, this is a terrible fucking season. What the fuck? And there's nothing good. Uh, my must Dekiru Neko wa kyo mo yutsu. This looks funny, maybe. Oh, 3D CG. Okay, this is kind of funny. There's a big cat. I like cats. Cats are, cats are funny. This could be good. Is it? If it if it's like... It's 23 minutes an episode. Uh, I feel like this would be good for like a series of shorts. I feel like a full season of this... Maybe not. But maybe. This might be good. Honestly, I'm hopeful towards this. I'm not saying I'm going to watch it, but if I see anyone talking about it, I'll be pay attention. I will pay attention to that show. I see something that... I see now we're coming to the end of the shows I'm not interested in, and I think we're approaching the shows that I am interested in. Okay, but we still got this huge, oh my god, long ass light novel name. The most heretical last boss queen from Villainess to Savior. Okay, who cares about that? That's just uninteresting. Next is Temple. Now this looks good. This looks interesting. This is, this is, this is, okay, hold on. This is maybe good. I, I just see it, the thumbnail. We got comedy romance etchy harem tag. Okay, it's not. A slice of life, like I thought. Oh, no one could have learned, yeah. Should I recommend to desire to become a great Buddhist monk, renounce worldly ways, but the temple is full of women. That sounds kind of fun. Honestly, this could be a fun, raunchy. Top review Old Weebs, your time has come. Temporu is pretty much one of those old school Haramechi anime from those distant 2010s. How is that old? But, uh, see? I'm telling you, this is where it's, this is, this is like a central part of the anime ecosystem. I'll watch this. I like those shitty harem shows. Um, not a slice of life though. Shiro Seijo Takuro Bokshi. Uh, Saint Cecilia and Pastor Lawrence. Darling, etc. We need Saint, okay. Um, shonen comedy fantasy romance. No reviews. Let me watch the PV. Mm. Okay, not interesting. We're moving on. Seija Muso Salary Man Isekai. Okay, we're just skipping that. I'm bored of Isekais now. Okashi Natenshi. That sounds kind of sick, actually. And I like the character designs. A promising patissier meets his demise and leaves the world without ever having to achieve, having achieved his dream of making the world's weirdest pastry. 
but he's given another chance when he reincarnates as a nine-year-old pastry millionaire mortel, determined to become successful second term. His life would not... Okay, I mean, this looks this looks kind of chill. I like these sort of niche, maybe more slice of life isekai. Frankly, this could be chill. If it just, like, focuses on the, the pastry making instead of the fucking action, copy-paste isekai stuff. I'll keep an eye out for that one, but I'm not hopeful. I'm way too... I'm way too... We're way too... We're way too far into anime to be hopeful. Anime is over. That's what people don't understand. Level 1 Demon Lord and 1 Room Hero. Ten years. Isn't there literally already an anime about this? Isn't it called... Um, something... Fuck. I've seen this show before. This show already exists. What the hell? Guys, comments. I've seen this show. It's a harem set in one room, like a Sixers Harmony mat room or whatever. Rokujoma, Invasion of the Rokujoma, that's what it's called, right? Hold on, I gotta look this up. The internet is dying. Invasion of the Doku. Maybe I'll just type in Roku Joma. Roku Joma no Shinyaku. Oh, no, Shin Daksha. See, it's the same goddamn show. Okay, but honestly, that one looks better. This one looks like a worse version of the same show. I should become a hero looking at the. Yeah, okay. Looks like ass. We're not watching that one. Fucking Invaders of the Roku Joma wasn't good either, by the way. Um, I know Udenshi. Science fiction omnibus. Okay, I don't care. Something. I mean, I just, I just took a fucking read of this. It just looks bad. I'm skimming it. It's from. Oh, it's Madhouse, but it looks like shit. So it's some like B team at Madhouse. Oh my god, this looks so like visually so bad. This looks so ugly. Oh my god. One of the, yeah, anime is dead. Sugar Apple Fairy Tale Part 2, not a real show, someone just made that up. Ayaka. Okay, how far, oh my god, how much, okay, we're, we're, clo- we're closing in on the end, we're closing in on the end. Ayaka, a story of bonds and wounds, something, okay, this looks bad, this looks like, who fucking cares, yeah, we're skipping that one. Um, Genjutsu no Yohane, Sunshine in the Mirror. Um, this could be a mobile game adaptation from the looks of the character designs. What the hell? Nobody knows the story of Yohane, something that doesn't explain anything. Oh, it's part of Love Life. What the fuck? It's a Love Live spin-off? What the hell? I hate Love Live. <laughs> I don't hate Love Live. I, I just don't like Love Live. Okay, well, if you're a diehard Love Live fan, you already know about that, so... Dungeon Meshi. Um, like it's Trigger. I like Dungeon Meshi. Dungeon Meshi, good. Okay, good. Dungeon Meshi's good. But it's not out yet. Spy Koshitsu second season, don't know what that is. Sin Duality Noir, this is some made up sci fi thing that no one's ever watched. Monogatari second season, what the fuck? This is this is the wrong goddamn Monogatari. What the fuck? Bang Dream, who cares? Yami Shibai, who cares? And then just the random card fight vanguard and stuff that no one cares about okay well that's every show oh ayakashi triangle what the fuck isn't this a visual novel wait what the hell what am i looking at here oh these are continuing this is from last season okay i think i'm getting confused with something else 
Alright, well, yeah, that's every anime. Damn, shitty fucking season. Holy. This is the worst season we've had in a while. I don't think there's a single... The only shows that I was actually interested in were shows that I wanted to watch, even though they were bad. Holy shit. This is the worst... Fu- the anime is dead. <laughs> we're dying here. There's nothing good. What the fuck? What are we going to do? There's absolutely nothing good. What the fuck? What's happened? What the fuck has happened? How did we get here? What are we going to do about this? I've, I've talked about this. I brought this up once before, but I think it bears repeating because I think I've discovered this. Well, I don't think I discovered this. People know it. But it's like this piece of little nugget of obscure anime lore that like isn't widespread for some reason. If not, I feel like it's super interesting. But maybe it's only interesting to me because I watched this stuff as a kid and like no one else did. Like no one knows about this stuff. Okay, so in like the mid 60s, there was some production company. I don't remember what this company is called, but it's some like British production company and they made a bunch of uh, like marionette puppet shows. I believe they call it Super Marionation or something, like some sort of... They had some corny 60s name for it, the technique, but it's it's basically marionette puppets um, uh, that are, like, filmed for kids, right? Like, these very detailed miniature sets and puppets in, like, a kid's show. Kind of like um, Team America, right? Like, that's what Team America is making fun of is that style of these these 60s kids shows, which a lot of people don't even know that. But um, anyway, there were these shows all made by this same production company, um, which I believe, I don't remember what, the, what it was called, but the ones I remember are like, there's one called Joe 90, which is, a, I vaguely remember, it's about some kid, he goes in a special machine And it gives him, like, super intelligence and something to do with his glasses that he wears. I don't remember. And then there's one which is called Stingray, which is about, like, submarines. And I don't remember anything about it other than that. And I think it had a really cool theme tune. Um, And then there's one called Captain Scarlet, which was too scary for me to watch as a kid. That's all I remember about it, is that I got too spooked to watching it as a kid. Uh, But my favorite one, and I think the most popular one, was called Thunderbirds. Uh, Now, I have no idea why I watched these as a kid, because this stuff is from the 60s. This is not like a show that my parents would have grown up watching, unless maybe they were watching reruns. But like, this is like older than my parents' generation. This is like my parents' parents' generation, maybe. Like, this is too, too old for my parents. So I, I don't really know wh- why they showed me this, but they did. And honestly, it's kind of cool they did. And these shows, if you go back and watch Thunderbirds, okay, I'm not telling you it's good, because it's really not. Like, an episode of Thunderbirds, firstly, they are just, like, painfully slow. For like modern standards. Like it's it's agonizingly slow. And it's also all people talking in rooms. And nothing else. It's kind of got the setup of like a 50s B movie. Where it's like. You get like one cool scene. And then everything else is just people talking in rooms. Except that the one cool scene in Thunderbirds. I, I believe. Went on to influence. Anime extremely heavily because uh so so thunderbirds is a show about like rockets like it's a show about a sort of pseudo military organization called international rescue and they fly in these big ass rockets and rescue people um in various situations and if you go and watch, like, the, on YouTube, the sequences with these rockets, it is very clear 
the, that they influenced the development of mecha anime. And this isn't just some schizo theory. It's not like I've, I've been trying to research this and it doesn't seem like anyone cares enough about Thunderbirds to like look this up. But it is a fact that Thunderbirds was very popular in Japan. Contin- they even made a Thunderbirds spin-off anime in the 80s um, because it was, it was popular. Uh, like it got dubbed in Japan. Uh, you know, it Thunderbirds was pop. It was big in Japan. Um, the people who grew up to, to you know, like Tomino and whatever, would have probably grown up watching Thunderbirds. Um, so I'm like, and the, the thematic like visual parallels are so clear. I think it's undeniable that Thunderbirds had a big influence on mecha anime and the development of mecha anime. And the second thing is that I said Thunderbirds is like just people talking and then one cool scene per episode. Well, that cool scene is the same scene every episode because it's the launch sequence of whatever rocket they're using or rockets they're using. That is the cool shit. Go look this up on YouTube. Like, go watch some of these things because it is fucking sick. Like, maybe I'm just autistic, but these launch sequences are extremely cool. In fact... If they made a movie out of Thunderbirds, uh, they actually made another movie. In like 2004, they tried to reboot it in like a cool modern way. It looks terrible. I don't, I'd, have, I'd never heard of this until I was looking this stuff up. Uh, yeah, they made some reboot Thunderbirds movie in 2004, and it's like the worst thing I've ever seen. Uh, I mean, maybe the movie's actually good, but it looks terrible from what I have saw of it. Not that movie. The original movie from the 60s. They made this movie, and, like, at the start of this film, there's, like, a ten-minute sequence, uninterrupted sequence, of just, like, mechanical parts moving around to construct, like, a rocket. And it's, like, the coolest fucking shit. It's, like, experimental cinema. I don't know. It's, like, it's fucking sick. Like... every All of these, like, really slow-moving, miniature, very detailed... And well designed, like mechanical design miniatures just moving around like slowly and assembling this ship and preparing it for launch. And it is like 10 minutes of this uninterrupted at the start of this fucking movie. And it is fucking sick. It is absolutely awesome. Um, But I think so, you know, this is just an obvious cost cutting measure. But the the I'm 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 trying to link this to the, like transformation sequences in general, because when the like um in in anime and in tokusatsu, because Thunderbirds was also influential on, on tokusatsu, um like uh, yeah, uh and and like magical girl stuff, like henshin hero stuff, because like I I think. Th- I don't know if Thunderbirds invented this. I pr- they probably didn't invent this. But every episode of Thunderbirds uses the same footage of these, like, launch sequences in the same way that, like, a magical girl show uses the same transformation sequence every time. Um, which I think is pretty interesting. But, yeah, this is, like, a secret hidden lore about the origin of, like, mecha anime um, that, that no one talks about. Because no one cares about Thunderbirds. Because who the fuck grew up... Firstly, I don't think it was ever big in America. Because it's a British show. And secondly, it's like fucking ancient. And no one from my generation (laughs) knows about it except me. Because I just happened to have grown up watching it. For some God knows why reason. Um, So like no one would ever think of this parallel. But I'm, I'm like certain it's there. Like, I, this is not a schizo post. This is very real. Um, I, 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 although I can't recommend watching the show because the shows are not good. Like, they don't hold up in terms of plot and story and all these things. And the puppets do look very fucking goofy. Incredibly goofy. Those launch sequences, those hold up. The set design, super fucking cool. 
like all of the the way these things move and and stuff it's all very cool um and it yeah i can definitely like see a clear line from this to to mecha anime so if you're a mecha fan uh, uh, i think you owe it to yourself to check this out just to like look into it briefly as a part of the history of of this stuff Hideki Anno is a Thunderbirds fan, confirmed, by the way. He's talked about it multiple times. Hideki Anno likes Thunderbirds. If that doesn't convince you that there's something worth, worth looking into here, then I don't know what will. I want to talk about Collapse. Um... I seem to go through phases where I'm like, uh-oh, collapse, and then I'm like, actually, it's fine. But I think um, I was right the first time. I think uh, the mundane collapse of civilization, like, a lot of people are framing it as the death of America, the American empire, but it's a bit bigger than that. Um <clears throat> Because, uh, well, there's no real empire to six. I mean, a lot of people think it's like the transfer of power from the, the west to the east, but China's not doing that great. Uh, so, India, maybe India's also kind of fucked. Uh, they really haven't gotten their shit together, like, even to the level that China had gotten their shit together. And to be f- like, yeah. So, but it's bigger than this because of, you know, environmental stuff, eco- ecological stuff, that, like, um, capitalism is a machine that runs on fossil fuels, and we're running out of fossil fuels. Uh, I was going to say something. Yeah, I was talking about, in my head, I was talking about <laughs> deglobalization. Like, if you... It's it's a relatively... So, so we had globalization, right? We had this thing. It was called globalization. It was really great for the time that it worked. And the idea behind globalization was if every country participates in highly interconnected global supply chains and neoliberal capitalism then all of these countries become so interdependent on each other that uh, stuff like wars and conflicts become disincentivized because they are unprofitable like why go to war with your neighbor when you and your neighbor and your neighbor's neighbors are all part of the same big supply chain or series of supply chains and that's how your economy runs. Like, if you attack your neighbor, you're basically collapsing your entire economy for some short-term benefit. Um, it seems like a really good idea on paper, and I've heard lots of people, otherwise intelligent um, people who I'm friends with, uh, talk about how great this idea is, that, like, oh, actually, um, globalization is, 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 like, the best thing ever, and um, economic into connectivity is like really important for maintaining peace and stuff like this and encouraging countries or communities to be self-sufficient is actually bad because it uh, you know removes the disincentive of like attacking your neighbors or whatever and it seems like a really good idea on paper the problem is that it's it's kind of a meme because these supply chains are actually very delicate and um, they're very easily, like, fucked. They're very easily disrupted. Uh, they have been very easily disrupted. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't take that much to disrupt them. So, first of all, the idea that all of these countries are, like, mutually interdependent is, is a lie. Because what actually happened is that every country just became dependent on one of four superpowers the U.S. and China, and then to a lesser extent Russia and India. Um, 
so you know what it really did was just increase the global influence of these few superpowers rather than making countries you know kind of all equals in this global production line instead it was countries are all equal in that they serve the few countries with money um and all of the you know the shittier parts of the production line the the, the mining <laughs> that we send that down to the global south and we don't worry about it up here right it's like th- there's definitely a bunch of problems with that but but from a from a systems design perspective um these supply chains were built for speed rather than resilience they were built to get goods um made on as large a scale as possible as quickly as possible and distributed as quickly as possible um rather than being built to withstand problems uh which means when you know i mean here you know a great example the ukraine war has disrupted a, a whole bunch of supply chains of grain and gas mainly and we're not seeing the effects of that yet too bad but we will be in the coming years um you know stuff like this i mean really it was the pandemic that kind of set this off like the pandemic fucked supply chains and then the ukraine war fucked supply chains more and now you have the trade war with russia i mean sorry the trade war with china the u.s trade war with china although um now trump is like going back on that i'm very confused by this guy he started complimenting xi I don't, I don't, I mean, does he even know what he's doing? I don't really understand what's going on here. (laughs) I think that's the point. I don't think you're supposed to understand. But if Trump's running on a policy of, like, re-instigating trade relations with China, that's, like like, a really smart, like, decision from him. I mean, he's the one that fucked it in the first place. I don't know how well China is going to be willing to put those relations back up, especially... The point being, sorry, I'm getting distracted. This globalized system was never going to work. It was always too delicate because all it takes, it like it works great as long as all the countries are cooperating and doing well. But as soon as some outside factor happens, like natural disasters or some country, you know, elects a dictator by mistake <laughs> or on purpose, rather, I don't know why it's by mistake. Um, some country elects a dictator or some, you know, some pandemic happens, some natural, like any of these sorts of things uh, becomes super, dis- you know, you're fucked. You can't get the shit that you've built your economy around now. And so suddenly you have a situation where the U.S. is like, fuck, we got to build semiconductor fabs real quick, you know. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and this is generally the situation because turns out you know having everything be distributed across the globe and having these these sprawling supply chains um, and economic interconnectivity is actually just a very delicate system it means that like you you're actually at each country very reliant on a bunch of stuff that you can't really control um and it was it was bound to collapse uh pretty much instantly or it was, it was bound to collapse anyway Maybe not instantly, but it was like, it was always a precarious arrangement. This is why I've, I've always been a bit more of a, um, I don't want to call it an isolationist, but, you know, I've been, a, I've always been more skeptical of this stuff than, than a lot of my friends have been, because I've thought about how it's like, this stuff isn't really a solution to the problem. It doesn't really dissuade war. It doesn't really work to do what it wants to do. <clears throat> um... So, you know, you have, like, ma- mainstream, or, like, I guess he's not mainstream within uh, the world of, like, his field, necessarily. I guess, I don't really know that much about that, but, you know, he's 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 mainstream in the public. He's, like, a, a, a communicator, a, 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 a niche, what a public intellectual, you know, like Peter Zihan, right? He talks about deglobalization, right? And what people, I think, aren't realizing about this, this deglobalization thing is that this is collapse. <laughs> like, this isn't um, a change in geopolitical strategy. This is civilization collapsing. Um, this is the first part of civilization collapsing. Uh, 
and we're, we're all going to be living in a, in a world of, of increased scarcity. So um, what I suggest you do is start growing potatoes. Uh, I need to get on that. What I suggest we all do is uh, start growing those potatoes and buy some fucking solar panels. Um, yeah, so solar panels, the thing about these things, right, is that having, like, solar panels in your house is not good for the environment. Like, you, they're never going to produce enough energy to offset the energy required to make them in the first place. Uh, uh, but what they do is they they would mean you're no longer, like, dependent on the larger scale in energy infrastructure to work. You have your own energy, like, local energy infrastructure which you can share with your neighbors, ideally. Um, and it creates sort of a, you know, bottom-up system, which is good. That's more resilient. That's how you do resilience. I've explained this before. I guess, really, that's the problem, is that these, these supply chains, they weren't decentralized. They were, they were heavily centralized. It was all about shipping goods to America. Um, like, that was pretty much everything. Uh, and Western Europe, to, some, to, to also an extent. They were they were basically all centered around the U.S. And so <clears throat> all it takes is one U.S. policy decision to completely fuck everything. Like they were too, there were too many choke points. There were too many single points of failure. If you have, a, you know, this like a, a, a network of actually distributed nodes, these things are resilient to failure on a, on a larger scale. Um... Yeah, so we're gonna have we're gonna have less energy. We're gonna have less energy, and what I mean by that is energy is gonna be more expensive. Energy is gonna be expensive, and food is gonna be expensive, and housing is also gonna be expensive. But uh, you'll figure out a way around that. Um, there's gonna be a lot of refugees everywhere. Um, some economies are gonna collapse. Not sure which ones yet. Too early to call it. Uh, and and so yeah, food, 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 and energy are like the big two things. Um, you know, this is why this is why I like Estonia, because Estonia, you know, what they got here. You know, what I'm sitting next to. I'm sitting next to a big ass fireplace, and and in the back of this commie block, there's a there's a big um shed and in that shed everyone keeps their firewood because it gets down to like minus 30 here in the winter and uh if something bad were to happen to some sort of centralized government run or 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 privately owned energy heating company people would die so instead it's more resilient if everyone just keeps their own firewood and has a fireplace can't really go wrong like there's no centralized point of failure which is cool that's good i need to get my fireplace working at my place because i have one but it's like decommissioned um i don't know how it's, it's kind of annoying you have to store a lot of firewood to have a fireplace like, i would have to have <laughs> I don't know where I would keep all the firewood. Yeah, enjoy it while you still can, is what I'm saying. Enjoy the fruits of civilization while you still can, because it's not going to last. And uh, don't let the vegans hijack this movement to be like, oh, you got to stop eating milk. Okay, milk is gonna be the one thing you have left. <laughs> you're gonna have you're gonna have plenty of soured milk products and not much else. Look, I shit on vegans too much. I'm gonna be honest. I'm just I'm just I've I've I keep seeing them around and they keep annoying me with bad philosophical arguments and even worse, you know, other arguments, <laughs> ecological arguments and stuff. But I shit on them way too much, okay? They're not bothering me in real life. I'm the one that just keeps seeing them because they just don't exist. It's fine. 
Um, I need to stop. I need to chill, okay? If you're vegan and you're listening to this, I just want to say one thing to you, okay? Just one thing. And you probably already do it. You probably don't need me to tell you this. But just in case. Please just eat normal foods, okay? Don't... I Like, I, why, if vegans don't like meat, do they keep making these fake meat vegan products? It doesn't make any sense to me. This shit sucks. You don't need it. There are so many amazing recipes you can make with no animal products. Why make something that looks and tastes like some mockery of an animal product? You don't, you, you already committed, motherfucker. Just eat beans and lentils. This is, okay, I just want to say one thing. Now that I'm making fun of vegans again. That they, they are like, uh... I've seen a, a vegan meme, which is like, lol, 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 eating the same three animals instead of the, like, thousands and thousands of different plants. It's like, motherfucker, there are, like, two plants that make protein. It's like you're either eating beans or lentils in some capacity. Tofu made of beans. You know, like, everything, <laughs> you're, like, if you're eating protein as a vegan, you're also eating the same, like, two plants. There's just not that much variety in protein. But, you know, that's not to mention the fact that, that, that we carnists eat fish and there are hundreds of different species of fish that all taste delicious. But, um, you know, that's neither here nor there. I think the one thing you can't say as a vegan is we have more interesting food. Uh, like, that's probably your worst possible argument there. Um, but, yeah. Just eat, eat fucking like a normal person if you're vegan. When I say that, I mean like eat, eat, eat like real fucking plant foods. Don't try and fake, fake it. Just eat beans. Uh, just eat like dal. Make some dal, okay? Dal is delicious. I love dal. I need to, you know, I used to make dal more often. And then I ran out of garam masala and I never bought more. So I stopped making dal. I need to get back into making dal because it's very tasty and very healthy and very cheap. Um, dal, yeah, that's where it's at. I need to go get back into making dal. I need to, I just thought about that. Huh, good idea, me. Well, when I get back from Estonia, I will do that. Um, <clears throat> but I don't think Dotsmay would like dal. Uh, too many flavors for them. They're like things that are simple. You know, Eastern European food is like get some flour, get like a bland bit of meat and cabbage, and then pour sour cream all over it. I like that. Don't get me wrong. I feel like it's good, but uh, you know, it's 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 not quite the same thing as Indian, subcontinent, Pakistani, Bangladeshi type food. Um, yeah. What was it? Yeah. Just, just like, don't, oh, that's what I'm saying, okay? I just, I don't know why this, this, it's just because this stuff tastes bad. That's why. Like, why fake it? I just don't understand. Unless it's, like, chemically identical, right? Like, um, I've heard that there's some way to make, like, the exact same milk proteins that you find in milk, but using yeast instead of cows. To create like something that is chemically identical to milk but doesn't rely on cows, like in that case, I mean, it, I would need to to taste it <laughs> to see if that's true, um, but yeah, maybe. I uh, I don't like. As time goes on, I'm I'm like you know, fresh milk is just lame. Like why eat unfermented milk? Yeah, you make yogurt is take milk and add yogurt, you know? That's based. I don't know why. <laughs> Does this make any sense? Here's another piece of semi-obscure trivia about the origins of anime. Uh, anime eyes come from Bambi. Go look up pictures of Bambi, the original Disney Bambi. 
the eyes of Bambi characters look exactly like, or the the deers in Bambi look exactly like anime eyes because Tezuka fucking loved Bambi. He watched it like forty times, and he yeah, he basically invented like the anime aesthetic, <clears throat> and it all comes from Bambi. So. Give thanks to Bambi for inventing anime eyes. You know how happy I would be? Hold on. I'm thinking about, like... Like, fandoms. Like, fandoms, you know? Like... Like, people... Who have their little thing that they're interested in. And they have, like, a fandom. How... Maybe it'd be cool. Like... Maybe I'm just not in the right places. Maybe I need to be on Tumblr. Do I need to be on Tumblr? Who's joining Tumblr in 2023? Sounds like a terrible idea. I'm on a few blogs. Yeah? Yeah, Tumblr's been with the massive surge of new users. Okay. These stages of the That's true, actually. I guess everything's getting new users because Twitter's dying. Also, Reddit is dying. That's true. Now, Reddit's not really dying. Um... We had like a massive surge when 196 closed down. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, 196 is fucking retarded anyway. Um. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. So maybe Tumblr's the place. But when I'm thinking, like, like I'm, I was thinking about, about Jan Meesley, who's a great YouTuber. He made this video about, about Rhythm Heaven. I was thinking about that because I was thinking about drama, and I saw a drama rhythm heaven meme, and so I was like, "Oh yeah, Jan Meesley rhythm heaven game," and I was thinking about rhythm heaven, and I was like, "Like you don't see people talk about rhythm heaven, right?" But there's very clearly an autistic rhythm heaven fan base, right? You know what I'm saying here? Like, like these people exist. I think that, like, how do I put it? How do I put this? Like, there's a community there that's invested in this thing. And it's like, I complain, I feel like I complain about this a lot, that I don't have a scene or whatever. Because, you know what I want, right? Is if there was a website where I could log on and I could see posts about Hidamari Sketch every day, That's what I would love in my life. Like, if that existed, I would be, like, I mean, I would basically, I I think I would reach enlightenment, because I would be beyond desire. It's kind of popping. popping. Yeah, there's a lot of posts. I'll consider joining Tumblr, because Tumblr's probably the place for this sort of thing, now that I think. I mean, it's got to be either Tumblr or 4chan. To actually, I haven't been on a, uh, on like 4chan really recently. I don't really know why. Maybe I need to just get... Maybe I'm just complaining about stuff, but I just need to be in the, the Gotcha user threads and the Hidamari threads on 4chan. Or, the, or may, maybe Tumblr is the place. I don't know. Like... The thing is that I'm not an anime fan, right? Like, I don't fit in with the anime fandom because I don't like most of the anime that they like. As I said when I was going through the, the seasonal stuff, right? Like, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a moe otaku. I'm not an anime fan. Like, I like... Like, you've got the, the, the stuff that's at the top of every season, the Norman tier shows, and then you've got the, the, the shows for 15-year-old boys... And I don't really, I, I mean, I'd rather watch the shitty isekai for 15-year-old boys than watch Oshino Ko or uh, Spy Family. But, like, beyond that, in the, in the niche that is Slice of Life anime, you know, that's what I'm all about. Although I haven't really been watching anime... Um, very much at all recently. What have I been doing with my life? Oh, I've been listening to this audiobook of this David Graeber uh, 
book called The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity. And it's pretty good so far, but it's also a little strange as a book. But so far, they're definitely retreading some stuff that I've seen him talk about in The Myth of the Stupid Savage. Um, about how, like, the Enlightenment was born out of uh, Native American critiques of Europe or European culture, European society. Um, and that stuff's interesting if I hadn't already heard it all in, in the myth of the stupid savage. I mean, there's new information here, but yeah, still cool. But then he sort of got, I, I didn't expect this to be the thing. I mean, maybe I'm just too early in the book because I'm on chapter four. Maybe he's going to go and talk about like archaeological sites of early civilizations and stuff, which I thought was what the book was going to be about. Um, it probably is what the book is about once you get past that. But right now, he's just like talking about... I'm saying he as if it's just one guy. It's both it's David Graeber and David Wengro. So they, I suppose, would be the correct pronoun to use there. They they are talking about, like, how the noble savage myth itself is a myth. That I think they literally said the sentence, the myth of the myth of the noble savage. Like, they're literally going, actually, the savages were noble. Which is odd, because, like, they've also explicitly stated that some of the Native American societies they're talking about were anti-egalitarian. And I mean, you also, of course, have like Mesoamerican societies that were, well, while I think Bataille would defend some of the human sacrifices and slavery, I don't think David Graeber would defend that sort of um, theocracy and slave states. Uh, so they, I don't know, it seems a little nitpicky to me. I'm not saying that their entire theory is wrong. I just, um, I, I don't know, it's maybe, be, I, it's strange. It's just strange. They seem to be trying to present this argument about Native American society. I mean, I, I think that the base idea, but okay, really what I'm getting at here is that I think in trying to present a clear argument I don't think it's because they don't know this I think they do know it and are probably hopefully going to go into more detail later in the book I think they're purposefully not talking about this for the sake of making a clearer argument for like a rhetorical point but I'm not sure I like that which is like they're not really differentiating very much between the organizational structures of different groups and tribes of Native Americans like this, they're 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 relating. I don't know, I don't know, whatever. So I am doing stuff, I guess. I've also been vaguely trying to learn Tetris, but I'm not sure if I am. Uh, anyway, that was not what I. I'm just. I want. I want to. I want to make hyper specific YouTube videos for my fandoms. But my fandoms are too, too, they're either, like, I don't have anything in the sweet spot. This is what I'm getting at. Like, there's this, I feel like there's a sweet spot between, like, like, for example, the TF2 fandom, which is, like, giga Reddit most of the time, kind of cringe, and also, like, too big, really. Or the anime fandom, which is, like, not even really a thing. But, like, the, the, what you see of the anime fandom, I have no interest in. Like, the broader anime, the people who, the, like, that culture that is based around, we are anime fans, I have very little interest in. Because it, it's too big, and it ends up being lowest common denominator because of that. Um, and then, like, the other stuff I'm interested in is, like, too niche, you know, to find, like... Um, maybe it's not too niche, maybe I'm just not trying hard enough to find these places, but like I feel like the community is already entrenched or something. Like, 
like the Hidamari sketch fandom. There, there doesn't seem to be. It's too small to have places to have like. I don't know if this makes any sense. Maybe it's not like. You know what's of a good size is like the Toho fandom, right? It's big enough to be able to do shit. And, like, make, like, there's a lot of, like, creative people who make original games and music and art and, like, that sort of thing. But, like, you look at the biggest, like, Toho-specific YouTubers, and they have, like, what, 20,000 subs? Something like that? Like, that's the perfect size. That's why I need something, like, I, I, I follow these people, like, Suako and stuff. You know, I like the Toho stuff, but I don't really like the Toho games that much, which kind of neuters that whole possibility. Uh, excuse me. Like, here to my sketch has got to be close. I don't know. It'd be cool to be. I don't know. I like, I like Half Life One, but I haven't deep dived. Like, if I wanted to be more interested in the Gold Source community, which does exist and kind of is what I'm talking about. I feel like I'd ha like, I'd need to, which isn't, this is not like a bad thing, but it, it would, it would mean getting more into like, like mods and fan created levels for Half-Life and stuff like this. Cause I, I do enjoy, like I've, I've, I actually, before I left for Estonia, I was, I was actually playing Half-Life Deathmatch, like pretty, like almost every day, not for very long. Cause it gets pretty boring. It's very samey type of game. But I was getting, like, pretty into Half-Life Deathmatch. It's a great, like, I, it's, it's a really good game, honestly. My, my, my hot take about Half-Life Deathmatch is that Crossfire is not actually a very good map. I, I think I will get crucified for saying this. But honestly, it's, like, the least fun map I've played on. Because, like, there, it's, it's, it's got so many, like, narrow corridors, you know? Like, it's, it's either... You're in these, like, super tight, narrow areas, a lot of which are, like, dead ends if you get caught in a fight there. Um, which make, like, half the weapons useless. I mean, you can't use any sort of grenade-based weapons, like, or, like, explosion-based weapons in such close quarters, or you just die to self-damage, or you do so much self-damage that it's, like, pointless. So either you're in these sorts of, like, super tight areas, which it, it's not, I mean, it's not, like... I'm not saying it's a terrible map, to be clear, but, like, those fights I don't find super fun. It kind of just feels like luck who wins those interactions. It's kind of scrappy, it's kind of meh. Or, you're, like, completely out in the open, where every single person on the server is seeing you and firing at you. Like, those are the only two types of spaces that really exist in, in on Crossfire. Which is kind of annoying, because, like, that's not where the com the combat in Half-Life is, like, the combat in every Source Engine game following it. It's best at, like, mid-range. Um, like, like, there's a reason that the AK and the M4, the, the rifles, are the most popular guns in Counter-Strike. It's because the gunplay in Counter-Strike is best at mid-range, and so maps are designed around that. Um, you know, if... That's that's where it's most fun. So the maps are designed to encourage mid-range fights. In TF2, you have damage fall off, um, and you know slow-moving projectile weapons, in order to again encourage mid-range fights. Uh, except if you're playing sniper, or a melee class like spy or demo knight. But generally speaking, most classes in TF2 are built around mid-range fights. Also, Pyro isn't. Uh, it's like the big balance thing about Pyro. But anyway, and it's also, that's also the same in uh, Team Fortress Classic, by the way. Uh, it's the same in all of the Counter-Strike games. It's the same in Half-Life 1, the game itself. And it's pretty much the same in Half-Life 2, although Half-Life 2 is a little different. It's kind of, yeah, it's kind of hard to compare. Um, and it's the same, in my opinion, on half in Half Life One Deathmatch, like the maps that are built around having a lot of these sort of mid range fights are the most fun. And Crossfire isn't one of those maps. 
it's a very hot take because Crossfire is the most iconic Half-Life Deathmatch map and everyone loves it, but personally, I don't see it. I mean, the fact that it's all tight 90 degree angles and corners, like, you can't really do much interesting movement stuff, which sucks because the movement, like, getting the long jump module and, like, b-hopping around with it is, like, super fucking fun. When I was playing on some random-ass custom maps that had, like, big open areas and you could just jump around with a long jump module and b-hop around, that shit was super fun. Like, you could b-hop into someone, you know, get into position, use, like, fucking play footsies with them, you know, like, dodging, evasive movement, positioning, super interesting and deep gunplay and movement in the way that all Source Engine games have. And yet, you know, I just don't feel like Crossfire actually enables for that, which is kind of sad to me. Like, what sort of... I mean, I know that people who are actually cracked can, like, do some cool shit with the Gauze Cannon in Crossfire, because I've seen them do it on YouTube. Um, I, know it's, I know it's theoretically possible, but, but I don't know. Am I crazy here? Maybe I'm just maybe maybe I'm just bad at the game. Let's I, let's not let's not jump to any conclusions that my opinions have any weight to them. I didn't like Bad Water when I first played TF2, so clearly I'm not the best judge when I'm new to a game. I didn't dislike Bad Water. I just thought it was overhyped. Now I understand it. No, it actually probably is one of the best maps in the game. But anyway, though I, I got off topic there. Like, the TF2 fandom, too big, too broad. Like, and I don't know how to get to more specific sides of, I don't know. Big misconception about specific sides of it are like sp focused on specific game modes and stuff. I don't know if this makes any fucking sense. I'm gonna stop talking about that. I just, I just want like, I just wanna, I just wanna hang out and t uh, and, and maybe I should rewatch Hidamari sketch. Maybe that should be something interesting. Maybe, maybe I just, I don't know. I often feel like I, I I'm, I'm. I don't, I feel like this might be, sound kind of like I'm sucking my own dick if I say this in the wrong way, but I don't mean this to come off as like, like egotistical, because I'm going to explain to you how it fails, how this is like a bad aspect of my personality. Like, I'm the type of person that has some level of hubris, where I imagine like, that the internet is still like the 90s or whatever, and that if there's like some community that doesn't exist, that I feel like should exist, that I can just create it. Like, in my head, when I'm thinking about this, the immediate reaction that my, my instincts have is like, well, I should create my own Hidamari sketch community. Except that I've done similar stuff like this in the past. I don't want to get into specifics because it's embarrassing and also, like, slightly doxy to myself. Um, but I've done similar stuff like this in the past, and n obviously none of them have ever succeeded. Like, of course they haven't. Because you can't just summon a community out of thin air. And no one, like, if there's no existing community of these people, there's nowhere to advertise. And if there is existing communities of these people, then you don't need to exist and advertise yourself because it already exists. So it's just kind of a stupid thing to do. Um, it's failed the two times I've tried to do something similar to it. So I don't think that's the play. Maybe, uh, maybe I should just join Tumblr or something. Or, um... I don't know, I need to get off Reddit. I've been on Reddit recently. It's just like, honestly, the fucking, the stigma against Reddit kept me off of Reddit for my whole life. And then recently, like, I don't even know what made me start going on Reddit. It's bad. I shouldn't be on Reddit. Like, what, do you remember what, what made me start? I, I had something where I was like, I need, I need to do something. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think you just 
Circling the 196. It was, it was actually you. It yeah. was you, Don't Smart. You did this to me because yeah. I was like, oh, anyone who uses Reddit on a regular basis must be like super cringe and gay. But then Don't Smart uses Reddit regularly. I just go on RuneScape Reddit. That's true. To see the RuneScape news. That's, tr- I mean, none of, like, this is like the problem, right? Like, there's a Hidamari sketch subreddit. It gets like one post a day and it's just like random artworks yeah. and stuff. Reddit is a good, like, news aggregator type thing. Mm-hmm. It's not good for the community. You just go through for, to it's see good, what's happening. It's, it's good for tech stuff. Like, all the tech subreddit, like, like the cute browser or, like, Vim. Yeah, but you don't go there to talk to people. You go there to see what people are saying. That's true. <sighs> yeah, I just need to go on A more regularly, I think. You need to start going on Tumblr. Yeah, maybe I need to start going on Tumblr as well. I don't know. I'll consider it. Tumblr is definitely maybe viable. And you can make posts like, I love my fag girlfriend and get a million reblogs. I don't want that. But you could easily do that on Tumblr. Why could I do that? To get a million reblogs. What do you mean? Are Tumblr people stupid? Is this what you're trying to tell me? They're just, they're excitable. Is it a trans circle jerk? No, not really. That sounds like what you're trying to tell me. No, they 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 love when people use fag and other similar words. Like retard? No, not that They one. don't like retard. They like tranny too. They like tranny and yeah. they like fag. Yeah. I, I, I saw a post today on Twitter. Someone was like, they think the word retard is coming back. And I hope that's true. We gotta bring back retard. It's a great word. It's no. Ne- I never stopped saying it, baby. <coughs> no one's ever tried to cancel me for saying retard. I think it's an American thing, honestly. I mean, it's also that you're retarded. I'm a genius. <laughs> what are you talking about? In order to be retarded, I would have to not be a genius, which is unfortunately not true. I have an IQ at least three standard deviations above the norm. <coughs> I should you have an IQ like three standard deviations above yeah. the norm. More like two and a half. I have no idea what my IQ is. I've never taken IQ's my IQ test. IQ stupid. It is stupid, but it's kind of funny, though. It's I like, think IQ is like really funny to use in jokes. It's like, oh, the, how, how monkey brain pattern recognition are you? That's how the IQ is. I'm probably not very monkey brain pattern recognition. I don't know. It, it only measures that. It doesn't measure anything else. It measures if you're good at taking IQ tests. Yeah, which is just how monkey brain pattern you are. I'm, I'm just a guy, mainly. Yeah. I like Hidamari sketch. <laughs> like, the, here's the subreddits. Here's the subreddits that I'm in, right? Or that I follow. <laughs> I, I could fucking put you on such blast right now. I don't give a fuck if you put me on blast. I'm not. I'm not hiding anything. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want you to tell people what my my Reddit account is. Yeah. Uh, if you want to, if you. There's some tell experiences that, scrolling through your Reddit. Listen, if you if if people want to know what porn subreddits I follow, I don't. <laughs> I don't fucking give a shit. They can know. How do I find out? Is it gonna be in profile? Is there some way to just see, like, every subreddit I follow? Oh, okay, here it is. Um, Alright, so, like, these t- two, like, meme sub- shit posting subreddits, the Adam Ragusea subreddit, literally the only posts on the Adam Ragusea subreddit are just the same guy who always posts when he posts a new video, and no one else ever says anything. Nothing else ever happens on the Adam Ragusea subreddit r slash anime piracy anti-work which is fucking retarded subreddit but it's funny to laugh at ask science i think i followed ask science when <coughs> i was like 12 years old and i made this uh, this reddit account i see uh, r slash bbs because bbs is a cool r slash breakcore what's r slash breakcore people post breakcore stuff i i actually followed that literally today because i was talking with better off dead and they were like, I saw this this on R slash Breakcore and sent me a song. And I was like, I should follow R slash Breakcore so I can find cool songs. I see, that makes sense. Uh, 
And then and th this is the thing. I ended up just following like a bunch of like really normy like meme reposter subreddits. Which is, I don't know, I feel like it's rotting my brain. I mean, you, you used to watch TikTok compilations. This is an upgrade. That's true. TikTok fell off, like, big time. R slash contagious laughter. Yeah, that's one of them. R slash CSGO. That's actually good. R slash CSGO is good. Because it's, it's basically just, like, actually people discussing the game or posting, like, clips. It's unironically good. Uh, what else? R slash... Destiny, yeah, I, I'm a DGGO. This r slash Discord video is just a meme video thing. Um, r DSBM, r slash Erogay, r slash Furry IRL. I'm not even a furry. <laughs> you keep saying that. I'm not really. I don't. I feel like in order to be a furry, you have to have like a fursona or something. It's, it's only a matter of time. I'm not bothered to You're going to be like, oh, my auto fursona has such cute paws. No, I don't have a fursona, but if I did, they would obviously have cute paws. R slash futurology. I don't know what this is. It's cringe. R slash Gemini protocol. R slash gadgets. What the fuck is R slash gadgets? What the fuck is R slash gadgets? I don't think it exists anymore. Or is it just the internet's down? Maybe subreddits down. I don't know what this is. It's just it just the description is just gadgets and it has twenty one million members. <laughs> and it's just gadgets. I guess it's just gadgets. <laughs> it's just gadgets. <laughs> Wait, did Reddit like just upload update their site design or something? <laughs> like live? The fuck is this? Oh I got signed out? How did I get signed out? What the <clears throat> what the hell? This is the problem. It's all of these like I guess the internet's down or something. It says you successfully logged in. But the, I guess it's like Reddit down. I'm confused. Let me let me try like a different website. Uh oh, Twitter's loading. Oh yeah, did you see this? Probably not, because it just happened. TF2 raised the max player count to 100 in custom servers. TF2 Battle Royale? Yeah, people are talking about it already. Someone's going to make a V-Script Battle Royale mode. That would actually be so sick. I've never cared about a Battle Royale in my life, but if TF2 had a Battle Royale mode... Wouldn't it just be like... Stock their online beans every time or whatever. No, it wouldn't. Or stock it wouldn't. A soldier, soldier, and them. I mean, yeah, it actually, it would suck if it was solos. But if you could only have like teams, oh, I see. it would be good because you. It would generally be like what a a, a medic and a soldier or a medic and a medic yeah. soldier scout. You get the solos. It would just be demonized yeah, soldiers. It wouldn't or be demonized. Demo man. Demo man. Uh, and and scout as well. Scout. Yeah. Because Scout counters both Demo and Soldier. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would have to be, like, teams of three or two. Okay, let's see if Reddit is, like, broken. I think Reddit is just actually broken. Well, that puts a spanner in my plans. What about old.reddit? I've never used non little tricky. Security issue. Why is it the fucking SSL cert out of date or whatever? Oh, it fixed itself. Okay, I can look at my subreddits again. Where were we? Gadgets. <laughs> <laughs> R slash Gemini protocol. No one ever posts there. Just like the Gemini protocol. R slash global offensive. Wait, why? Which one's the real one? Is it RCS Go or I don't even know? R slash Hidamari sketched, like it's like one post every three days. R slash history, I think I probably followed that. It's probably like when you make your Reddit account, it's like follow these popular ones, and it one of them's probably R slash history. We don't need to talk about <laughs> that one. The I, I, this one's actually fun. R slash holofractal. This is like a weird conspiracy theory about 
people who think the universe is a holographic fractal. I think it's just people who like did a bunch of mushrooms or something. Um, r slash linux r slash linux on thinkpad r slash livestream fail I, you gotta follow some streamer drama from time to time it was actually lsf that got me into reddit to be oh to yeah be you used to go on lsf like on the clock i i, I you're like time to clock into lsf for the day <laughs> i had a, a an lsf drama andy uh phase and then i got bored of it r slash london underground I'm a tube nerd. I like the tube. Um, yeah, most... Okay, I'm not going to just go through every single thing, but like r slash OpenBSD, r slash Retro Battle Stations, that one's actually a good one. Uh, Strike Witches, Subreddit Drama, TF2, ThinkPad, Thomas the Tank Engine, TikTok Cringe, that one's actually bad. I should... This is the problem, right? Is that the TikTok cringe videos are like, it's not actually cringe, by the way. I don't know if yeah, you use Reddit. But you showed me TikTok cringe. They're not, like, they're TikToks, right? Like, they're not good enough to justify watching. But because I'm on Reddit and scrolling, it's like, if I see a video, I'm going to watch it. So I, I just, just watch it anyway. I just YouTube. Yeah, see, I'm not as... I just don't click on videos. It's easy. If but, you're there for the I posts, like look at the posts. I don't look... I don't... I'm, I'll tell you, I'm not there for the posts. I don't want to read. If I'm reading, I would just read a book. So, so you want to watch YouTube shorts? I watch YouTube shorts when I'm taking a shit. Yeah, but like instead of watching Garth Stash take the cringe, I just pull out your phone and watch YouTube. Because I will show you why. Because let me pull up YouTube Shorts right now, <laughs> and what do you want to bet? It's some bullshit. Intro to bass okay, guitar. this is a Rob Scallon video. It's an ad. One thing I wish I knew sooner in Counter Strike was the dead bodies are often clients. Okay, he's just gonna say that it's one thing I wish I knew sooner in Counter-Strike is that dead bodies are actually rendered on the client side and just because you can't see through a dead body doesn't mean that your opponent can't doesn't mean they're hacking Thanks, come on in. so I have Some this theory that we're all innately attracted to Ableton, you don't like I don't even use Ableton <laughs> good mythical morning what is How that system of see this is the thing YouTube Shorts recommends you videos with like two views it also like I've had like three different videos of like actual pedo shit like, like I see it recommends me videos and not like back to back I'm saying like yeah, over the yeah. like year or whatever that I've occasionally watched YouTube shorts like three separate occasions it showed me video of like a very young child like dancing not in an inappropriate way but in a way where I'm like someone is watching this and like you know someone creepy is watching this yeah. on like and this is getting shared and fucked up play you know what I'm saying yeah like I don't know, man. YouTube Shorts is weird. Like, I don't know what the fuck. This, you, told, you know what I'm saying? None of this, this is, is better than TikTok cringe. Here's too. a question for you guys. At least, is it? Okay, let's go on r slash TikTok cringe and look at the top ones right now. Okay, you know what? You're right. You're actually right. Yeah, so what I'm saying is if you go on Reddit, right? This one was good. Okay. But I also just saw this in an Atriog video. Well, yeah. If you go on Reddit, right, you don't go there to see r slash TikTok cringe or r slash Discord videos. You're just a time gate you click on. You click on the time gate. It's like, okay, I will be staring at this for 20 seconds. Like, if you just want to stare at something for 20 seconds, look at fucking YouTube shorts or whatever. Don't tell me the truth. I can't handle the truth. I, I don't know what to do with my life, don't smite. I need stuff to do with my hands while I'm listening to an audio book. Hey, you know what? It's a really good thing to do with your hands while listening to an audio book. What? There's this little game called Antimatter Dimensions. You're at your... I just haven't been in the mood to commit to anything. You just look at it, the number go up and you can come back like five months later and it'll still be there. It's too much pressure. There's not that much pressure. Okay, I'm gonna do it. Antimatter Dimensions. We're going right now. <clears throat> It's like perfect fucking audiobook. Whoa, it? look, there's the antimatter and here's the dimensions. Yeah, this is the new view. I haven't used it. What the fuck am I supposed to do? I See, this is the thing. I'm not, I don't yeah, want to lear I don't want to learn what the spreadsheet means right now. Yeah, but this isn't supposed to look like this much of a spreadsheet. 
Uh, UI Classic. Okay, this is better. It looks exactly the same, but no, worse. I, put, I buy this. Yeah, it's the only thing there, there is on screen. Okay. There's not 5 million things going on. My antimatter is now going up. Yeah. I'm getting one per second. Yeah. But then once it hits 10, I can get another one. Yeah. I got another one. I love cookie clicker. Cookie clicker. Cookie, cookie clicker. Yeah, this is the problem, right? Is that right now, I'm like, I really don't care about this number going up. I couldn't care less. The problem is, if I spend, like, 15 more minutes doing this, I don't like the, what it's going to turn me into. <laughs> no, I like it. <laughs> I'm just going to wait till it gets to 70, because we're already there. That's what's called a cunt cost for lackey. And that gives you, makes the times 1.0p go to times 2.06. I don't even pay attention to that. I just click the buttons as they come yeah. up. Yeah. Then you buy a hundred, they get bigger. Oh, 10k am, I see. Yeah. This is still costing a hundred? Yeah. It scales every 10, because every oh, 10 I gives see. you a bonus. Also, you can just hold down number keys or in. You just I'm buy it automatically. Wait, what? <clears throat> you can buy it automatically if you just hold down number keys or in. Number keys corresponding to the numbers on the screen. There's numbers? Yeah, it's oh. first two. If you hold Wait, three, two, it'll how does this work? The, the first, uh, there's, the, so are, are these relating to different dimensions? The second one produces the first one and so on. I see. So yeah. if I hold down two, it'll just automatically buy yeah. them. Yeah, and if you hold down them, it'll automatically buy everything. I see. <coughs> oh, max all M, I see. Yeah. I'm gonna just buy this, fuck it. You put some text speed. I don't know why I did that or what it does. Takes is the best thing. It makes everything faster. My percentage is going up. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm playing antimatter dimensions now. I guess I'll go back to listening to my audio book. I'm playing antimatter dimensions, but at some point I'm gonna rewatch Hidamari's sketch. Let me. Have I like made clear the story of what happened to me on Mastodon? Because I feel like I've, I've kind of like jumbled the timeline when I've told it. So I made a Mastodon account. I used it for shit posting because that's what you do on the internet. So I used it for shit posting. Um, one of my shit posts was making fun of fat people. Uh, I don't even remember what I said, but I said something, something mean about fat people. I don't think it was even that bad, but I think it was like, you know, edgy. It was edgy, but I don't think it was that bad. I don't remember exactly what I said. Uh, to which the um <clears throat> you know the 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 guy who the owner of the instance was like he he replied to my post and said something like uh we don't talk like that around here or something like that um and so i made another post what do they call it toot fucking stupid name i made another toot and i said at the the admin the the, the owner is a state actor um and then he banned me. <laughs> and then I went over to another instance to immediately, like pretty, like instantly afterwards, because I was salty. I went over to another instance. I made another account with the same name. And I said the same thing. <laughs> I said, at this admin of this server is a state actor. And then they banned me from that instance instantly without any like warning or recourse, or anything. I got banned from that instance instantly, which makes me think, you know, these admins are in cahoots, or, I mean, there's no other explanation for it. Why would you get banned if it's your first ever post, and you're just saying, at this random user is a state actor? Like, calling someone a state actor isn't some, like, super offensive... To, to, like, I would understand if I joined an instance and instantly started saying the N-word. <laughs> like, oh, hello, doc. Um, I would understand getting banned for that, but, like, it doesn't make sense unless that person that you're calling a state actor happens to have some influence over this different instance. So that's the only explanation. That's how, like, I figured it out, that, that these people are all in communications with each other. Um, <clears throat> so I got instantly banned from that place, uh, upon which I was like, well, Mastodon sucks, let me go on Pleroma, 
Uh, and so I went over to join some random Pleroma instance with a different name this time. Um, and then, yeah, basically just got bored and stopped using it. Uh, but that's that's what happens. That's the clear timeline of of what actually happened. How much of that is my fault versus the Mastodon's fault? I mean, I probably shouldn't have made an edgy joke about fat people. But also, like, it wasn't edgy enough to get banned. Even the guy who owned the server didn't think it was edgy enough to get banned because he didn't ban me. What I actually got banned for was just, like, saying the server owner is a state actor, which I think is just a funny thing to do. Um, so, and, you know, it shouldn't be offensive to anyone, I, like, surely. I don't see how anyone could see that as, like, some sort of attack on a marginalized group, unless the marginalized group is state actors, unless this guy really did have something to hide like that, if you know what I'm saying. I don't actually think this guy really was a state actor, I just wanted to find an innocent insult that I could use to, 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 to make fun of him. But anyway, this guy was clearly upset about that. So no, I don't think that I was in the wrong there. I probably shouldn't have been posting as edgy as I was posting, which, I may I say, was not as edgy as it is possible to post. <laughs> it was nowhere near as edgy as stuff that you can find, like, in many places on the internet. But, uh, you know, I would, I, would I call it even edgy or just rude? I think I was definitely being a bit uncouth, right? Definitely a little bit uncouth. Uh, but anyway... You can make that decision for yourself, whether you think I deserve that. That's a problem with me, or that's a problem with the way the website's set up. Uh, <clears throat> I also had, like, 20 or so followers, somehow. So, clearly, people, like, some people wanted to read what I was saying. Um, which is why I like the, uh, the way the at put, the, the, the blue sky, which I'm not in, the, the at protocol, where if you get banned from an instance, or delete your account from an instance, like, if you want to move from one instance to another, all of the information, like, your followers and all of your past posts are stored locally, so you can, like, migrate without losing your followers, which I think is, like, a really obvious no-brainer that, uh, Mastodon should have included if it was actually smart. Uh, yeah, but I'm probably not gonna use Blue Sky either, because who fucking cares? I like TWTXT. Now that's a neat thing. I need to get into that. Okay, my hot take. It shouldn't be a hot take by like reasonable standards. It's just that everyone is insane. <laughs> everyone is insane. Okay, but to be fair, um, he's weird. He's a weird guy, first of all. And um, when this happened, there was a lot of other weird guys doing actually fucked up shit like Epstein or um, what's the the Harvey Weinstein right like th there was a lot of reason to just be like okay well clearly lots of these Hollywood people are, are doing like rapey shit but my my hot take is that that Kevin Spacey uh, I, I unironically think he's innocent okay uh, because like unlike these other people Kevin Spacey's been, like, literally cleared in court multiple times. If you don't, like, you have to, if you actually believe that Kevin Spacey is, like, some, some rapist, you have to also believe that, like, both the US and UK judiciary system is incapable of, like, doing anything. Um, and the way they, they, they try and believe this, like, the way they try and, and justify this is they're like, ah, yes, but the only reason... Like, this is as if I'm a conspiracy theorist to thinking he's he's innocent. The, the, the actual public belief is that he literally assassinated people in order to get off these charges. Which is a fucking insane thing to think, right? But it, it also is just from people who clearly don't know anything about how these people died. So, I will admit, it's, it's odd that that three of, of these people who are related to the case died, you know, in a relatively short period of time, in a matter of a few years from each other. It's definitely unusual. But, like, the circumstances of their deaths uh, don't really make any... Like, one of them died of cancer. You think, you think Kevin Spacey has a cancer beam 
You think he can just, like, give people terminal cancer? What are you talking about? That doesn't exist. He, the, the, you can't say, oh, Kevin Spacey killed these three people, or he hired someone to kill these three people, and one of them died of cancer. It's, it, like, obviously not true. And so there was two other people that died. The first one didn't even accuse him. They're like, oh, he killed three of his accusers. Well, the first one, and this is a direct quote, uh, I didn't feel it was harassment. With all due respect to whistleblowers and those who experience harassment, but for me, it was actually a compliment. I really take seriously all young actors in London who find it traumatic, but for me, it was just hysterically funny. So there was no... He didn't actually, like, try and push a case against this guy, right? Like, this... That one... He wasn't trying to take him to jail or anything. He was clearly didn't give a fuck. So there's no reason for him to be killed. Again, the second guy was, was died of cancer. Um, and then the, 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 the next guy uh, uh, died in a car crash. Right? Um, which, hold on a second. Uh... It, it it was, I mean, like, it's just insane to insinuate that, that somehow Kevin Spacey was just, like, orchestrated a car crash. Um, like, it, it doesn't make any goddamn sense. How, how is it possible? Like, that he was, I mean, it's just a random car crash. Also, that lady who died in the car crash was, was like a, a um, literally prosecuted for cyber stalking Kevin Spacey. Like, she was clearly, like, obsessed with Kevin Spacey, and uh, she had a, a picture in her apartment of Kevin Spacey with his eyes blacked out and mouth scribbled out and multiple pages, which he had just, uh, which she had, like, been, been writing down insane crackpot plans to kill Kevin Spacey. Um, so, like, she'd been, like, you know, consistently harassing him. She clearly just had some sort of vendetta against him. There's no evidence that was, like, hard that he ever actually did anything to her. She was basically just making shit up because she was a fucking insane stalker who hated this guy for no real reason. Um, like, there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's, other than, like, her, who, she was clearly nuts, right? <laughs> like, you don't do that shit that I just described unless you're fucking insane. I mean, Kevin Spacey had to hire bodyguards specifically because of this woman, right? Like, she was clearly fucking an, an insane stalker um, who was obsessed with this guy for, for some reason. Um, and you're going to believe her testimony over, like, the courts? It doesn't make any goddamn sense. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. And then she just died in a car crash. You think Kevin Spacey orchestrated a fucking car crash? She was, like, she was literally trying to make a bomb to kill Kevin Spacey. She was trying to make a bomb. She was trying to get anthrax to kill Kevin Spacey. And she just got killed in a random traffic collision with some random guy um, who... Uh, the the other guy who was involved in the crash was seen trying to avoid hitting or or she he only crashed because he swerved trying to avoid hitting another person it wasn't like that was what the 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 the, the witnesses said happened so it's like he only crashed in, like that's not something you can really like, you already have to be, like, kind of an insane conspiratorial person to believe that Kevin Spacey staged a car crash to kill this woman. Because uh, you have no idea how well a car crash is going to go to kill someone. But, like, the fact that there's this extra detail, it just seems to me like a random car crash, to be honest. And then, yeah, the only other person who died was legitimately an accuser, did say that Kevin Spacey did some fucked up shit to him right, uh, but also just died of cancer, which again, nothing that Kevin, Sp there's no way that Kevin Spacey did that, that's just not possible, you can't give someone cancer, um, 
So, as far as I'm concerned, this whole, like, insane theory that, like, oh, he had his accusers killed in order to get off, I mean, it just doesn't hold any water to me. I don't understand how it makes any sense. And then, the fact that he, again, um, like, uh, he, 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 he's found, he was cleared in court, like, how how much more cleared than can you get than in court i don't understand you know what i mean like what do you want from people like legitimately what do you want from people if if you can't if if you can't trust like if you're literally trusting like random people on the internet over the judiciary system then like I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Like, that's a... I guess you could do that, but that's a weird way to look at the world, in my view. You know? Like, I feel like one is... There's, there's a, we have a whole system set up to try and figure out if people are guilty of crimes. And it's, like, relatively good. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. It's, like, the best we have. Right? And, and if that system, in multiple countries, multiple times, finds out that someone didn't do a crime... Like, in any other case, you would consider that to be good enough evidence. You know? It's just because it happened at this time where there was a whole bunch of other accusations that were legitimate against other people uh, that you somehow suddenly, you know, literally just because of a time correlation, think that it's, this case holds more water than it does. Anyway, that's my schizo opinion, which shouldn't be a schizo opinion. This should be, like, it's actually the opposite, because in reality... I'm just trusting the system rather than believing there's some grand conspiracy where Kevin Spacey has a cancer gun and orchestrates car crashes. Um, <laughs> you know, it does, you know, I, I, I'm really the only one that isn't thinking conspiratorially here. Everyone else is, which is, which is insane to me. But anyway, that's my, uh, that's my Kevin Spacey take. Uh, you may, you, if you, look, if I'm missing out on something, if I'm missing something, about this case, please feel free to tell me, because maybe I am. I mean, he did do that weird shit. Like, I, <laughs> he didn't do the weird shit of making those videos. I will admit, that was weird. I kind of find it cool, but, you know, that's just my opinion. I've never watched House of Cards. Okay, um, I'm going to do a comment response now. Sunset Inn said, The problem with RSS is that you don't know who's following you. Plus, it's easy to lose an RSS feed. Have you considered setting up a mailing list as an alternative to RSS? Um, no, I don't like mailing lists, and I like RSS. Uh, if the problem is that you don't know who's following you, I don't really see why you would need to know who's following you. Like, what what would you do with that information? Unless you're some sort of company who's using it for, like, marketing purposes, um, which do, I don't really support anyway. Like, why would me or you as an average person really need to like why would we need to know that information how did how would that help us i don't think it would right like if you're just like maybe if you're like you know trying to sell something right if you're like some company and you have some business you want to know like okay well let me get a rough idea of like how many people are interested that or like who they are so we can contact them without, like that's interesting that's useful right but if you're just a random person with a blog you know like why, why does it matter if you know the email addresses of who's following you. Like, I don't particularly feel like I need to know that. Um, in fact, I feel like it's probably good for privacy, but I don't know that. Like, I'm a, a random, you know, Joe Schmo. I don't know that I should be trusted with being able to keep people's email addresses private. You know, I don't have a proper um, secure setup to protect people's personal data like that. Um... The fact that you would trust some random person with your email address is odd to me. Like, if, if I'm... Yeah, I, I don't want that responsibility over people's personal data. I'm not prepared to, to store that securely. Um, so I, I would actually rather not have it. Um, yeah, and if you're, if you're thinking it doesn't matter if, if your email gets leaked, I guess you can believe that, but uh, I, I just on a, a moral level, I, I think that it's a breach of privacy if you're not storing that data securely, um, because you can't know what, how other people feel about it. Um, 
So yeah, I, I think it's actually good not to have other people's email addresses. Uh, just because, like, you know, I, I'm not prepared to store store people's personal data securely. I'm, I'm not trained in that sort of thing. I, don't, I wouldn't know what the best practices are. I don't, I don't want that responsibility. And I just simply don't care. Like, why, why would I need to know your email address? I'm just interested in writing the blog post. It doesn't matter to me. And, uh, yeah, the other thing about... Uh, so you said it's easy to lose an RSS feed. It's easy to lose anything. Uh, that's why you keep backups. I don't know. <laughs> you could say that about basically any file on your computer. Yeah, it's also easy to use lose a, a, a Word document or or your email password or anything. You can you can. I, I that's on you to make sure that you keep backups and you know have some some way to recover something if you lose it or just don't lose it in the first place which I guess you, yeah backups are probably the better option there but uh, I mean you could yeah you could just as easily lose access to your email as you could lose um, access to an art like anything can be lost that's not really an argument I don't really agree with that seems like an odd, odd argument to me especially because many RSS feed aggregators or whatever they're called are like online they can store your shit on the cloud which is just someone else's computer but uh yeah no i don't i don't like this idea of a mailing list because like i don't like email is email i don't want to clutter up people's emails like we already have a thing for this it's called rss you know if you go if you want to feed you go to rss i don't i don't like it when i'm checking my emails and i'm seeing a bunch you know like if i go on my email right now Okay, let me, let me check my Gmail account, right? My main Gmail account. Ad from, from Uber, because I used Uber like five years ago and I haven't unsubscribed from their ads. Ad from Just Eat. Again, I used this, I literally used Just Eat once and they continually send me ads and I just haven't bothered to unsubscribe from their, their newsletter. This is what I associate with email newsletters. All right, let me unsubscribe from these fucking things. Okay, I've unsubscribed from both of those. Um, what else have we got? Audio notes. This is, again, another fucking, like, some random service I subscribed to once. Uh, some, actually an important notification, thank you, that I was private, so I'm not going to share. Something from chess.com, I would like to unsubscribe from, you see what I mean? Like, I get, okay, the unsubscribe request doesn't even work for chess.com. Um... Hey, it's something actually useful from my bank. Uh, you know, it's just like a, a some bills, you know, more promotion shit. It's like, I don't like any of this stuff. I want my email to be just emails from people, not from companies. Like, if you actually go through your email these days, most of the stuff you're getting is, is stuff from, like, some company. I don't like that fact. I want, like, I don't like newsletters. I don't like automated email shit. You know, it's like junk mail. I want emails to actually be authored by a human being. Uh, I don't like the fact that this is what email has become. Uh, and I, I don't want to participate in it by, by adding more automated newsletter bullshit to people's feeds. Uh, yes, it's on me. I should be unsubscribing from all of these places. They, they, they did, they're very sneaky about it. You know, they make it like just like slightly more effort to unsubscribe than it is to just scroll past it every day. So I, I never bother, but... No, I should I should just go through and unsubscribe from all of these fucking newsletters. Um, yeah, like I don't I don't want to be. Do you understand what I mean? Like I like the separation. I like the compartmentalization of these things. Like, if I want to talk to people, to check my mail, I use email. If I want to check a, a, a feed, you know, I check my RSS. To me, the fact like those are two different compartments of stuff I'm interested in. I, I don't I like the fact that you can that they're separated. Um and you can probably, you know, I bet there's some service out there that will like turn an RSS feed. Like you you can set this up on your end. Like you can you can have it so that you you can can t turn your RSS feed into an email feed. I bet. I bet there's some service out there. I mean you could probably program this yourself if you wanted to like do it in an afternoon or something, but like, 
you could you could easily have some service where like as, as a feed updates it just emails it to you it just like automatically checks it I, I bet that exists somewhere um, if you really want it to be an email rather than in an RSS reader which I don't really understand why but if it's up to you I guess you can do whatever you want with your computer uh, that's the whole point <clears throat> which is great because like this is another thing, right? With an RSS feed, you could do stuff like that, but you can't really do it backwards because you need to have access to your private email, which, I mean, you, I guess you could do it, but it would be kind of annoying, right? Like, with RSS, you, you, can, you, can, you can turn that feed into, you could do anything with it. You could pipe it into any program you want and do whatever you want with the data. Uh, whereas email is a little more complicated than that. Like, it's, it's a little harder to do because you need to be logged in and it's, it's just like a more complex protocol. Um, so it's, I guess with those, the three reasons, like, uh, uh, RSS, I just think it's a better protocol for doing those sorts of things, for doing, giving people a feed, because it's actually built for that, rather than email, which is built for mail. I feel like it's just a better design protocol for the thing I want. Secondly, I don't feel comfortable storing people's personal data, and I don't need it, so there's no reason to. Um, I, I neither want nor need your emails. Um, and uh, third, I like the compartmentalization. I want to keep people's mail separate from like f feeds, you know, like to me, those keeping those things separate is a good thing. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. Okay, so if I was to sum up so far what the book, The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity by David Graeber and David Wengro is about, um, uh, it would be this it's it's kind of about the question what is the origin of social inequality um and in trying to answer that question it realizes that like uh it really ends up going after what is the origin of asking the question what is the origin of social inequality uh because like for most of european like medieval and ancient history uh, no one bothered to ask this question. No one, no one really cared about this, or no one thought about it in the same way that we think about it now. It's only during the Enlightenment that you suddenly see people being like, "Well, social inequality exists; must have had an origin at some point." And then suddenly, you have people uh, like Rousseau or whatever proposing theories about how like people in the state of nature were like socially equal. And then during like the dawn of agriculture private property existed and started to create social stratifications and people ran headfirst into their own chains, this sort of thing. Um, and that this is like the common narrative, but modern archaeological records don't support this. And uh, the sort of theory proposed by this book is uh, like the entire premise of the question is kind of flawed because it, it assumes that social inequality has an origin. Uh, like again, people in the medieval period wouldn't have assumed this. They would have. They would have just thought that, like, well, that's just how it always was. It was only during the Enlightenment when Euro Western Europeans, or, or not even Western, but white people, let's just say, were um, confronted with the fact that, like, there were Native American societies that didn't have the same social stratification that Western societies have. That suddenly they were, and you know, they, they constructed this theory about stages of social development or stages of societal development where it's like, oh, you have like hunter gatherers and bands, then tribes, then chiefdoms and agriculture, and then cities, and then industrialized. Like, that was a, a narrative constructed to explain the fact that these Native American societies existed without uh, like the same level of social hierarchy as they were used to in. Europe. So they basically were like, well, those guys are just sort of on a more basic rung of society, and if they eventually develop, they will naturally become socially stratified. Uh, what the book proposes is that that's not really true. There is no natural state of being for human beings. If you actually look at the archaeological record from prehistory, um, humans have organized in innumerable ways, just like there, there is a massive diversity of social organization among uh, prehistoric humans. Um, you know, there were places that had cities and monumental architecture 
and government buildings uh, and you know the ability if you can do monumental architecture you must be able to organize large groups of people to make projects that aren't just like feeding people right um, and yet they didn't have agriculture or they they, they you know like for example the people who made Stonehenge um, in in Britain uh, they uh, had animal agriculture but they didn't farm grains they 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 collected hazelnuts as their main source of uh plant food they they just gathered hazelnuts they they had they kept pigs and sheep i think or pigs and goats i don't remember but uh they didn't they didn't uh keep they didn't farm cereals but they came from mainland europe where they did farm cereals so at some point they migrated to britain and then decided to stop farming cereals um uh, because collecting hazelnuts was better for them for some reason. And yet, you know, they, these people still managed to organize enough to drag huge stones all the way from Wales to southern England uh, in order to build this uh, structure that, that, like, coincides with the solstices. So that's just one example of, like, the, the weird variety of the ways that people organized. I mean, they give, like, a million different examples in the book of all of these weird and wonderful ways that people organize societies. But the, the fundamental point is that uh, um, when we imagine these past people as these sort of innocent, uh, you know, beings, like, we often compare them to monkeys, to apes, like, rather than comparing them to humans, because they were humans, they had the same brains as us, you know, they could do the same level of reasoning. And by that logic, they were also capable of political thought, that ancient or, or prehistoric humans were political actors in the same way that modern humans are also capable of thinking about po politics, i.e. like, they could reason about what modes of organizing society would mean, how they would affect them in the future, and that they used this reason to actively avoid these hierarchical dominance uh, societies that we live in now. That it wasn't that they were like, oh, they were just in this basic mode of, of evolution, like they, they, they just hadn't progressed through the natural progression of like, uh, you know, small bands of hunter-gatherers up until like, you know, horticulture, and then, like, no, that natural progression doesn't exist because there, like, there was just, like, a massive wide variety of these societies. And some of them were, you know, comparatively authoritarian, some of them were comparatively egalitarian, some of them had slaves, some of them had vastly unequal uh, relationships between uh, gender roles. You know, like, it's not saying that they were... The, ah, yes, everyone lived in these egalitarian... The, the, the book is, like, very much refuting this. Uh, it's just that people at this time, they weren't just innocent, naive actors being dragged along by the, the rules of history. They were political thinkers. They were able to think about politics and how they were organizing the society. And in many cases, it wasn't just that they... Like, the fact that there were pre-agricultural groups of humans who organized with authoritarian structures at least some of the time proves that it was possible to do so it wasn't like farming immediately meant land ownership which immediately meant authoritarian uh, hierarchical modes of uh, organization it was that many people specifically chose not to do that they could imagine in their heads what that would have led to and chose to avoid it. Um, I think this is like the key thesis. It's not that like, um, or, or really it's just like a refutation of what they call the myth of the stupid savage, that like somehow these savage societies were, you know, even if you get past the noble savage or like the brutal savage archetypes everyone still for some reason thinks they were stupid when we have no reason to believe that like we know that they were humans in every way that matters and capable of human reasoning uh, and that they 
should therefore have been able to reason about political structures. And yet everyone ignores this and compares their behavior to monkeys. Inst- like, you know, behavioral, uh, what do they call it? Uh, evo psych retards and stuff. <laughs> Behav- you know, they're like, well, monkeys organized like this. So early humans must have done that too. Like ignoring the fact that, uh, you know, humans, even early humans had the capacity for reason and forward planning and stuff like this. You know, I think people underestimate humans in terms of like fighting ability. Hear me out here, right? Like there's a lot of talk always about what what animal could you be in a fight, you know, which is a funny question. I think everyone always underestimates it. Like I think people don't realize that humans are actually really good hunters and really good at fighting. Like I think the it comes from the fact that people are imagining like what animal could you be in a fight without sustaining serious injuries? But, like, one of the big advantages that humans have in terms of, like, fighting is that we can sustain serious injuries and survive. Like, most other animals, if they, like, break their leg, they basically just die, uh, whereas humans won't. So it's like, yeah, if you, like, take on a, a wild boar, for example, like, everyone freaks out about wild boars, and for good reason, you know, they will, they will fuck you up, they will break your bones. But, like, with a broken leg... A, a, a wild boar is basically out of the fight. Whereas if you if the boar breaks your leg, you can still pick up a big rock and hit him on the head and kill him. And also, picking up a rock is not cheating, okay? The, if you're saying that picking up a rock is cheating, then you may as well be saying that using claws is cheating. Like, that's the whole strat. That's the whole strategy. Yeah, of course, if you're not able to pick up a rock off the ground, you're going to lose. Because no one's ever done that. <laughs> like, that's a, that's a novel way. Where we have hands designed for throwing rocks and shoulders designed for throwing rocks. Uh, that's kind of the whole... That's our whole gimmick as humans. We can throw rocks at things, which is kind of a big fucking deal. We can throw spears at things. So, like, you know, 1v1, with you're allowed to pick up rocks and throw them at things. It's fucking easy. It, I mean, like... Human versus boar, I think, honestly, as long as there's a big enough rock around, <laughs> the human's probably going to win, even if it sustains some injuries. As long as you're, like... Like, you'll probably get fucked up. I'm not saying you won't get fucked up, but I think you will outlive the boar. Um, and then you get into the whole aspect of, like, well, humans are really social animals. One of the most social animals. Um, it's like... So, really, this should be, like, a team fight, I think. Like, so again, actual, act, accurate appraisal of how effective humans are at fighting. It's got to be like a 5v5 or something. And like, in that scenario, there are very few animals that humans can't... Like, I don't, I don't think... Because, like, we're, we're predators, right? We're hunters. The whole point... Like, <laughs> you're not going after a herd of bison and killing all the bison. You just need one bison, Right? And, like, there's, you think five guys or, like, ten guys, twenty guys can't take down one bison, especially if they have a couple of spears with them? Like, well, you could, like, I, I think, like, you wouldn't even need that much training to do that. I think if you and some of your mates got together and started, like, hunting a bison, you would probably fail the first couple times, but you would figure it out. Like, you would get some strats and, like, you know... You, I think you could do it. Like, I think, I think it, it would be not even just that you could do it, but I think it would be, like comparatively easy relative to other things that humans do regularly. I'm just being honest here. Bruh, this fucking FD signifier guy. Look, like, I don't think he's the worst YouTuber ever, okay? Like, fine, whatever. He makes some good videos, like, shitting on red pill people or whatever. Like, I don't really watch his stuff, whatever. I see a video about, about Aaron Yeager. I would never watch this. It just got posted in a Discord server. I would never watch this because I could not give less of a fuck about Attack on Titan. It's not my thing at all. But yeah, I see this video, man, and I, I click on it, and he's like, he's like, guys. That is, listen. anime is weird. It's like, anime is weird. And then he posts three clips, right? And all three of these clips are from... Surreal comedy shows. This would be like, like imagine if someone from Japan was like, guys, 
Western TV is weird. It's so weird. And then posted like a clip from the Mighty Boosh or like like I don't know some SpongeBob clip out of context. It's not like there's words like yeah. Obviously, if you post the if you that's the point of the comedy shows. Like yeah, Nichi Joe has like some surreal humor in it. Huh. You're telling me Nichi Joe, the surreal comedy show, has surreal comedy? Guys, isn't anime so weird? Isn't it so fucking weird? Aren't those anime guys so weird and, and, and strange and unusual? Like, oh, I hate this. I, I hate this shit so much. Like, I'm not going to lie and sit here. I'm, listen, I'm not going to sit here and say there's nothing, like, weird about, like, actual tropes in anime. Like, a lot of the tropes in anime are, like, odd to someone who's not, like, what's the word? You know, in, in, immersed in the culture, initiated, to the uninitiated, to someone who doesn't really know the cultural context behind them, or hasn't, maybe, ha- if you want to be a little less uh, generous, who hasn't been desensitized to it. You know, there's a I really, look, like, the idea of a tsundere, that's a kind of a weird concept. The idea of, like, uh... I mean, some of the most popular anime have very weird premises. Like, like Haruhi it is like a weird as fuck show, if you you know, or even Evangelion or something, right? It's just that when those when like Ava is weird, no one's like, oh, bro, anime is weird. They go, they 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 say, oh, it's it's artsy because it's art. But no one treats comedy like it's art. Uh, that that because it's low, it's low art. It's not counted as high art. Like when when Evangelion has weird, you know, out there scenes in episode twenty five and twenty six. Oh, that's that's not like, uh, oh, bro, anime is so weird. That's like, oh yes, this avant garde, you know, creative expression. But when a comedy show is wacky, it's like, isn't anime so weird and wacky? Aren't these weebs so weird? By the way, that's not me paraphrasing. He literally says this. Uh, no, I'm not going to watch the whole video, because if you start a video off like this, I'm not going to give you... I just don't want to hear anything you have to say. Here. And this is not up for debate. Now, I want to be clear, anime is not weird because culturally we don't understand it. It's not weird because it's cartoons. It's weird because it's made by weird people for weird people and if you watch anime you should do it with a condom on your brain or you're going to catch the weird i know this from experience that's what i'm saying right it's these people they just want like normative they just want to be they just they just want to make some sort of like i don't even know what to call it like normative behavioral statements right like oh okay anime is weird it's, I will agree with actually everything that FD Signifier said here, besides the 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 uh, you know the ought statements he made. Anime is weird. It is made by weird people for weird people. Those weird people are called otaku. Um, like yeah, it's uh, called pulp media. This is, anime didn't invent the concept of pulp media. Okay, in fact, much of what was considered pulp media at the time has you know since been you know, reflected upon and is now considered to be, like, high art, as an example, like sci-fi, right? Uh, originally, or, or detective stories, murder mysteries, you know, there's, there's pulp media that has existed for as long as popular media in any form, like, to, to going back to the early literature, has, it had, like, the earlier, cheap, literature being wide, widely accessible, you know, uh, what are they called? Serial fiction. Serialized fiction. As soon as serialized fiction became a thing, pulp media became a thing. Um, so yeah, that's anime. Yep, yeah, it's it's for. I suppose you could call you could call them you could call them weird. Niche would probably be a more charitable term, uh, but you you can call it weird. Uh, weird people who are probably not interested in the same things that most of the media consuming public are interested in, like. Uh, you know, not that the shows that you, that that FD Signifier chose to use as examples really fit into this, but like let's say for example, um, 
you know, most of the, the media consuming public isn't going to be super interested in Hidemari sketch. They're, they're wrong. They should open their mind because um, it's the best thing ever made. But like, if you just, you know, you describe a show about nothing, uh, they're going to, you know, they wouldn't, they're not going to be super interested in it if it's not Seinfeld, really, right? Like, they're not really, the concept of Moe as, like, a driving emotion in a work of fiction is not going to be enough to sell an average person on something. Like, yeah, you, you have to, you must have, like, some sort of, you know what that's called? That's called just, like, having interests. Like, that's just called being an individual. Everyone has taste. Like, this is, it's, I don't know, am I being salty about something that I shouldn't be salty about here? I don't know. This is, this is fucking... I don't know, man. This, this makes me, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch, he's, he, the, the, okay, I'm just gonna watch a little bit more of this. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, FD Signifier watched Digi and Nino back in the day, that's kind of based, but... Uh, you can you can still be wrong and have watched Digi, okay? Obviously, Digi this, is wrong and has watched Digi. Yeah, Digi is wrong and is Digi. Yeah. Um. But anyway, th- this is th- th- the this I don't like. He's he said he's like, he's he said the thing I don't like that he said is like oh, you listen, anime is weird. It's made by weird people for weird people. And you gotta watch it with a condom on your brain, or you'll catch the weird. That is what he said. And to me, I'm like, why in the goddamn fuck would I be consuming art if I didn't want to catch the weird? That is the point of consuming art, yeah. is to catch people's weird. Because that's life. That's exciting. That's interesting. It reveals things about the world, and it reveals things about yourself, which is like, that's the human experience. That's what you're chasing after being a person. Um, yeah. So, I f- I've, I've finally given in. After years, I've decided to watch the animated Spider-Verse movie. I'm watching the first one. I, I haven't watched the second one. I've, I've finally given in. The reason I didn't want to watch it is because I'm just so sick of cape shit and I don't care. But I've finally given in and decided to watch it after years and years of everyone saying it's the best thing since sliced bread. Wait. Is that what the meth is that the the idiom? Or is it older than sliced bread? Is that wait, am I getting my idioms confused? Best thing since No, it's a real thing. Okay, it's real. I I wasn't getting them confused. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm watching Spider-Verse right now, the first one. Uh and yep, it is exactly what I thought it would be. It is like what one of these movies where you 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 go in to it with some sort of precon. I mean, you go into every movie with some preconception about what it's going to be, and uh, once in a while, your preconception is just absolutely on the money. Um, <clears throat> and you know what I thought it would be is a movie that looks amazing, but is act- like the, the actual content of the movie is is just like very stereotypical cape shit, with like quirky quip dialogue and you know, stupid multiverse plots that don't really mean anything. And, uh, yeah, I was exactly right about that. Uh, movie's not very good. The movie is, I know, this is a hot take. Everyone and their mother loves this movie. Everyone fucking loves this film. And I gotta say, I'm very glad this movie exists because it looks incredible, okay? Like, it's one of the best-looking animated films I've ever seen in my life. And it changed the trajectory of American animated, you know, productions. Like, the visual design of modern animated movies changed because this one just looks so good. Although I guess it goes back to that one Disney short. Paper, is it called Paper Man? It's really Paper Man that did this. Um, I think that's what that, that short is called, so shouts out to that. Anyway, it looks amazing. No one's gonna deny that. I think there's, like, Every, like, something I've not seen anyone else point out, but I've, this is just a fact about this art style, this sort of 2.5D, I guess, art style, is, um, as I noticed this with this film, and I also noticed this with the, uh, the Puss in Boots movie, which is that, like, 99.9% of the time, it looks amazing, and then once in a while, 
you get like one shot where the look just slips and everyone looks like low poly 90s uh, animated characters like Toy Story 1 characters with like the smooth lighting the 90s lighting like it's it's not really a complaint i'm not saying it's a bad thing um i I don't even think it looks bad it's just that like once in a while the look slips but this is a massive this is a minor 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 nitpick it's like that most people put clearly don't notice it because no one talks about it um but no the movie looks incredible no one's denying this i definitely would not deny this looks incredible and it's not just the animation style; it's the directing as well. It's the shot composition. I mean, it's the 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 color direct like the from top to bottom in terms of visual design. This movie is just on point. But as a movie, I mean the script. I mean the script. It's the movie is also very well edited. You know, I'm I'm the editing guy. I'm the guy that will talk about the editing of a movie. This movie is very well edited most of the time. Sometimes I feel like the pacing of the editing. Um, I think it's mostly a script issue, to be honest. But it feels a little too tight. Like like certain mem- moments are kind of rushed through. And I would like to take in the atmosphere for a bit longer. Um, but I guess zoom or attention spans or whatever. Uh but no, this the movie is like not very good, especially the second act. I'm an hour in, almost. Exa- I'm like an hour and five minutes in, an hour and six minutes in. Um, and what's just happened is, so they go. You've all seen the movie by now, and if you haven't, let me like tell you what the movie actually is. Because what I didn't realize when I was going into it, because I just didn't really think about this, is that like I knew it would be like cape shit, but I didn't realize it would be like a movie for babies. Like, I didn't realize it was a kids film. And I'm watching it, and I'm, like, realizing, oh, yeah, it's an American animated movie. Of course it's a kid's film. I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about the fact that it's a kid, that it was a, would be a kid's film. But it's very obviously a movie for, for, for little children, which is fine, I guess. But, you know, it makes me surprised that so many, like, fully... You know, I wonder about the, like, intelligence of the wider population. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Everyone loves these movies for babies. Like, at least Puss in Boots, like, felt like, like, there's, you can make a movie that is, like, for all ages, and then you can make a movie for children. Do you know what I mean? Like, for example, all of the, the, the Miyazaki, well, not all of the Miyazaki films, but maybe all of them. I guess, like, Totoro is, like, the, 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 the archetypical example, right? Totoro is a movie for everyone. Of any, you can be one year old, you can be ninety nine years old. You will like that movie. You'll get you'll get something great out of that movie, right? Whereas well, like then there are kids' films, which are like movies you can maybe enjoy somewhat as an adult, but like only in a kind of pulled back way, you know. And this film is like that. Like it's clearly targeted at babies. Um, which is, I mean, like, this is, shouldn't be, like, a massive insult. Like, it's fine to, for stuff to be aimed at kids. I don't have a problem with that. I'm just surprised that, like, so many grown adults go around talking about this like it's, like, a masterpiece. Or, I mean, it looks great, but don't let the fact that it looks great distract from the fact that the script isn't very good. Um, now when I say this, it's not the plot that I necessarily have a problem with. The plot is dumb superhero shit, right? But that's fine. It's very bare bones. I want. I'm glad actually. I'm happy that the main central like conflict of the movie is is like super straightforward. That's really good. That was a great decision. That's what these sorts of movies should be. That's that was an excellent decision. Um, like, this that's really the dialogue that's bad, and the the characterization. I guess, like for example. What just happened in the film that got me to, like, think about this and recording it? I mean, there's a bunch of bullshit, like, bad, like, just, like, general bad stuff, like, you know, the Marvel quippy dialogue, the, 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 the stuff we all know as the terrible Marvel dialogue, um, is all there, all the tropes are there, including, like, way too many bad pop culture references for no reason, 
um, like, what is this, a 90s animated movie? Is this the genie from Aladdin? What the hell? Come on now. Uh, yeah, and like, oh, we're breaking the fourth wall. We're doing meta fourth wall comedy. That's not going to take you out of the movie. Like, I don't mind a bit of fourth wall comedy, but I just don't think this is the appropriate movie to put it in. Maybe I'm crazy for that. I felt like it came, it kind of was distracting. Anyway, these are all minor nitpicks. The real, like, if I'm actually getting to a, a scene that I feel like is emblematic of the problem with this film. So, all of the spider Men's from all the different places, they're all gathering in the, this basement bat lair type of hangout place, you know? Um, and... It's, it's kind of like a bam, 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 bam kind of scene, right? Like, lots of things are happening at once. Um, and they're kind of rushing through it. Like, they're, it's not kind of. It's rushed. Like, you've got the the scene, the, the shot of the other universe Peter Parker looking at his picture, the framed picture of Lois Lane, right? That's a, that's a scene that's supposed to carry an emotion. But then... Immediately, we're moving from that to, hey, this spider suit has a cape. I guess it's kind of like, to undercut the tension, we don't want it to be too serious, but it doesn't really play into anything, but it's probably a setup for something that's going to happen later in the movie, because they've already set up the cape thing once, now they're, re- uh, they're, they're, they're talking about it again, so I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen, I don't know, but this the sort of thing, normally it's called the rule of threes, you set something up, then you remind the audience about it, and then it comes into play in the final act. So it wouldn't surprise me if there was something to do with a cape that happens later in the movie. I don't know, I haven't seen it yet. Um, I might be completely wrong, in which case this is, I guess, it was just a random throwaway joke. Um, so that happens. Then, um, you get the scene where Miles goes to the other Spider-Man suit and looks up at it, and you get sort of a, a shot from this POV of the suit, and then, like, a reverse shot of Miles looking up, and it's supposed to imply that he's being sort of drawn to the suit, which you, I guess is going to be the suit that he wears later. Then the introduction of the other Spider-Mens, um, they all have their stupid gimmicks, Nicolas Cage is one of them, so I like that. Um, shouts out to Nick Cage, he's great in everything, that's not true, don't know why I said that, he's very bad in lots of things. <laughs> that's kind of his whole shtick. Um, uh okay so so there's kind of this that they, they go through all the other the the you have the main three which is miles peter parker and spider gwen the people who are actually people the characters who are characterized like characters like and then you have the other three who are the wacky zany gimmick ones the pig the anime one and the nick cage one um which is that's kind of stupid but fine, it's not a problem in itself. They all introduce themselves, and then um, they sort of... Hold on, I'm going back a little bit so I can remind myself. Yeah, they do this, they talk about their character introductions, then they talk about the plot for a bit. They do some, they do, they make sure everyone's caught up, it's all good. This is like sort of fine writing, there's nothing wrong with this. Then... Yes, yeah, so they talk about this, they talk about, like, the necessities of the plot, like, to hammer home to the audience, to really, which is fine, like, this is good, this is the sort of thing you should be reminding the audience of, it's good to go over this, but, like, okay, all of them are gonna just, like, they can't live in this world, that their, 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 their DNA is being corrupted, or whatever the fuck, um, and one of them's gonna have to stay behind to destroy the Collider, and it's gonna have to be Miles, because if anyone else stays behind, they'll get destroyed. This is probably, I'm imagining, a setup for Peter Parker to sacrifice himself in some heroic sacrifice at the end of the movie, because that's the sort of thing that they would do to that sort of character. Uh, but, uh, like, uh, anyway, so they go through that, that's all good, and then, boom, suddenly the tone completely shifts, every character is suddenly a completely different person, and they all start talking uh, like cartoons, uh, or like a music video. Like, you have a relatively serious scene here. Like, the sad music's playing um, when when he's like, oh, I'll be the one to do it. And then, suddenly, dramatic tone shift, dr- shift in characterization, 
we do uh, some co- like and suddenly everyone's like um oh we're gonna can you fight can you like this the spider gwen character it's just so poorly character like her character's all over the fucking place she's like introducing herself as this loner who doesn't do friends except she never like they just tell you that in reality she just seems like a perfectly nice person who's immediately friends with miles um and wants his dick or whatever like it's and then she starts talking you know i don't know it's kind of hard to explain the specifics of why it feels like all their characters suddenly shift, but it's a vibe. The characters all suddenly shift because they're trying to run a bit. And this happens all way too fast after, like, a, a relatively emotionally weighty scene about, like, sacrifice and stuff and the promise to the previous Peter Parker. Everyone's like, oh, can you do this? Can you do this power? Oh, we're all so much smarter and better than you. You're Miles Morales, who only became Spider-Man, like, two days ago. And you suck. Anyway, we're talking directly into the camera, uh, in order, and and the music is speeding up as we apply pressure. And then, all of a sudden, and then they're like, "Oh, he's not ready. He can't do it." Suddenly, it's a dramatic, sad scene. Peter Parker goes on the elevator, and then literally a Juice World song starts playing. <laughs> a sad Juice World song starts playing, and at that moment, the movie lost me. Like, why the Juice World song? Like, I have a little more of a subtle musical cue than that. Please, like, the, I'm so love asking. I know, but the thing is, it's a movie for babies. Like, it's a movie for babies, and babies, they don't get, they don't get stuff like that. And that's fine. That's not a problem. But don't, like, this is why I'm just surprised that I've seen all these grown-ass adults shipping this movie around like it's some sort of bastion of, like, mature filmmaking. It's not a bastion of mature filmmaking. You're just watching the first part of the movie right yeah, now. Yeah, I'm sure I am, but it still doesn't excuse it. It's still a bad part I of know, the movie. I know, but it's like, if you were watching this in cinemas, you couldn't have this reaction because it would immediately go to the next scene and the movie would get better. No, if I was watching this in cinemas, I would still have laughed out loud when a Juice World song oh, started playing. Oh, yeah, crying. and then you would have gotten over it because the movie would have kept playing. No, it, it, you would have gotten over it, maybe. When um, stuff like this happens in a movie, <clears throat> it's it stays in the back of my mind for I the see. whole film. But anyway, I'm not... Listen, maybe I'm being way too harsh on this film, and maybe the third act will redeem it. But it seems to me like they were writing a script, and then they were like, we don't have a strong enough lowest point, right? Because on the, the the hero's journey, which is bullshit, but on the hero's journey, you know, at the end of the second act, you're supposed to have the hero at his lowest point. You need a big, sad thing to happen. And this is... And they're just like, well, our big, sad thing isn't big or sad enough, so we're just going to make one up. And so they just went back into the script and inserted this scene, which is why it feels like it comes completely out of nowhere and the emotions are way overblown with this Juice World song because they just need the emotion of... They just need... The, the point of the scene is not the point... Like, the scene doesn't actually matter. What actually matters is to tick the checkbox of, okay, we need a sad beat here so that we can root for Peter when he redeems himself. Miles. Miles, sorry. We can root for Miles when he redeems himself by getting better at being Spider-Man. And that's... I don't like it when I can see the cogs of a movie working like that. I want it to feel natural. Sorry, I'm complaining too much. The movie's good. Well, it's not good, but the movie looks good. (laughs) Okay, so I finished the movie. I got some of my predictions wrong. Um, But, you know, fundamentally, I think I was maybe too harsh. It just has a bad section in the middle. But that bad section is like 20 minutes of the movie. No, it's not. I counted. Well, I checked on the the, the thing. It's like 20 minutes of dog shit in the middle. The ending, final fight, is creative and interesting. Basically, all the times where it's not trying to do plot or, like, be a movie, it's fine. The thing is, it just reminds me of what Scorsese said. That these movies, they're not really cinema. They're just, you know, roller coasters. This is very much a roller coaster, and that's not really my thing, but maybe I was overly harsh, but at the same time, no, I kind of don't feel like I was overly harsh, because this isn't some underdog movie, like, I feel like one of the reasons that a lot of people, you know, really like this film is because it feels like an underdog movie, it's separate from the rest of the cape ship movies it's animated it has this unique style it has a a a more i don't know how to put it like 
youthful take. I guess it's just aimed at kids, if you want to put it that way. You know, it it has a different vibe, kind of, although really it has the same Marvel dialogues in every movie like this. But, like, I uh, there's a vibe to it, right? Where it's like, wow, this movie's doing something different, and it's kind of an... Un- it, but it, it's not. It's made by a major studio, had a big budget, did really fucking well, got a sequel with a massive budget that also did really fucking well. It's a superhero cape shit movie. It it was never going to do badly. It's not an underdog film, right? Like, talking about it like it's, like, some sort of underdog film is, it doesn't make sense. Now, I, look, maybe the fact that it, like, looks good as an animated film, like, I understand the vibe. The vibe is, the, the, the atmosphere is... Give this movie loads of praise so that Hollywood will make more shit like this because this has a really creative visual style. And I'm on board with that messaging. I'm completely on board with that. Give people more, you know, give animators more money. This is the thing. What we really want is for these animators to get paid and have good working conditions. There's not what they got because the animators on Spider-Verse 2 uh, got fucked over. I think you can find some news stories about this if you if you want to go looking for more details. I haven't looked into it that much. But as far as I understand, they were not working in great conditions. Um, they got fucked over, as animators tend to, to do. Um, so, you know, whatever. I don't know. I can't... I don't hate the film, but I also don't... I wouldn't say it was good. And it was, like, m- the amount... It didn't deserve... A, all of this praise, like, it's still, I was skeptical, because I was like, way too many normies like this for this to be good, and I was right, it's exactly what you would expect this movie to be, but, like, that doesn't take away from the fact that it is one of the best looking animated films I've ever seen, some of the fights were really creative, character designs were really good, um, you know, that, pretty much is it (laughs) that's it for praise soundtrack sucked well a lot of it sucked um some of it's okay the sound design was good uh sound design was actually excellent shout out to the sound designers under under underappreciated part of the filmmaking process foley artists and so on shout out they did well good jobs um Yeah, just has a big chunk of, like, garbage. Like, the beginning is not... I'm not I don't even think the first part of the movie is, like, particularly good. Because I'm just... It's impossible to separate this from my personal biases, right? But I'm sick of superhero origin stories. We're all sick of superhero origin stories. I don't fucking care about the superhero origin story. I don't care about the arc. Like, really, the central arc of the movie you know, plot aside, is Miles finding himself when he finds his, you know, and, in, you know, in the process of mastering his powers, getting his powers and, and mastering his powers. And it's like, frankly, I don't fucking give a shit. I'm sorry, I, there's nothing really to do with this movie being bad, although the movie's not great, but it's also just fatigue, because I've just seen this plot too many fucking times now. Like, come up with a new idea. For God's sake. Maybe they could only get the budget and studio backing to make an interesting animated movie if they made it cape shit. I don't know. That doesn't... Just because of the behind the scenes doesn't excuse what a movie is. It's fine to make roller coasters. I like roller coasters. They're fun. But, like... I, I, for the amount of praise this film got, I just ex- kind of expected something more. Or, really, I didn't expect anything more. I, I had always avoided it, because this is exactly what I expected it to be. Also, I feel like I should address something. So I, I, calling something a baby movie for babies, you know, I can see someone being like, just saying something's made for kids isn't criticism. That's not real criticism. And no, it's not supposed to be criticism. It's fine to make things for kids. I'm just pointing out that I'm not the target audience. 
so you know i'm it's not made it's not for me to enjoy i'm sure if i was 12 i this would be my favorite movie ever made right like that's that's not criticism of the movie itself necessarily although i think it you know it kind of is but not necessarily right that it's mainly just saying like this isn't this isn't i'm not supposed to like this so don't be surprised when i don't like it that's more what i'm trying to get at anyway enough talking about this fucking movie i always uh back in in csgo i was always the guy who was like you know in cs if you're losing some russian kid on your team is like oh they're cheating they're cheating that shit like the amount of cheating accusations per game in in csgo is, is just fucking insane and, like, I was always the guy who was like, nope, they're not cheating. I mean, sometimes they were, but it was very rare that I really thought someone was, like, you know, war hacking or whatever. Um, or had aim or whatever, right? Like, I I was normally trying to be the voice of reason in CS. Right? Like, I would be like, no, 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 no. Like, they're just good. You just got lucky. You don't know that he's cheating. Like, if you really think it, report it. We're flaming him in the chat is not going to do anything. You know, like I was always the voice of reason. I tried to be in CS. And now in TF2, it's like normally I play on Uncle Topia where cheating isn't really a problem. I mean, there are cheaters on Uncle Topia. I've run into a cheater or two on Uncle Topia. Um, but cheating in TF2 is very different from cheating in CSGO. Like the, the hacks in, in TF2, I mean, you have like snipers who are just insta headshotting anyone relatively easy to spot those sorts of cheaters uh but because of that it's you don't really see it on Nagotopia. the more often i feel like is like direct hit soldiers who cheat uh, but those are really the main two types of people who are cheating it's i'm you know it took me a while to get to try and understand like what the the actual tells for a cheater is and so trying to adapt to be like well, I mean, on Uncletopia, there's very, very, very few cheaters. Like, I think I've probably seen one cheater ever on Uncletopia. Um And even that, I, no, actually, I'm pretty certain that was a cheater because he was shooting rockets behind him, looking the other way. Uh, but, like, yeah, very, very rare. Uh, but recently, I've been playing on Valve Casual servers because I've been... Uh, I'm on Dotes my setup, and Dotes has, like, this really small mouse pad. Uh, not super optimal for playing demo with the the sticky or sorry with the 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 grenade launcher flicks and stuff that was my note if not yours um you know so i've been playing pyro because you don't have to aim and i've been playing flank pyro full flank pyro back burner thermal thruster axe extinguisher pyro um by the way i gotta say thermal thruster is a criminally underrated item uh but anyway and flank pyro is one of those play styles that just doesn't really work against good players. Like, I don't think you could pull it off. Well, firstly, it, it's very, very map dependent. Like, I found that, that unless I'm playing on upward, I basically can't do anything. <laughs> upward and bad water, it, like, it seemed... It, I tried... I, I basically started from, like, all the decent maps and have narrowed it down to just playing upward and bad water, which I don't have a problem with. The way I see it, right, is, like, l- look at fucking, like football people play football it's the biggest sport in the world is one map it has one map <laughs> you know yeah, like that's the way i see it or like tennis i guess there are the different surfaces there's like grass clay and like the the artificial court i think there's only like three surfaces there's like three maps and tennis is a massive sport you know you know what i'm saying like the way i see it I don't. I, I think TF2 doesn't need this many maps. They need to start deleting maps in the game. It just spreads out the player base and a bunch of shit that no one actually cares about. Like, please, like, CP Junction shouldn't exist. Sorry, this is a tangent. But um, anyway, I'm trying to get used to... So because, like, Uncle Topia, you don't get to control what maps are played, right? And I, I can't really be playing combo pyro on this setup because the mouse is kind of fucked i mean it's complicated i i, I don't want to tell you the details it's just boring but i i think i might be able to to pull off combo pyro but like in terms of like a really aim based class if i have to hit stickies or have to hit any i don't know sniper is like definitely my best bet right now 
I mean, sorry, Pyro is my best bet. What am I talking about? I'm tired. Uh, and Flank Pyro is something that I haven't really put much time into, so I figured, like, let me put some time into it and try and get good. And I'm having, like, decent success, but py Flank Pyro is very much like Spy. Well, it's like, it depends on the server you're on, how well you're going to do. Like, every spy main, like, you know, requeues 50 times before they get into a server with oblivious players. Flank power is the same way. Like, you kind of have to get into a server with players who aren't, like, you know, super aware in order to do, like, decently. I think if you're really good, you can play well against good players. But I'm not really good. Um... I don't, I don't, you know, even when I'm playing, it's not like I'm doing super well. It's not like I'm, like, requeuing to own noobs. I'm requeuing to be able to, like, do this playstyle at all. Because, like, on a server, you know, like, like on a server like, five snipers, I, I can't even get behind the enemy without, you know, getting fucking shot in the head. It's not even fun. You can't play. You know what I'm saying? Like, or, like, I had a game, Blue had three... NGs, three blue NGs, two of them had level threes set up. It's like, how am I supposed to fucking flank behind the enemy? It's not possible. Like, it, I mean, it just makes the entire playstyle impossible. You can't do it because you just get shot by a sentry. Like, oh yeah, you put a sentry on the flank and then you put a sentry behind the, you know, your back line. It's just impossible to flank. Which, I mean, maybe, sure, that's good. Like, you're playing well, but it means I can't play. So I'm going to requeue in this situation. Uh, but anyway, so I've been playing Flank Pyro. Uh, and because of that, I've been playing not on Uncle Topia. Because Uncle Topia players are too good. And there are too many maps in the Uncle Topia rotation that are just bad. So I've been I've been playing on Valve Casual. Um, and Valve Casual has cheaters. And... I am starting to recognize cheaters, but because of my CSGO days, I'm so used to thinking, like, no, they're not cheaters, like, no one's cheating, blah, 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 you know, like, I'm supposed to be the voice of reason, but I'm starting to realize, actually, that's not true, TF2 kind of has a lot of cheaters, like, today, I'm pretty sure I was playing one match against a sniper who was cheating, this guy seemed to just be a little bit too good. And then I'm also pretty damn sure I was playing a match against a soldier who was cheating. Except, the, the weird thing is, it seems like no one else cares. Like, I'm the only one that notices in this situation. I, and I'm starting to gaslight myself. Like, am, I, am I crazy? Is this guy not cheating? No one else on my team is calling him out. But it's, to me, it seems very obvious. Like, how is he not, like, you know, like... I don't know. It's, it's too sus. I'm not going to go into detail about this guy's play, but, like... Sus. I'm not crazy. I've seen cheaters in YouTube videos. I know the way that direct hit soldiers cheat. I know what it looks like. And that's what they're doing. It took me a while to realize it. To even not like think about the fact this guy might be cheating. But once I thought about it, I was like, oh, clearly that's what's going on. But I don't know. I'm going to get political real quick. I'm going to get political real quick. Uh, in an abstract way. So... Leftists, they they have a lot of stuff to say about the police, right? Now, I want to preface... I mean, look, you'll hear what I... I don't have to preface this. You'll hear what position I'm taking. So, th the leftist sort of attitude towards the police is... Uh, they exist to uh, protect private property. Like, this is the, the, the leftist, like, Gnosticism kind of meme, right? Where it's like, uh, well, if you actually get to the underlying state of things... The function of the police is to protect private property. And that's why, like, that explains why the police don't seem to do their job very well of, like, what you think they do, which is, like, serve and protect you. Because the police have never been very good at doing this. I mean, I mean, I don't know how, like, right-wingers or anyone can really be, like, pro-police when you see just how bad they are at doing their job always in every country, in every time of history. Like, they've always done this. Um, but leftists, you know, they talk about the origin of the police. They're like, they really were, like, invented, uh, you know, it's kind of questionable. But, like, oh, well, it's about breaking up strikes and labor movements and, in the U.S., specifically, uh, catching, like, escaped slaves. So, hence why the police are, like, racist and 
uh, classist. They're like, really, they're about protecting private property, which at that time included enslaved people. Um, and, I, you know, while this isn't, like, strictly wrong, I also disagree. Like, I think... I think this is too uh, hopeful or, or too positivist even towards the police because it imagines that they serve any purpose really at all that has like any level of justification. The way I see it, the police exist to be violent and incarcerate prison, in, imprison people basically for its own sake. Uh, that like, you once the sort of uh, homo criminalis was invented... Once the concept of, of the criminal was invented and you had the categorization of, you know, police, criminal and citizen, uh, that's like, that's the reason the police exists is to preserve those categories. Like, that doesn't really matter even like that they're protecting private property because the, they don't care about laws, really. Like, they, they just, like, none of them are like sitting there thinking to themselves about the laws or how just they are, uh, they they just enforce them, right, whatever they, they could be, but they don't really even do that, like, if you actually look at what the police do most of the time, they mainly just sort of harass people for being, like, black or poor, <laughs> I, I know, like, you know, there's probably, I'm not saying they're going out, like, just murdering unarmed black men 24-7, right, I think some of that stuff is overstated if you actually look at the statistics about murder, but if you're looking at excessive use of force, I mean, that is understated, if anything. Like, police around the world, in the US and the UK is what I'm most familiar with, are, like, continually using way too much force over the most minor shit. I mean, it's it's worse in the US, I think, but in the UK it's also extremely bad. And they are continually found to be racist and classist and sexist. I mean, the Metropolitan Police in the UK, they had a big report so there was a there was a police officer in the UK who uh, kidnapped, raped, and murdered a woman, and then the rest of the Met Police covered this up for years. Uh, I don't know. I I imagine this story didn't make it out of the UK, but this was a big story. This police officer kidnapped, raped, murdered a woman, and then the Met helped cover it up. You'd imagine if something like that happened, this would be a massive deal. Um, but, like, the amount of, like, inaction from the police is astounding. No, of course nothing's happening to the police. You know, of course there's no, like, structural reform going on or any of the people are really being held accountable. Of course not. Um, but because of this, you know, there are some... Some things had to happen, right? They, so they, 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 they had an independent audit, right, of the, of the Metropolitan Police Department. And this audit found, and this is, you know, this isn't some lefty thing, right, the person who did this audit is literally a baroness, okay, she's literally an aristocrat, the, the, the person in charge of this, which is uh, arguably why this sort of aristocratic system is like, maybe acts as a check and balance over, you know, the existing party politics, because these people, you know, if you're a hereditary peer in the House of Lords, you don't have any motivation to be biased towards one party or another, uh, so you can be objective. At least that's the theory behind it. I don't. I'm not going to get into whether I agree with that or not. Um, but this lady, she found in her very long, like almost 400 page long report, that the Metropolitan Police is institutionally sexist, racist, and homophobic, um, and that's just like the surface level. I mean. Some of the stuff that was found in this report is just obscene. I mean, like, even within the police own ranks, not even, like, how they treat the public. Like, there was a... They, they, they pinned a Sikh police officer down and trimmed his beard, which is obviously... A, you're not allowed to do that if you're Sikh. And they, they, they harassed a Muslim officer by putting bacon in his shoes, which is, I mean... Like, you shouldn't be doing this sort of thing. <laughs> That's going a bit too far, let's be honest. That's a bit beyond... I mean, anyway. I mean, if you look at the reports into the... Uh, the the Minneapolis police, they did a Department of Justice report, and, I mean, this stuff is just horrendously bad. This stuff is just, like... They just... 
literally slamming people into the pavement and handcuffing them for jaywalking and shit. It's insane, the amount of, like, excessive force. What I'm saying is, none of this helps serve the interests of private property, right? Like, there's no... None of this is really helping... Like, you know what I... Do you understand what I mean? Like, you can say, theoretically, it, the police exist to enforce private property. Um, in the same way, you can say, theoretically, the police exist to you know, keep the peace and arrest the evil bad guys or whatever, right? You can, like, if you, but if you look at the reality, like, they exist because they exist, right? They exist to, to ju just like every system, okay, we're going to get a bit of Sterner in here, right? Like, Sterner points out that, like, any, any union of people, any, like, organization, any system has to primarily exist to further its own existence prior to whatever purpose it might serve right so like uh i think the example he gives is like imagine a labor union it will like the primary goal of a labor union isn't to help its members it's to keep the labor union existing and then beyond that you know help its members and you know do whatever labor you organize strikes or whatever right like, that's the case for every system. Otherwise, these, I mean, it has to be the case, definitionally. Otherwise, these things would collapse because if they were constantly making choices against their own continued existence, they wouldn't exist anymore. So any system that doesn't do this collapses, which, you know, in Sterner's eyes can be a good thing, but, and in my eyes too, but, like, that's, do you, do you understand what I'm getting at here? Like, the real reason the police exist is because once you get the invention of the criminal, once once the category of, of, you know, a criminal exists, and a police officer exists, and a citizen exists, you know, as these separate categories, the their primary goals become to keep these categories existing. So that, for no reason, for no, like, justifiable reason other than because they have to, otherwise they would stop existing, right? They they are themselves, so they have to keep themselves existing. Um, like, that's my analysis of the situation. Because all of this stuff, like the, the excessive violence and corruption and prejudice of police departments all over the world, isn't explained by just saying they exist to protect private property. Because there is nothing about being racist that helps you really protect private property. There's nothing, you know, about excessively using force on pe people jaywalking that, like, at no point was private property threatened in this interaction. The, the real purpose of the police is just to do random fucked up shit for the sake of doing random fucked up shit because that's what they're there to do. Do you understand? Like... Uh, and then arguably, if you want to get a little more systematic into it, into like the theory, private property is a part of it, but it's also uh, to produce legibility for the state, right? Like these categories were put in place for a reason. They were invented for a reason, right? Like now that they exist, they exist to maintain themselves. But before they existed, someone put them in place and the state is the one that put them in place. And the state is very interested in uh, creating a legible populace uh, because that's how you do control. That's how you govern a people. You can't govern a people if you don't know who those people are. If you don't know any basic facts about, like, who they are, where they are, what they do, you know, you, you need, like, this is the fundamental uh, basis for governance is you need, to, you need to have some information about your populace. Except the problem is that people are not particularly easy to, to, you know, they're kind of complicated, weird kind of creatures. They kind of do all sorts of stuff. And so the state has a vested interest in creating a legible population, right? Enforcing regulations and uh, categories on its population in order to make it easier to govern by basically forcing everyone into certain groups, right? Like... The, this is the group of disabled people. This is the group of criminals. 
this is the group of police officers. This is the group of uh, you, you, people who wear suits, you know, you know work, in a, work in a bank. I don't know what the name for that would be. Yuppies, that's not the word. <laughs> Working professionals, I don't know. Like, this is the group of, like, you, you, you fill out any sort of government bureaucracy and it immediately starts asking you for your categorizations. Right, this is women, this is men, you know, this is child. This is uh, a meter. This is a car. <laughs> right, like these, these are, it, it, it's not like I'm arguing against categorization as a, you know, itself. It, you, you can't have thought without having categories. You can't, you need to categorize the world in some sense to make sense of it. But the problem comes when uh, the state creates these categories and then forces people into them. Uh, whether or not they actually reflect reality or are useful, or rather, they're useful for the state, but how useful are they to the individual people? I mean, the example would be like, uh, and this is like, you know, not necessarily the best example because there are many cases where this is useful to a regular person. But like, you go to like Vietnam and you ask someone, how far is the next village? No one's going to say five miles. If you're in like some rural place in Vietnam, no one's going to say like five miles. They're going to say, oh, about like, uh, like the amount of time it would take to make rice twice. Because that's a reference point that everyone has. Everyone, you know, eats rice for every meal or most meals. Everyone knows how long it takes to boil rice. So if you say, yeah, it takes, it's about as long as like boiling rice two times. Everyone knows how long that is intuitively if you're doing that. I mean, you know, you could... No, no one has like an intuitive sense of how long a mile is, but people have an idea of like, well, if you walk for about as long as it takes to boil rice twice, you'll end up at the next village. A very intuitive way of measuring distance for people. And this is not just a thing in rural Vietnam. This was how everyone measured everything in the past uh, with these sorts of folk units. I mean, the imperial system is descended from these folk units. Um, like, like lots of people uh, used to harvest barley a lot, and so... Oh, fuck, there's there's some some imperial unit is defined as like a sack of barley or something right? like these these are the sorts of th like people would have measuring distance wasn't super useful because it's not you know it doesn't really matter how far something is in miles i mean in short distances people use like you know an arm's length or from your from your elbow to your hand or a hand's width you know these sorts of measurements but in terms of like long distances why would you ever need a precise measurement for that when Really, you, you could say, like, well, it's a day's walk, or, um, you know, these sorts of things, right? Uh, it's uh, in even longer time scales, you know, people talked in terms of seasons and harvests. Uh, that's why, the, hey, that's why seasoning is a thing, right? People talk about, uh, like, uh, seasoning wood, you know? When you cut down a tree, you can't immediately put those logs in a fire because the tree is still wet. So you have to leave the wood out to dry for like a, a, a amount of time. How much time? Well, basically a season. And so they call it seasoning wood. Uh, that's where the term comes from. And that's where the term seasoning, like for every use that we use, the word seasoning comes from. Yeah, I watch Adam Magusi as well. Um, but, but you see what I mean? Like these sorts of folk measurements don't, this is, this is the sort of thing that the state can't have because these aren't going to be this, it's not very legible for, for a state bureaucrat, right? So instead you need to, inf and I'm, I'm not here saying, and that's why the metric system is bad actually, okay? I'm a big fan of the metric system and standardized units are useful for a lot of things. I don't have an intuitive sense of how long a mile or a kilometer is. But I have a pretty intuitive sense of how long a centimeter is. So, you know, I, it's, it's okay. It's not the worst thing. But it gets bad when you start doing this to, like, people rather than stuff that doesn't matter that much. It, um, and, it, you know, the, the category of criminal um, is it's one of these situations uh, where, like, the, there were no criminals in the past. Like, at, at some point, someone had to invent the idea of a criminal. Like, 
there were people who did crimes, this is an action, right? Like, this is a, actually a very common, it's a very, very, very common tactic or, like, situation that you'll see once you start looking into these things, is people taking actions and turning them into uh, essences, right? Like, uh, for example, uh, the idea of if you're a man who has sex with men, that's just an action that you do, right? You, you, I, I, sometimes, once in a while, I have sex with men, right? That's just something you do. Taking that and then inventing the homosexual, right? This is from the history of sexuality. That's why I'm referencing it. Because we're also talking about homo, we're doing some Foucault stuff here, I guess, right? Like, the, at some point, someone had to invent this idea that, like, no one would say, for example, I don't know, if you, if you make spaghetti once in a while, you're a spaghettiist, or something like this. Like, but there are many, many actions that you can take in the world, um, but only some of them, it's been decided that these are no longer actions, these are some category of human, right? Like, you can be a person who commits a crime, uh, like, you can be a person who steals, but, uh, you know, you, among uh, many other things that you do, but now, you know, to, a, to, to, to certain people, you're now defined as a criminal, right? In the same way, if you could just be a person who has sex with men, you're now de defined as a homosexual. Or, you know, there are many different cases of this. I mean, you could even make this case to, to like, gender, right? You might be a person who does various gendered activities or has certain biological markers, but at some point someone, you know, at some point you gather a bunch of them together and say woman, man, whatever, right? Like, this is making, and it, there's nothing wrong with, like, the, having a world that's legible. There's, like, that's good, in fact, having a world that, that's understandable by, by, like, you or I. I like that. I like the idea of, like, I can look at this object next to me on the bed, and I can be, like, Four legs, covered in fur, floopy ears, snout, nose that has a texture of, of a PlayStation controller, joystick, dog. That's a dog. Useful. I can now categorize that as dog, and I can see other dogs, and I can be like, that's a similar type of, that's a, a like thing. Those things are like. Um, they're all dogs. Like, this is useful. I like that. I like that fact, right? Because then I can, you know... It allows you to do useful stuff about dogs. <laughs> or like, you can say, uh, you know what, a meter of yarn is actually the same type of thing as a meter of uh, wood, you know? Like, that's not something that's necessarily inbuilt into the world, but that's like a construct. But that's a really useful construct, because it allows you to abstract in really interesting ways. So there's nothing wrong with categorizing uh, stuff and creating constructs. The, the 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 thing that's that's a problem is like once you start doing this to people uh which again isn't necessarily a problem right like not in, not inherently this isn't inherently a problem it's when it's like enforced with violence that it becomes a problem and when it's not coming from what people actually want with their life like what like what the average part like as a sort of bottom up system Right, it's it's not coming from, you know, the populace, but it's instead being enforced by a state. That's when it starts to become a problem, um, and that's really what the police are. Is they just they just exist to enforce this categorization of like criminals who it's okay to be violent to. Like it's perfectly fine to kidnap and lock someone up who's a criminal, or, or slam the, their head into the pavement and arrest them or any of these sorts of things, right? Like, that's okay, because they're not really people, they're criminals. That's, like, a different class of people. Um, right, like, that's that's really... Do you, that's This is my theory. This is my, my political theory of, of what... I don't, It's not really mine. It's just a combination of, like, Stern and Foucault and seeing, like, a state and maybe some other stuff. But this is, yeah, I, this is, I think this gets at the truth better than just sitting there and being like, well, the police actually just exist to protect private property. 
It's like, no, not really. The police exist to justify their own existence by categorizing people. I'm, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of, of no one understanding Nick Land. It's like they don't even bother to read his books. And I get it. It's complicated. There's not like this part is like ver you can't avoid it. In my opinion, you can't read Nick Land and not notice this because it's like one of the few things that's been consistent basically through his entire career, even before he ever like like started writing, like even before he wrote First for Annihilation and got published, right? Like his, it's like the one through line is like anti-humanism, anti-anthropomorphism, right? It's like his one main thing. He even said in First for Annihilation, he says like, you know, he's going on these manic, insane rambles. I need to like actually finish that book because that book is bonkers, especially after reading Bataille. <laughs> like you read Bataille and then you go read Thirst for Annihilation, which is just some guy on meth who has who is just talking about something, just something else. It's great. Um, <laughs> but like even in that book, he says like anthropomorphism is like the number one sin committed by philosophers, right? Like if there's one thing Nick Land doesn't like, it's humanism. It's the, it's like, I mean, they even call um, accelerationism a reboot of historical materialism for the 21st century, right? Where the idea is, you know, historical materialism posits that class struggle is the driving force of history, right? That like things change over history, or history is a history of class struggle, right? They're like, you can, you can, you can trace all of history as this big narrative where uh, the mode of production is like the central um, factor and that mode of production changes because of class struggle, which really is a very, I mean, it's an incredibly humanist philosophy, right? It's like people, average everyday people rise up and overthrow the ruling classes to or not even necessarily that, but just struggle against like hist history, all of these forces in whatever mode of production they're in, like you know, th all of the the contradictions inbuilt into these modes of production, sort of flow through people and result in a struggle in average everyday people's lives, that people have like everyday people have to live in these societies, in like a feudalist society or a capitalist society or whatever, and these societies are built on modes of production with weird contradictions and they have to struggle against this. And that their struggle against this is the fundamental driving force of history. Land says, uh, you know, that sort of, that sort of historical materialist position was kind of falling out of favor in the 70s and so on with uh, more of the post-structuralist, post-modernist theories who were way critical about big historical meta-narratives like that. And for good reason that, I mean, I agree with them, that meta-narrative falls apart. I mean, it's not just that, that they did it for philosophical reasons, like they just were like, oh, it's passe to believe in meta-narratives. It was also that like new archaeological, anthropological, uh, you know, scientific discoveries and historical discoveries we're starting to show that, like, other factors, you know, like how starting to disprove some of these theories and stuff, right? Or at least show counter evidence that might lean towards suggesting something else. And people's attitudes towards, like, you know, Eurocentrism were changing, uh, imperialism. Right, there's a whole bunch of factors. I don't know why I'm going into all of this. Point is, Land's accelerationism is supposed to be a reboot, right? It's like, okay, historical materialism from the 20th century kind of like isn't quite there right it's clearly fallen out of favor it's clearly been dissected in all of these different ways it needs a reboot for the 21st century and what he means by that is actually there is a central driving force of history but it isn't people it is technology it is this this um eldritch lovecraftian um god called capital or AI called capital from the future constructing itself 
via the and and you know it's a artificial intelligence a constructed being a technological being right and so it's basically technological change technological development that is the central driving force of history not class struggle i.e it's something in human machines and technology rather than humans class struggle so the central thesis of accelerationism this is what i'm really trying to get at is not an ought statement land would never make a, well, okay he did later early land would never make a political ought statement because he doesn't believe that human beings are the drivers of change in the world so why on earth would he say yes we need to accelerate technological progress we need to accelerate te techno capital he would never say this because he thinks that we can't we have we're just cogs in a machine we we don't even have any impact on this we are completely controlled by techno capital or you know we don't have any impact on it it's a literally the real you know guiding force of techno capital is this is important an ai from the future he talks about it why do you think he frames it as an ai from the future constructing itself retrocausally rather than just saying you know it's converging on an ai why does he frame it like this why does he frame it as as the future perfect tense will have happened right they're like there's the, because the point is to, to, to because it's inevitable it, to his view that he's saying like it's something that it, it already will have happened like it, the humans we don't get to have a say in in it because it's already there it's just there in the future right that like he's to, he's trying to put it that like it's it's so obvious when you read his when you read <laughs> anything he's ever written that this is what he thinks i don't know why every youtuber or anyone on the internet who mentions nick land has to make up this thing that he thinks we need to accelerate capital or we need to accelerate techno capital he doesn't think like this oh we need to is such an insane thing to attribute to land like it's it's so wrong and so obviously wrong if you if you have done like basic reading it's baffling it's actually baffling how do people make this like such of and people are still doing it like you know who's been doing it recently martin screlly has been doing it recently <laughs> that fucking guy but you know martin screlly you know that guy he's gotten involved with this effective accelerationist movement which is bullshit um and he keeps going on shilling this idea of human agency and humanism and anthropocentrism and, and anthropomorphism you know it's he's land's not dead but he may as well be you know pissing on his grave already it's it's fucking nonsense i watched this video of this guy he's doing a oh it's the philosophy t uh, iceberg video i don't know why i'm watching i knew it'd be bad because it's the philosophy iceberg i mean what do you expect okay i knew it would be bad but i'm like fuck it i'm gonna watch it anyway reason he made another video that i thought was pretty good and he seemed to have some idea about philosophy and to be fair he does but he clearly doesn't know anything about nick land because who does because no one no one's out there reading nick land if they're a serious person who's taken like a philosophy course it's fair enough but don't start spreading now i'm like what else has he been i don't know i haven't read spinoza maybe all of the stuff he said about spinoza was wrong you know <laughs> Like, I haven't read Hegel, maybe all of the st or I haven't understood Hegel, very few people have, as I understand it, but I, you know, like, maybe half the stuff he said about that, you know what I mean? Like, uh, he also got some stuff that about Deleuze and Guattari wrong, but that was more minor. Like, this is Land's central thesis, and it's not just this guy. I, okay, so then, in this Philosophy Iceberg video, you go down the list, and eventually you get to gender accelerationism, which is not something I ever thought I'd hear in a YouTube video. And he gets that wrong too for the same reason. He's like, uh, it, uh, uh, oh, gender accelerationism is that we need to accelerate gender. No, it's just it's not an ought. It's not a normative. It's not a, it's not an instruct. None of these accelerationisms are instructions. This is why there was the schism, which he also brings up in this vid same very same political or philosophical iceberg video. The schism between LACC you know, left acceleration, right acceleration, and unconditioned accelerationism, right? The reason that there was this, that UACC exists in the first place 
is to correct for this entire thing that left and right both misunderstood. That everyone continually misunderstands because they're humans and they want to, they're, they're fucking hubris, right? Is they're like, oh, well, I believe in this philosophy, so that means I have to do something. Because they're brainwormed by Marx. Marx told them, oh, philosophers have only interpreted the world, now we have to change it. And they're like, ah, that must apply to literally everything all the time, right? It's like, this, you're missing the goddamn, literally, the central point. <laughs> like, it's not like you're missing, like, oh, you're misinterpreting some nitty gritty detail of uh, Fang Newman or something. No, like, this is the main thing. <laughs> this is, like, the basis of his entire philosophy. How are you messing this up? How do you not understand this? Like, it's, it's, oh man, it annoys me so much. It actually annoys me so much because it's like a game of Chinese whispers where, like, one person says something and they get it wrong and no one's actually going back to read land because land is really dense and it's really long and it's not useful. Like, reading land doesn't help you in life. You only do it if you're a loser neat with nothing better to do and you're autistic, so you just want to read something stupid because you're autistic, like me, right? No one's actually going to do this who cares about philosophy. And so... <sighs> all these people are just relying on second-hand sources that themselves just, for some reason, think accelerationism is this, like, you know, ought statement, human agency type of ideology like i can't put it clear like i think it, it's it, there's no there, it's it's not like a nuanced or confusing thing it's a clear cut is it because of negaristani or however you pronounce his, his name who's like more normative about this he's more like we ought to accelerate something is it because of this guy i don't know i haven't read that guy's stuff i only know about nick land and his ilk also, for some reason, whenever anyone talks about Wittgenstein, they're super happy to be like, well, there's a clear distinction between early Wittgenstein and late Wittgenstein, right? And so if you say, like, oh, I like Wittgenstein, the next question someone's going to ask you is, oh, do you like early Wittgenstein or late Wittgenstein, right? This isn't like an obscure concept. Everyone understands this. But for some reason, again, with Nick Land, no one seems capable of being like, well, there's early Nick Land, you know, Frank Numina, Thirst for Annihilation, the, the, the CCIU stuff, the post, like, slightly after, you know. And then there's Dark Enlightenment, later Nick Land, and these two lands have very little to do with each other, for a lot of the reasons I've just explained. That, like, early land is very anti-humanist, very, um, you know anti-human agency in history but then when it comes to the dark enlightenment suddenly he's giving all of these prescriptive normative ideas about how society ought to be run and you know they're very clearly these two things don't mesh like there's no fucking debate just because they both have like similar ideas about technology doesn't mean that they they that, that they're like compatible. They they're obviously not compatible. That land wouldn't say they're compatible. I just it's it's insane. Like he's a meme guy. He's 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 the meme. He's he's like one of the big meme philosophers. Okay, if there's anyone going to be a meme philosopher, it's Nick Land. So no one wants to read him seriously because he's Nick Land. He's a meme. I get it. I get it. I agree. You know, these days I'm way less into land than I used to be. Right, but like, like in terms of my personal philosophy, I but but one of the things I do agree with him on is like, you know, the Marxist um, mil sort of lineage of philosophy overstating the role of human agency in the development of history. Like maybe it's not zero, like he says, but I don't agree with like this is the central disagreement I have with David Graeber is that like Graeber thinks. Uh, I mean, he said the, 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 the truth about the world is that it is what we make it. Like, that is, to me, disgusting to even say. That is, like, one of the most egregious things you could ever say. <laughs> the, the Not true. I strongly disagree. I think that the world is a product of, like, you know, mostly things completely out of human control. And then, like, 
some amount of control in how we react to those things but like again even that is like questionable because like how one person chooses to react to something doesn't generally have much impact unless that one person happens to be in a position of power and whether that person is in a position of power is basically up to historical chance uh, and how a group of people how a collective a large enough collective to have influence reacts to a certain event is also basically random chance like you're not going to get a bunch of people to all agree and all act on something enough to make a major change in society unless something like extreme has happened for example the liberal revolution you had the black death um you know uh producing a lot of this stuff and you had i mean if you want to go back to uh, Graeber, the Enlightenment, the influence of uh, Native American thinkers on European thought at the time. So, like, this is stuff that it's always something that comes from outside that's going to influence enough for some sort of large social movement to happen. Or, like, if it's just like some king or some prime minister or whatever who decides, you know, some president, some some great great leader, uh, you know, some. Uh, Stalin type figure who decides to run society in XYZ way it's like the fact that that guy's in power is basically historical chance so like I agree this is like the number one thing if anything I agree with Landon is that like to this day is the lack of like human agency really in the development of history <sighs> I don't know how everyone fucks it up like it's 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 like baffling to me it would be like if people were like I don't even know, like, I'm trying to think of, of a comparison with, like, a more mainstream philosopher or something. Or, like, like, it would be like if people went around saying, I don't know, uh, what's, a, what's some, okay, Camus, okay? Like, it, it's like, if, it would be like if people went around saying, see, what Camus actually wanted was for everyone to realise that the world has intrinsic meaning ordained by God and uh, your job is to like obey whatever the church authority tells you is the intrinsic, me intrinsic meaning to life. And from that is where stems the rest of his philosophy. Like it's like that, it's like that big of a fuck up. It's like you're just talking nonsense at that point. You may as well just be talking about someone completely different, which is true. They're all just talking about Marx. <laughs> <laughs> they all think they're talking about Big Lab. They're actually just talking about Marx, and it's baffling to me. Okay, I've been autism baited. I'm going to do this tier list. This is the Pol Comp Ball Ideologies Flag XD tier list. Um, it's just a bunch of ideologies, and if going from uh, top tier, m mega based, really based, kind of based, not so based, meh. Not so bad, bad, really bad, and fucking hell. Okay, so we're going to start off with... Uh, <laughs> uh, hold on, I'm interested. I'm interested in something. Okay, so we're going to start off with absolute monarchism. I'll put that in a meh. Worked for a while, but it didn't work super well. The biggest problem is they don't really know how to solve the problem of uh, what if the king's son is an asshole. Because you can have a benevolent king... But then, like, what do you do if the king's son is an asshole, right? It's kind of epic. I don't know if I should call it... I mean, th the thing is, it did work for a long time. Um, in a lot of places. So, I don't know. Uh, accelerationism. Uh, I don't know if this really fits on the rest of these, because these all seem to be sort of a... You know... I already talked about this, you know, but almost all of these are, like, normative, as accelerationism isn't, but I'm going to put that in mega-based. Agorism, I don't know that much about agorism, I'm putting it in meh. Agar agrarianism is not so bad. Agrarian socialism is kind of cringe. Alter globalized, these are just made up. I'm just going to put that in meh. Anarchism, I'll put it in kind of based. Anti-authoritarianism, I'll put it in kind of based. Anarcho-capitalism, that's really bad. That shit sucks. They haven't figured anything out. I don't know why I'm doing this. This sucks. 
this is just like something I would have done when I was 16. As, and I, I, I could read the Wikipedia page for all of these things. I don't know why the fuck I'm doing this. These are all made up also. Like, half of these, no one believes in any of this. Like, fucking ego mutualism. You ever meet someone and they're like, yeah, I'm an ego mutualist. No one's ever gonna fucking say it. Like, these are just made up. Like, I mean, some of these are literally made up. Like, national anarchism is like one guy made this up and then everyone memed about it because they were like, whoa, it's like the two sides of the political spectrum in one thing. Whoa, isn't that crazy? It's literally just one guy made it up and then everyone, like, thought it was based for some reason. Or, like, not based, but, like, real, you know? As if it, like, as if anyone actually believes it. No one, no one believes it. It's just, it's just a made up ideology that one person invented. So yeah, you know what? I'm not, I'm not gonna do this because this is just some fucking gay shit. Uh, this is, this is kind of retarded. You know, I'm actually gonna make an argument thinking about that thing. If you're this kind of like internet i i thought these people like stopped existing i thought this was like a meme on like lefty pole type error where like oh it's like oh lame here's all the ideologies you know they all have their little flags and stuff which one are you i thought this kind of died but apparently not because i saw that on twitter just now uh although it wasn't the contact well i saw a guy getting clowned on on twitter rightly so he was getting clowned on but i decided to check his his profile to see if I could find any to laugh at him to laugh at him and he'd have done this so that's why I was like maybe I should do that but that guy's an anarchist right he was posting something vaguely anarchisty oh he was actually talking about blessed is the flame man I'm lucky I didn't have twitter when I was like well, I did have Twitter, but I didn't really post about that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Anyway. I think... I don't... I don't know... That you can really be an anarchist... And see the world like that. <clears throat> because... That sort of... Categorization shows like that sort of attraction to imposing uh legibility onto groups of people is like a state ideology that's my that's that there you go that's my two cents i don't i don't think you can i don't think if you you might think you're an anarchist but i don't think you really can be so it's been enough time now that I feel like I can talk about the TF2 update confidently. New maps. New maps, okay? And unfortunately, uh, they all suck. <clears throat> yeah, unfortunately, sadly. So the payload maps are the only ones I really care about, obviously, because payload is the best game mode, uh, at least in my opinion. There's three payload maps, right? You got Cashworks, Phoenix, and Venice. So I'll go through. Cashworks sucks. Cashworks probably the worst one. It's uh, way too choky. And the chokes aren't fun to fight over. Every single point feels like just a mess. I mean, it's very clear that it was designed for like an older version of the game without half the items. I mean, this, the second point, like fighting... That that little, like, really tight choke to get to the big downhill section, right? Like, that is just hell to fight over. It's not fun in any way. It gives way too much power to the defending team. And even if you do manage to push through, like, I don't know, man. And then the rest of the map just feels weird and awkward to play on. I don't know how to explain it. It just doesn't feel right. And then last, like... Attacking and defending on last feels bad. I don't know how to explain it. The angles feel unnatural. It doesn't flow well, in my opinion. Like, I, I especially don't... Like, I'm not saying it's, like, particularly unbalanced last. It just doesn't feel good to play on. Like, it doesn't... Like, normally, 
like last should be where ng shines right like you you can set up a nice level three and get yourself a nest going you like there's no it doesn't feel like there's anywhere like i've tried i just don't I, it's not fun i'm not i'm not gonna spend too long on it it's just i don't like this map phoenix is definitely the best of the three in my opinion uh but it also fucking sucks uh mainly because so most of the matches I've played on Phoenix just end, like, they just stalemate at the second point, like, the bridge, specifically. There's, like, this... The The first point is fine. It it looks great. And it's it's okay to play on. It's not my favorite. It's not, it's not that bad. It's actually... I've been having a lot of fun playing Soldier on Phoenix for some reason. It feels, like, really good for Soldier for some reason. Um... I don't know why. Lots of, like, verticality for rocket jumping, I guess. I don't know. It just feels good to play Soldier on Phoenix, to me, for some reason. Um, but yeah, first point's fine. It's not It's not amazing, not terrible. It's it's a, it's a pretty good for... Like, it, it has a good feeling of, yep, yeah, this, is, this is pushing out onto first, right? The little, like, gas station type area is kind of a neat feature of the map. Um, it's fine. Don't really have a problem with it. But then that like, um, like most of the matches I've played, neither team can make it past the bit where you have to push the car under the bridge. Uh, like it, it's just way too strong for the defenders in that area. Like way too easy to hold. The spawn is way too close to where the the point is, where the car is. So you they just respawn and they're right there. It's kind of like upward second, but um. Uh, yeah, it's kind of uh, like upward second, uh, but um, the 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 spawn point isn't choky enough. Like the reason upward second is balanced is because you know everyone's coming out of basically one entrance. Like the um, you can very easily focus fire on uh, as blue. You can very easily focus fire on where all of red is going to be respawning from, and and sort of keep them in this little doorway. Uh, in order to push through like you push them back and back and then they get stuck in this little you know eventually they're holding this little bit and once you've got them there you can easily sort of like crouch behind the car and push it onto the point which makes it balanced um, and it's also engaging gameplay wise because there's like a strong sense of progression on both sides it's not impossible to hold but it's like it's good because you don't really want like generally speaking you want most matches to go to last not all matches but most of them right uh, yeah, this doesn't work because there are like five different exits from red spawn on second, um, and blue spawn is just way too far away. Uh, and there's just I don't know, like I don't really understand. I'm not a map designer. I don't know why exactly it's too powerful to hold, but it just is. Like uh, factually, all of the games just never make it past there. Now, if it does, if you actually can make it past this point, the rest of the map is really fun. That's why I think it's the best, because the the third and fourth points are are very fun to fight over, in my opinion. Uh, some places where uh, I've I've been had very annoying times fighting against Vanguard level three sentries, but like overall, I don't really have a problem with it. I think it's pretty fun. It's not my favorite map, but I put it put the rest of the map on the same category as like maybe a barn blitz, where it's like yeah, I'll play it from time to time. It's alright. Actually, I quite like barn blitz. Maybe more like a, yeah, but I'll put it on like like that sort of level, like 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 a, you have the S tier maps, which is obviously, bad water and upward, and then you have like the, the sort of like the the B tier maps, right? Which is to me, it's like bomb blitz, swift water, these sorts of things. It's kind of on that level, although it's not quite as. I mean, it, it obviously has this terrible seconds, which is just impossible to push. And then finally, Venice. Uh, Venice also fucking sucks. For like, I don't know. It's 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 incredibly unfun. <laughs> like it, it feels like a CS:GO map. It doesn't like. It doesn't feel like a TF2 map. It feels like always awkward. There are all of these tiny little corridors that just are like weird to play in. Um, they split the spawn. They split your first spawn as blue into like these two buildings. Which is also really weird now. 
And that, I mean, none of the, it just feels weird. I don't know, maybe it's just because it's new, but I've played like four games on Venice and not had a single shred of fun. Um, and last is hell on Venice. Like, it's not fun to defend, it's not fun to push, it just feels kind of random and spammy, not in a good way. It's it's too much just like a death box without, like, features. Yeah, don't like Venice at all. It's not as bad as Cashworks, in my opinion. But maybe it is. Maybe it actually is. I haven't played it as much. Because I, 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 I had so little fun, I just leave. Anyway. Um, yeah, I haven't played anything. I haven't played any matches on Sulphur yet. Um played two matches on hardwood and didn't really understand the map so I don't think I can like give a, a rating on it I uh, haven't played reckoner uh, oh shark bay is a good map shark bay is good good king of the hill map I, I like shark bay uh, yeah I've played like quite a few fun matches on shark bay and rotunda is also really good uh, although it's kind of weird I, I like it it's good to play demo night on rotunda um, yeah, I, I like Rotunda and I like Shark Bay. The two King of the Hill maps are both good. Uh, I haven't played Pelican Peak. and uh, Then you have Selbien, uh, which is obviously the, the, the seal map. And uh, personally, I, I don't get it. Like I, I Not as in like I don't get why people like the map. As in, like I can't wrap my head around the map. <laughs> like I just seem unable to play well on this map for some reason. And I, I have no idea why. Uh... But anyway, that, those are my opinions. I don't really care about any of the... Like, I like the King of the Hill maps, but I don't care that much uh, about anything other than the payload maps, and the payload maps aren't that good. So, frankly, I mean, the past three days, I have been queuing fucking Upward and Bad Water exclusively and having a fine time. As I said, you know, tennis, football, all of chess... They have one map. Like, these are... if it, It's perfectly... You know, TF2 is, as, as in my opinion... It was a very hot take. It's as, it's as good of a, a game as, 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 like... Those games. <laughs> At least it can be in its most perfect state. Like, there's... You don't... It has... You got too many goddamn maps. Team Fortress 2 has too many goddamn maps. And no one plays... Who's playing, like... Enclosure, you know, like who I don't fucking I don't know. That's these are my opinions. Okay, these are my opinions on the new maps. I'm just gonna probably continue to play more bad water and upward. Yeah, I don't I don't care about war paints or cosmetics or anything like that. Of course, because why would you? So that part of the update didn't matter to me. Bug fixes are good. Um, I haven't played the new CP Steel because I'm not a big fan of CP Steel. Uh, I should probably check it out. I should probably like find a game of Steel just to, so I can play what or see what they change. Because maybe maybe I'll like the new version, although I doubt it. Uh, so I guess that's something to pay attention to that I need to check out. And then obviously the other big thing is versus Saxton Hale, which I still haven't played uh, because I initially had no interest in it. Although after seeing some clips on Twitter and YouTube of people playing versus Saxton Hale, I'm a little more interested in it now. I think I might check it out like tomorrow or something, see what happens. Maybe it'll be good. Maybe I'll have fun. I don't know. I've been eating... Uh, the diet of a 19th, early 19th century, actually maybe earlier than that, say 1700s, uh, dock worker, lots of, lots of, lots of brown bread, dense brown, lots of brown bread, lots of butter, lots of cheese, uh, and preserved, cured meats, rye bread. Although, I've also been drinking lots of kefir, which I guess it depends where you live. I don't know how much uh, 
1700s dock worker would have would have drank kefir it might be more of a medieval thing or different parts of the world anyway spent basically half of today looking for a movie to watch I tried to watch Falling Down I got through the first like four scenes and then I was like yeah this movie isn't for me um, I tried to watch Office Space pretty similar vibe where I was like this is too removed from my daily life to be I don't know I didn't like it I didn't find it very funny to be honest with you um, I didn't yeah I didn't really like Office Space the bit that I watched and I just was looking I was like trying to find a movie to watch I don't know I couldn't find anything but um, I, you know what I was thinking about is uh, the most influential video essay of all time. Every single video essay wishes it were this one. It's not even that. Like, every single piece of, like, film criticism wishes it was this particular video essay. Um, and that video essay is... Uh, hold on, I will... It's, it's called The Marvel Symphonic Universe. You've probably seen it. It's a very popular video essay. Uh, it's by Every Frame of Painting. Uh, who basically invented the current standard of video essays and did it better than anyone else ever has. But this one specifically, I think, is, I mean, it's undeniably the most influential video essay, the most important video essay ever made. Not just because it was made by arguably the most influential video film essayist on YouTube, but also because there is basically no question that it single-handedly changed the shape of the most popular movies in the in the subsequent years. Right. If you don't, if you haven't seen this this video essay or you don't remember it, uh, I'll jog your memory. It starts with some man on the street interviews, saying like, "Hey, can you hum the James Bond theme?" And everyone's like, "You know, like, hums it." And then they're like, "What's going on over there?" Hold on, I'm gonna go check that out. Uh, uh, anyway, then he's like, "You know, can you hum the Harry Potter theme?" He goes through a couple, and then. He's like, okay, can you remember any music from a Marvel movie? Now, this video was made in 2016. So Marvel was already huge at this point. Almost everyone would have seen Marvel movies. This is really annoying me. I don't know what is going on here, but the washing machine is making this noise, but it's not even turned on. I don't know why it's annoying. Anyway. Um, no one can do it. No one can hum a anything or sing anything from a, from a Marvel movie soundtrack and what's interesting is if you did this now I think many people would go oh of course I can do the Marvel theme it goes like right you know it we all know that uh, they fucking spam it they started spamming it especially uh, let me look up the Marvel timeline. Let me let me look this up. Uh, okay, twenty sixteen. Doctor Strange. When exactly did I'm I'm curious. September twenty sixteen. Okay, so the next movie to come out would have been Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. But those movies. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 and Spider-Man Homecoming were probably too far into production to have been influenced. So the next movie that could have been influenced by it was Thor Ragnarok. And funny enough, uh, Thor Ragnarok is the only one that we know for sure was influenced specifically by this video. Because the composer for Thor Ragnarok's soundtrack literally said that they watched this video and it, you know, gave them a bunch of... Uh, I mean, they just specifically said they watched this video and at the time they were making the soundtrack for this Marvel movie and it changed their approach. 
because they talk about temp music and a bunch of other stuff um and you know like i don't know when the that uh, i don't know when that that came came into effect but i am almost certain that it was this specific youtube video which made eventually tra- i'm not saying like some executive at disney saw this video although it's possible it, in fact it's i would argue it's even slightly probable because you know these people have children i wouldn't be surprised if you know someone's kid was like hey dad you 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 make these movies right like what do you think about this look no one can hum the tune and then this guy was like huh no one can hum the tune but you know whether it was that or whether it traveled up the chain of command because every frame of painting was popular with hollywood people like from the ed- editors and random behind the scenes people that we've never heard of all the way to like a list c lebs um they watch this stuff. I mean, not just this, but they watch all sorts of random fucking YouTube videos about their movies. Like, you you, you wouldn't expect it, but it's true. I mean, just recently I saw a clip of Tom Cruise, like, talking about some random reaction video he watched <laughs> to a, a Mission Impossible movie. Um, like, these people... And that, I, would, I, fa- I tracked down the reaction video. It has, like, 200,000 views. Like, it's not even a particularly... I mean, obviously that's a pretty... But it's not like 7 million views like this one has. And it's not a Mr. Beast video exactly, right? Like, you know what I'm saying, right? In the grand scheme of things. So these people, they watch videos about this stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I, like, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that while this may not single-handedly have influenced the decision to put a strong musical theme into Marvel movies, it almost certainly had a large part in influencing this. Um, Which is why it is the most influential uh, video essay of all time. Thanks for listening to my video essay about the most video essay influence of the video essay. Essay, video, video, the essay. Anyway, I'm going to watch Inception now. Because I just can't think of a movie to watch, and I've just given up. And I'm like, you know, I've been on my Christopher Nolan hating arc for a while. Like, I really didn't like Tenet. I don't like this, 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 the back half of The Dark Knight. Um, let me look up the Christopher Nolan movies so I can remember them. I didn't think Interstellar was that great. I never watched Dunkirk. I haven't watched Oppenheimer. I like Memento. Um, I didn't like The Prestige, I didn't like Batman Begins, I guess that's all of them. But I haven't watched um, Inception since it came out, so I don't really remember, like, much about it, which makes, so I'm like, fuck it, I'm gonna rewatch it. So, because this is really the key, this is really, like, the, this is the movie that was, like, if Inception's good... Because Memento's great. Like, I love Memento. Great movie. And The Dark Knight is, like, pretty good for most of the time. Right? Dark Knight Rises was actually the film that made me a, into a Nolan hater. Because that is one of the worst films I've ever fucking seen. That is absolutely one of the worst films ever made. And I will not hear anything about... Okay, that is, like... That is, like, an offensively bad fucking movie. It's so bad. I don't understand how anyone can, like, be like... Well, it's not his... But no, it's, like so incredibly bad <laughs> I don't even know where to start with the bombs of that movie yeah I didn't like The Dark Knight Rises at all I thought it was a terrible film um, yeah so it's like Memento good but pretty damn good movie right? Dark Knight Rises one of the worst movies ever made Tenet pretty fucking bad movie Interstellar Mid, if you, like, average out the entire runtime, it comes in at, like, a five. Dark Knight, it's probably, like, a s- strong six, maybe a seven, right? The Prestige, I didn't like it very much. I'd probably give it, like, a five, maybe a six. Um, 
So it's like he's. He, well, I'm not saying he's a bad director, right? I, like, if you want, I, what I said to my friend Young Sai is that like if I wanted a movie that kind of does something in the vein of of a Christopher Nolan where it's like blockbuster but also a little high minded, I would watch a David Fincher film. Like David Fincher gives me everything that I could possibly get from a Nolan film except better in every way. Um, except going back and watching the David Fincher films, a lot of those aren't that great as well. Uh, right? Like Fight Club's great. Seven is pretty good. Gone Girl I didn't like. I'm the only person that didn't like it. Girl with the Dragon Tattoo I definitely thought was pretty mid. The game I thought was pretty bad. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that as well. But anyway, so far it feels like, you know, Inception was the sort of, I mean, there was the prestige, but I feel like Inception is where Christopher Nolan kind of started sucking his own dick and I, I need to judge whether it was a, a worthwhile dick to suck right because the consequences have not been worthwhile I think I've established this but was the inciting incident of the dick sucking worth it let's find out does inception hold up a decade and a bit later the problem with... Okay, and there's not the problem with Inception. A problem with Inception. Okay, like, let me let me just tell you what, what happened just now in the film. They're already in the dream, right? The big dream, doing the dream heist. And it's like, one of the guy gets shot. And it's like, okay, I'll just kill him and then he'll wake up. And then uh, they're like, Leonardo DiCaprio's like, no... You can't kill him or he'll be trapped in limbo because the sedative is too strong. And what's strange to me about this is that, like, there's no universe that they wouldn't have discussed that beforehand, right? This isn't like a cinema sins nitpicky bullshit, right? Like, this is like an obvious thing. You've just had literally an hour of the movie up until now to exposit this kind of thing. You've set up very clearly one rule, which is if you die in a dream, you wake up, only to then switch it out for a different rule. If you die in a dream, you go to limbo, something that we haven't... But instead of a... St- like, it doesn't make any sense for the character not to know this. It's literally poor characterization because it makes me think, oh, okay, this is like a hodgepodge team of amateurs. But, but the point of all of the exposition and characterization up to this point was actually, no, 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 this is like a, a, it's a heist movie, right? So you get the, okay, we need to assemble a team part of the movie, right? Which is always a good part of every heist movie. Um, And the point of this is they're all, you know, highly experienced professionals. They demonstrate this repeatedly. So the fact that they wouldn't, a, already know this. Okay, except for the girl. They're all highly experienced professionals. If she didn't know, it would make sense. That's why she's in the movie. So that she, She's in the movie to ask these dumb questions so that the audience can know. The fact that this comes so late, it's just very strange. Like, in what... It doesn't make any sense to me that, th- that these characters wouldn't have already discussed this. Like, this is such an obvious thing. Like, okay... What happens if one of us dies in the dream? Okay, you go to limbo and go insane instead of just waking up. Pretty big difference from other Inception jobs you would have had before or whatever, right? Going into dream jobs that you would have had. Like, it's a pretty fucking glaring big difference that makes, makes like, the, the risk of the operation significantly higher. And for the pacing of the film, they want it to go here. But in terms of the logic of the story, it doesn't make any sense that, uh, who is that, Tom Hardy? Is that what the actor's name is, I think? That his character would just be finding this out now. Either he would already have known this because he knows about this shit, or they would have discussed it earlier. Because it's such an important detail, right? It's, like, the movie is full of little things like this, like bits of dialogue. I mean... Christopher Nolan is not very good at dialogue. 
I will look. I don't think this is a bad movie so far. I think that there are lots of really good ideas. He's an ideas man. Um. Actually, you know what this? What what I was thinking about? There's this. There's this particularly wacky Max Landis pitch, which is like his pitch for. Uh, I don't even know how to describe it. It's a heist movie. It's a. It's also a heist movie. But it's a they they they're heisting a spaceship while it's in space or something. I haven't watched it in a while. I just remember it. And like, people clown on Max Landis for making like very wacky, cartoonish ideas, but like this is like on that level. It's just pulled off with like an illusion of prestige behind it. But really, this is like a B movie type of plot. Which is fine. That's not a complaint. I like B movie type of plots. I don't have a problem with that inherently. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm not convinced Christopher Nolan has ever like observed humans speaking. What are you doing, dog? Okay, you're licking something. I don't know what you're licking. Now you just lick in the air. What a strange dog. Um. But yet, like this, this particular example of like, like, it immediately pulls me out of the movie because my first thought is, what do you mean he doesn't already know that? Right, like it just immediately goes counter to his character, and the film is full of like tons of tiny. Like they're trying to explain it away now. Like, oh, you didn't tell us this. Like, as if he held this information on purpose. But it wasn't just him. It was also the the other guy, the chemist guy, who, who has no motivation to withhold this information. And even if Leonardo DiCaprio... Like, I don't know, man. It's just stupid. It's a bit stupid. There's a, it's, a, it's a... It's like... This movie is a stupid person's idea of what a smart movie is like. But I, th- I'm not saying it's, like, terrible. I don't think it's terrible. Okay, so I've come to my conclusions about Inception. So, Inception... Okay, so there are some movies... There are some movies that are kind of like this. Right? Like, uh... It looks like it's about the mechanics of the plot, but really, it's this deep character study. Uh, so, as an example of, like, two contrasting movies, like, so Inception's a heist movie. It's a weird heist movie with a fun gimmick, and gimmick is not an insult. Movies should have gimmicks. It's a very good gimmick. It actually has quite a few gimmicks. Um, it, yeah, not nothing wrong with that. So it's a heist movie with a fun gimmick, but it follows the structure of a heist movie. Let's compare two other heist movies. Um, So an example of, like, a movie that's just about the mechanics of the plot would be maybe Mission Impossible 1 or Ocean's Eleven. Uh, Whereas uh, a heist movie that is actually, it looks like it might be about the mechanics of the plot, but when you actually watch it, it turns out to be this deep character study would be Heat. Now, I think everyone agrees at this point that Heat is one of the best movies ever made. It's absolutely a masterpiece. I love Heat. It's one of my favorite films. Uh, Heat is also kind of similarly about a heist that goes goes kind of wrong. right? In fact, in Heat, it goes much more wrong than it goes in Inception. But it also goes wrong in Inception. Um, uh, but really, it's not about the heist. It's about, you know, Al Pacino and Robert De Niro's characters and how they interact with the world and how they interact with each other like that's really like the 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 emotional highlight of the movie the, the emotional peak of the movie like the emotional peak of Ocean's 11 is when they steal the thing because that's normally the emotional peak of a heist movie the emotional peak of heat is when robert de niro walks away from the girl Right, because he has to turn, turn his back to to escape the law. Right. That's the, that's that's the difference between these two kinds of movies. And I'm not saying necessarily. I mean, I prefer Heat to those other movies, uh, but like, there's nothing wrong with making a straightforward heist film. I like I like 
Ocean's Eleven. I like the first, most of the first Mission Impossible. I don't like the ending, where it get, kind of jumps the shark a lot. Uh, but I like most of the first Mission Impossible. They're good movies. I, I have nothing against them. What I'm trying to say is Inception thinks... So why you have a movie that... It looks like it's just about the mechanics of the plot, but it's actually a deep character study. Inception looks like a movie that looks like it's just about the mechanics of the plot, but is actually a deep character study, but is actually just about the mechanics of the plot. Because the the main guy is not really characterized. He doesn't he just has like an event in his life. It's it's not really about him. Like if you take a look at the difference between like the gunfights in Heat versus the gunfights in Inception. Like, the big shootout in Heat where they're sort of like on the street, right? You, you know the one. It's not really about the shootout. It's about characterization. Like, each character makes choices during that shootout which will ultimately determine their fate. But it's not about whether they can aim their gun properly or not. It's about, like... For example, the one guy he picks up a kid to use as a human shield. That's his decision, right? And in that moment, he kind of sacrificed. He kind of like, he lost everything. He went too far. And so the universe sort of punishes him for it and he gets fucked up, right? Or Val Kilmer sacrifices himself, kind of, right? Uh, like, each character's decisions during that moment aren't really about the mechanics of the shootout. They're about their own internal states. Whereas in the shootouts in Inception... There's a very clear delineation, right? They they really keep these things separate. Where it's like, the shootouts are just about shooting a gun at people so that there's explosions happening on the screen to have tension. Not really anything deeper than that, right? They justify it with a gimmick, but that's not the same as having the mechanics of the world reflect the internal state of the character. Like, when they go into the dream at first and it turns out that the guy has had some sort of training and his projections are, like, attacking them with guns. That doesn't happen, really, for any, like, character reason. It happens so that the movie can have guns in it. And so that the tension, the stakes can be raised. It happens for a mechanical reason, rather than a character reason. That And that's, like, the case for every aspect of the plot, including all of the stuff with, with the girl that kills herself, the wife that kills... Like, all of that stuff... Also, it's not that the movie exists as a reflection of that. It's actually that, that that stuff exists all to create stakes and tension and momentum in the plot, in the mechanics of the plot. But the movie thinks it's heat. It thinks it's heat. And or, or a lot of people think it's heat. A lot of people think the movie is actually about all of that stuff. It's not about any of that stuff. That stuff doesn't matter. That stuff exists to further the, the gears of the plot. To get, like, all of that stuff is set up so that they can set up the, the place of limbo and end up there because that's important for the narrative. All of the shootouts in the movie don't happen for any reason other than we need tension. And they just kind of turn into visual noise by the end of the film. Like, by the end of the movie, when they're in the sort of, like, the, the alpine kind of lodge or whatever, it is, like, you know, where the, the final vault is, the, the, the snowy place... The, the, the gunfights, they really don't matter. Like, they just they just exist as, like, mechanics. Like, they're not interesting to watch, really. They're just noise. Um, yeah. Yesterday when I was playing TF2, I had an almost gigabrain moment. But my brain was, like, 0. 0.2 seconds too slow to actually make it work. I was playing pyro, I was fighting someone, and I let them on fire, I think it was a scout, I actually don't even remember who I was fighting, I let them on fire, they were running away to, to a health bag, and I basically knew, like I knew they were on low health, and they were on fire, experiencing afterburn, I knew even if they turned around and killed me, they would have died to afterburn. But they were, like, almost at this health pack. But I was also low. Um, and I was running after him, and he was in front of me, 
So he got to the health pack first, turned around and shot me. And then, like, the instant he picked up the... I was like, fuck, what am I supposed to do? Right? And then the instant he picked up the health pack, I I realized, fuck, what I could have done is air blasted him into the air. I could have air blasted him into the air so he couldn't pick up the health pack. And then I could have used that time while he was in the air to run under him and pick up the the health pack, and then just sat there and watched him die of afterburn. Which would have been so fucking cool. That would have been such a genius IQ brain play. But I was a split second. He was definitely within air blast range. Like, 100%, I could have done it. Um, I just didn't quite think of it fast enough. It was so annoying. Because the second afterwards, I was like, damn, I had the opportunity for a really cool play, but... Anyway, now you're hearing about, like, can you imagine the clip of that? That's crazy. I don't know, maybe it's not that clever, but in my mind, that's clever. You know this Byung Chul Han guy? I kind of like some of his stuff. If you don't know this Byung Chul Han guy, he's a philosopher. Um, modern, contemporary uh, philosopher. Um... And he he's sort of in the tradition of, like, you know, analyzing power. Kind of like a... I don't even know what to call it. Like, what do you call the... Because, like, I would imagine you would say... Well, maybe it starts with, like, Spinoza. But then, like, probably starts with Marx. And then it goes to, like, the 70s post-structuralist critical theory. P- critical theory, guys. Those fucking poofy. Dog's poopy. Don't sit down. Dog. Okay. Good job. But anyway, that those guys. He's in that sort of tradition. But he's. I think he has some really good stuff to say. But then he always has to undercut it with some random nonsense. I don't understand why. Like, his main... I think the thing he's known for is his theories about psychopolitics or psych- and psychopower... And, um, fuck, the, like, the, 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 the achievement society, that's what he calls it. So it's like, it's kind of like Deleuze contrast control societies against Foucault's discipline societies. Bong Chul Han is doing a similar thing where he's like, we no longer have these disciplinary societies. I mean, he's basically just paraphrasing Deleuze, but it was, which I don't really understand why he's doing that, but... Uh, I mean, when I say worse, it's not necessarily worse, because it's definitely more legible. It's more easily understandable. But, like, like he definitely writes in a way that's, like, quite um, easy to interpret to a, a layperson, which I think is good. More philosophers should do that. But anyway, so his, his, his deal is, like, you know, in the past, we had this disciplinary power of, like, a factory or whatever... In these industrialized economies. Hey, can I be on the podcast? You're already on the podcast. Do you ever think about how brown is an ephemeral color? What the fuck does that mean? Because, like, human color perception wise, right? Brown is a dark orange. Brown is dark orange, yeah. yeah. Well, then you look at the tree trunk, right? It doesn't feel orange. Yeah, because it's not really orange. It's like a weird mixture of, like, reddish and greenish hues, right? True. But the eye doesn't have a receptor that can simultaneously see red and green. So it just kind of short circuits and goes dark orange. You think that's why? Uh, yeah. I feel like it's just the, like... I don't know, brown just has its own vibe, so it no, doesn't feel like, like orange. Have you, like, tried to paint a tree trunk, right? Yeah, it's, it's hard. Yeah, because you have to put those, like, greens yeah. and purples and shit in there. Yeah. Because brown isn't brown. Brown is not... Brown uh, is your brain short-circuiting and going like that circle range. I don't know if I'd say that it's short-circuiting. I mean, it's... You no, I think, have a receptor for I think you're it getting is. it backwards. You're saying it's your brain saying it's dark orange? Yeah. What I'm saying is, it's already dark orange, but, but your brain really, doesn't really interpret it as dark orange. No, it's not really a dark orange. It's a mixture of red and green, right? A tree trunk might be, but yeah, a yeah, yeah, brown, yeah. I don't think, is a no, mixture. No, yeah, like a brown paint isn't like that. Yeah. A brown paint is just dark orange. Yeah. I'm talking about like a tree trunk, right? Yeah, but a tree trunk is, I mean, just like anything made of many colors. Yeah, but it's also made of those specific hues that your brain can't process as a mixture. 
I see. Because there's no red, green color. If you try to mix red and green, your brain just goes like that's brown, that's dark orange. I don't think that's quite how it works. That is how it works. No, I think it's not your brain. I think it's your photoreceptors. I mean, it's it is your photoreceptors, but it's your brain is like your brain has to eventually contextualize your photoreceptors. I see. Because your photoreceptors are pretty like picking up red and green baby wounds, right? There's no like. There's no whatever it's called. But there's no optical sense for a red green color. Right. It has to be a red yellow color. But that's isn't that I don't yeah, I I, I guess so. I guess yeah. you're right. Anyway, I'm gonna go back to talking about Byung Chul Han now. Okay, so his deal is like instead of the Foucaultian control societies or, oh sorry, the disciplinary institutions of like factories and, and stuff like this. This is the same thing Deleuze says. It's like we've been replaced with this complete with with the economy reshaping away from these sorts of industrial processes, uh, at least in the West. He says like, oh, that's been replaced with the achievement society. Like, rather than having to have some authority come and and say, oh, you can't do this. You you have to do this, right? Uh, or, it, like, you must, he, the, the, I think is the phrase he says, like, rather than some authority saying you must, instead, you it's replaced, rather than this negative, it's replaced with this positive, like, oh, you can, you can achieve your true self, you can become more productive, you can become more disciplined, like, you can go to, listen to a motivational speaker, so you can get motivated to achieve your true productivity goals and you can manifest and you can uh, get a CEO mindset and uh, you got to rise and grow, like all of this stuff, right? You, you know the kind of vibe I'm talking about. You can become an entrepreneur. You How are you going to maximize your productivity? And it's all framed in this sort of positive light rather than some authority coming and saying, no, you must do this. You're not allowed to do anything else, which would be a negative. It's framed in this positive. You can become this guy who's very productive and whatever, but really, it's just the same process, or it's it's the 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 function of like enslavement to capital is still there, and that this results in burnout, right? Which is really something. If you think about it, burnout is like a fucked up thing. <laughs> that's kind of some, that's basically what he says in in more words, and. Uh, Okay, so all of that, I think, is great, right? That's all great stuff. And then he's like, and, pe- you know, the difference is, really, that, like, in the past, there had to be all these disciplinary institutions to enforce capital. But now, people willingly enslave themselves, right? They love to, they love to do all of this because, because there's all this nice comforts that they or rather like they they've become dependent on the system psychologically and socially like their their self-worth is um tied to their productivity under a capitalist system this sort of thing right or the the way that they view their social interactions the way that they uh their hobbies right your hobbies it's like can you monetize it right like the the can you turn your hobby into a side hustle like everything you do becomes financialized um and you become psychologically dependent on the sorts of like for example you could have a hobby that is just talking about like the very subtle i mean lots of people are like car i, I don't think byung johan uses this example but this is just like something i thought of right is like let's say there's lots of car guys, right? There's lots of car guys who are really into cars. Or, uh, actually, maybe even we could go wackier than that. Like, let's say CSGO skins. There are lots of people who genuinely feel very passionate about CSGO skins. But, like, in a very real sense, these skins are direct replacements for each other. In the same way that, like, there are 50 soap brands on a shelf but they all do the same thing it doesn't you have infinite consumer choice but that choice doesn't really matter you're not really free because you have a lot of consumer choice same sort but people you know become very invested in this sort of and i'm i'm kind of on board for this as well like i think this is also some 
decent analysis. And then just randomly out of nowhere, he's like, oh, and porn is la bad. Porn is la bad and sex is la bad. Casual sex, la bad. Porn, la bad. Uh, any sort of, like, pleasure, that is la bad, actually. And he literally says, love is supposed to be violent. He uses the word. And I'm like, tell that to, like, fucking sexual assault victims. See how they feel about that, okay? This is a, this is a weird-ass thing to put in your book. What's this going on? Like, this is fucking insane. He, I don't know why he goes off on this. He just, like, suddenly turns into conservative when it comes to, like, sex and relationship stuff. And like, I understand there's plenty of, like, very good critique that you can make about how, you know, romance under capitalism or whatever. There's great... There's loads of stuff you can say. I think Zizek said a lot of good stuff about this, right? And a lot of the stuff Zizek said is kind of parroted in Byung Chul Han. But, like, Zizek is Zizek. He has a way of, like, you know... He has this... Uh, I feel like he understands it in a better way. Like, I, I don't think Zizek would would be like, oh, porn is la bad. You know? Zizek loves porn. He, I don't know. He doesn't give any... I'm, I'm, I'm... He literally doesn't give any sort of satisfactory explanation as to why he thinks this. Like, I think it's very clear when I'm reading is that he just, like, has this innate knee-jerk reaction against... Uh, like, like the porn industry and the idea that, se- like, in the same... He, he views, I think, like, sexual liberation in the same way as, like, consumer choice, right? Like, that, like, they're not... It's not a real freedom. I think that this is just, like, a very strange way of viewing things. Like, if you... If you... I, I don't know. It's It's very... To me, they're, they're, they're very clearly different things. And also, like, the the version of romance that he's, um, like, like, appropriating or calling for a return to, I suppose, um, is a construct. It doesn't... I, I don't think he, he, he establishes sub- sufficient historical basis for, like why this particular, you know, idealized version of romance that's like a, a chase or or risky, you, which is a word he uses as well, is like superior. I, I just, I, I mean, look, you can, you can make like, there's, there's loads of really valid criticism about like, like dating apps and and even, you know, digital pimps like OnlyFans and stuff like this. But to just and I mean there's even valid there's loads of criticism about the porn industry you could make that would be perfectly valid but he doesn't really do any of that he just sort of says it's it's la bad because it just is okay you're doing romance wrong like you're doing love wrong I think he would look at my relationship right and he would he would think that, 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 that we were miserable he would probably think that we were miserable oh he also hates video games it's very clear he's never played a video game. He he's like video games. They're like these. They're not some technological thing. That they're not some advanced reasoning thing. They're actually like relating to your base animal instincts, and it's actually like that's bad. Which, like, I mean, not to get too abstract here, but that gives me that that's kind of like, uh, literally the exact same narrative as like fascist narratives of degeneracy. Am I wrong? Like he's 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 almost literally saying video games are degenerate, and that like uh, free love or or the sexual revolution is degenerate, and I I just really, I mean again there's loads of great critiques you can make about video game industry, like oh how exploitative it is of the workers, how they use addictive loops and how they turn social and like for example team fortress 2 is my favorite video game but i'm not here to say it's good okay like uh, it, uh, it, like for ex- uh, i mean okay so you're you're playing team fortress 2 you want to do social interaction in the game the game is built to be really good for social interaction and one of the ways it does this is with emotes which has been picked up by like every other video game ever but like in order to do the emotes beyond the default one you have to buy into the game's in-game economy, and that's bad. 
that is paywalling social interaction that is basically saying like oh if you want to be you see all these other people that are able to have social relations with each other in order to do that you have to buy into our in game economy and i really don't like that i mean cosmetics i understand because i don't care about cosmetics when it comes to emotes you know i i personally feel a little more uh bad about that you know cuz i i feel like that sort of you what are you going to do next paywall in game chat you know like it just feels wrong to me it feels like you're saying oh we're putting a limit on your so like you know if you're poor you're not allowed to have any sort of self expression within this arena i don't like that so there's i mean that's just one example i mean I, his critique of video games is just insane it does, it's so obvious that he has no idea what he's talking about that like it doesn't even really bear paying any attention to um i mean even in the parts where he's like closer to being correct i still think he's wrong <laughs> so yeah this is like he just he 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 sees this this positive like aspect of society where he, and by positive i don't mean like good in a sort of an ethical sense positive as in like sort of additive i guess like you know yes rather than no uh he sees all, like that society is like defined by this a lot of a lot of this, these sorts of positives rather than historically has, has been defined more by by disciplinary negatives which is a good observation i think um but then he goes on to just sort of with a, the the broadest brush possible dismiss any sort of positive aspects of society and i am not sure how i feel about that um you know it's it's ha, let me let me tell you about video games okay people in video games actually a lot of the time they play these games to reproduce this is going to sound crazy to reproduce a disciplinary system which they've been denied by today's control society listen this sounds insane but I, okay think about the amount of people who play a video game like let's say team fortress 2 because i'm familiar with it who refuse to use certain weapons not because they are bad weapons but because they're too good and they feel like they don't deserve the kills they want a game specifically they're like uh, i mean uncle dane said this in in his in one of his videos right or actually he said similar things in many of his videos like using something like the scorch shot you can get kills but it doesn't feel like you deserve it whereas in this is in his pyro video cuz i was just watching rewatching this to fall asleep last night He's like, "Oh, I don't use the scorch shot cuz it feels like I don't deserve it, but I love the dragon's fury because it punishes me." This is the word he uses. It punishes you when you miss and it rewards you when you succeed. This is a this is literally operant conditioning. Like there's no that is precisely definitionally operant conditioning. People actually enjoy this. They don't get it from some sort of industrial labor anymore. or or anything like this. And I think that's something weird. I don't know what the uh, what the the reasoning for this is. I think, you know, if I had to to come up with something off the top of my head that isn't well thought through, it would be that like it's something to do with um uh like how do I put it? I don't even know. I don't even know. I don't even have the words to explain it. But you know what I mean, right? Like that is in in some sense or or for example, like grinding in video games. Uh like it's something that you wouldn't do on a regularly unless there was some sort of carrot dangling at the end of it, in which case you do the grind. And I'm not saying everyone feels this way, but I just did the grind for the grind. You do the you're you're unusual. but like a lot of people will do the grind which itself isn't necessarily fun in any traditional way because once you do something difficult and achieve the ending that sense of achievement feels good and it, and the harder the grind is the better the sense of achievement you get is even if 
So, like, this is something that byung Cho Han completely doesn't understand about video games. He doesn't think that anyone would ever do something difficult or disciplined in a video game. He, he has no idea, like, he, he has no idea that this exists. He thinks they're just, like, flashing lights with, like, 50,000 things happening all the time. He clearly doesn't know about RuneScape. Um... He, 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 yeah, he, I, I don't know what he would think if he found out about this. He would probably find some excuse as to why that's also bad. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. What I'm saying is there's a lot more nuance here in this subject. There's a bunch of interesting stuff that this kind of critical theory type of guy could analyze, and yet instead, he just, instead of having any sort of nuanced critique or uh, taking a look at the, the psychopolitics of, 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 of any of this, he just sort of is like, it's Labad. It's Labad because it's degenerate. And I don't like that about Byung Chul Han. I think, and it's not just that book. He does this in every book. He do, he always does this. He has some astute observation, and then he's like, he wants to make his theory, like, more profound by making it very broad. And so he'll just bring in, like, a bunch of disparate things that he sees as being sort of representative of modernity like he'll just bring in a bunch of like random shit and and just sort of throw it at the wall and come up with some way to to manipulate it to fit his theory and sometimes he's right a lot of the time he's right but but then he always brings in some bullshit that has that where he just completely i don't know in my opinion just misses the mark i don't know in order to make his theory seem more broad and more important it's very odd to me. So that's my opinion on Byung Chul Han. I've been playing a lot of Pyro recently. <clears throat> and I have thoughts about Pyro. So Pyro is, is kind of weirdly designed. Pyro is extremely unique in pretty much every video game. Like, no, there's not a single other video game I can think of with a weapon that's anything like the the flamethrower. Um, it's very unique to TF2. And within TF2, he's a very unique class. <clears throat> but Pyro is uh, strangely designed. Uh, so, I might even say flawed. Although... Oh, uh, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, so like, <clears throat> the 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 problem is, or the the thing is, that pyro, the 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 flamethrower. Is, uh, it it doesn't actually, do much damage. Like this is something you'll figure out very quickly. He just like you'll start to feel, when playing pyro, is the WM one is not actually a good tactic. Because the flamethrower is not um, particularly powerful uh, compared to other weapons in the game. Like, uh, you're not really doing super high damage, doing particularly good damage uh, by just holding down, you know, M1 and running at people. <coughs> so so you don't have a very, a very good damage dealing weapon or burst damage dealing weapon. You're not particularly good at dealing with groups. Uh, but, or, so you don't have any AoE, you don't have good, like, individual burst damage. Uh, but then you're punished on top of that by having uh, a really short range. So all the other classes that have to get up close in order to do damage. So most classes in TF2 focus on mid-range combat. But there are some, you know, that are close range. Uh, Spy is the obvious one, uh, but Spy makes up for this by, well, firstly, Spy is already the weakest class in the game, so it's not necessarily a good combination, a good comparison, <coughs> but uh, Spy has a bunch of options to get close to enemies, right? You can disguise and cloak. Pyro doesn't have this. And Spy also has the ability to insta-kill anyone with massive damage from a backstab, whereas Pyro doesn't have any of these abilities to get close to enemies, um, and then also doesn't do that much damage even when he is close. Demonite is exactly the same. Demonite has the shield charge, which 
allows you to close the distance on enemies very effectively and then also gives you a crit uh, damage with your melee swing so you're able to do much more damage now again demonite is quite a weak class uh, but you know the place the, the it, it makes sense right he has the mobility option some option to close the distance and then he also has the high damage output this is basically how melee classes work pyro doesn't have that i'll get to it because you're probably thinking in some senses pyro does have that but i'll get to it um it's like stock pyro doesn't have that is what i'm saying uh and then the other class that ideal that, that works best at close range is heavy and heavy um is actually the closest in my opinion to pyro because he doesn't have any particular options to get close to enemies uh, he also relies on ambushing which is also how pyro works uh, but heavy also has the really high dps and is really tanky so you know you can tank a bunch of shots while you're closing the distance or you you know if you pop out behind a corner uh, and you do a bunch of damage so you're going to delete anyone who you catch off guard pyro is very different right because even if you manage to get in close to someone it's still you know you you're not very tanky you you're you're a mid health class uh, and you don't really output that much damage so because of this uh, in order to balance pyro, like the the number one balancing mechanic the pyro has is air blast, because otherwise you would just get absolutely destroyed by any power class. But with air blast, with the ability to reflect rockets and uh, pipes, you actually stand a chance against soldiers and demos. I mean, and huntsmen, snipers, and stuff. But that's less relevant. Uh, Without air blast, you would be fucked. I mean, you would be completely fucked. Uh, because it, not only does it let you reflect the projectiles, but it also lets you juggle enemies, which is, you know, very... Uh, it lets you control the distance of the fight, which is extremely important, because Pyro has such short range. Uh, does this actually balance the class? Well, it's questionable. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of problems with Airblast for good reason, on both sides. Um, is it too easy to just spam mouse 2 and reflect rockets? Quite possibly. There is definite skill to getting reflect kills. Like, if there's no question about it, there is a 100% skill. And the feeling of being in a close range fight with a soldier and perfectly predicting the rocket to get a, like a, a frame 1 reflect a kill is like extremely satisfying it requires being able to read your opponent very well having good game sense having good game knowledge um and it's the same with like reflecting bullets that you actually see coming or reflecting projectiles that you actually see coming you have to st you have to turn into a soldier all of the skills that apply to aiming a soldier apply right tracking movement predicting movement and so on right uh so in that sense, Air Blast is, is skill-based. Um, like, air, that's not the problem. The problem is that it's too... It, the, it's not risky enough to go for. Uh, that you have, like, ten Air Blasts with the stock um, f Flamethrower. And the Air Blast range is fucking way too generous. Like, you can Air Blast projectiles that are behind you. Like, it is, it is way too generous with how wide your sphere of influence is. And, uh, you know, way, you, you, you have way too many options to fuck up. Like, Air Blast should be, like, a final resort. Like, oh shit, I've been a 1v1 I probably shouldn't have taken. Uh, but, like, I, yeah, instead of it being like, okay, you're just dead... It's like, okay, if you can pull off this skill check, you can survive, but it's a, it's a skill check. It shouldn't just be, okay, you just spam the, the fucking mouse too and win. Which is why I am going to say that flank pyro, 
literally fixes every problem with pyro. It is what the class should be, except in one aspect, which I, I have a minor problem with, but it is basically what the class should be because you're using the back burner. Now the back burner has a much higher reflect cost than stock or the degreaser. The back burner, you only get four air blasts and assuming you've used some of your ammo, just like fighting someone, you're probably gonna only have three air blasts. So you better be fucking hitting that timing like perfectly. It is a real skill check. Each air blast actually carries a lot of weight and it makes it feel really rewarding when you actually get it. And if you, it also heavily discourages you from just spamming because if you run out of ammo with your primary, you are dead because your secondary is not going to be, a, I mean, you don't have a shotgun as flank pyro. Uh, so you're probably using the thermal thrust or the decimator, um, which is not going to be able to kill a soldier, <laughs> just on its own, probably. Uh, so you, it really, you know, I think balances air blast properly. Like this is how air blast should have been from the beginning is that it takes a lot of ammo, it's a high risk, high reward thing. Uh, and it's a it's a big skill check. Uh, then the second thing about the back burner is it fixes the problem of Pyro's weapon being weak as fuck. The, py, because Pyro's weapon is weak as fuck, you have to come up with some fancy way to get around this fact. The main way is through combos. Uh, either comboing with a flare for a puff and sting type of situation or comboing with a shotgun like the panic attack to just output higher DPS. Um, the uh, uh, Combo pyro is very fun, or also the axe extinguisher, which I also run as flank pyro. Uh, the axe extinguisher is way too nerfed. Um, and pyro combos are really fun and really rewarding and a good mechanic, but they're not. I mean, I don't have any problem with it. There's no but. That's good. That's a that's a good good way to balance the class. Combos are a good way to balance the class. Uh, but if you want to balance the class without getting into combos, they basically have to give the 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 flamethrower some way to deal more damage. And the two weapons, or I guess the three weapons that do this, are the Dragon's Fury, which just completely changes out the flamethrower for a more traditional projectile weapon that's very unique and interesting, but I suck with it. Uh, the Flog, which is widely hated because it overcorrects, but the Flog works by completely sacrificing Air Blast in order to build crits, and then you can deal out massive damage because crits are crits. But then the back, but the problem with the with the the flog is, or the 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 reason people often don't like it is it can feel like um, it doesn't like getting kills with the flog, but like crit, but like once you've built crits, uh, like they don't require very much skill. You just sort of run at the enemy and just hold down mouse one and wheel your mouse and deal insane amounts of damage. Like normally, if you want to do insane amounts of damage, you have to have insane amounts of skill. Whereas the flog pyro can deal insane amounts of damage uh, by just taking low risk pot shots with the scorch shot for a while um, to build crits. So that's why it doesn't feel very good to, to fight against. Um, Oftentimes, especially if and I don't think the flog is unbalanced by itself, but I think that if you have a pocket medic, Uber flog is is unbalanced, and they should have thought about that when they put it in the fucking game, because like you can you can troll an entire ser server, which is f like a funny meme. Don't get me wrong, but you can see why it's a hated combo, right? It's like you can basically troll and shut down an entire server if you and your friend, you know, go as a uber medic flog pyro combo because, I mean, a pyro running at you with full crits and full uber 
is just under like you can't do anything about it even the regular techniques to shut down uber aren't going to work because if a pyro comes and air blasts you to shut you down you you to get an air blast range like you're going to be critting them to death they, they're not going to survive they, they it doesn't really do anything like you really have basically i mean it's it's the most it's like the very very powerful the nothing more powerful really exists in the game than full crits and full uber and the fact that you don't really have to have a high skill to get that reward is why people find it annoying. Uh, like if it was a situation where it it was really difficult in some way to build crits, I think people would care less. But it's not particularly difficult. I mean, it's not. I'm not saying it's like trivially easy, but like the skill isn't in like aiming <laughs> or like like the the problem is that pyro has too many options to light people on fire without ever putting himself in danger like it would be chill if there was a risk reward part right like if it was like oh well you have to get you have this flaw like on its own in a vacuum the flog is a perfectly balanced weapon because you're sacrificing air blast which is like a massive thing that balances pyro uh and so if you have to like set people on fire and do do fire damage to build crits, and you only have the flog, and imagine all the flare guns don't exist, and the scorch shot doesn't exist, and all of this, then it is a hundred percent balanced because you are taking a massive risk every time you you take a fight with the flog, uh, and so you really deserve the reward of crits for that. But because the scorch shot exists, and you can just go on the other side of the map and set enemies on fire for full afterburn. Uh, it doesn't, you know, and you don't even have to aim the scorch shot properly because it explodes and has an AOE effect. You know, this is why people think it's unbalanced or just not super fun to play against, which I think is perfectly fair. So the flog has its problems, but the back burner has none of these problems because the back burner does, it. it's the same as the stock flamethrower, but it it has the the properly balanced air blast first of all and secondly it has the ability to deal crits but only from behind just like another class which i already said is similar to pyro spy it's like a a halfway you know it's like a, it's like a halfway point between pyro and spy because you're rewarded for sneaking up behind people and you can absolutely just melt heavies with full crits from behind but the the radius from which you deal crits is actually even lower than spies radius like the back hit box for for the back burner is much smaller than the back hit box for the spy spies knives so it definitely requires positioning and skill it requires you know getting behind unsuspecting enemies or in a fight maneuvering yourself to get behind enemies in a similar manner to trick stabbing um so rather than just being rewarded for using the scorch shot from across the map and then wm warning you actually have to like have uh active skill and positioning and aim in order to get that back hitbox to deal crit damage uh it, and it it also you know discourages or disincentivizes players from running away if they're fighting you right because if they if someone turns around to run away from you your face they're now you know their back is facing you so you're you're gonna melt them but it is definitely definitely not overpowered right because it works really well against like in if you manage to position yourself correctly, whatever. But if you're facing, you know, a scout in a one v one or a sentry, you're still fucked. Like you, you, it doesn't make pyro too powerful in any way. It it's it's the perfect balance. It's it it makes pyro like very viable while also you know still being extremely counterable. Um, because unlike Spy, you know, you don't have the disguises and all of these things. So if a team is actually holding down their flanks properly, you, you can't do anything. 
Uh, and then, finally, you know, I said Spy has these options and Demo has these options to close the distance. Well, Pyro's movement options are basically detonator jumping and the thermal thruster. And personally, I've been using the thermal thruster a lot recently. Now, thermal thruster is an excellent addition to Pyro's toolkit. Uh, and I think, well, I used to think it was criminally underrated, but I see more and more people using it th these days now that I'm looking out for it, so I don't actually think it's underrated. Uh, but it's a good trade-off, you know, like you're sacrificing your entire secondary slot, so especially with the air blast ammo <coughs> penalty, like it, it is not even uncommon to just completely run out of ammo and just have nothing you can do except melee someone. Like it is... It is like, it, you know, it's a, it's definitely a good trade-off. Uh, the problem I have with the Thermal Thruster is that it's too easy to use. Like, you just right-click. There's no... It doesn't have the nuance or depth that the other similar movement mechanics in the game have. Like, you know, sticky jumping or rocket jumping. Uh, which is a shame, in my opinion. I think, you know, it might be better if detonator jumping was buffed rather than adding thermal thruster although i'm not sure about that i still like the thermal thruster and it's it has a unique way of moving but it feels cheap in some sense because you just click a button rather than having to learn a skill i mean there is some skill to it but it's not that much it is closer to demo knight's charge than it is to uh rocket jumping or sticky jumping uh because you know the charge is also you just click a button but the charge has a whole bunch of unintended depth to it with trimping and all of i mean you've probably seen the solar light video about the charge like the charge has a whole bunch of jank to it which which produces like a bunch of unintended depth to its mechanics whereas the thermal thruster doesn't have any of that it's just what it does in the tin or it just does what it says in the tin which is a little bit of a shame it would be nice if there was some tech discovered for it that could do something interesting, uh, but there is not. It's also very clunky to use, but uh, I think that's on purpose. I'm not sure why. I mean, maybe it would be overpowered if it wasn't clunky to use, but it is very clunky to use. Uh, I think it could be improved as a weapon or as, a, as an unlocker, uh, but I'm not exactly sure how. Detonator jumping is also, like, good. It's closer to... I mean, I don't know. The self-damage thing, it kind of does a little too much self-damage to be, like, super practical, in my opinion. Maybe not. I'm not sure. I, I haven't, like, super experimented with it. I mean, I have used it a decent amount. Um... But yeah, I, I need to maybe put more time into it before I come down to a full judgment practice. Because it requires skill, unlike the Thermal Thruster. But yeah, this basically balances Pyro. You, you're you actually locked into the close range playstyle, but you have the ability to close the distance and deal stomp damage and stuff. And the back burner balances everything. And you can still do combos with the extinguisher, which is, you know, situate. But instead of it being your main source of damage, it becomes a situational thing, right? Which I'm not saying is necessarily better or worse, but it's interesting to me. All right, those are my thoughts on Pyro. You know what I don't understand about Team Fortress 2? Trick stabs. Not in the sense that I don't understand how to do them, although that is also true. But in the sense that I don't understand how anyone ever falls for them. Or at least how people fall to them to the degree that they seem to. Because it's not like I've never died to trick stabs. I have, and I continue to. It's very rare. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the rarest ways that I die in the game. Like, I would say for every one trick stab, there were probably 80 or so regular deaths to a spy it's extremely rare that i ever died to a trick stab even when i was new to the game it was rare but even now that i'm aware of like what trick stabs are it's even rarer 
when I go on YouTube or even I just watch people in game spies play, people seem to get all sorts of trick stabs all the time. Is it just that being a good spy is super super rare? Or is it that these spies somehow are really good at finding new players? Or am I just particularly good somehow at avoiding trick stabs? Because the thing is, all you have to do to avoid a trick stab is just to learn the basics of what a trick stab is. You're, and then you immediately go, okay, don't chase after a spy up a set of stairs unless you are really confident that you know what you're doing. <laughs> you know, you figure that out like pretty quick. After you get stair stabbed twice, you're going to realize what's going on and you're going to stop doing it. Okay. Same with corners. It's like, okay, if you're chasing after a spy and he goes around a corner, make sure to take that corner wide as fuck, <laughs> you know? Same with certain types of circle strafes. Um, or circle, are they called circle stabs? I don't remember. You know, it's like, if you're running back with a spy, I don't really know how to describe this one in language. It's a little more, more of a complicated setup. Uh, but you figure out how to avoid it. I mean, you avoid it by just being like, if a spy is do is moving around w weirdly, uh, just stand still. <laughs> just stand still. That defeats every trick step. Take your hand off the keyboard. Right? It's, it's so, so easy. Like, that, that defeats everything. They can't do anything. Just take your hand off the keyboard. Like, instinctively. It took me, like, a week to start doing this instinctively when I was when a spy was trying to come at me with you know it just doesn't work like I don't understand how do people not realize this it's like the most basic thing it's like the first thing I learned it's, it's like dealing with spies 101 uh don't show your back to them like what are you talking about how do you get matadored I don't understand like you see the spy I've I've been matadored a couple of times it's happened to me I'm not saying it's never happened, but it's super rare because I have to be like not paying any attention to the game. I have to be like full autopilot. I mean, even auto, it's not even that. Like I have to really fuck up. Like maybe I'm trying to focus on a different enemy or something like extraneous is going on. Like I'm never going to see a spy go one way, turn to face him and then not see the fact that he's turning the other way and, and, and also turn you know, while running forwards. I'm never going to do that. Or like extremely rarely. Because all of my instincts tell me, don't do that, you're going to be showing your back to the spy. You know? I don't know. I've been trick-stabbed. Sometimes, you know, you see a spy player who's cracked. And you can always spot the really good spy players. Because they move in a very particular way. Like, the second that you're on a team or against a team with a good-ass spy player, you will notice them. You will know them the second you see them. Because the way that they move is, like, very, very particular. And so then I'm like, I instantly register that. And I'm just like, okay, don't run after this guy. <laughs> if, if, if I don't have every, like, you know, don't chase this guy around corners or upstairs. Don't get too close to him, you know? It's very obvious. I would say about 90% of the times I die to a spy, it's because they stabbed me when I didn't know they were there, right? They snuck up behind, which is like normal. And then maybe 10%, maybe like 9%, maybe let's go a bit, like 80% is like they stabbed me when I didn't know. 20% or maybe like 15% is, there's probably more than that. It's like maybe 18% is like, they kill me with their revolver. Actually, maybe it's even higher, but you know what I'm saying. Like, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, I'm killed, they don't, I didn't know they were there. Un unsuspecting me. And then, a minority of the time, I know they're there, and they kill me with a revolver. The revolver is a relatively powerful weapon. I was facing a spy who was really good with the, the one that does headshot damage today. Like, I, I, I'm playing pyro, so I'm coming across spies often. And, uh, yeah, this guy was headshotting me, doing well. Shouts out to that guy, good aimer. But in terms of, like, 
trick stabs, it's like a really low number of the amount of times I die to a spy is to a trick stab. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It's happened. I've been stair stabbed. And not just when I was a noob. Like, I mean, I'm still a noob to some extent. But like, you know, recently, relatively recently, these days, within the past, I think I've probably been trick stabbed like once or twice within the past two months. <laughs> you know, it happens. It's just very rare. And I like, but I see people who aren't even like, you know, super cracked spy mains just uploading montages to YouTube, but YouTubers who just are like, people on YouTube who just aren't even spy mains who can just get trick steps all the time. Or people who died to trick steps. I don't, I don't understand it. I'm, I don't understand what's going on. Hey, I wanna, um, by the time this video comes out, this will probably be out of date as a take. This drama will have passed, most likely. Uh, you may not even be aware of this drama if you're not in certain parts of YouTube and the internet. Uh, but the uh, React content drama is, is sparking up again. Uh, because of two independent events happening simultaneously. I'll just fill you in real quick. So one is XQC, who is the biggest Twitch streamer in the world, uploaded on his YouTube channel him doing a reaction which was taken from his live stream to a video by a, a YouTuber called Lemino. And that video was a very high effort over, I think, an hour and a half long documentary. Um, and XQC basically added like nothing to the video. He didn't really comment that much on it. Uh, I think he was like eating through a lot of it. And I think that part of it, he'd left his chair with the video running you know, just left the video running in the background while he wasn't even in the room while he went to pick up his DoorDash delivery. And this sparked some controversy um, because his reaction to the video uploaded to YouTube got, I think, around 200,000 views, which is quite a lot for what is basically a re-upload with him in the corner eating. Um, so that's, that's something that sparked some controversy. And then at the same time, the YouTuber Jax Films also had some drama with the React YouTuber Sniper Wolf. So Sniper Wolf makes pretty terrible TikTok React videos where she just takes people's TikToks, filling one half of the screen with her face, filling the other half of the screen, very clickbait titles and thumbnails, um, and just sort of speaks over the TikToks, but doesn't really add anything, just sort of narrates exactly what's going on. And Jax Films made a few videos calling her out uh, for this, because she is very, very successful doing this, and Jax Films was basically saying, this is terrible content, and what's worse is you're cropping out the names of the TikTok creators, and you don't link to them anywhere in the description or anything, so... Uh, if some, you know, you're basically stealing their content for millions of views, well, these some of these TikToks have only in the hundreds of views. Um, well, you're not really adding anything. So these two things have happened at once and brought uh, some level of backlash or debate about the ethics of reaction streaming. And so I want to put my horse in the game and take the unpopular opinion to defend these people. Um... Because, well, I am somewhat of a copyright abolitionist, uh, but that's not necessary. We don't necessarily have to go that far for this discussion. Um, I think that there's not. I mean, I I don't particularly want to go super in depth into like the nitty gritty arguments about like whether or not. It actually helps or hurts other people when you react to their content or whatever. I want to talk more about some of the broader ethical things. Um, uh, there's a couple of things here. So firstly, React content is generally considered to be low art. right? Like People think it's shitty, low art, common denominator. But it also gets lots of views, right? which is one another reason why it's, it's unpopular. It's popular with children. Um, and it's it's considered to be low effort, and and just generally considered not not high art, not art that takes a lot of a lot of competency or deserves a lot of merit, but low art. Um, what is considered high and low art in any society is often pretty arbitrary. I mean, 
you have to remember at one point literature you know books were considered to be or novels were considered to be a, a like low art uh you know so these things are culturally constructed they they change over time um and i think at this point there are many people who are willing to step up and defend low art uh and just an example of this actually that you might have seen is uh this guy defunct land made a brilliant video about the music on Disney Channel's, like, ident bumpers things. Um, and that's, you know, traditionally, this is low art. Not just in the sense that it is art for the lower classes, because it's not necessarily true in this case. But that it's, you know, it, it's, it's corporatized, it's incidental, um, you know, it's not in an art gallery, it's on TV, it's on a TV program for children, you know, it's con these are not classes that are generally considered to be uh, highly valuable. And the, these sorts of React YouTubers fit into a similar category, but I, and I think that because of this, people have this knee-jerk reaction that this you know, I mean, I imagine there are people listening right now who are thinking, how can you even call this art? Um, but frankly, you know, I don't think it's up to any of us to decide what can or can't be called art. Uh, you know, maybe you're the sort of person who would go to a modern art, contemporary art exhibition and say, well, I could have painted that, but you didn't, did you? Also, give it a try. You might have some fun. Uh, we're, we're kind of beyond we kind of moved a little beyond this this whole paradigm at this point but as a society we're kind of a bit more willing to accept what may count as as art you know and like it or not there's some level of creativity going on here so the next thing is like effort like generally speaking people often value stuff that it takes a lot of effort uh, like I think the big controversy surrounding the XQC video is that Let Me Know's video clearly took like a year to make, it was an extremely high effort video with lots of research, lots of animation and editing and effects and voiceover and script writing, like it's it's a, a whole project whereas XQC's reaction was, you know, just eating it didn't even take really much effort at all but again I don't think effort is a good judge of um, whether art is valid or not uh, so take for example Vaporwave you remember the the original Vaporwave the Macintosh 420 uh, let me see let me get it up um, this this one floral shop right You remember this song, right? This is a fucking classic. This is an all time to, to our generation, you know, this is considered an all time classic. It, it had a large part in birthing an entire art movement, you know, multimedia cross platform art movement, maybe like one of the defining art movements of our generation. Um, and it's, it's got a powerful mental image and association in our heads. And it was very influential, but not only that, it in itself is a powerful art piece, you know. It's a commentary on uh, the, the failed dreams of 80s capitalism and, um, you know, the... the uh, I've heard people say it sounds like an empty mall, you know, these sorts of things, right? There's, there's a lot to say in this track. It's not... But it's also just a slowed down Diana Ross song. Right? Like, it is just taking someone else's song. I mean, it probably would take five minutes to, to make this. You just download the song. You didn't have to pay a licensing fee or anything. You just download the song, which you can do in a, a minute, drag it into a, a, an audio editing program and slow it down, and that's it. You know, he looped it, that's it. It doesn't take very long at all. It's extremely low effort. I'm sure Diana Ross put a lot more effort and time and money into the original song, then Macintosh Plus put into uh, the, the 
flow shop version of the song. And yet, the flow shop version of the song is an entirely different artwork than the original. It is, you know, it the, the Diana Ross that had no idea that the song she was making would ever be a commentary on the lost dream of 80s hypercapitalism. It simply wasn't there. It's something completely different. So effort isn't really a good judge, in my opinion. Um, and even quality isn't a good judge of whether art is valid or not. Uh, as an example, you know, I, I, I hope I'm not alone in thinking this. Lots of places will have sort of local community theatre, and it invariably sucks ass. Uh, like, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. It's a bunch of terrible... Th- it's terrible. It always sucks. But I think that we also all kind of agree that there's something important about keeping that alive. That it doesn't matter if the art is bad. Like, what's important is allowing these people to have their their outlet to express themselves. And that this interaction in culture, if it's something that makes them happy, it doesn't really matter what we think of the result. Because it's kind of the process that matters here. You know? So, really, none of the common critiques... I mean, the other critique or uh, about the sort of nitty-gritty uh, matters of fact, whether it takes away audience from the original video and the matter of payment and money, which um, it's just quite hard to find orig- to find data for, first of all. And secondly, uh, it almost certainly is going to vary significantly from video to video. I do have some arguments in defense of that as well. But it's not really what I'm interested in saying right now. Um, it's like, from the, away from the sort of matters of fact into the more like abstract philosophical stuff, I don't think that there's any solid arguments that this is invalid as a form of art. Um, I, it, it seems to me that every criticism has it. I feel like I've rebutted it fairly well. Uh, now, if I want to get into the nitty gritty, it's kind of the same argument that you could make in favor of... Oh, I will say one more thing, actually, before I get into that, which is... uh, I think a lot of people are going to use the word theft or stealing. Uh, And quite... I mean, just quite simply, that is not taking place, because copying is not theft. The original is still there, no one stole it. No one was denied access from the original. Therefore, it isn't theft. There is no definition of theft that it fits under, unless you want to talk about the legal construct that is intellectual property. Uh, but, you know, morality and legality aren't the same thing, and we're not making a legal argument here. Uh, and outside of legal arguments, intellectual property doesn't really make any sense to talk about because it's not something that exists. It doesn't really hold any value in itself. Uh, so, yeah, not, copying isn't theft. That's like a number one thing to keep in mind here. I don't like it when people call this sort of thing theft because it's not. It's just sharing. There's no, you know, there's a reason if someone takes my apple, right? I don't have an apple. So I'm like fucking pissed because, my God, I wanted to eat that apple. This guy just fucking stole it. What a bastard. Right? But if I have a, a, a JPEG of an apple and some, someone copies it, it doesn't really matter. I still have my JPEG of an apple. It doesn't take any resources, really. Like any, any resources it takes to copy a JPEG are negligible. So it's like it, in no like concrete way does it have any of the same effects as theft. In terms of money and exposure, um, I think that there. this is like probably the best argument from the other side, but I also don't think it's particularly valid. So uh, it's a similar argument uh, in favor of piracy, which is the idea that everyone who, like let's say with a video game, right? That like everyone who pirated your game would otherwise have bought it, which is just plainly not true. There are many people who would never, like, I mean, me included, 
Like, I would just never play various games if I didn't pirate them first. You know, I would I would have been like, well, that game looks interesting, but fuck paying 60 quid for it. That's way too much money, you know, because I don't have I don't I didn't grow up buying games for six, you know, for that much money. So I'm, it's not like conditioned into me that that's how much a game is worth. So I'm just not doing it. I'm not spending a bunch of money on something only to find out it sucks. Fuck that. I mean, I know Steam has a refund policy, which I will use because it's more convenient than looking up a torrent first. But if that's not an option. You best fucking bet. Because I don't want to pay money for something that might suck. You have no, like, you just simply, it's very hard to, to, you know. The idea that, well, if if that option hadn't been available, if the option to watch the Let Me Know video on XQC's channel wasn't there, then those people, those 200,000 people or whatever, would have all gone over to Let Me Know's channel to watch it. I think isn't true because um, Let Me Know is an extremely successful channel. That video had, uh, last time I checked, 7 million views. Uh, I could check again. Oh my god, what the fuck? I forgot how to type. Okay, it's 5.7 million views. I was a little off, <laughs> like a couple million. But it has, like, you know, this is a lot of views. This is this is a, a definitely a high view video, and he has five point twelve million subscribers. So it's safe to say that most of the people who would have found Lemino's video already did, because this is like you know an extremely high view count for a YouTube video. Um, and since the video is like an hour and a half long, uh, you're probably not gonna watch Lemino's video and then. Uh, what I'm saying is, it, there's no real evidence that any, um, you know, potential customers or potential viewers were taken away because you don't know how many of the people that decided to watch XUC's version instead of the original would have ever even bothered to watch the original if it wasn't for the fact that XUC was there. Um, so yeah, I mean that's pretty much the fallacy. But even if you assume I mean, even if you assume it to be the case, right? Like, let's take, say, with Sniper Wolf, right? Because Sniper Wolf, I think, is, is one of the, you know, very egregious. Not many people want to defend her because her content is bad. Like, her videos are very bad, and I don't like watching them. They make me very, they make me cringe a lot. They're not very entertaining to me. However, I do defend that it's like community theater, right? Where I, I defend its right to exist. I think it's, people have a right to express themselves. Even if I don't think that what they make is very interesting, or that, even if I think it sucks, uh, which is you know one of the, now I do think Sniper Wolf should credit people. I, I think that's the thing she did go wrong. I'm not going to argue that it's okay just to take people's you know to re-upload people's videos in a reaction and not credit them. I think credit should be important, um, but uh, you know imagining if she did. Uh, there's an argument that, like, well, some of these Sniper Wolf videos, they get millions of views. Meanwhile, the individual TikToks are sitting at just a few hundred. Um, which is just a very strange argument to me, because I think that very clearly shows that no one was interested in watching the TikTok in its original context. That Sniper Wolf is providing some sort of value simply by recontextualizing the video. Even if she didn't, even if she didn't talk over it at all, she's a curator. Uh, and that's the that's what people come to her for, not even necessarily for her reactions, but for the cu the curation aspect of it. Um, and it's the same for XQC probably. Is that these react channels? They don't just exist to show the streamer or the person's reaction itself, but also as a form of curation. That uh, these are people who the or their audience trusts to watch good videos, um, and. You know that's why they're coming to them. You know, I I think if YouTube, you know, I don't know if you remember, but there used to be this reply video feature on YouTube back in the day. I think that YouTube could easily implement something similar to the point where uh, someone could upload, you know, a reaction which would basically be an overlay over the original video and maybe do something more equitable with advertising shares, 
between those videos. Um, that would be nice, but uh, uh, that's a, a problem with YouTube, not a problem with the React streamers. Uh, you can't blame the random participants in an unjust system that the un that the system is unjust. Um, I mean, it's it's sort of like why does YouTube pay its creators in the first place? It's not because they're nice or kind. It's because it's good for YouTube. It's because it cements YouTube as the premier video hosting service on the internet. Because you upload here, we'll literally pay you. And then we pay you, you get more budget to make bigger videos that keep people on the website longer because they're higher budget, Mr. Beast, dog shit. You know, people people want to stick around for that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a win-win for everyone involved. And I think... Except it isn't really a win-win. You know, the idea that... I don't know. I'm responding to a point that I only barely remember from a video that I only barely watched. So I'm just going to stop, actually. <laughs> uh, anyway, I hope I've made a reasonable defense here. Um, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people throw around this word transformative. Um, but, you know, I would argue that this is actually something I've, I've, I've made the point of before. Right? So like me, you know, I'm, I make music. Let's say I was to take uh, a Beyonce album. Let's say I, I was to take a Beyonce album and I were to just re-upload it exactly bar for bar on my Bandcamp page with the same, you know, everything exactly the same. Same cover, same titles, same exact music. I didn't change anything. I just re-uploaded it online. By the very nature of me doing that, I've already changed the meaning of the work because I've changed the context. Now, it isn't just a Beyonce album, it's like, well, why did this guy re-upload it? What's he trying to say by doing this? Is he just trolling? Or does he have something to say about the nature of copyright? Is this like a plunder phonics thing? Is this a collage thing? Like, what's he trying to talk about here? Or, you know, wh why would he do this? You're asking a bunch of questions that had nothing to do with the original intent of the art. And so immediately, you're, that's transformative. So even a direct one-to-one -one copy changing nothing fits is transformative, in my opinion. In fact, even if two people watch the same thing, it's transformative because they're bringing their own experiences and interpretations to the work. There's no such thing as art that isn't transformative. Everything is transformative. It's a nonsense phrase. Some people say transformative means it can't act as a substitute for the original work. Um, but that doesn't really make any sense to me. I mean, there's there's an argument to be made about the legal rights of people. You know, in that case, sure, whatever. Um, I personally am in support of a... Uh, probably some sort of socialized entertainment industry um, which is I don't think people really think about very much like people talk about socialized healthcare right that's for the most common one we have many you know even in America you guys have many socialized industries like USPS that's socialized mail right or um you might have a metro system that's run by your local government that's socialized transport. Um, and obviously, in UK, we have socialized medicine. Um, it, to me, it's not that wild to say that there should be a socialized entertainment industry, at least maybe in part, uh, that you know maybe artists should receive some sort of dividend from the government because the old school methods of selling art don't really make sense in the digital economy. But this is kind of beyond the scope of what I'm arguing here. Uh, there's some ongoing developing controversy. Um, and this is beyond my pay grade. Okay, this is not... This is some, some deep science shit. Beyond my fucking pay grade. I'm just trying to understand it. Uh, but there is some ongoing controversy 
regarding this paper, Chen et al. 2023, Psychosocial Functioning in Transgender Youth After Two Years of Hormones. Um, and the, the, the controversy or discussion going on here is that there's really not that much research into the effects of but the okay so let me let me just clarify this uh this is specifically about what happens when you give hormones to teenagers does it actually improve outcomes short term which in this case is like you know within a few years because so far as i can tell the consensus has been when it's an adult you do whatever the fuck the adult wants. If they if they have con informed consent, it's all good, right? That's generally been the case when it comes to transgender adults. When it comes to teenagers, um, no one's really giving teenagers hormones. It's a pretty rare thing, and uh, surgery is even more rare. It's like extremely, extremely rare. Generally speaking, uh, most people will prescribe puberty blockers, and even that is like relatively rare. Uh, until like later puberty uh, or later teenagers you wouldn't even be discussing hormones until someone was like at least 17 just to clarify like this is it's not like this is a study where people are like oh we've been giving hormones to teenagers it turns out they're all going to kill themselves like no one's been doing that so it's people have generally been acting with caution but the trend has been towards like you know the uh, we might end up doing this at some point in a few years. However, this study, so the controversy with this study is that the conclusion in the paper, the written conclusion, states that uh, uh, these hormones improved appearance, congruence, and psychosocial functioning, right? That they, that they were basically all good. Uh, but the actual data in the paper doesn't seem to support this. It doesn't seem to show any particular positive improvement for uh, after two years of adolescence on hormones. Now, when it comes to the long-term effects of um, hormones in adolescence, there's simply been no studies on it. No one knows. Um, and this study isn't great either. It doesn't have a placebo group. It doesn't have a control group. You know, it's it, it's not perfect. Um, it's 315 transgender and non-binary petition participants aged 12 to 20. 60% um, trans masculine. Uh, uh, yeah. So the, there's there's a graph. If you want to look this up yourself... Uh, you can find it with some searching. And what I would particularly... Well, what I see as being identified as a problem is figure 2C, I believe. Um, or was it figure 2B? Um, yeah, I believe it was figure 2B, where the T-score for positive effect between... Uh, GAH, which is gender affirming hormones, initiated in early puberty. The line for, I mean, it doesn't seem to, I mean, I don't know. Listen, I don't understand this. This is like some statistical analysis that is beyond my pay grade. I, I read this. Um, they failed to, sh basically, there's, there's, there, there's not like, it's not that they hurt. Like, this study doesn't show in any way that it worsened mental health outcomes. No one's saying that. But that, you know, when you give someone hormones, it does, like, sterilize them and have... I mean, that's the main effect. And that, generally speaking, the consensus has been it's probably going to turn out to be better uh, to do this because the adverse effects of not doing it outweigh the harms of doing it but if this study if similar studies to this come out you know it would seem that giving people gender affirming hormones in early puberty uh 
if it doesn't have that much of an effect on mental health outcomes, if it doesn't really reduce suicides um, or anxiety and depression symptoms and so these sorts of things, then maybe the 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 risks outweigh the benefits, right? The the negative side effects could turn out to be worse. Again, no one's saying that this should apply to adults. Adult, every psychiatrist is in agreement that adults should be able to do whatever you know they can, if they can inform consent. This is about teenagers specifically. Um, I don't know. This is an interesting thing to me. Uh, I I don't know if this is really making it out of uh, a niche a relatively niche, you know, community, because this is not some turf, right? The, 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 I found out about this because this is a, a post by someone, there's a very, very long and detailed, and I say very long, it is, I think, the longest Reddit post I've ever read. It is really long on r slash medicine um, by someone who says they are a child and adolescent psychiatrist with a... Uh, 10 years at least of experience uh, they have a lot of experience and they're not a turf they're a leftist whatever they're just trying to like it's just an in if you go into the comments it's just like an actual like talking shop discussion between people in this field not politicized at all just like talking about treatment options in terms of patient health okay um so that's the setup. That's the setup that I want to introduce, right? So you have this paper that comes out, and it's not just that one. There's also another one that showed something similar, uh, which I haven't actually looked into this other one. It's Tordoff 2020. I haven't looked into this paper, so uh, I'm not going to talk about it. But there, there, there really isn't... Um, uh, ...much evidence for short-term mental health benefits from gender-affirming hormones that outweigh the risks. Um, and that that this stuff should be held to the same standard of evidence as any other form of medicine. That's what the, the Reddit post basically argues. Now, me, someone untrained in the fields of psychiatry and science in general, will now weigh in on this. Uh, because I don't think this is the sort of thing that you're going to be hearing about in the wider world. I mean, unless some, it'll be terrible if some right wing or turf press picks up on this. It's going to be fucking awful if these guys find out about this shit because they are going to manipulate what is right now a reasonable discussion into something just horrid. Uh, so yeah, I will weigh in on this in terms of. You know, I don't, I I feel like generally speaking, maybe I'm wrong, maybe Dots might, do you want to wait, hey Dots, hold on, I've got to message them on Discord for them to pay attention to me, because they have headphones on. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you for, to, for weigh in on something as a tran? Sure. What, did, what is the general vibe in the trans space what is the consensus on uh hormones for teenagers and adolescents um i mean if they're only keeping hormones for adolescents no matter what that's the general vibe i mean like if you're not, if you're not a teenager you don't have hormones in your placing right that's that's what puberty does i mean we're talking about from anywhere between ages like 12 to 20. I mean, why not? What do you mean? Um, well, ge generally the consensus, or I don't know if, the, if this is the consensus, but essentially medical data shows that after you have hit puberty, like, and you identify as transgender, that's not going to change. Yeah, I mean, that's what I've seen too. That's what the data shows. Like, yeah. I'm I'm the reason I bring it up is because I'm I I've there's this paper, Chen et al. 2023. Let me go over towards you so the mic will pick you up. Chen et al. 2023, and it's basically 
um, an analysis of uh, gender affirming hormones for adolescents. And even though the conclusion written in the paper says that it showed that it was good, if you actually look at the data in the paper, I mean, it shows no. At uh, uh, 12 to 20. It, it was a whole group of people, 12 to 20, followed up two years. I mean, that doesn't mean anything. Well, well it was 300 or so people. From I th- 12 no, to 20. was it 12 to 20? I, I should fucking go check. Hold on, I have it up. 12 to 20 is a completely yeah. useless age group. Like, I don't think you can draw any significant conclusions from something that broke. I mean, I think that's pro- that's a pretty valid criticism. Um, but the the thing that's interesting about the paper is specifically that even though the, the conclusion claims that it showed positive results, yeah. if you actually look at the, the raw data, it basically shows like zero outcome on, like, there was no difference between people who had gender affirming hormones in adolescence and people who didn't in terms of mental health outcomes. It didn't seem to have any real effect um, uh, over the, uh, after two years. in terms of suicides or depression or anxiety or any of these sorts of things. Um, and so people are debating, not, you know, random people, but psychiatrists yeah. are debating like, well, you know, we're sterilizing people here. Uh, obviously, if it's an adult with informed consent, then they can do whatever they want. But if it's a teenager, like, do the risks outweigh the benefits? I mean, the risk being sterilization is literally nothing. If that's a risk being discussed, the doesn't mean anything to you. Well, yeah, it doesn't mean anything to you. But, like, you can imagine as a medical professional, you might be concerned. I mean, as, a, as a medical professional, sterilization shouldn't be your primary concern. Well, that's considered a significant harm. I mean, that is considered a significant harm, but it shouldn't be. Well, I mean, what do you mean? Like, being sterilized isn't, like, a, an objective heuristic on your quality of life. See, I think I think you're right about that. This yeah. is basically what I was gonna say. Is I was gonna go, so, I I think we're gonna probably see more and more studies that are similar to this. Yeah. Um, and not just in terms of adolescence. I think there's gonna be more and more studies from psychiatrists, that show that. I mean, the thing is, though, is like, two years of HIV case later, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't do anything. It's incredibly overstated and overblown, and you're. If you're transgender and if you're an HRT, you're probably not going to see anything change until like four years or something. Yeah. Well, there's there's no um, data on the long-term <coughs> effects, so that's why we're... Yeah. Uh, Short-term effects on this stuff doesn't, don't really matter anyways. Interesting. Like, uh, until you have timelines of like five, six years, I don't even consider the data to be useful when it comes to like quality of life. Because if you're an HRT for two years, that's essentially the same thing as being an HRT for zero years doesn't really yeah change. but well okay if 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 you're talking I'm playing devil's advocate here because I agree with you yeah. but if you're talking from a medical perspective just treating HRT as a medicine yeah. if you don't have any data reliable data on the long-term effects of a medicine but you do know for sure that the short-term effects are negligible and it causes what you define as significant harm you can see why someone would be skeptical to prescribe like if you're uh, treating yeah, HRT yeah. Yeah, as but that, that relies on having completely fucking ass backwards definitions, and I'm not gonna respect that to dignify that. I don't. I, I don't think treating sterilization as negative is an ass backwards definition. It is kind of an ass backwards definition. Why? Because it doesn't it's, affect people's quality of life. Well, it's. Uh, I mean, if you're looking at it from a scientific perspective. It's uh, you know interrupting a process that your it, it's it's there's a there's something that your body is supposed to do, and you're just you yeah, know but, destroying your body's ability to do yeah, that. Yeah, but going into it with the mindset that your body is supposed to do anything. Yeah, I mean I agree with you. Not to make me ignore anything you say after that. Yeah, but this is the that like what I'm saying is like imagine if it was a different medicine for something else that was severe like let's say yeah. some sort of illness like I don't know. I mean. Cancer. Let's say there was a thing that treated bipolar and caused sterilization, right? Yeah, it's called HRT. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, if there was a cure for bipolar that would sterilize you, right? Yeah. How many bipolar people would be like, oh, you know, I, I've considered the risks and rewards and I'd rather be bipolar and be able to have kids? Probably like 60% or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. But there's still 
of a population that's predominantly heterosexual, right? Mm -hmm. There's 40% of them that would be like, yeah, you know, I would take not being able to have kids to not have bipolar. Yeah. Right. So when we extend that to the I think that's a very tension, important thing is to, to note that it's, it's kind of like, it's not saying you can never raise children because yeah. everyone can adopt. Yeah. Right. And also, like, no one would make this argument to say, like, oh, well, if we catch someone who's gay in puberty, we have to do everything possible to stop them from being gay, because yeah. if they're gay, they won't have kids. So, if you look at the transgender population, right? Yeah. About half of them are, by the definition of their birth gender, right? Yeah. They're homosexual. Yeah. About half of them. About, like... Or, I mean, it, it's... There's way more bisexuals. Well, I'm saying it's, it's like a 50-50 split between exclusive homosexuality and like heterosexuality, bisexuality, and mm -hmm. so on, right? And when you look at the heterosexual trans people, right, after they transition, they're going to be essentially lesbians, right? Yeah. So either you're fucked from the start, right? Yeah. You, you transition, you end up in a heterosexual relationship with a man, right? Yeah. You can't have children anyways. Yeah. You transition... You end up in a homosexual relationship with a woman. Having kids at that point is like, oh shit, do essentially lesbians who could have reproductive yeah, yeah, I know what you're trying to say. Yeah. Capabilities, right? Like to to me, ignoring those dem like biological demographics, right? That essentially say like, hey, like this sterilizing this specific group of people is a massive medical concern for their quality of life, right? Like that doesn't make any sense because first of all, heterosexual groups, right? for who have severe mental health issues would probably accept sterilization in large quantities. I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but well, I agree with the rest of your argument. Like, I mean, if you, if you could have a bipolar method with sterilize, you would take it. No, I wouldn't take it. Why not? Well, I mean, I don't really care about being st sterilized because yeah. I don't plan on having kids. Like, but if that I was the really negative side effect. I don't want to take any... I don't really want to take a bipolar med, just in general. It's not really relevant. I mean, <laughs> I'm, quite, I'm okay being bipolar. It's not a problem for me. I don't want to medicate it. It's not a problem for you? No, it's not a problem for me. I'm fine with it. Wait, what? It's a, to me, it's a fundamental part of my, my personality. Like, it would feel like I'm... I've spent so long learning coping mechanisms and, like, adjusting to living in a cycle where it's like okay sometimes you're going to be really able to do stuff and too much stuff and sometimes you're not going to be able to do anything I mean, and the, the yeah. entire rhythm of my life is kind of based around those cycles that makes sense. to take that away like I, I don't really have much interest in taking that away i mean you saw me before i was medicated like, yeah i was intolerable yeah i have i mean I, my depression is uh, like i should clarify my depression is nowhere near as severe as it used to be which is also yeah, a big yeah, yeah, significant yeah. factor in this like i don't get super suicidal anymore so, I mean, if I was actively really suicidal when I was depressed, instead of just, like, you know, incredibly lethargic and unable to do anything. I mean, I do occasionally get suicidal, but it's very rare. Yeah. It's not, it's only ideation, you know, previously yeah, had yeah, been, yeah. like, actually planning and stuff, or attempts. So, like, if it was back then, I think I would have... For anxiety, it might be different, though. Mm -hmm. I might take a drug that would sterilize me to stop my anxiety. Yeah. I think I probably would actually. Yeah. Yeah. Anxiety is way more debilitating for me than bipolar because I don't have it that bad. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, like, essentially it's the same thing. Honestly, I might, maybe I should, now that this is not really related yeah. to what we were talking about, but maybe I should be downgraded to cyclothemia or whatever because yeah. my bipolar is much less severe than it no, used I mean, to be. No, I'm still bipolar too, by all definitions. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you had cyclothemia, you wouldn't get manic, really. I see. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, cyclothemia is just... Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I wouldn't get hypomanic. Yeah. But, uh, um, but yeah, well, essentially what I'm saying is if, if you're treating a population group that doesn't have a choice other than not to be homosexual by some definition yeah. and you sterilize that group, like, yeah... With it, consent. With consent, obviously with yeah. consent. Without yeah. consent, that would, it, be, that would be evil. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, at that point... There's, there's no objective heuristic downsides. Yeah. The objective heuristic downsides that exist in that situation is whether or not the homosexual couples can adopt. Yeah, okay. uh, so my, my, my like devil's advocate counter argument to this would be I completely agree with you and I think everyone does when it comes to uh, adults. But when it comes to, let's say, uh, a 15-year-old, can we really be sure that they know 
that like in 20 years they're not going to get really upset that they can't have kids or maybe even if you don't want to talk about that aspect there are other aspects of hormone therapy that I, I'm not I mean, certain like, on but. a 15 year old is like such a corporate argument right because a 15 year old by any standard is either right above any type of colour right below any type of colour right so that's where that's where the grey area starts if you start talking about 14 year olds right you have two hardline senses right Either 14-year-olds are children or 14-year-olds can make informed decisions. 14-year-olds are adults if they've had their bar mitzvah. Yeah. <laughs> so, if, if, if you're talking about people younger than 15 or older than 15, right, I can have a hard line sense. 16-year-olds should be able to choose whatever the fuck they want. 16-year-olds are functional adults by any metric in any functional society. Yeah. If you're, if you're and Americans about, are going to think this is yeah. retarded, by the way. Yeah, but no, Americans this is literally... Yeah, have a functional society. Yeah. Right? No, in every, like, normal country, this is how... This is just yeah. the, the case. Yeah, 16-year-olds are functional adults in every normal society. Yeah. Right? I mean, look, if we... What if we just said that, like, the ability to consent, to, like, medical consent should be... It should just match the age of consent in whatever country it is. I mean... Sure, but then you get into the arguments of parents controlling children and stuff like that. Like it's like that. That has not gonna fix right. That can't be like if that was a thing in a vacuum, maybe it could make sense. You would get a bunch of people like flying to Spain to transition at fourteen. Maybe, maybe like like if it didn't have any knock on effects, maybe you could like make that type of argument. But I I don't think that argument works in the yeah. context of like you know. I th- I think you've made a very good point here, which kind of builds into what I was going to say, yeah. which is that like fundamentally, this is like, this is all limited to the psychiatric point of view, where everything is seen as a pathology, and those pathologies are really just embodiments of like, some sort of normative morality, which is like a very Foucault thing to say, right? Like history of madness type thing, like what you said about, uh, like you know how this is all kind of heteronormative and even hey dare i say it patriarchal in the sense that like a woman's job is to reproduce right and that's her main source of value like seeing that as like something super important um that like this is basically handing down some idea of like some moral judgment as a clinical judgment which is what like most of psychiatry is really based on yeah um, and that, like, I hope that this is the beginning of a broader trend in the trans movement to become a little more skeptical. I mean, trans people are already pretty skeptical of psychiatry because they tend to be mistreated. But, uh, you know, less yeah. less pointing to a psychiatric authority as the be-all and end-all of truth. But, yeah, uh, it's like, should, should a 14-year-old be able to take HIV, right? If that's a, if that's a question being asked. Yeah. I think, theoretically, yeah, practically, there are more complications in that regard. So, like, I, I think as, lo- as long as, like, transgender healthcare is medicalized by necessity, right, as it is right now, mm-hmm. if a 14-year-old goes online, buys HRT from whatever online website there is and takes it, I think that's perfectly okay. I don't think there's right. any single problem I mean, with it. I, I, again, this is about it being medicalized. That's the fundamental that's the fundamental problem is yeah. that you're looking at it as a as i mean this is probably a controversial stance yeah. in the like liberal spheres but like this is not like if the argument is not about mental health outcomes in a study yeah. and psychiatry if that's like saying oh well the studies show that a lot of people regret their tattoos so yeah. like should we ban tattoos it's <clears throat> like in in reality i think this is just a uh a matter of bodily autonomy and so- yeah. sovereignty over your own form. So, if, if, if the question is, should 14-year-olds be medicalized into transitioning, I think wait a year, wait two years. Right. That's my... That's I mean, I can, I can probably agree with you. At, like, I, I haven't... I've seen conflicting information about, like, puberty blockers and how harmful or harmless um, they are. They're not harmless. Pe- anyone who says that they're harmless is... Delusion. Yeah, I, I that's basically what I've seen. But they're I think they're relatively harmless. I like, think um regular HRT is more harmless by objective heuristics, but like <clears throat> it's like regular HRT, like if you choose to de- de-transition, right, 
take a letter is your case more harmful essentially right so it's it's a question of like um how how relevant do we find these if these transition is right yeah and i think i mean maybe the maybe i'm taking a hot take here yeah but i think we're gonna find that a lot of the future detransitioners are gonna be ftms who transitioned at like 14 or whatever maybe i'm crazy i mean no that's totally true right and yeah. uh, like testosterone is a much harder thing to reverse because it's a more powerful hormone i mean mm, that's just what i've heard i mean sure but like es- essentially if you choose to detransition up of testosterone or estrogen right mm-hmm. what you can end up with in medical terms is either gynecomastia or excessive facial hair growth or um, whatever right essentially essentially yeah. Like, those are the side effects you're essentially going to have if you choose the teeth transition of a regular HRT. If you choose the teeth transition of a puberty blockers, right, what you're going to end up with is just slight retardation <laughs> compared to your <coughs> yeah. other, like, and, and other medical issues of that kind, right? Like, mild medical issues that can affect, like, yeah. anyone. It would be the same as if you just had a late puberty or yeah, similar. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. And when, the thing, so when contrasting that... With outcomes for people who don't choose to detransition, right? Yeah. Purity blockers are entirely more harmful in every well, single way. Well, the thing is, no one knows what the outcomes are for people who don't don't detransition long term. There has there's never been a reliable study on this because it's always been such a rare thing. Yeah. And um, only recently has it you know been. More... I mean, there there are still very few people who like detransition because they want to detransition. Yeah. Most people with transition, they transition out of necessity. Right. Yeah. But that what I'm saying is, there's a there's it's, it's there there simply is like the stuff that you just said from a medical perspective that like oh it's it's just better to let these people transition as a default. Yeah. There's there's not any evidence short term or long term that it actually is better. Like generally speaking, the medical, like in any medical field the guidance is always going to be like no treatment over treatment, right? It's always better to not treat something if you don't have to because any intervention is going to have side effects. I mean, that's true. Yeah. And so if you're seeing data which either doesn't exist, so you have no evidence to show that something helps, mm-hmm. or shows that the, you know, any help is negligible, then from a medical perspective, the standard would be don't treat because it doesn't seem to do anything. I mean, yeah, but we all know that that's retarded. Well, the, this is the f- the flaws of, um, you know, this whole thing being medicalized. Yeah. And I can imagine some people listening to this would be would, might be thinking like, well, what do you mean medicalized? Like, if people, if there's no reports of improvements in people's lives, then no one should do it. But it's like, these, this sort of scientific categorization of the human experience can simply never actually capture people's real lives. This is the entire problem. This is why all of those French people in the 70s got mad at psychiatry. Because, like, this is literally, like, this idea that you can take the scientific approach of categorizing the natural world and then just directly apply that to human thought is a is a leap in logic that, or humans in general you know it comes with some side effects it comes with this missing out on uh some of the you know metis um and like fundamentally it's the same as my tattoo example you know if you showed the people who get tattoos you know, maybe they maybe they experience like some slight happiness from their new tattoo at first, and they sort of forget about it, and it doesn't really have much of an effect on their life. But like one in ten people who get a tattoo maybe come to really deeply regret that tattoo and have to go through the expensive and painful procedure of removing or covering it up. From a scientific perspective, maybe one in ten is too high, but you know, from a scientific perspective you would immediately say, oh, we have to ban tattoos because, like, the the benefit is just simply not worth the risk. But that's that would be completely missing the point because you simply can't quantify 
human freedom <laughs> in terms of psychiatric metrics like that. That's, uh, I don't know, that's my opinion. Do you, am I, am I, you think I'm on the right track there? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, it, like, in reality, the idea that, like, transition even constitutes, I mean, I, I agree that, that when it comes to, you know, very young people, it's yeah, a gray I mean, like, area. If, if you're only, like, 12, 13, right, you haven't gone through puberty, there's no data that shows that transitioning other than socially at that age has any benefits yeah. or has any merit, right? The data isn't there for that specific use case. So no one is arguing for that specific use case. What people are arguing when it comes to like trans children, right, essentially under the ages of like 12, 13, is that social transition is a perfectly reasonable yeah, thing to do. Yeah, that's right? pretty much, that was also the only thing I've ever heard. Yeah. And then when it comes to like, maybe like 14 years old, maybe puberty blockers. Yeah, I, I just think like, like when I was 14, right, the choices I had was either go on the internet and order a restriction or go on puberty blockers, right? Yeah. I'm not going to go on puberty blockers when given that choice. Because that would be retarded of me to do. Because first of all, they have more negative side effects given that I know that I'm going to be transgender in 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. Than ordering estrogen would. Yeah. Right? There's definitely people who aren't you, though. There are definitely people There who are many are. people who are very... The, the scientific term is social contagion, which is a very nasty sounding, you know, way to phrase it. Yeah, I, I don't care about them. You, you just let them die? Or <laughs> they're not going to die, but... Like, if, if you go through, like, fucking years of effort to transition, right, and after that you're like, oh, you know, I, I, I used to take a pill every single day, every single morning, right, and now, now I regret choosing to do that every single yeah. day, right? To me, you're retarded. You don't matter. <laughs> because it's not something that you do, like, as an officer. Yeah. It's, it's not... something that you have, to, you have to do perpetually for yeah, years. You, well, there's an argument to be made. Because those sorts of... There's also, um, especially as I understand it, yeah. in FTMs, there's um, a link between BPD and being transgender I don't FTM. Know. I don't really know. And these sorts of people are more likely to be a bit, you know, not very good at making long term judgments about themselves. Uh, I, I, I may have to make on that. Like, what, what I can say, right, is if you choose to transition, there isn't the. Yeah, it yeah. takes a long time. You have to consistently choose to do it. Yeah. And, like, yeah, you're not. It's, it's not. Like, one day you wake up and you're like, I wish I was a boy, and then two days later you've got a penis sewed onto you. Yeah. You know, there's many years of this. Yeah, and I mean, the, the argument against, like, informed consent from these PPD transitioners, essentially, right, um, is that they go into a psychiatric institution, they say they have gender dysphoria, they get prescribed with testosterone, right? And that's, that's essentially their, their problem with the system, right? when instead they should have gotten, like, psychiatric assessments. Right. But, like, the thing is, that being the case, it's only true in, like, two places in the world. Yeah, right? it's, it, firstly, it's very unusual that that's yeah. the case. But secondly, um, I mean, they're well, wrong. Yeah, but, but <laughs> what, what they're actually they're talking about is they went to a psychiatric facility right yeah they lied at every single turn yeah at every single psychiatric assessment and then after that they got prescribed testosterone yeah that's actually reality that they're describing it's like what happened is uh, like if you were writing an important document and then you went to press x out of microsoft word and then microsoft word put up a pop-up that said you haven't saved are you sure you want to leave without saving and yeah. then you clicked yes leave without saving then you were like, what the fuck, Microsoft? I'm suing yeah. you because you deleted my document. It's kind of like that. Yeah. Like, what I'm arguing for here is the exact system that allows these people to lie and get their way. Because, you know, psychiatric institutions can be way too repressive and, you know, d just, just hand wave any patient's concerns. No, so, they don't hand wave any patient's concerns. Well, they used to. I mean, when it comes to transgender people, they do the opposite of that. They do what? 
Like, if you have any concerns at all in the transgender healthcare system, you're fucked. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. No, I mean, like, like, when I said concerns, what I meant was, like, the things that they say about themselves. Because they just assume that everyone's lying all the time. It's like that famous... You know the famous experiment where they got a bunch of people to uh, lie and say that they were experiencing hearing voices and get admitted to tra- to a psychiatric institute and then immediately stop lying and act normal mm-hmm. and many of these people were kept in for months and months and months even though they no longer showed any symptoms and then the same psychiatric institute or some other psychiatric institute was like huh you could never pull that off here send in a secret guy and we'll find them if you send in secret guys then like a few months later the hospital was like we caught all your secret guys and the professor was like i never sent any secret guys mm. so clearly these guys have no fucking clue what they're doing yeah um but th- you know that's the sort of thing that comes from not trusting patients from forcing people to repress their desire yeah which is all goes back to freud that fucking bastard yeah you know they're acting as if they're the patient's daddy it's like you're not my daddy yeah. You don't get to tell me what to do and how to think. This is it all comes down to just these moral concerns masquerading as pathologies. Like, oh, you won't be able to fulfill your role in society by reproducing. You know, heterosexual. Hold on a goddamn minute. You know? Who said that was like something unusual? Like you wouldn't pathologize that in a gay man or woman you know somehow something becomes a pathology something is a disease I mean they would have pathologized it a few years ago a few decades ago but now you know you know what I'm saying I don't like this whole psychiatry business I think Foucault was on to something I I need to stop fucking watching these Peter Zayan videos. It's Peter Zayan? People with Peter Zayan? I don't know. You know the guy, right? You've seen him on YouTube. Because he just has this very particular worldview that he talks about as if it's the objective truth. But then every time I listen to, like, other military analysts and geopolitical analysts, none of them ever say the same shit he's saying. Like, they say... Similar things, and so actually sometimes they repeat the same things when it's like about some objective fact of the matter. But like, I've heard, it's just that I don't really have that broader perspective. And I've also heard him say stuff that I just know is, I don't know if I want to say wrong, but at least unsubstantiated. So as an example, he made a video where he was like, I'm going to tell you who's going to win the next US election and blah, 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 it's going to be Joe Biden because of these reasons. And I don't even necessarily disagree with his reasoning there. I think the stuff he said in terms of that stuff is pretty well agreed upon. It's this kind of meme that, like, uh, what is it? 45% of Americans will always vote Democrat. 45% of Americans will always vote Republican. The other 10% has no fucking idea what's going on, and they're the ones that decide elections. Um, <clears throat> it's something like that, right? Like, that's an old saying, I believe. Uh, that's basically what he's, what the sort of thing he's saying. He's like, and that, it turns out that 10% right now really fucking hates Trump, and so they'll vote for anyone who isn't Trump, which will be Biden in this situation. Which I think is probably accurate. I mean, I'm not going to go out and make a prediction because I can't tell the future, but I, I can see where he's coming from, whatever. That's not my problem with the video. The thing in the video, like, he might be right. He might be right, and I might just not know, because I'm not super involved in that sort of, like, American electoral politics, and I wasn't in when Bernie was running. But he says at the beginning of the video, like, oh, there are people who will support Bernie Sanders. And when he's like this, Bernie Sanders, he's a bit of a kook, right? And that, like, when you go through the math, as people have done, you go through the math of what Bernie actually proposes, it doesn't add up. It's not possible to do what he wants to do with the resources he wants to do it. And you can tell this to Bernie, and you can tell this to Bernie supporters, and they'll agree with you, but they won't stop supporting him. They'll just increase taxes until it eventually works, you know, to the point of collapsing the economy. Which is confusing to me, 
I might be missing something, okay? Maybe I'm just not aware of everything Bernie proposes because I'm I didn't thought I'm not a Bernie guy, you know. I, when it comes to like following that sort of thing, I tend to focus more on UK politicians rather than America. I don't know the nitty gritty of Bernie's like policies, but as I understand it, like Bernie is a moderate lefty from European standards, right? Like. I don't think he proposed anything that hasn't already been done many times in Europe and isn't just the norm. Am I crazy? Like, what did he... He wanted, like, single-payer healthcare, is that it? Like, I think there were some reasons why single-payer healthcare is, like, especially hard in America, but I, I don't really understand what those reasons are. And maybe the argument is that, like, the American economy is just, like, completely unique compared to like every other country in the world which somehow manages to have like you know some system of government insured healthcare many many other countries including much poorer countries somehow manage to do it but the US is in this unique position where it can't like to me I don't think that makes any sense unless I'm missing something important that doesn't seem to make any sense to me how can you say that I mean you know what it's even crazier than that because it's not even just comparing the US to Europe a lot of times it's comparing the US to the US but like before Reaganomics like the US in the 40s and 50s and so on when corporate tax was higher and so on like this I I would have loved if Peter Zahan explained that part of the fucking video instead of just saying something in a matter-of-fact way without really giving any... Because I'm not saying he's wrong. Like, I'm assuming he has some reason for saying what he's saying. I would, people wouldn't just go... I, I don't imagine he's the sort of guy that would just make something up. So he probably has some reason for saying what he's saying. I just don't understand what that reason could possibly be. It might, it, it must exist. I don't know whether it's truthful or not, but it must exist. I just want to know what it is, rather than just like, you know, like there's a there's a difference fundamentally. This is this is what I'm really getting at, right? Is that his point in that video is like, oh, you know, the Bernie fans, they'll vote for Bernie no matter what. Or they would have, even if you tell them that his policies don't work. Because he's not a political leader, he's a religious leader. And Trump is the same way. Except, I think fundamentally, this is just not true. Saying Trump is a, is a, is a religious leader makes a lot of sense. Because you literally have Republicans praying to Trump. Like, there are many videos of this sort of thing happening. And tying the Trump campaign heavily into fundamentalist Christianity. Like, this is a very well-documented phenomenon. And secondly, if you ask Republicans why they like Trump, beyond tax cuts, which they don't even affect them, probably, because they're not in the right tax bracket, beyond tax cuts, they probably can't name a single policy they actually like. Right. Like in order to like a lot of Republicans just believe or a lot of like the diehard Trump people just vote for Trump because there's there's some big conspiracy that they have in their minds. And, and tr but they can't name like a policy that they like maybe beyond tax cuts. Like they could say they're voting for Trump because of it, because of immigration, but they don't really know what Trump's actual policy on immigration is. Uh, right. Whereas I think, you know, no one really gave a shit about Bernie. I, like, maybe I'm wrong about this, but it seems like people like Bernie because of his policies and nothing else. You know? And I'm not, I, I'm, like, I'm not trying to play hard defense for Bernie and these similar progressive Democrats. Because I don't, I don't think they're, you know, I think there's big flaws with the, the what they're doing. Um, I don't think their policies are, like, terrible or the best. But what I'm saying is, like, I don't know. This, 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 when he said that, it was very confusing to me.
I was thinking about making this a whole video of itself, but I thought it might be too edgy and it's also very short. Like just to make a short, quick, snappy video. Maybe just an IDMR. I don't know. I might still do it because this is seven hours into a podcast. Um, so I, if you want to hear my qualifications, um, I'm autistic and I'm not self-diagnosed. I am professionally diagnosed. I am autistic enough that the government decided to get involved. Um, I also, just for completeness sake, I'm diagnosed with bipolar 2. And um, I am not officially diagnosed with um, health anxiety, aka like hypochondria, but I, a, a, a clinical psychologist basically pseudo-diagnosed me, right? Like, like he said, you have all the symptoms of uh, health anxiety, like you fit the description for health anxiety, um, it's kind of a pain to go through the bother to like get you an official diagnosis. Like you can do it if you want. Do you want me to, to do that for you or not? And I was like, yeah, it doesn't seem like much of a it matters very much if I get diagnosed or not. So there's that also that situation. Um, okay, so those are my qualifications. Now I will say what I want to say. Please just call me retarded. Please just call me retarded. I don't want to hear someone's... You know what term I fucking saw? I saw someone say neurospicy today. Just call me retarded. Please. Like, I know there's, you know, there's all of these fancy words. You can say neurodivergent. Okay? I would much rather be called... Now, this is crazy, maybe. But I feel like I would rather be called retarded than neurodivergent. Because retarded just means slowed. And I'm kind of slowed. It's accurate. I'm slowed in various, you know, places. In other places, I'm not. But yeah, like my social development, I guess. Ability to socialize and pick up on cues and whatever. All of that stuff that autists can't do. It's slowed. Yeah. It's a, it's a perfectly accurate way to describe it. Neurodivergent is so vague as to be, you know, useless. It just means, like, if you were to translate that into to, to common parlance, you, you, would just, you would translate it as maybe mentally different. I don't want people to be go, oh, oh don't, don't worry about no thank you. He's mentally different. <laughs> that sounds fucked up. It's way worse. It also is, like, different from what? You know, it implies a whole bunch of stuff. It implies that there's some... Like, mean that you're diverging from. It implies that, like, the neuro, it sort of, like, scientificizes it. You know, it makes it seem like some sort of... I don't like it. I don't, I don't, I don't like, hate the term. I don't hate it. But, like, like you just want to call me retarded. Just call me retarded, bro. I don't give a shit. Like, it, it's perfectly... Like, the re- people don't want to say it because it's vulgar. Right, it's a it's a swear word. It's a it's a a slur or whatever. But like, yeah, you know what? My existence is vulgar. Yeah, you know what? You, correct. You should have to say a vulgarity when referring to me if you want to do that. You should have to do that. Okay. Fuck you. Yes. There you go. That is what I'm gonna. That is that is my take on that. No, I don't know. I just. Just say retarded. It's not... It's just, anyone who complains about it is a fucking retard. Okay. Here's why... I... am gonna make the case... That... You probably should vote. I used to... Be like... Oh no, you just spoil your ballot. Whatever, right? Or just don't vote at all. Because if voting changed anything, they'd make it illegal. But... Uh, I've sort of come around on the idea of voting. And let me put it like this. I think that it, what I'm coming at it from is more of a pragmatist or maybe materialist, I don't know what you want to call it, angle. Um, so like in America, let's say. in Because the, Amer- the American political system is the most... 
like extreme example of this. Like you gotta, st- I've been I've been listening to this. Um, the guy from the YouTube channel Plastic Pills, he has a, a a podcast called the Pill Pod Philosophy and Critical Theory Podcast, and they go they go in deep. I, I actually really recommend it. They it's a bit above my level. Like there's a f- there's a bunch of episodes on Deleuze. I thought I had a pretty good grasp of like the basics of Deleuze. I'm not saying I fully understand Deleuze, but like, you know, I've read a good chunk of Thousand Plateaus. I've read a good chunk of Anti Oedipus, and I've watched like. A shitload of lectures on Deleuze and like podcasts on Deleuze. Like I f- feel like I'm relatively had a good grasp on like the fundamentals. Uh, but yeah, no, they talk about. I mean, they d- clearly just uh, levels above me. But anyway, I've been listening to their podcasts. They they've done a couple of these podcasts, which are kind of about posthumanism specifically through the lens of this sociologist that I'd never heard of called Niklas Luhrmann. Luhrmann? He wrote this book called Social Systems. Um, And his basic premise, at least as they explain it, is that, like, the human doesn't... uh, Society actually is not made up... There are no human beings in society. Um, Like... The human being as a category, which is only a relatively recent category, that's like a Foucault thing, I think, um, doesn't actually really ever come into play. Um, And, like, the example that they used, I think, was, uh, like, like when you you make a bank transaction, the bank never realizes you as a human being. You are, um, you know, you, you, you exist for the moment that your credit card and your bank account p- produce some sort of transaction, and then as far as the banking system is concerned, you stop existing. That that there are all of these independent systems that, like, ra- rather than thinking of society as a bunch of individuals with who are, like, individual actors, uh, a, 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 a possibly better model is that the world is made up of these closed systems which can only really interact within themselves and the rather than like you know humans there are just actions there are just events that take place and those events only take place within their own closed system and like you might imagine for example that like uh there's some I'm a bit confused about this part, but apparently it's very important that each of these systems is actually completely closed off. That, like, for example, the system of the psyche, you might think, and the system of communication via people, like language, right? Like, the way I'm talking to you right now. Like, the, clearly, the psyche as a system is not completely closed, and the language system is not completely closed, because they're clearly... I'm explaining to you with language right now and you're understanding it through the computer, through the internet, something that's in my psyche. So clearly these things must not be closed, they must be open. But in reality, there's this is not the case because if these two systems were really linked, you would be able to influence... If, 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 if these systems were, were really open... Uh, you you would be able to control my thoughts simply through the act of listening to me talking right now, but you can't. R- really, there's some loss, there's some degradation. In a Darwinist sense, there's like random mutation that happens as this information transitions the borders between systems because although they can interact... It's only the parts of them that exist in different systems that interact. They only they only interact within themselves. I don't know if I'm making any sense. In the same way that, like, you know, there may be a system of my psyche that decides to go to an ATM and perform some credit card transaction through the financial system, the banking system. But as far as the banking system is concerned, none of that has to exist. None of that exists. Like, the only thing that exists is some, you know fucking signal from one bank account to the other whatever right 
Like it never interacts. It never sees me. It never sees any other system other than itself. It doesn't have the capacity, like in the same way that we don't have the capacity to look in a color that we can't see beyond our visual spectrum, right? We can translate some infrared color by shifting the frequencies into something that we could see, but we can never like actually perceive a color that's outside of our, our ability, right? Or something like this, right? We, we could never perceive radio waves or we could never smell the way a dog smells the world, follow scent trails, right? Like the, the, we can only understand it by translating it. The only time it actually exists, as far as we're concerned, as far as our, our sensation is concerned, is when it's within the closed system. And the same sense, you know, the only sense in which a human being exists for a banking system is when it briefly pops into existence to perform some financial transaction. I'm using the banking system just as an example, but this applies to literally every system in the world. It doesn't physically have the capacity to interconnect with other systems because it's closed, because it can only understand itself within its own means or understand the world within its... Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a bit of a heady fucking concept and it's also probably useless for most things. But one thing I've... After listening to this, I think it's really interesting and they mention this in the podcast about the political system, that like as far as the American political system is concerned... There's only three options. Either you're a Republican, you're a Democrat. That's or there's, there's only two options. If you're not a Republican or a Democrat, if you don't exist, right? No one's really, you know, it doesn't matter if you vote for the Libertarians or whatever, or if you don't vote. You, you don't exist unless you're a Republican or a Democrat. That's the only way you can interact with the political, you know, the party political system, the, 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 the governmental system, whatever you want to call it in America, in the same sense that you can't, you couldn't go to a ATM and start trying to communicate to it via some system that didn't exist within the ATM. It, it, it would be nonsense to even suggest such a thing. Like, you couldn't write poetry at an ATM, <laughs> you know? It, would, it doesn't make any sense. You couldn't communicate with an ATM in the same way that, like, you 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 can't interact with the system that is the 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 financial transaction system with the same mechanisms as you would communicate with the medical system like it's not comparable you can't send you know a a doctor can't take notes about you know what i'm saying like it it it, it doesn't even make it's, it's it's something that's not even conceivable it's it's nonsense to even imagine such a thing and so i think because of this like that's really if you want to think about it this way you start to actually understand the choice you're making when you decide to vote or not to vote is like it's not oh you're a protest vote or like oh yeah me as an individual I, myself as a human being, am choosing to rebel against the system because it doesn't, like, none of that even matters. There's no rebelling against the system. The system, as far as it's concerned, you either exist or you don't exist. There's, um, and non-existence isn't accounted for, right? Like, the, the ATM isn't constantly checking when someone's not interacting with it. It doesn't matter. You just stop existing. You're just, it's void. It's null. It's nothing. It's not change. Like, you're not affecting some transaction by not transacting in that particular system. Um, And in the same sense, you're not affecting any aspect of the party political system, whatever you want to call it, governmental system, by not, by choosing to be a non-entity. Because you're not really choosing to do anything in that sense. So this is why I think you should probably vote for Joe Biden in the next election. I'm sorry to tell you. Uh, pains me as much as it pains you. Now, in the UK, 
it's a completely different situation. It's not complete. It's a it's a slightly different situation, where like I think it's valid to vote. Like I think I will probably be voting for the Greens in the next election. I think I might vote Labour, but I think I'll probably vote for the Greens because my ideal situation is a coalition between Labour and the Greens, which I think is like some. I think Labour is gonna win, but like. A Labour Green coalition would kind of be POG. Maybe I'll just vote Labour. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. The next general election is quite a ways away, so I have to see what all of the parties do in the next, you know, coming months or years or whatever, how long it is. Like, but you still, you know, it's not like I can vote for someone who actually represents my views. Like, no one's going to come out and be like, we are the Delusian party. Ah, uh, yes. The party of the solar anus. The party of the solar anus. We're here to examine how the British economy ought to best deal with uh, the accursed share. Uh, no one's going to fucking come out and say that ever, right? Because <laughs> it's not within the, 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 the communication and the actions that are permitted by the system. Like, you don't get to... It, it's f- shifting from a humanist framework to a post-humanist framework, right? Where rather than... You, you, if, you're, if you cling to this humanism and you keep thinking about society as being made up of human actors associating in whatever ways and doing whatever, then, you know, you're just never going to... I mean, you're you're just. It might be a helpful model in some situations, but in many situations, you're missing the. You a more accurate model would be to just ignore. This construct of the the human in the first place, and look at how these systems are actually communicating internally, and how these closed off systems actually view. Interactions, right. Like, the voting system doesn't acknowledge the existence of a person. It doesn't have the capacity to know what a human is. It knows what a vote is. It doesn't know what a human is. You know? Uh, yeah, I don't know if that is actually a good argument to vote or not to vote. I'm still thinking about it. I don't know if, you know... It might be a good argument against the current political system. I mean, it's definitely it's not hard to make a good argument against the two party American system, but there's one of them. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I don't know. It might maybe it'd just think just just food for thought, really. Just food for thought. Just a different framing of the world. Very interesting. I might have to read this guy's book, but apparently, according to these guys on the podcast, it is extremely dry and boring but also extremely enlightening. Uh, and I never finish books like that. Like, I never finish seeing, like, a state, which is exactly that kind of... Seeing, like, a state is the epitome for me of, like, extremely dry and boring book that is also, like, fucking world-shatteringly mind-bending, kind of. <sighs> yeah, anyway, that's uh, that's something interesting. I decided to watch this Sophie from Mars video. <clears throat> it's called The World Is Not Ending. Um, if you're... You might get this recommended. This is the sort of video that ends up in people's recommended feeds, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> anyway. Uh, it's like two and a half hours long. It's about climate change and climate catastrophe. Uh... And capitalism, of course. Okay, so I'm just gonna... I'm 20 minutes into it, and there's just there's just some shit that is just, just annoying me. There's just some shit about it that's annoying me, which always annoys me with this person's videos, which is... Fundamentally comes down to the fact that she hasn't read enough books, or she's read a bunch of books, she's just read the wrong books, or not fully understood them. I'm not really sure what's going on. She just has a very... Um, 
she's she's very into like sound bites <laughs> rather than like robust theory. Like she tends to understand the general vibes of like leftist theory without really I like 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 well, but it's sort of like a game of Chinese whispers where it's sort of like um, oh fuck! Let me think. There was something I heard the other day. Some that is a good example of this. Oh, it was it was a, a stupid TikTok, right? There was this TikTok where someone was asked on TikTok something like, uh, "Why are all? Oh yeah, you really think all billionaires are evil? Explain why all billionaires are evil, right?" And then this guy he goes to to do it, right? Oh well, actually yes, all billionaires are evil, and I can prove it. With material analysis, excellent. We're doing some Marxism here. Good job. You know, we all we all we, we all know about Marxism. We all know how Marxism works, right? We can all understand. This is this is like this is like a one oh one. This is like you don't even really have to read Marx to understand to, to know this, right? You could anyone any one of us could explain this in our sleep, but he fucks up. He gets it completely wrong. He says he just makes something up instead of doing the really basic Marxism. Right. He he says something about how um, there's oh if you had twenty two billion dollars you could just do that pay twenty two billion dollars once and it would solve homelessness in America which is not true I, uh, the statistic he was looking for was actually twenty two billion dollars a year not just a single time payment of twenty two billion dollars um, but that's kind of if you look, that is a fact checking aside. You know, they, so if you have, you know, if you're a billionaire, you could get together with a few of your billionaire buddies and pay a billion dollars each or something, and you could solve homelessness easily. And so every billionaire is constantly choosing not to do that. Um, and I don't think that's like the, the worst. I, th- I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a bit weak. It's a bit weak, right? It's not the really the lefty line. It's, it's kind of missing the point. I mean, firstly, it assumes that, like, billionaires keep all their money in cash, which is obviously not true. That, like, you could just inject a few billion dollars, you know. I mean, you could, but it would have to... Like, what do you mean by end homelessness, you know? Like, how would... It's not a very robust plan. It sort of imagines that billionaires have a button that they can push that just says end homelessness, and it will just do it. Like... There's no mechanism by which they can do this. What you want is like a system of maybe taxation or something that would then, you know, through some democratic system of government, redistribute that wealth to the people who need it. Not, right, like individual... This is like the liberal mind virus where it's like they're individuals. Like as individuals, they're bad because they're not choosing to do this rather than looking at like the system like... They're bad because they're not campaigning for... It doesn't really make any sense when you think about it, right? There's no... Like, ending homelessness isn't a matter of just pressing a button where you pay a bunch of money and it goes away, right? You need to set up a robust fucking welfare state. (laughs) Anyway. But that aside, it's not even the Marxist reason why you're supposed to think billionaires are evil if you're a Marxist. You're supposed to think billionaires are evil if you're a Marxist because... And I'm sure, you know, this is a lefty. If you're a lefty, you're supposed to be a Marxist. I'm sorry. Like, that's kind of, the two things are kind of, like, inseparable in my head. Or at least, you know, if you don't want to be, you can be some sort of advanced, weird post-Marxist, you know, something like this. But, like, to me, you know, you're talking about, like, the labor movement. You're talking about Marx. Which is, you know, to me, they're all kind of lumped together, right? I think you can assume these sorts of things. Someone says they're a socialist. They're probably not, like, a utopian socialist. They're probably a Marxist. Anyway, the, just to, to go through this, you probably already know this, but the reason, if you're a Marxist, that you're supposed to think the billionaires are evil is because of the theory of value, that those billions are stolen because those, those are billions of dollars of extracted surplus value from workers, um, right? That, that, like, all of that money, that wealth, is actually something like wealth that they've stolen from all of the workers who actually produce the value in society. Um, like they're literally thieves. That's the, and not only thieves, like that, you know, knowingly so on a, a massive, massive scale. 
because you know in order to get billions of dollars you have to extract a lot of surplus value from a lot of workers and that means you know taking basic you know you're basically underpaying millions and millions and millions of people which is effectively stealing because you're taking the money the money doesn't just disappear that's the marxist reason why you're supposed to hate billionaires it's this sort of thing right where people they understand the form of leftism which is like something about how rich people are bad and maybe capitalism is like bad and like there's something called socialism which has something to do with like workers rights or like they're not being any rich people anymore I don't really understand much more beyond that but they've like heard this sort of thing and they like it on an aesthetic level um, and then they make like really because they they don't bother to like actually think anything through or like research anything they end up making these sorts of blatant mistakes. And this is a, a thing that I've seen in Sophie from Mars's videos a lot, is I think she's like some sort of anarchist, which is fine, you know, I'm probably also some sort of anarchist. Um, and she's read, I believe, like a, real, a pretty good amount of like anarchist theory, which is good. I've also read a pretty good amount of anarchist theory. Um, but you, you, when you only read anarchist theory, you start to look at the world like you don't really have your you, you sort of get stuck in an echo chamber I guess which is something that happened to me I had to branch out and read more varied philosophy in order to have the fuck was that? yeah I don't know a more accurate view of the world or whatever I think this is something that this person does a lot uh, is they just sort of have this Chinese whispers game of leftism without really understanding like what it means. So as an example, you know, the reason I actually paused the video to come here and talk to you about it was at, at one point she says, she starts talking about like, like when you dismantle capitalism, you have to replace it with a system based on, I think she says like love and compassion and um, an equitable world with uh, the, the fairness, like all of these buzzwords. It's like, this, is, this isn't socialism. This is like whatever the fuck Russell Brandism is, you know? This is just some spiritualist nonsense. See, that, that, that's not a, a foundation for a robust political theory, but love and compassion and equitability. Like none of these make any sense. They don't mean anything. These words don't mean anything. I don't want to live in a world based on love. I want to live in a. I don't want. To, I don't want to live in an economic system based on love. I want to live in an economic system where, that that functions. <laughs> you know, like there's no love doesn't have to play any fucking part in it. Uh, and I'd rather it didn't. Keep love out of my economics. I want my love to be in my relationships. You know, I guess economics is also relationships. I mean, I guess you could have maybe a love based economic system, but that would be very strange. Um, yeah, like, this is the sort of thing that gets repeated that's just fucking nonsense and makes me want to, like, shoot myself. Um, and I also think she actually underestimates the severity of the problem. For a video that is all about how everyone underestimates the severity of the problem, she still continues to underestimate the severity of the problem by limiting her sphere to just capitalism. So she says something like, this is like a big, powerful statement in the video, like early on in the video. She's talking about, and I think she makes a few like factual errors here, a few historical errors here, but the general form of what she's saying is correct, about like American imperialism, uh, how it's related to the fossil fuel industry, and global capitalism and so on, right? Pretty basic, but you know, good to point out, good stuff. You'd want to see this in a video like this. Um, and then uh, she says sort of like, so if you want to actually end climate change, first you have to end global capitalism, which, you know, lots of people have said. Um, and she says like, so you have to not only dismantle the most powerful state on the planet, but you also have to dismantle the very system that gives that, that gave that state power and then replace it with some bullshit about compassion or whatever, right? Um, but I think she's she misses, really, reality is you have to dismantle the state, the most powerful state in, the, like in existence. You also have to dismantle the system that gives it power, 
But beyond that, you know, even if you do that, you might only succeed in just like eliminating some types of fossil fuel usage in certain parts of the world, some sort of oil extraction. Like you're not actually going to solve climate change by doing that. You have to go way further than this. Like in order to actually, you know, solve these problems, it requires a complete restructuring of society beyond the mode of production. Like, I mean, it requires like large scale deindustrialization, which is something that's never been attempted in human history. I mean, beyond all of the other stuff that's never been attempted in human history. Like, you can't just go to America, take over America as your amazing communist anarchist society that's definitely going to work. Um, somehow make this happen quickly and effectively um, and then you know super do everything goes perfectly you you're like we're going to stop extracting oil we're going to stop buying oil we're going to stop selling oil you know no more oil no more oil in our economy economy we're done with oil we're going to not have any of that anymore okay great you know wonderful so what are you going to do now how are you going to like meet your energy needs this is obviously where you're going to run into a massive fucking problem because um, none of these green energy, you know, a lot of this green energy stuff um, actually relies on polluting industrial practices and, you know, in many cases, fossil fuels at the end of the day. Like, uh, you need to set up the infrastructure to set up the infrastructure. It's kind of an ouroboros. Like... To produce solar panels, you need big mining operations and big industrial operations. And those industrial operations require a lot of energy, right? It takes a lot of energy. It takes, it takes a lot of energy to mine and construct and distribute solar panels and install them and everything. It takes, that, is, that is a very energy intensive process. Where are you getting that energy from? Because it's not going to just, you know, appear. If you stopped using oil entirely, none of that stuff has ever even been attempted to be greenified. There's no, you know, and okay, say you do do it. Well, it turns out most of these solar panels will barely make more energy in their lifetime than it took to produce them. You're going to have, like, very, very little actual energy surplus. If you're saying okay, we use some short amount of like nuclear or sort of fossil fuels or whatever to make this transition until we can change the infrastructure, the industrial infrastructure to be running on renewables. Okay, great. Now you have almost all of your renewable energy going into manufacturing replacements for the renewable energy when it breaks because, you know, solar panels don't last very long, wind farms don't, uh, like wind, wind turbines don't last very long. Um, Turbines in hydroelectric dams and systems don't last very long. Like a lot of the stuff needs to be replaced relatively often, and replacing it requires some sort of energy intensive industrial process. Um, so, all of your energy, you know, like at least let's, even if I'm being super generous and saying it only takes half of your energy to do that, you think you're going to be able to produce double the current production of, of the world? Uh, with fossil fuels, without fossil fuels, that is, and it not be an ecological disaster. I mean, there's also a pretty strong argument that, like, covering, you know, because if you wanted to do, like, solar, you would have to, like, cover a desert somewhere in America, Nevada or something, which is not actually an ecological, like, good, necessarily. I guess you can weigh these things up. What I'm saying is, like, you don't just... It's Renewables are not actually just a solve climate change drag-and-drop replacement for fossil fuels. It doesn't work like that, because renewables aren't really... The, the resource is renewable, but the ways in which we capture that resource are actually not renewable. They are also finite. They are made of materials which require industrial processes to produce in many cases, and often don't actually create that much more energy in their lifetime before they need replacing than it took to create them in the first place. Some, a lot of them are positive, like net. They do net produce more energy than it takes to produce them. Um, but, you know, uh, not by that much. Not in the scale of oil or gas or even coal. Uh, 
And so you need a society with much lower energy needs. You would need to completely restructure society. You wouldn't be able to do like industrial agriculture or, or maybe even like the level of urbanism that we have today. Um, you know, there would even be questions about like, I don't want to bring this up because this is always like a slippery slope, but like population numbers, you know, we, we produce this many people based on the assumption that technology would continue to, you know, this is like the old Malthusian like fallacy where it's like he didn't assume that agricultural technology would improve with increases in population. But those quote-unquote improvements in agricultural technology are actually, you know, in ecologically problematic in many, many cases. Uh, is it possible to feed everyone with permacultures and regenerative agriculture? You know, I don't know. I haven't seen the numbers on that. I, I probably, I think if you're, you know, you probably could manage it. But I mean, it would just require, like, people, it, it would require just a complete reshaping of society, like, beyond what even communists imagine. Like, you would need to, you wouldn't have compute, like, you wouldn't be able to do this, right? Like, you wouldn't have, if you really wanted to be solving climate change, there wouldn't be excess energy for every single person to own gadgets like this computer, you know? Like, you would maybe have some sort of scavenged low power device. Maybe like a, a, you know, that you've managed to hotwire if you know what you're doing. But no one's going to, like, there's not going to be the excess, there's not going to be the spare energy to, you know, create everyone iPhones or computers with that require this much power. You know, there's not going to be, you know, like, there's not going to be Fortnite, <laughs> there's not going to be Netflix. There's not going to be really, and then, like, there's not going to be any movies or, like, TV, you know. Maybe books. Books are probably possible. Maybe. Uh, there might not be, like, you know, that much artificial lighting. Uh, not going to be, like, heating or air conditioning. Uh, there's not going to be, well, I mean, there'll be fires, I guess, but, like, yeah, there's, there's not going to be, you know anything energy and not going to be refrigeration as an example you know you have to go back to fermenting and uh you know root cellars and canning and all of the you, like it's a completely different it's not just a matter of like oh well once the mode of production changes all of these problems go away because we no longer have the profit motive so we can just be like well fuck you I'm not giving you oil anymore, even though it would be profitable. We don't, profitable doesn't matter anymore, so fuck you. Not even a matter of that. It's a matter of, like, you would have to force people, or not necessarily, for, I don't even know what you would do. It's, it's untenable. Everyone would somehow have to start living in this low energy consumption modality. Somehow. Like, I think it would require, it would mean, you know, there's no, no, there's no more like, you know, importing fucking off season vegetables from Argentina or whatever, you know, like people would have to be growing food locally. You'd have a lot more people growing a lot more of their food, assumedly, a lot of potatoes, probably. Um, a lot of seasonality. I mean, like, there's so much would have to change. Like, I think these people, they read all these stories, which are true about how, like, the vast majority of carbon emissions are generated by, like, you know, certain companies or whatever. Like, maybe, I mean, maybe, like, if you want to be optimistic, you could argue that, like, we wouldn't have to completely deindustrialize. We could, you know, somehow return to a world of, like, industrialization from, from not, like, su super long ago. We'd have to get rid of some luxuries. Uh, but, like, most of these emissions would be, emit, like, eliminated because all of those rich companies would be no longer existing, I guess, which somehow means, like, all of their services would stop existing. I mean, I looked this up once. The most polluting companies in the world are all, like, oil and gas companies. Like, they're not, you know, consumer and <laughs> They're all industrial corporations. Um, so, like, what do you plan to do? You know, like, how do you plan to... 
like may, maybe there's a world is what, what I'm saying. Like maybe there's some world where if you just do enough carbon capture, right, in terms of like not the made up carbon capture, but in terms of like, you know, fucking planting biodiverse everything, just covering as much land as you possibly can with as much plants as you possibly can as quickly as possible and like actually make it work. If you if you do that, I mean, it would still require like, you know, massive changes to like the agricultural industry. Um, in every form, maybe like I mean, the world. I I can't describe to you how big these changes would have to be, and how you would have to get them right first try. There is no second try, you know. Like unless you want to be, some sort of techno utopian. And imagine, oh, these fake made up carbon capture machines are going to be invented and they're going to work great and somehow work or whatever. I mean, they're not that, they're not that fake and made up. Like, they sort of exist. Maybe if you're in a communist society and you don't need to make them profitable, you can just, well, I mean, you can run them off of renewables, which aren't really renewable. And like maybe, I don't know, and then plant a bunch of trees and then maybe you can like have net zero sort of situation. And but pl- like planting a bunch of trees is not the same as preserving forest that already exists because it takes like a, it's, yeah, I don't know. Um, like, I don't, yeah, I, I guess maybe if you invest a large portion, like, what I'm saying is, like, there is no world out of climate change without some acceptance that we need some form of energy scarcity. Or not need, but we're going to end up living in a world of energy scarcity. Not even intentionally, just by necessity. Like, there's no other option. Either climate change runs its course and, you know, resource scarcity runs its course. We run out of easily accessible cobalt or lithium or whatever the fuck, right? Or even oil. I don't know. You know, it's arguable that we reached peak oil at some point in 2019. Uh, you know, like, it, either that happens and then we slowly deplete and energy gets more and more expensive and we're, as well as climate change worsening, and then, you know, we end up fucked in terms of energy scarcity. Or we deliberately impose energy scarcity in order to slow climate change. Like, there's no world where you still manage this ridiculous amount of energy abundance. Um, you know, people imagine that this stuff is just free, that gadgets for everyone just fall out of the sky. It's not the case. And it's not just a matter of class relations. It's a matter of something beyond that as well. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm only 20 minutes into this video. Maybe we should talk about this later. But I'm sorry, it doesn't matter how much love you put into your economic system, it's not going to change the fact that fiberglass, which is used to make the turbines on wind um, generators, isn't recyclable and requires an industrial process to manufacture, which is polluting in itself and energy intensive in itself. You can you, love, com, compassion, equitability is not going to solve this problem. That's a fundamental reality. You have to move, you know, you know what I'm saying? I would like to sort of slightly walk back what I said about this. I forgot what her name is now. The video I was talking about. Um, when I said she needs to read more books, I want to be very clear that what I mean is she needs to read more varied literature outside of just the lefty theory or like lefty political theory specifically like more maybe some some broader philosophy stuff would be interesting um <clears throat> but i actually don't even necessarily believe that i think the video is like okay what's interesting is this video is basically like a direct parallel to one of my first videos on this channel like if you scroll all the way back on this channel that you're watching this on right now, or you might be on my website, in which case you can go to my YouTube channel, which is no thank you spelled backwards. Um, yeah, did I mention that 
hey website websites guys websites but, but anyway if you if you go all the way back to the beginning you scroll a little bit you will find a video titled climate change is a good thing actually which is not really the point of it. and it's, it's more of an inflammatory title than anything else but the point that i'm trying to make in that video is sort of an accelerationist argument i guess in the sort of meme sense not in the nick land sense uh or maybe that's not even accurate the point i was trying to make and i was reading many similar books as sophie that's her name right sophie from mars that's the channel you know i was reading blessed is the flame which she mentions in the video as well and desert and stuff like that um the point basically being sorry i'm kind of kind of rambling is is that like capitalism can't survive the climate crisis like one way or another this thing is coming down right that like if it's it's not necessarily a matter of like oh you know society is going to collapse if we can't establish some sort of revolution and get rid of capitalism right now it's also that well also if we fail to do that the the continue the, the closer and more society collapses the less and less capitalism is able to sustain itself because capitalism is a system that runs on fossil fuels um right which so if you're this is why i said it in the video title as sort of a purposeful clickbait i don't know whatever climate change is a good thing the premise is if you are someone who wants radical social change like if you're an anarchist or something like that um then you know here's your here's your opportunity there's not going to you know this is the i mean i can't think of anything more trad marxist you know dialectic destroyed by its own uh contradictions than this capitalism requires fossil fuels and industrial imperialist nonsense to function and yet all of those functions result in environmental collapse which make capitalism untenable you know uh and so if you you know this is this is your time to take advantage of the situation where I, there's also an, another um thing that I want to talk that kind of adds on to this which is like as a system collapses more and more of its resources have to be dedicated to pretending that it's not collapsing keep protecting the image that it's fine um and I'm not sure what that means for for anything however um I also want to say that I am probably not as much of a climate alarmist or uh, maybe that's a kind of inflammatory language but I'm my I'm not convinced that global warming specifically is as catastrophic as some people make it out to be now this is not any sort of climate denial or anything okay i'm a strong proponent of ecology sometimes even the deep kind um yeah i i think i just talked about this for long enough that you understand this about me i i'm in no way denying that this stuff is very bad and there needs to be something done about it in no way am i denying that my contention is that certain issues are talked up and certain issues are it aren't, aren't okay so <laughs> like global temperature rise has some catastrophic consequences and it's all one system right so to talk even to talk about this stuff separately maybe it doesn't make any sense maybe i'm sort of nitpicking here global temperature rise has some catastrophic consequences however in my mind the real things that are going to kill us is ocean acidity 
uh, or acidification. Uh, topsoil erosion, that's probably maybe the biggest one, even, I guess, arguably. Um, and resource scarcity in terms of, like, you know, it becomes diminishingly profitable or reasonable to access scarcer and scarcer resources from the ground, like lithium or whatever, cobalt, I don't know. Uh, to me, these are bigger issues than the other issues, which are also very real in terms of like extreme weather events and, um, you know, stuff like, well, you know, the weather being fucked, which is not good. Uh, but we have, as I understand it, in, term, in some of these cases, in terms of um, like topsoil erosion is in many cases surprisingly reversible with regenerative farming. And regenerative farming is already catching on in, I don't want to be like a hope I don't want to give you hope because there's no hope. Okay, there's nothing. We're not. The, 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 she said this in her video as well. There's no hope that because hope is like, oh, someone's dealing with this. I don't have to worry about it. No, not the case at all. But I just want to tell you about the material reality as I see it. So there, there is a lot of regenerative farming practices that are like all the rage in the agricultural sciences right now. Like I mean, this stuff is is very well. It's 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 a it's a it's a, it's a big topic of study. Uh, and it's also quite popular just with the wider populace. I mean, like, I know personally two people with permacultures. Like, you might know someone who has a perm. Like, you know, these sort of ideas are spreading mimetically through the population and they're effective. Um, and especially, I was going to say, in Australia, I was, uh, it looks like these practices are really catching on more in the mainstream agricultural sector. In America, these practices basically don't exist yet, because um, America's just fucked, man. Like, there's just, on every level, America is fucked. Um, like, I think there are some small farms that do this sort of thing, but, like, there is zero... I mean, it's the same in Europe, like, but... Like, Australia has generally, you know, it's like half of the, well, most of the countries are desert. It's very easy for desertification to take hold in, in Australia, and it already has in many cases. And there are popular movements within the agricultural industry and community of farmers who are, you know, experimenting with various forms of soil regeneration, uh, you know, agroforestry or... Uh, you know, all of the sorts of good regenerative practices that are based. Um, it's not really coming from the top down. The government in Australia is fucking horrendously corrupt and will do whatever they can to destroy any remnants of the natural environment in their country for God knows what reason. They're just evil. <laughs> They're just how I sleep at night knowing my enemies are ontologically evil. I don't know, they just want money, they're, 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 they're just fucked. Um, but yeah, and what, from what I've seen, a lot of these experiments in Australia have been quite successful. And Australia is a relatively difficult environment. Uh, again, most of the country is a desert. It's not like... And a lot of these cases, I mean, you're getting lands that used to be like extremely sandy soil that no one would believe you can grow anything on without potassium and nitrogen fertilizers. Like no one would believe it. And then within like a matter of less than a decade, these places are completely transformed into, you know, grasslands or fields where you can actually grow crops. Uh, you know, and during that transformation process, they're also still being productive. You know, like if you're putting, like, what is it, nightshades put nitrogen into the soil? And um, uh, beans, fava beans, if I remember correctly. It's been a while, I don't really remember this stuff. But so these, you know, you're, you're, 
there are many people experimenting with this sort of thing. Top cell depletion is is very reversible. It's like surprise, it's not easy, um, but like the the scale is hard. But the time frame is actually not as bad as like there's a moment where it gets too far where like okay now it's just the Sahara Desert you're not going to succeed in turning this back into dirt so you got to do this quick before it gets too fucked up but if you do manage to do it you know you're talking like you know it's it's not too hard to reverse these effects as long as you get it before the crucial point that's my understanding of the situation any soil ecologists or whatever who are in the comments that want to correct me on any of the nonsense I just said please feel free to um, the next issue I talked about was um, ocean acidification. That's just fucked. That's just a that's a carbon that's a carbonic acid thing, which is a carbon emissions thing. So that's fucked. <laughs> We're not gonna have any fish anymore, which is a bit of a bit of a problem. Um, and then what was the last thing I said? Fuck. Uh, oh, this resource scarcity I think is another situation. I mean, this is not something you can solve, right? But it's another situation that just pushes more and more people to sort of oh, uh, uh, away from, how do I put it, like, I don't know, I don't, I'm not even going to really be able to make predictions on this level, you know, like I can't say, uh, for example, I've seen a bunch of these like Duma, Duma College, I don't know, Duma College is the thing that like, uh, these sorts of people, the do deep ecology, reed desert, eco whatevers, like the guy who makes that 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 fucking sieve boot OS or something like this, I think it was him, and he was writing this blog post about how like you can read his blog on his website, and he's just talking. He's like every time there's a new blog post, this is it, it's over now. He was saying this when the supply chains like quote unquote collapsed during COVID, I read a blog post that was like, this is it. This is the big supply chain collapse. And uh, like, this is it. This is the moment you, you, you know, it's done. Where it turns out those supply chains, you know, still exist or they've been replaced. It wasn't the end of industrial capitalism in any way. And he hasn't really you know, all he said, I think, in response to that was something like, okay, well, this time they fixed it, but eventually it's going to get... It's like, you know, this eventually it's going to... Something, like, I still can't help but think back to Deleuze and this nothing has ever been destroyed by its own contradictions thing. Like, the process can just intensify forever. Like, what if, what if the process can just intensify forever? Like, I think that this Sophie from Mars video... She is, she is like shockingly positive uh, in many ways. Like, for example, um, I forget what she was even talking about in this section, but she was talking about how like there was some piece of media that she was watching and it was like, oh, in the case of like these, these climate collapse wars or whatever, like you assume that the military and all of these institutions would just continue to follow orders uh, even when they could clearly see that these things were actively destroying the planet that they live on and making their lives worse, but they would just continue to do it. And she said, like, I don't think you can assume that. I think it's much more sensible to assume that people, once they realize what's going on, will just ig ignore this. They will stop following orders. It, you know, they will, you, you won't be able to, like, wage some sort of capitalist, I don't know, whatever the fuck she's talking about. Like, I disagree with her. I think people uh, will just continue to, I, I think um, the, the masses, insofar as they can be said to exist, are an inertial force. They, you know, once, they've, once they're doing something, they keep doing it, and if they're not doing anything, they don't want to start doing it. Uh, and it's really hard to change this. Um, I, yeah, I, I think uh, people... I think she literally said it because no one wants to die. Like, this is the bit where I literally disagree. I think that's not true. I think we all have this sort of death drive and people will literally do it even if it's killing them. Um, for no... Like, if you even ask what reason, they wouldn't even have one. I think people will just do it anyway because they're just doing it just for its own sake. Um, like... 
like you know some some like militia security what or or, or or military protecting a pipeline as if they're just going to suddenly ignore orders because they realize shit's gotten so bad that this pipeline like no they're not going to do that i just don't buy it they're just going to the, the people who join these sorts of groups who are going to be willing to be hired as private security for oil company or willing to you know follow you know join the, the military and murder people they they like don't have this sense that you think that they have where they're thinking through the consequences of their actions and how they like no one thinks they make any impact on the world right i mean they will literally it's it's it's, just, it's the same as the just following orders thing like it will just be bureaucratized is that a word it will just be turned into some bureaucratic process that takes place you know off in the some office building somewhere it's like oh you don't have to think about this don't worry we've paid some bureaucrat to create some sort of form that thinks about it for you like that's what's going to happen which is yeah i'm not very confident about this <laughs> that, that, like she seems to think that like this sort of situation where capitalism can't survive ecological collapse like people will will realize this as things get worse and like band together to create some sort of communist anarchist utopia whereas i don't see that being the case i think that the the communist anarchist whatever the fuck will not it will not be some sort of utopia it will probably actually suck because most people will have to do a lot of farming work um and it will just be a matter of necessity for whoever the fuck is, you know, manages to survive some sort of ecological disaster, right? Like, if you have some sort of ecological disaster in your community and it cuts you and there's the, the government is stretched too thin to send you any help, you have no choice but to try and, you know, figure something out in the aftermath. And in many cases, these people are just going to reproduce the hierarchies of whatever system they were brought into, brought up in. You know, and that will inevitably lead to whatever the fuck it inevitably leads to. Um, and then in some cases, they'll probably form something similar to sort of a com communal system. And it will just be that. It won't, be a, it won't even necessarily qualify as a society. Um, and maybe that's a good thing. You know, there's, an, there's definitely an argument to be made there. Um but but it's not you know fully automated luxury gay space communism it's it's <laughs> basically uh, you know you know what it is right it's a bunch of people working on a farm because they need food and uh you know the world isn't gonna end like i think this is the the video is called the, something like that, right? Like, what's it even called? The world isn't ending, or something like this. The world is not ending, right? But the the truth is that the world was never ending, and she still uses the language of like, oh well, people will stop when they realize it's the end of the world, right? But the world is not ending. You can't end something that doesn't have a beginning. Like, what do you mean the what end of the world? What is the world? the world historical not really i mean unless all humans are white the, the end of humanity it's not going to happen you think that the humans aren't going to be able to survive just because a lot of places are flooded humans will survive okay maybe not that many of humans but some of them i'm sure like nothing's gonna there's no shot that things can ever become like, it's just the end of industrial society at worst. That's a worst case scenario. It's the end of industrial society. Like, it's not like... For most of human history, people... There were way fewer people on the planet, and they didn't live in big cities. You know, some of them did live in big cities sometimes. They migrated maybe to some... But that's confusing. There's too much... It's, it, there's no generalizing here. But they didn't all live in, you know, industrialized urban whatever the fuck we live in right now, right? They weren't 
all pastoralists and they weren't all hunter-gatherers but some of them were and some of them did some sort of horticultural thing and you know they had season you know like this is just if anything's the default state it it's it, there is no default state but 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 Am I making any sense here? Like, it's not going to get worse than it already got worse. This is already... We're already living in the worse, right? I don't know if this makes any sense. I also don't, like, I'm a bit confused about this specific brand of anarchism, anarcho-communism, whatever, I don't know what she calls herself. She sort of says, like, socialism, communism, and anarchism all interchangeably in this video. Um, I'm a bit confused about what she, like, thinks it entails and how it, like, intends to solve the climate crisis. I'm not sure I understand. Like, she hasn't really laid out any sort of vision for what that means. I mean, maybe I still haven't finished the video, so maybe she will. But, like, if what she means is just, like, you know, the, the typical Twitter anarchist idea of how it works, which is just, like, small societies of farmers living communally, farming communal land, somehow in touch with nature, whatever that means. Maybe modelled after, like, the Iroquois Federation or something. Like, yeah? Okay, sure. But that also comes with a bunch of problems. Like, I mean, I, I, I'm, like, this is the, the big thing that everyone always comes back at these societies with, is like, okay, but what about insulin <laughs> like how do you make insulin in this society or you know well in the middle ages there were many people who did sort of communal farming and stuff like that and um they had famines every 12 years like you're arguing that that's better I don't really know. I, I, I mean, I'm assuming that that's what she's trying to get at, right? But I don't think she's read enough post-collapse type theory. And I also haven't. There's a lot out there. But, like... I, I say she hasn't read enough. I'm being, like, mean I, I, when I say this sort of thing. Because I feel like I'm calling her, like, uneducated. But I'm pretty sure she's read more books than me. Um, what I mean is, I feel like she waves these words around as a magic bullet, as if we're all supposed to understand what it means, without her giving it, but they're all words that have a lot of conflicting interpretations to them, you know? And many setups, which are really bad <laughs> like um you can say we need communism but you obviously don't mean we need stalinism right she clearly doesn't mean that what does she mean then something else vaguely somehow Democratic control over the means of production is supposed to change the fact that fossil fuels work really well for doing energy. I don't understand it. Like, she's just assured that, well, if the workers were in control, they definitely would vote to live in a less productive society that was more ecologically viable. I guess. 
like how would this work because we're talking about a deglobalized system here so what would it even mean to be the workers in her situation like you're talking a reindustrialization of like Europe after decolon decolonializing the rest of the world so a bunch of people working on farms and in factories um I don't know man I'm just but then like that shouldn't set out and what I'm saying is I need like a a positive agenda here rather than just like capitalism is doing the bad thing I can agree with you on that one maybe extend this to industrial capitalism but you know capitalist imperialism you're getting there you're close enough for me I'll accept it good enough for me like okay not just we're going to do this social relation like this is how production is going to happen in terms of like people's relation to productive capacities of society rather than a capitalist mode of production we're going to have a communist mode of production okay explain to me now like what kind of communist mode of production because like you could easily imagine a communized, worker-run, co-op oil company. It could exist. You can, you can just say to yourself, oh, they would never do that. But it could exist. So, like, you need to set up some sort of something more than this, <laughs> you know? Because clearly, you can't simultaneously, you know, talk constantly in the video about the rising far right and how it's it's rising as a populist movement in popularity with the general public talk about just consistently how popular fascist rhetoric is and then say well we hand all of the power over to those people and they will clearly you know all of the climate deniers once we give them power over the means of production they will orient that production away from any ecological problems somehow i don't know i'm not saying it's not possible but i would like a clear something clearer than this you know i would like something some explanation of how that's supposed to happen and why that you know some sort of systemic setup unless she's just saying fuck industrialization in most places in society twitter anarchist you know small communities of farmers um, which is almost certainly better ecologically um, maybe that's what she's saying maybe she's sort of mirroring what I was saying in that old video maybe she's just saying like that's the only thing that will be possible is like you'll be living in some sort of ruins of a societal collapse like the structures will still be there albeit crumbling but there won't be any power to enforce it, not in the hands of government anyway, because that capitalist government will have collapsed due to, or, you know, it will be in the process of collapsing. And there will be this parallel system, something, I don't know, it's, I'm, I just, it, it feels very unclear to me. Like, I would really like some clearly outlined political project beyond just communism will fix it because that doesn't seem self-evident to me maybe it seems self-evident to her I, maybe I'm just more doubtful of communism than she is yeah, a bit confused about this I will keep watching the video though Of course, the end of the video ends with um, the worst thing David Graeber's ever fucking said that ruined leftism forever. That that stupid fucking quote about, like, the world is what you make it or whatever. Uh, you know, I love David Graeber, but um, this is uh, this humanist stuff that I really don't like or agree with. And this is sort of everything that leftists in the mainstream tend to sort of cling to, which I understand it, 
I mean, it's a good way to mobilize people, and it's a much more digestible, um, it's a much more digestible rhetoric than, like, actually, this is all, like, really governed by systems that are largely out of our control, and, like, (coughs) you know, there's a, it's this sort of, like, inability to wrestle, in my opinion, with this basic problem, right, which is, like, you know that communism would be just better for everyone, right, well, at least, except for a small ownership, you know, except for the bourgeoisie, it'd be better for the vast, vast majority of people in society, and a revolution would be, or at least, it would be relatively easy to, sh- like, there's a very clear action on how you just shut down capitalism. You can do it really it's not easy to do, but like it's not complicated conceptually. You just have to have a general strike, right? Like just general strike, all production stops, capitalism grinds to a halt. You can basically do whatever you you like right, in that situation. But that doesn't happen. That continuously does not happen. And this is like the 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 thing that ever that that I think is like the fundamental question that modern leftists are grappling with is like that's weird why isn't that happening because it used to be happening kind of you had the Russian revolution and the Chinese revolution even like the French uh, you know uh, fucking what was it called the commune thing you know what I'm saying and then obviously (coughs) right like what I'm saying is you used to have these people doing communist revolutions or trying and at some point it sort of stopped um and those ones didn't really work out very well according to most people right like the those ones that that seemed to be the thing turned out not to really be the thing um and so lefties are just sort of left wondering like well hold on according to my worldview the world just is what you make it but it, you're wrong. The world, it's not the true... Oh, the David Graeber fucking not quote. I, I, I hate this quote. The, 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 like everyone throws it at the end of, of some sort of thing. It's just like all of this messaging about like... Sub- system, system, systems. It's all about, you know, right? And then suddenly it all just... F- forget about that. Actually, you just... The world is what you make it. It's, not, it's fucking drives me nuts. I don't even... I don't even know if that's what Graeber meant when he said that. Um, but no, uh, the world is not what you make it. We don't get to choose how to construct the world, actually. This is this is my contention. Uh, actually, David, Graeber probably did mean that, because he's kind of big into this idea, but I disagree with him on this. I think that, like, the ways in which the world is constructed, they might flow through humans, or something that looks like humans, but they're not originating from humans. They're originating from external external factors, the outside. So, like, um, like you know, some sort of environmental factor, technological developments, um, which seem to happen like basically at random. I mean, you can throw a bunch of money at them, but like, you don't know which ones are going to be revolutionary and which ones aren't. Uh, like, there's a you know, technological <coughs> development, not in terms of progress. I said development. Uh, it happens effectively at random because you're just poking at the world and you never know which part you, that you poke at is going to be good, you know, until you do it. Uh, normally it's material science that tends to be the, the really big driver of change, at least fundamentally. Uh, this is my opinion. Like it's, 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 it's all just a, like a setup of inhuman... The human subject, like, doesn't even need to... There's no need for the human subject in this, like, analysis, I, I don't think. I think this is, like, a big fallacy. Um, <clears throat> that, like, you just sort of have these... I've been looking into this, like, systems theory stuff, right? You just have these closed systems, and they sort of do their thing. They communicate internally. They don't... They, they're closed off. They can't communicate with each other, but they can be sort of disrupted or disturbed by each other, um, like interlinked in some way, and uh, that's it. There's no, 
need to have a human subject to have some sort of analysis about the world. And you don't need it to do fucking leftism. It just makes it worse. <laughs> you, you don't need to put... You don't need to somehow... Tr- it, you're just ruining your theory by just, like, appealing to God, essentially. <laughs> you know, you, you're just... You have this, some decent analysis, and then you just at the end go, and God will fix it. Uh, that's how it feels to me when people do these David Graeber things. It's just like... Uh, well, this thing that we made up, the human, can fix the, or change this thing that we made up, society. It's like, no, these two beings never interact with each other. There are no human beings in, in society. Or these two things never interact with each other. There are no human beings in society. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is, so this is why I think the climate doomerism is actually, it, it should be, at its heart, the perfect, I say doomism, maybe not doomism is not the right word, but climate collapse is like the best post-humanist argument for, so for, for communism, right? Because you take a look at this thing that is entirely, you know, caused by inhuman industrial machinations and chemical processes and so on, uh, on timescales and in scales of all kinds, larger than any subject, human subject, um, and something that like even relatively well organized groups of humans seem to be unable to disrupt in any meaningful way uh, given a lot of effort right because there is quite a lot of money power like not as much money and power as is sustaining you know global fossil fuel industry but there is still quite a lot like out of all the movements in the world the environmental movement is one of the stronger activist movements with in many different variations most of them liberal but you know nonetheless right um like this is a very and then if you look at this this like you know take away humans from the equation unless you're just looking at the economic systems and the material reality or whatever you see that like well i don't see how global hegemonic capitalism can survive uh ecological collapse right? you, again at no point do you have to worry about humans in this uh, and then you right do you understand what I'm saying like why then undercut your entire argument which is like finally there's this inhuman process which is I mean it, it's almost like the Marxist dialectic right destroyed by its own contradictions thing um, to become, I say destroyed, but it goes above itself and becomes itself simultaneously, uh, as I understand Hegel, which is to say I don't understand Hegel. Um, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, why ruin this by then making some nonsense about how how you can save the world? You can't save the world. You can't do shit. You don't exist really as a like your subjectivity doesn't need to play into this in any way. Giving people this idea is just misleading. This is my opinion. There was also some other like factual errors in the video that I thought were like wrong, given what I know. But I don't want to fucking go through and just nitpick and fact check the entire video because we're really talking about like the the overarching essence of what's being said. I don't know about this, man. I mean, there's also, like... I don't know. I don't know. I, I'd say it was a good video. I'd say, like, generally speaking, I agree with the ideas presented. I'm a little skeptical of this vision of societal collapse or ecological collapse leading to... Like, I think that this is very inspired by this one particular book, which seems to be have a very extremist view on how bad climate change is. Like, again, I really don't want to come off as some sort of the climate denialist because I absolutely am not one in any way. But I have read various accounts of climate catastrophe, some of which line up with what this person is saying, but many of which don't line up with what this person is saying. That, you know, there, there doesn't, and this is not just in, like, popular science communication. This is in 
the field of climate science. Like, everyone agrees shit's fucked, okay? There's no denialism here. And there are very few lukewarmists, right? Which is like, yeah, climate change is real, it is caused by humans, but it's not that bad. That's the lukewarmist position. Those are few and far between in climate science, right? But there is still room for discussion between four degrees rise equals everyone dies and, like, you know, shit's going to be really fucked, but, like, civilization probably won't collapse, right? Like, there's a, there's a middle ground there, which I feel like this is, is kind of being ignored. Like, this is why I stopped being such a, a, a green anarchist, you know, Reed Desert guy, is because I started reading more varied accounts of climate change and ecology and realized, actually, this stuff that these people are very certain about is not certain. Like, there was, oh, fuck, I wish I could remember this book I read. There's this book that was all, it was by a climate scientist, and it was about, like, dispelling a bunch of, like, commonly repeated statistics that were very, like, you know, uh, doomery, very, like, <clears throat> fuck, I forget what the book was called. But it was, yeah, it was, it was a, I didn't finish the book. It, it was, it was by a climate scientist, and it was about, like, taking a look at a bunch of statistics that get parroted around and a bunch of, like, messages that get parroted around, and, and, like, seeing where they originated from, and then comparing it to the actual data, and showing that, like, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, this is where I got my thing about, like, climate, you know, global warming is probably not the actual real issue here, because this is basically what, like, uh, this partially came from this guy. Uh, he wasn't a climate scientist. What was he? He was some sort of scientist. I don't remember what he was. Maybe he was a climate scientist. Fuck, I don't remember. I remember he said he was, like, in the Congo doing something when he was at the lithium mines or something. I don't fucking remember. Anyway, that book was interesting. And there were other things similar to it. Um, like, there's this regenitarianism blog that I quite like. It talks about soil regeneration and regenerative farming. I believe he made a video, or he made a blog post about, like, how the doom and gloominess is, like, partially based in bad science, or, like, not necessarily bad science, bad science communication, like, misinterpreting data, or taking, like, what fringe scientists take, say, seriously. But at no point is he saying ecological collapse, or ecological disaster isn't imminent. He's just saying... Um, the the modes in which people are saying that it's imminent are actually, yeah, it's this, beyond hoax and apocalypse. It's like, there's actually some middle ground between, like, either there's an apocalypse coming or um, a, the climate change is a hoax, right? Like, there's actually, uh, you know, some middle ground. Yeah. 2018, researchers from UC Berkeley published a comprehensive study for three time periods from 1967 to 2015 on the causes of fire in California on different types of managed land. This is the thing, right? He, this guy's a land, land management guy and a soil scientist. Um, and this was super fascinating. So, you know, you hear a lot about how, like, the increase in wildfires in North America is because of global warming. But, at least according to this study, uh, relatively minor effect of climate variables, like average maximum temperature, annual, average annual precipitation, precipitation, and average annual topsoil moisture content by volume, compared to ownership, firefighting, and reserve status. Um... Furthermore, if climate change were the main driver, then all land irrespective of management would have been equally impacted. That wasn't what they observed. Federal ownership of land had over a 4.5 times increase of fire probability than a degree Celsius increase of temperature. So in reality, uh, this is like something that I, you know, am tentatively... It seems good to me, but I don't know enough about science to say I fully agree with it. Critical support. Critical support for... Uh, sometimes people will push just being shitty 
right? Like, like the government not spending money on something because they're conservatives to manage that, like poor land management practices. And then they'll be like, we couldn't do anything. It was the climate. You know what I mean? Like in reality, they're pushing this thing off onto this, gra- you know, these people are just fucking up. You know what I'm saying? And at no point is he saying that, like, extreme weather events aren't increasing or anything like this. But, like, you can have... These two things can be true at the same time. Um, But a lot of these fires and stuff... Better battery storage and... Contributing factors. Okay, yeah, this is basically it. So he's he's saying, <clears throat> you know, now this guy has some bad opinions. Don't get me wrong. I've seen him have bad opinions on Twitter. But, um, he has good opinions about land management and soil ecology, which is what I really care about talking, seeing his stuff about. I think this is accurate. It seems accurate to me. Right, that like, it would it would it seems believable that people who don't want to invest in proper land management practices would simply cheap out on them and then blame the resultant wildfires on climate change. That seems reason. That seems like a realistic event that would happen, given what I know about the world. That seems likely. It also seems very likely that. Climate change does have an impact as well, and is real and caused by humans and so on. But, like, do you understand? So sea level rise is something I'm also very confused about. Because I've seen, like, so many conflicting models about sea level rise. Like, you see these maps of, like, this is what the world's going to look like when the ice caps melt. And it's just, like, insane... I don't think any climate scientists, like, actually believe this. I think that, like, there's, like, way more going on that I don't understand. But you just see this, like, these insane maps where, like, everything's underwater. Um, And it's not to say that this isn't happening in some sense. You know, there are many, like, smaller island nations that are being flooded and floods are becoming more prevalent in many cases and so on. It's just that, like, I I don't think that these models where like you know all of fucking new york is now atlantis like i think that i i think i've seen loads of stuff talking about how like this isn't realistic because of this this and this reason um i need to look into it more before i tell you before i actually like form an opinion on that though um you know, I'm not saying it's not a real threat by any means unless you know maybe you in the comments can tell me something about this uh, yeah, but, but back to get back to that book I was talking about earlier, like this is the thing that that he's talking about in that book is he talks about a bunch of these statistics and maps and figures and all of this stuff, and you know, sometime somewhat debunks them, right? To say like actually a lot of this climate change stuff is probably not as like alarming as you think it is, but the second half of the book is. But there is still actually massive man-made ecological disaster in all of these cases that doesn't get talked about because everyone only talks about climate change. That, like, look at all of this, like, massive environmental disaster that is the large-scale, like, mining operations for cobalt and so on and how dependent our economies are beyond fossil fuels on, you know, some of these other things like lithium or whatever, right? Uh, And look how human rights abuses occur here and how terrible they are for the ecology and he goes on to talk about a bunch of other stuff including topsoil erosion and soil health which is a massive concern that goes hugely uh, unreported on and just sort of gets lumped in with climate change even though it honestly doesn't have that much to do with climate change itself um yeah okay there we go those are my some of my fucking takes I will say, nonetheless, even though I don't believe that the human subject has much of a play in the grand machinations of history, um, I will say 
That video did encourage me to try growing potatoes when I get back to London. I think I will try and grow potatoes at some point because I've been meaning to do that for ages. And in the video she grows mushrooms and I would like to grow mushrooms but mushrooms aren't very useful to me. They look cool but they're not very useful. Whereas potatoes are actually delicious and nutritious and easy to grow. And I can make a bunch of them and give them to my neighbours if I have too many. Which will improve my social relationship with my neighbours, which is good. Because I think everyone likes potatoes, right? Like, no one's going to be like, no, I don't want your potatoes. Or if, they, if I don't feel like doing that, I can probably just eat all of them myself. Which is also good because they're tasty. I've just spent the last, like, three days doing nothing but playing... Trolger, High Tower, TF2, which I'm getting, I wouldn't say good at, but compared to how I started, much better at. And listening to episodes of the Pill Pod and other, just researching critical theory and this stuff. And then thinking about this Sophie from Mars video more, and then reflecting on. Nick Land, who was, like, my introduction to thinking about weird Deluzzo Guattari fucking postmodern nonsense. Um, and thinking about it, and just, like, I don't want to say I'm doom appealed. I'm just, like, very disappointed that, like, how do I put this? It seems like there's, there's a bunch of, the, the paradigms, I'm basically, what's happened to me in a macro scale, in a macroscopic sense, is I used to be kind of into this weird theory stuff, and then it all went really boring on Twitter, because everyone, as they tend to do, which is the same thing, I mean, if you remember Accelerationist Cave Twitter or whatever, I caught the tail end of it, and when it collapsed, it collapsed into, like, an ever-fragmenting ACC, starting off with left and right, and then both of which I thought were shit, which is why Unconditional Accelerationism became a thing, but that project never really developed, Mainly because it can't develop. Because, as I saw someone describe it, I think it might have been Mark Fisher that was actually said this. Accelerationism isn't something you do, it's something that happens to you. It's, it's describing a process in the world rather than a normative, uh, you know, actionable praxis. Unlike other strains of political thought. So you can't really organize a movement around accelerationism because it's not you 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 can't do anything. It's something that happens to you, right? I mean, you could you could you, I, I you could organize some sort of system of analysis some sort of system like like an academic study of acceleration but you can't organize a political project of acceleration, right? It's too beyond organization. And the problem even with ex with an academic study of it is, as is proven by Nick Land, uh, by the time you've even gotten a grasp on it, you, it's already moved out from underneath you, as you can see with cryptocurrent, Nick Land's cryptocurrent, right? By the time he even finished writing the first chapter of his thing about Bitcoin, Bitcoin had already collapsed and the world had already moved on. Um, like the the processes in many cases have accelerated to the point where you don't even get time to talk about them anymore. By the time you even manage to make some analysis, the world has moved out from underneath you. Um, you know, I think we can see this in the state of like philosophers that like for for a few thousand years it was basically just the Greeks, and then it was like a slight increase of medieval Christian philosophers. And then you had the Enlightenment philosophers, where there's like five or six of them that anyone cares about. And then as you get closer to modernity and then post-modernity, you get, you know, like suddenly concentrated within a few years, a whole bunch of these French philosophers, or not just French, but, you know, all of them. 
and 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 then you know more and more. And Nick Land had to literally drive himself insane in the nineties. I mean, like this is a well documented thing, right? This isn't a meme. He literally self. In- I mean, it's kind of like Nietzsche drove himself mad to do philosophy properly, right? Like. And actually, I was reading this Mark Fisher thing about how Nick Land is like our generation's Nietzsche. Not, uh, but, you know, in the sense that he kind of floods with fascists. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, Nick Land purposefully induced like psychosis through psychedelics and amphetamine usage in order to do philosophy that turned out to be about 15 years ahead of the curve. But now we're about five years past his 15 years ahead of the curve. And so a lot of Nick Land's philosophy, you know, you look back on it and it seems kind of outdated, weirdly outdated compared to stuff from the 60s, you know, to me, which seems only more and more relevant. Well, I don't know about that, actually, not necessarily more and more relevant, but, you know, Foucault, Guattari, Derrida... I don't know why I said Guattari instead of Deleuze. Deleuze and Guattari, Derrida, fucking, um, what's the guy's name? Baudrillard. They're all very relevant still. Like, yeah. Whereas Nick Land was really good at being 15 years ahead of the curve. He doesn't, doesn't have the timelessness of the really great philosophers, right? Where... Or I don't know if that's necessarily true. Look, all I'm saying is, I think there's some valid criticisms of Nick Land when it comes to, like, confusing criticisms from the left, right? Which, it, like, as Mark Fisher's criticisms and stuff like this. Like, the, this idea that he confuses the deterritorializing force behind capital with capital itself. Uh, like, that's a valid criticism. Like, he doesn't understand that there's got to be a re-territorializing force that comes after it. He somehow still thinks, like, capitalism and technological innovation are, like, the same thing, even though you can see plainly phenomena like stagflation and stagnation where it's like, oh, if capitalism is, like, this technologically innovative force, how come... It's the same iPhone every year. Is that the best capitalism can manage? I guess there are counter arguments, but you know. I still think that Land is onto something, like very poignant, even if I don't agree with him for 100%. I mean, not to go into any specific, like, I guess this is close to like machinic desire or something, but like. The the idea of capitalism as, like, land is going to say capitalism is a alien force. And it, no, capitalism is an alien superintelligence from the future constructing itself in the past or in the present, right? Whereas, you know, I might not totally think that that's the case, but... I definitely think it's accurate to say capitalism is a lot like an alien superintelligence from the future constructing itself in the past. It's a lot like that. Um, And I like, I don't know, I'm more and more, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking a lot of this stuff through. I disagree with, I mean, I disagree with a lot of his economic libertarianism takes. Like, I think that this stuff is, like, historically inaccurate. I think, you you read David Graeber's stuff, and it kind of disproves a lot of this stuff about, like, Nick Land's, more modern Nick Land's, like, libertarian economics. Like, I've sort of seen him just repeating nonsense von Mises memes about, you know... Oh, you don't... He said something about how it's, like, mathematically fucking Kantian, like, a priori, synthetic a priori truth about economics, where it's like, oh, you don't need to, like, measure 
the environment or know anything about the world or anything to know that like increasing the minimum wage will increase unemployment because it would, it's just true by pure thought which is obviously nonsense at least it, by my <clears throat> understanding of economics this doesn't seem to be how the world works um i don't think that nick land has a very good idea of like how modern economies actually function as most libertarians don't like a lot of the absurd functionings of modern cap i mean not even that let's not even talk about that like you just talk about like the actual relations between the state and the economic sector and how there's this idea that they're at war with each other or somehow go against each other but in reality there's never been a historical moment where there's been one without the other um at least in any like of their modern like in terms of money right obviously you can have a state without the economics and you can have economics without a state but you can't have capitalist economics without a state at least it doesn't seem to be the case historically um, the state has to enforce capitalism I mean it's just very obvious right you uh, you can't what is money money is a bit of metal with the king's head printed on it right why would the state give everyone a bunch of coins with a picture of the king on it and then be like actually you have to give me some of that back as taxes i mean graver has a good answer for this i'm not going to get into it but so i'm kind of kind of gone on a little detail here but i wanted to talk about i mean what i wanted to say is just how i'm like i'm i'm disappointed with like like i don't like capitalist realism I've I've come to realize I although I think it's a very well written book and it clearly resonates with a lot of people I just don't agree that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. It may have been the case when I read that book but I've put a lot of effort into imagining the end of capitalism since then and I feel like I can do it like without too much difficulty. I can imagine many different ends to capitalism that don't have the end of the world as a prerequisite i'm not going to describe them because that's a different phenomenon fisher didn't say you can't describe the end of capitalism anyone could describe the end of capitalism it's about imagining but i don't know about you i feel like i can imagine it in various not just in one way but in multiple potential futures um and because of this, you know, I'm, it makes me very disappointed in the left where they still think it's like May 68 in Paris and they're going to, I don't know, d d all they can think about in terms of a fundamental shift in social relations or whatever is only the mode of production. That's what they limit themselves to. And maybe some of them are like, the state is also bad. But I don't necessarily believe that revolutionizing social relations is this like i don't necessarily agree that modes of production are this definitional historical epoch thing they they always coexist with each other and you know i i mean i can really easily imagine a communist world that is just very very like exactly the same as or not exactly but i like, what is, if communism is just democratic ownership of the means of production, then, like, you can imagine a world where basically all of the same shit exists, except there's no managers and bosses, they're just, all the companies are worker-controlled and worker-owned.
Like you can, you, I, I don't know about you. I feel like I can imagine a world where everything is equally shit as it is right now. Like there's nothing about a worker controlled Google that means it wouldn't collect your data and spy on you and sell that to the government to spy on you. You know, nothing about that implies that people seem to imagine it does, but I don't believe it. I mean, I can very easily imagine a worker owned, worker controlled or worker managed democratically organized no bosses horizontal uh shell or bp or exxon mobile doing the same thing that they're currently doing i can Im- like do you want is what you want fucking a democratic <laughs> worker control and ownership of the means of production for the british east india company because to me like i don't i don't see how i think like that's a pretty funny meme the democratic worker ownership of the East, British East India Company is a funny meme. Write that down, someone. That's a funny image in my head. Uh, like, this is not... This is this is how you end up with problems, <laughs> in my opinion. Like, I think... The first thing is we got to do away with... Like, even Marx didn't agree with this. we got to do away with this humanism nonsense... Like, I'm, I'm, the more I've been thinking about it, the more I realize, like, I'm not just post-humanist, like, I'm pretty much anti-humanist. I think it's, like, a massive misguided step in thought, this, this whole construction of the human subject as the center of, um, the central historical agent or whatever. I just think this is a massive misstep, and I think it's fucking us. Like, this is how you get this insane stuff, like, this this Sophie from Mars thing about, oh, we got to make a fucking economic system based on love. Like, what are you, like, you may as well just be farting into a microphone and calling that theory. Like, it's insane. I, I think it's deeply misguided. Um, but then, you know, simultaneously, this is the thing, right? Is, is you, you want, what you want is to have some theoretical framework. You want to have some really good analysis of the world as it is, and hopefully the world as it will be, right? Like, like you know, Foucault's analysis of power. Like, here is a really rigorous and detailed, you know, analysis of power in many spheres. And then what you want to come out of that is, okay, now that we've understood it, how do we dismantle it? But you're never going to get that answer because there's, well, I think actually, um, was it Derrida who said this about Foucault? Fucking, I think it might have been Derrida. Like, if you're in a position where you can do that, where you can create this sort of perfect analysis, then it's already, you've already fucked like, by the time you're, you're in a position to do that, uh, it already doesn't matter. I don't know if this makes any sense, but, it, like, if, if, if you can characterize something as this totalized system and you can analyze all of its, like, inner workings and how it all meshes together, and, it, that, and that system turns out to be, to, turns out really well, right? Like, your analysis makes perfect sense and describes all of this in, in, in exquisite detail then, you know, there's no gaps left for you to poke holes in it anymore. Whereas the opposite is true. This is why I like Nick Land's characterization of capital, is that if your your fundamental characterization of something is it's this eldritch Lovecraftian alien force working through us, that, like, you're, 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 you're implanting, you're in imprinting into that the all of these unknowable qualities and those unknowable qualities are the 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 points of of um you know the the chinks in the armor right because if you have a system that already works perfectly you there's no 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 bit to attack
So what have you even done by describing it? You just figured out that there's no bits to attack? I don't know. Yeah, this is why, like, you get this deterministic um, Marxist idea of capital, where it's like, well, you follow the line, right? You, like, imagine there's some graph, and the graph cuts off at some point. You can extend, you can you can make a prediction about where the graph is going to go by just extending the line. Like, that's 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 the point of the, the Marxist analysis, is like, here's how I think capital works, capitalism works, um, and here's its, you know, let's do a, a dialectic and see what's going to end up as a result. And it's like, well, here's the tensions. The only way to resolve those tensions would be communism. So therefore, that's how it has to end. But like, I mean, obviously, I think that the premises are false in a lot of cases. Um, but it also it, it, it's try it's it's doing this view from nowhere thing, right? It's doing this view from nowhere thing. I don't know. I want more, like, this is what I'm saying. This, like, there was a point where I was on, on this Twitter, I'm going back now, was, this is a very schizophrenic segment. There was this point where this Twitter weird theory segment was, was popping off and it was cool, and you had the accelerationisms, everyone was making new ones, it was a wacky time. And then, at a certain point, everyone sort of realized that, well, I don't really know if they realized or what happened, but everyone just sort of disintegrated back into left and right. That like a lot of the, the, the esoteric or like more strange and out there and interesting R ACK people just became R people. <laughs> they dropped the ACK and they just they just were like, you know, they just became trad cats or whatever boring shit, and the L ack people just went back to being Marxists, and the U ack people just disappeared. They just stopped doing anything. Uh, maybe they I don't know they 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 just I have no idea what happened to them. They just they just melted away into nothingness. And then, you know, you get this e act. this is the, the newest act. I don't know if you've heard about this, effective accelerationism, which I don't know if I've criticized this enough before, but it's fake. It's not accelerationism. It misses the point fundamentally of... It, 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 it's a fundamental misinterpretation of, of land, in, as many of these things tend to be. Um, and, yeah, it's just... What I'm saying is... It all just melted back into this this stupid paradigm and everyone became obsessed with all of this nonsense, including Nick Land himself, just became obsessed with like a, you know, stupid fucking boring nineteenth century race science and <laughs> you know, bad analyses of the philosophy of Bitcoin. Uh, you even had this section where it was like Moldbug was kind of doing interesting stuff, right? Like, I like Moldbug. I think he's a good writer. I think he's funny. Obviously, I, I don't necessarily agree with all of his ideas. Um, but I think it's, it's worth reading just at the very least to get a sense of, you know, what's going on inside the heads of people who are anti-egalitarian right-wingers. And I think it's fine. Like, I don't think... Maybe you'll disagree with me and I'll get cancelled for saying this nine hours into a podcast that no one's listening to who would be bothered to cancel me. But, like, I don't think it's inherently a bad thing to be constantly pushing back at liberal values. 
and and questioning is egalitarianism really something that's valuable is democracy really something that's valuable is freedom something that's really you know like it's good to have um pushback there because it forces you to re-examine your fundamental values and come up with justifications for them or abandon them if they're not justified and i think in some cases there are parts of these things that ought to be abandoned like for example this misidentification of equality or now no one says equality anymore they've started saying equity which is just meaningless difference it's a distinction without a difference but um like the problem isn't for example the the real problem is not really wealth inequality it's the fact that having a lot of wealth it's 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 the 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 transferability the um exchange exchangeability of 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 wealth and power that like there's a, there was uh, it's it, it, this comes up in brief, briefly in the new history of humanity um that like there were there were native american societies that were broadly egalitarian but they still had wealth imbalance because that just sometimes happens that they had they had situ- i mean it wasn't as bad as it is nowadays obviously that's this is an extreme level of wealth imbalance they had some level of wealth imbalance but having more wealth than someone else didn't give you power over them in any real sense i mean you know you can say like it it wasn't it wasn't allowed it wasn't it wasn't a part of the system right so it's not necessarily wealth and i mean you know if, if in a case where people can't afford basic necessities of life it's different and the wealth is concentrated so heavily in the like top four richest people on earth then it's different it's not unhelpful as a political goal entirely uh but you know the the, the wealth itself is is to, the the problem is the transferability of wealth into power under capitalism not the the fact that there's an inequality of wealth so you know these sorts of pushbacks on these sorts of ideas are good because it forces you to challenge and understand the the actual underpinnings of what's going on here like i mean you can even i think make some pretty valid criticisms of democracy even direct democracy um i've seen some ana- i've seen some anarchist criticisms of democracy which i thought were like 50% garbage and 50% actually not bad right like th- there's nothing you, you understand like th- there's nothing inherently wrong with this in my opinion um yeah what i'm disappointed in is just this like so anyway it it just seems like like everything everyone's just become boring like like all of the people who who would have been doing interesting accelerationism weird shit i've just moved on and like half of them are just disappeared all the ones on the left just disappeared and the ones on the right they just all got sucked into this this cali acc cult i know saying it's a cult is like to giving it too much credit it's a it's a stupid one of these fucking it's it's one of these like situations that i mean there's a reason that it devolved into an nft project <laughs> <laughs> is that it's fun it's based on the same premise as nfts are based on which is this idea of like um i guess meta irony like where it's both something genuine and ironic but the irony actually hides the fact that it's genuine but it's fake but it's real kind of thing and that like if you get it you get to say that you're part of the in group that gets it and that's the whole point there's not act- the actual ideas don't matter what matters is if you're it, you you get to say that you're part of the in group that gets it and feel special about yourself which is why it devolved into an nft crypto meme 
because that's what that whole sphere is all about. It's about having these memes that are like they mean they they say on the surface one thing, like let's say wag me, right? We're all gonna make it, but you you know fundamentally that this is not the case. We are not all going to make it. Everyone knows this. You can't say that because you would be spreading FUD. So you don't say that. And you come to believe that by simply not saying that it's not... You understand? It's a feedback loop where the more you believe it, the more true it becomes. And the the distinction between what is the, the being said ironically or performatively and what is being said like genuinely breaks down and in that breakdown you get to feel like you're really smart because you're like look we've broken this thing down that most people like hold to be sacred but in reality you're wasting your money on pictures of, on, on jpegs <laughs> you know <laughs> like, that's, if everyone else thinks you're an idiot so it was all built on that, and then a bunch of people sort of fell for it, because I, I don't think they, they all were just, like, I mean, they were doing what I do, which is pretending to have read Deleuze, for some reason. It became fashionable for a while on Twitter to pretend that you'd read Deleuze. And the people who had actually read Deleuze are just, you know, like, like, xenogothic. He's just writing books now. <laughs> he just got a book published. I should probably read his book, it's probably interesting. Um, yeah, I'm just, like, generally speaking, I want, I, I, I was thinking about this, this, that, that Sophie from Mars video, and thinking about, like, I have enough criticisms here that I think are legitimate and concrete that... And th th this video is going to be pretty popular because it's long and YouTube algorithm likes long, high effort content. Like that video is going to do pretty well. It's going to cement this person's popularity in this sort of space. And a bunch of people are going to be exposed to a bunch of ideas, which I think are deeply flawed in many of their premises. To be clear, not all of the video is bad. There's a lot of like feminist theory in the video, which I think is like absolutely spot on. Um, you know, there's stuff like that. But a lot of people are going to see this and just unquestioningly agree with it because someone in a position of influence told them to. And a similar thing was happening in the past with economics on Left Tube. And a guy with an economics degree showed up and was like, made a bunch of videos like, hey guys, you're talking out of your asses. This is how economics actually works. And everyone loved him for it. And this guy was called M Unlearning Economics. And he's like one of the only like two good leftist YouTubers. Because he actually knows what the fuck he's talking about. Unlike everyone else. Um, including me. By the way. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about either. Uh, but I could. I was thinking like I could make some sort of video like those early online economics videos where I respond to it and point out how I think it's flawed. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this is a pretty different sphere than that unlearning economics video. Is that like I could just make a video where I basically nitpick the, the factual errors. Like here's something that this person said about statistics of climate change and here are some other studies which show that might not be the case or here's this person's interpretation of this book but if you read the book carefully you'll see it actually says something else I could do that it wouldn't you know it would be boring fundamentally and it wouldn't really be what I'm trying to say because there's also something deeper than that which is not just like oh we're coming from the same place she just made a mistake which is what the unlearning economics video is kind of more so about but actually the more i thought about it the more i realized my real problem is that i don't agree with where she's coming from 
at all because she's coming from this humanist angle, which I think is wrong. And that is not something I can prove with empirical data. Um, it's, it's something, and it's also something that most people are inherently hostile to once you start talking about it, because it includes a bunch of strange ideas that people aren't generally thinking about. Um... Like I, it, this is you. You you understand? So there's like there's a there's a difference between what the projects would be compared to the online economics responses, which were like we're coming from the same place. I'm just gonna like help you out here. I realize what I would actually be doing is something closer to uh, a takedown, where I'm sort of like actually we're not coming from the same place, because. One of my biggest criticisms with the video is I don't think she did a good enough job explaining how communism slash anarchism slash socialism, which she uses interchangeably, uh, is going to solve the climate crisis. She just says we need a, we need a revolution now um, because it's the only way to solve the climate crisis without explaining the mechanics of how such a society would solve the climate crisis or giving any positive view as to what society would look like and then hand waving at Mark Fisher in order to explain why she doesn't have to do that. I don't think that's acceptable. I don't think that is very, I don't think that's good. I don't think it's good messaging and I don't think it's correct. I, I, I think you're hand waving at Mark Fisher to say you don't have to explain anything because you don't have an explanation. As I said, I feel like I can perfectly easily imagine a society in which there is simultaneously communism and global warming. You know, that is not hard for me to imagine. So, yeah, I don't... I don't know about that. And then there's also the aspect to which... Like, basically, I, fun, I disagree with her, her, her outcome, but... The way in which I disagree with her, her, her conclusion, or at least one of her conclusions, is actually quite antithetical to the left, right? It's not, it is like a post-leftist position, or po maybe post-Marxist, right? Like I'm, I'm, unlike on learning economics, who is very much a leftist, and all of the other YouTubers liked him, because it was like, here's this smart leftist who's going to correct me in a way that I actually makes me agree with myself more, <laughs> right? I'm instead saying, no, you're wrong. Uh, communism will solve your problems, even if it were possible, which it isn't. No one's going to like to hear that. Um, and it's, it's, it's such a, it's, it's a, but more importantly, it's a position which goes significantly beyond the scope of responding to one YouTube video, um, which makes it like an impossible task. Uh, like, f fuck, I was going to say something. Yeah, like I would want to bring in some like, I, I would want to steal from some Nick Land Bataille-esque stuff where I talk about energy expenditure and thermodynamics that cosmic libertarianism that like this particular historical meta-narrative of technological development is not just a story right it's based in thermodynamic laws it is it is based around the fact that entropy must increase, that the story of life, be before even human, you know, beyond the story of economics, the story of or history, the story of life is uh, a, a, a thermodynamic process by which the universe expends energy in ever more it figures out ways to waste energy in more and more complicated ways. 
And that's why we started off as single-celled organisms, and now we have iPhones. It's a very explanatory premise, but it requires a lot. It's, it, 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 it fundamentally disagrees with everything. Because it says, like, something like, well, I don't know what it says, to be honest. It says a lot of stuff. It's one of these broad concepts that, like, it's it's almost too broad to have any real, like, predictive power, which makes me, like, suspect of it, even though I think it's right. I've seen enough evidence to think that this is, like, a good explanation. Um, I think, you know, if maybe if you understand what the fuck I'm even talking about, you'll probably, maybe you'll agree with me. Um, but it's also such a broad story. It's such a big narrative, such a big mechanic, that it almost lacks any predictive power. Because the timescales are just too big. And it's so inhuman. Like, you can't take that premise and say, and that's why, you know, even if we have to stop using fossil fuels, we will actually continue to find new ways to increase our energy expenditure. Because the R in that sentence doesn't make any sense, because we're talking about timescales of millions of years and a, a process that goes far beyond the human. So, you, even though it seems to have... You can apply it backwards in time to the history of life, it's too... It's almost too broad to have real power to, to actually be... Well, I don't know if I want to say to be useful. I think it can be useful, but do, I don't know. Do you understand what I'm saying? Hopefully you understand what I'm saying. Like, there's, as long as the, as, there's, there's nothing in this premise which says that there can't be some temporary decrease in entropy, as long as, overall, on a time scale, there's an increase in entropy. Like, there could be a situation where there's some sort of environmental collapse and all of humanity is wiped out and for the time being the earth is actually not is actually not wasting energy in complex ways but then all that means is that at some point in the future there will be a massive you, you see or somewhere else you know like something it has the energy has to get wasted because of just how, how physics works I don't know. Mm. Oh, okay, I'm done talking about this for now. Today, I made gnocchi from scratch. I've been thinking about doing this for a while because potatoes are here. I'm in Eastern Europe, many potatoes. I'm getting kind of bored of just eating, like, when I'm making potatoes, I'm just cutting them up, boiling them, then coating them in, I, you know, once they're done, drain the water, then in the same pot that I boiled in, I'll just put in some butter or olive oil, a bit of salt and pepper, and just, like, basically give it a toss, like, it's, it's almost like frying them, but I'm not really frying them. I'm not trying to get any browning. Sometimes I will bother to get browning on it, but most of the time not. Really just to, like, coat it in fat and so that the seasoning sticks and so it tastes better. Because fat is flavour, but that's good. Or, I'm like, if I want to be a little bit extra, then I'll, you know, boil them, mash them, mashed potato. But I, I was like, you know what? If 
for a while I've been being like gnocchi is like at the supermarket when I normally buy gnocchi it's more expensive than regular pasta um it is really good I do like it a lot I've always liked gnocchi but it's more expensive than regular pasta but I've always thought to myself it should be like cheaper gnocchi was invented at a time when flour was more expensive than potatoes so they used potatoes to make a dough so like theoretically and that's the time that we're living in right now as well potatoes are very cheap in the UK they haven't been affected by Brexit as much as like every other food stuff so but I'm not in the UK I'm in Estonia but I decided to make gnocchi because I've got nothing but time and potatoes in my hands right now um and it turned out pretty well I tried to make enough for two portions so that I could have some for lunch and dinner which I'd successfully achieved um and I didn't follow a recipe or anything I looked up a, I went on YouTube and typed in like gnocchi recipe and there was a YouTube short and I clicked on it and it, it was just like you boil the potatoes you peel them you boil them you mash them, you put flour in, and you boil, then you boil it again. And it, that's easy. So I just did that. And it turned out pretty well. In terms of like, you know, then I I did it. They were gnocchi, <laughs> you know. Uh, I got, I just like tried to copy the texture from the video and what felt roughly right in my hands with the amount of like flour I was putting in. And I think it turned out pretty well. They were maybe flour, a little more floury than typical gnocchi. Like, yeah, I, I might have gone maybe too hard on the flour, but maybe it wasn't too crazy. I don't know. They turned, the texture was good. I, I didn't have any problem with them, other than the fact that um, it, it, for the amount of effort it takes, which is, you know, it's it takes like, what, an hour from start to finish? Maybe, I mean, peel the potatoes, kind of, but and it's not an hour of like just sitting there, right? Like, it's about a lot of active stuff making, peeling the potatoes, cutting the potatoes, boiling the potatoes, draining the potatoes, mashing the potatoes, mixing the flour in the potatoes, making a dough, kneading the dough. You don't really have to knead it, but like mixing it up so it's homogenous. Um, <clears throat> then rolling the dough out, cutting the dough into the appropriate sizes, getting another pot of water on the boil and then boiling the gnocchi and then you know plus making whatever sauce or side you know, like protein or whatever you want with it so it's quite a lot of active effort for just like something that basically tastes the same as just putting some pasta <laughs> on the boil like you, you could just take dry, dry pasta from, I mean it's not exactly the same but the experience is very comparable just like putting dry pasta on and eating a plate of pasta. That was the first gnocchi I ate. But then I just ate my second portion of gnocchi with the leftover dough, portioned out again, cut up the gnocchi, boiled it, but this time I remembered I've seen people fry their gnocchi. They boil it, then they drain it, and then they fry it. And that was fucking elevated, okay? I've never done that before. I always just, I mean, when I have gnocchi, I normally just like, you know, boil it from the store, boil them, and then put them with pesto or something. I don't have any pesto. It like, I just fried them in olive oil until they got like browned. And damn, the textural improvements were significant. And I, yeah, I don't know, it was okay. Would I bother to make gnocchi again? Probably not. It was probably too much effort for what it was. Now, I understand, like, this is t a very typical of these, like, old school, like, relatively old school Italian recipes, where it's like, this is a recipe that makes loads of sense if you have, like, ten people to cook for, and there's five of you <laughs> to make it, and you have all day, which is, like, the traditional Italian household. Like, this, this sort of thing scales really well. What are you doing? There's not going to be any food for you down there, Pinso. Um, 
But yeah, it scales very well. But if you're just making it for one person or two people, I don't know if it's really worth it. Okay, so that's the first thing that happened today. The other thing that happened today is well, I, I was playing Team Fortress 2, and I think I've discovered a entirely new strategy that no one's ever done before in TF2. It's a meme strategy. It's not a, it's not even a play style. It's so niche and not viable. It doesn't even qualify as a play style. Maybe I didn't just invent this. I've just never I've watched every TF2 video on YouTube and I've never seen anyone do this. So, you know, I would assume I I feel like I might have come up with this. But correct me if I'm wrong. The strategy is you go bonk scout, right? You go scout, you equip the bonk atomic punch. Then you find your NG. You find the other team's NG. You drink the bonk. You run towards the NG. And then it only works if they have a level three. You try and like run at the NG himself so that the turret, the turret, oh my god, I'm gonna kill myself. The sentry fires rockets at the NG, killing him. <laughs> <laughs> you could you can get the 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 sentry to shoot rockets at its own engineer and kill the engineer while you're invincible as bonk scout. This is my strategy. I think it's pretty fucking funny. I discovered this because I was doing the 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 classic bonk maneuver where you, I was very bored. I've been playing a lot of TF2 and I've, I kind of got bored of every play style. So I'm now just like, I went scout, equip the bonk and I'm just doing the classic thing where you just drink bonk and then just run out in front of the enemy team and just taunt in front of them <laughs> and then run away. Um, my team, you know, not particularly happy with me, but they didn't kick me. Anyway, that's what I've been up to today. I've also been, like, still slightly on my critical theory kick, thinking about reading a little bit of Baudrillard. 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 Thinking of reading Fatal Strategies, which is not probably a good Baudrillard to start with. I should probably start with Simulacra and Simulation. I just feel like... Well, maybe I'm wrong. What's up? What are you whining about? There's no food for you here. I already ate all of the food. Okay. You know what I don't understand? Maybe I could research this. Like, maybe there's some answer to this somewhere on the internet. The word waifu. Where did... As I understand it, the word waifu sprung up out of, like, nowhere. Because it's 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 obviously supposed to imitate how words like a, a what, what are they called gairaku loan words japanese loan you know like a, speaking in katakana of of the english word wife i don't know why i'm explaining this it's obviously supposed to be how you would pronounce the word wife in japanese but no one's it's not an actual loan word that they use in japan <laughs> it's a made up loan word in japan they say wife for what we call waifus, like anime girls that you feel a strong attraction to. But they say, you know, oyomesan. They say wife in Japanese. They don't say waifu. It's like a weird reverse English thing. I, it's, I, I don't know. I wonder who invented the term waifu. Because it's also, like, I mean, not to get too um, elitist here, but it's it's not generally something people... It's like, it, it was, it's kind of an outdated meme is what I'm saying, right? Like, back in the, the day, everyone said waifu. But now, the people who refer to waifus are generally, like, the the entry-level weebs. The hardcore weebs, they don't talk about waifus. Um, they might, they, they just say my wife. <laughs> I don't know what they say. My daughter slash wife. Um, 
I have seen people say waifu, actually. Maybe I'm being too harsh on the term. Uh, it's an interesting thing. I just think it's worth pointing out. Because you, you would imagine it would be like one of these reverse crossover things where it's like they hear it in Japanese media and they start repeating it. But in reality, as I understand it, unless I'm wrong, it was never a loan word that was popular in Japan. It was a made up loan word from the West. But they also say the same general idea to refer to the concept of waifu, like they say yome, wife, in Japanese. I don't know. I think it's interesting. So there's a guy called Dream Crusher. Um, they're like a. You probably know them if you're like a, into noise weird music. But they, they make noise weird music. They're kind of cool, I guess. But uh, like, as I understand it, Dream Crusher is like pretty well known. Right, like in the space of like noisy, I, I, it's almost like power electronics. I don't really know how to describe their music. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Personally, I, 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 I quite like their music, although I haven't kept up with their newest stuff. Um, let me look up how they're doing on Bandcamp. Uh, yeah, the last thing I listened, to, yeah, I'm pretty far behind. <laughs> I, I listened to, uh, Grudge 2, I think, is the last thing I listened to, which is, like, quite a while ago. So, actually, yeah, I'm pretty far behind on that music. Um, but, uh, they're, they're on Twitter complaining right now. I'm not going to retweet them because I don't... I don't want to start fucking Twitter beef with someone, okay? Like, there's this is stupid. And they're, it's also the, the actual point that they're making is, like, really true. So I'll just read out their tweet word for word. I'm angry that my music has been overlooked for nearly two decades, but I'm grateful to the people that still support and show up for my community and I. I don't want to compromise my expression in order to succeed slash excel, but the way these bills are set up, weird emoji face. So obviously the point, like just to get out ahead of this, the point is true, right? Like uh, this person is obviously struggling financially and shouldn't have to be struggling financially. This is why we need the socialized entertainment industry. Uh, I think I'm just going to go all in on socialized socialized art now. Because it seems like a, the only fucking reasonable solution that I can think of. Um, yeah, I mean, no one should have to feel like they have to compromise their artistic integrity to make a living. People shouldn't, you know, artists shouldn't be out here having to fucking struggle while some, like, you know, one in a thousand of them suddenly become billionaires. That's not how the art industry should work. It's disgusting. And, you know, I wish the best for Dream Crusher. However, this idea that their music has been overlooked is just absolute fucking nonsense. As far as, like... Here, I'm just going to play their most recent song. Okay. I'm going to skip, like, three minutes into this song. Okay, like, to me, this is good shit. Like, I like this type of music. But, like, as you're, like, the peak of success that you can possibly achieve making music like this. Like, what do you expect, Dream Crusher? This is just how, I mean, it's not, it, it shouldn't be how it works. You shouldn't be punished financially for making music like this. But in terms of, like, reaching a broad audience, we both know that, like, there are hundreds of people out there, thousands maybe, who make similar noisy, obtuse music, ab ab abrasive, if you want to use that overused word, and see way less success than you. Like, I know you, I've been following Dream Crusher for ages, okay? This person, they get featured in, like, magazine articles, Bandcamp Daily, you know, they collaborating with pretty big bands. I think they have, like, an ongoing relationship with Show Me The Body, who's, like, a, one of the, the, you know, relatively biggest punk bands out of New York, uh, or, like, hardcore bands. Like, they, they're, like, as far as, like, this type of music goes, they're, like, a celebrity, Right? 
meanwhile, if you go on like here, let me go on. But so the the noise tag they tagged their their music as noise. So let's go on the noise tag, and like sort by by new. Okay, you're gonna find, you know, some fucking. Okay, this isn't this isn't not best selling new arrivals. Okay, I I I click on like this new arrivals to noise thing. Okay, here here's new arrival noise, and like you know. This is just shit, no one's ever bought this, okay? This has literally, you can see on Bandcamp, no one has ever bought this album that I'm playing right now. And if you go through the noise tag, you're gonna find hundreds and hundreds of albums like this. Here, this one, no one's ever bought this. This one, I'm clicking another one. And maybe these are too recent, maybe I need to go here. I think Surprise Me will just give me a random one, right? Okay, here, random one. No one has ever bought this. Not a single person. Okay, not a single person has ever bought this. Another random one. Yeah. No, okay, this one's relatively successful. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 21, 22. 22 people have bought this, right? That is still less than half of the number of people that have that have bought Dream Crush's latest album on Bandcamp. Significantly less than half. Uh, there are loads if you go on back, and this is just their most recent album. Like you look at their most successful releases, and they have you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of of people who have bought these things, and that's just on Bandcamp. If you go on YouTube, here I will look up Dream Crusher on YouTube. Here. Yeah. Okay, sort by popular. I mean, this video has 31,000 views, 19,000 views, 14,000 views. Like, to be a noise musician and get over 10,000 views on something is insane. Like, you're doing really well. What are you talking about? Like, oh, my music's been overlooked for 10... It hasn't been overlooked. What are you talking about? You're getting, like... I'm not, I'm not going to say... You're... This is exactly, this is like, this is success. This is what success looks like. What are you talking about? This is insane. Like, yeah, I'm sure it doesn't, it, it's it's terrible that this isn't translating into, like, financial stability. Like, that's evil. That's part of the evil capitalist system or whatever. But, like, in terms of, and if that's what you're complaining about, then I, of course, completely agree with you. But in terms of, like, success in terms of, like, reaching an audience, this is a lot of fucking success. It's not overlooked. There's no, in no sense is this overlooked. Like, what are you talking about? This is insane. I mean, like, and also the idea that if you made, this is, this is just like not true, right? This idea that like, if you, if you compromised your, your success, your expression, sorry, I don't want to compromise my expression in order to succeed slash excel. Uh, the idea that if you compromised your, your expression, you would succeed. Like, compared to you, right, I'm making more accessible music in, in many cases, okay? Some of my my more, like, post-punk stuff is, or whatever you want to call it, is way more accessible than a lot of this Dream Crusher stuff. And yet, you know, even my most accessible music is not close to fucking, you know, being as successful as your noise music. What I'm saying here is, what are you talking about? <laughs> you're like the Beyonce of noise music. You're you're literally a a a darling uh, of. You should start Twitter feed. You should go like you're the Beyonce of noise music. Adam. You're the it, the it's it's a they them not a him. Oh, I I started. It's a, um. Wait, what was I gonna say? Fuck, I lost my train of thought. You should, you should. You're, you're the darling of, like, every fucking indie press, all the music press loves you. You, you should treat them and treat So this is probably going to be pretty outdated by the time you guys actually end up hearing this. Uh, but uh, there, there's currently the, the Linus Tech Tips scandal is taking place. And you know me, right? I say I'm above it, but I'm never really above it because I, for some reason I have... A, a need to comment on every single piece of ongoing internet drama that happens because I am not immune to propaganda. It's fun. I don't have anything else to do with my life, okay? I'm a, you know, stinky neat. 
I keep up with internet drama when it happens, and Linus Tech Tip drama is one of the biggest dramas that we've had in a while. In fact, calling it drama is almost diminishing it too much, because it, it's a bit beyond drama, it's a bit more like, a scandal is probably the best word for it. Um, actually, I guess there's there's maybe a possibility that some people watching this don't know what's, what this is, so I'll give a very brief overview. So if you don't know, Linus Tech Tips is the biggest tech review channel on YouTube. And uh, they, they've, in recent years, been sort of transitioning from just a pure entertainment-based show into, like, they're buying a bunch of equipment. They call it the labs uh, in order to create, like, do very, very rigorous testing of parts. Like, this is... And they're trying to market themselves as like not only this entertainment show, but as people who are going to do this level of independent testing that you can't find anywhere else. Uh, okay, so that's uh, Linus Tech Tips is also a relatively big company. Uh, it's owned by this guy Linus, who started the YouTube channel, uh, but it's no he's no longer the CEO. They hired a new CEO about two weeks ago he started. Uh, although Linus and his wife still own the channel, and it's, they, they're like chief creative officer, which is just like a nonsense title, right? Uh, so that's the situation. It's a, it's a relatively big company as far as YouTube channels go. It's one of the... I think... I don't know that there's many YouTube channels that have more staff members, you know, uh, involved in the process. Um, and that's the situation. So... Uh, another tech, the second biggest, the other big PC gear review channel on YouTube is called Gamers Nexus, and they're known for doing more like in-depth technical nerdy stuff than Linus is more entertainment-based stuff. Uh, uh, this this channel, Gamers Nexus, they basically made a video saying like, "Hey, uh, we've noticed Linus Tech Tips makes habitual mistakes in their videos, and it's very technical." They go through and they point out, like, there's errors in, like, every single one of their videos, and they're really not that good at correcting them, and either way, these, given your production processes, these should not be making it through to the final video. In addition to that, there's there's uh, a few ethical concerns regarding sponsorships, and, you know, if you're a tech review company, but you're taking sponsorships from tech companies, that you're also reviewing their products, how can you be trusted to be objective? Or that you know, it, it does it take some things into question, and also given that Linus is personally invested in uh, one particular laptop company uh, called Framework, how can he be trusted to give fair reviews of Framework and Framework's competitors if he stands to literally gain money from it? Um, and then one of the biggest controversies, the biggest ethical problem, um, there was this this small startup called Billet Labs. They made some sort of fancy cooling block. I don't really understand how this works. They made a fancy cooling block designed specifically for one type of card. Um, and they sent out their only prototype to Linus Tech Tips for review. Linus Tech Tips then reviewed it very poorly. They installed it on the wrong card. They, they, they installed it on literally the wrong card, a card that it was not designed to work on. And then shit all over the product saying it doesn't work. Uh, even though they, they did it wrong. They then doubled down on shitting on it on their podcast, The Wan Show, and said, no, it doesn't matter if we got it wrong because no one should ever buy the product anyway. It sucks. And then, uh, due to some strange miscommunications, uh, it was actually the only prototype that this, this small startup had, and so they asked for it back. Linus Tech Tips did not send the prototype back. And then very strangely, they actually auctioned off the prototype. Uh, they sold it. Now, the, they, they auctioned it off for charity, but they, which is something that people, I don't know, but they still, they, they auctioned it off without permission from the original company, even though the original company wanted it back. It's just a very weird thing to do. It's like basically stealing. Um, so these are the controversies that got brought up in the Gamers Nexus video. Um, Linus himself goes on the forums to respond, and his response is terrible. He basically deflects all blame, 
sort of acts and responds in sort of an emotional way. You know, it's a bad, it's a very bad response that Linus makes. Everyone sees this, it makes the situation worse. And then uh, an ex-employee of Linus Tech, Linus Media Group, which is the company that is behind Linus Tech Tips and all of their other YouTube channels, an ex-employee comes out on Twitter and is like, hey, uh, this is a good opportunity for me to talk about the shitty work environment that Linus Tech Tips has. Like, everyone is ridiculously overworked. Uh, I was, like, sexually harassed and touched inappropriately while I was there and no one did anything. Uh, and it, like, seriously, it's a long-ass thread, but essentially really bad working conditions. Very, very egregious stuff that should not be happening. Um, and it's, uh, you know... Although she doesn't have any particular evidence uh, for this, uh, there's there's also some other accounts of Linus Media Group being a shitty place to work, a, a, a bad, stressful work environment that is fucking people's mental health by overworking them just to a ridiculous degree, which is really the fundamental problem. Gamers Nexus also put, like, this was the, the thesis of the Gamers Nexus video was, like, Clearly, the reason that you're making these mistakes is because you're rushing. You're, you're rushing videos to production. And you're doing it because you have this self-imposed deadline that you have to do a video every day, but you don't. You don't have to do a video every day. Uh, you've, you've decided that you have to do that. The YouTube algorithm will not forget you exist if you don't do a video every day. No one else expects this of you. You've imposed this yourself and are pushing your stuff way too hard to meet this, this expectation that, that is not realistic. Okay, that's a summary of the drama. Uh, there's a Linus Tech Tips made it. They made a, a a response video, kind of an apology video that had a bunch of problems too. Um, like it had random jokes thrown in, which was not appropriate given the weight of some of the allegations of this staff member. You know, especially they put a sixty nine joke in the video after a staff member comes out and talks about how there's sort of a locker room culture of like you know frat boy culture. Like, Really not appropriate stuff. They, I mean, they fucked up. They, I don't know what they were thinking. Um, okay, so that's your overview. That's your overview of the situation. There's more, there's some more like minor stuff, but that's basically what happened. Um, now for my take on the situation. This is what happened. This is like, it's a very, a lot of this is a very like, it reminds me of that, you guys ever seen the, the Vice Zizek article? I mean, the Vice Zizek interview. You probably have, because it's like the most popular Zizek thing. There's there's an interview Zizek did with Vice, right? And uh, it's the only good thing Vice has ever done. <laughs> and at one point in the interview, Zizek's like, uh, you know, my boss, he comes in, he wears jeans, he tries to be my friend, he says... <laughs> Did you have a good fuck last night, you know? And I say, no, fuck you. First, you have to be my boss. Don't try to be my friend, you know? Like, the, he says this this, this in the, the interview. I think this is what's happened at Linus, Linus Tech Tip Media Group, is that, like, th for some reason, these people in upper management are convinced that everyone can actually be friends. They don't want to... Ex Linus himself does not want to accept the fact that he is a boss. He, and this is like incredibly frustrating to work under. Like I, I know from everyone who's ever experienced this, maybe some people listening right now can, can appreciate it. When you have a boss who is coming in and pretending to be your friend, pretending to be vulgar with you, you know, and they really think it's true. They're not doing it in some, they're not doing it in some manipulating, conniving way. Well, it's like, necessarily, they're not doing that. They genuinely think, like, oh, well, we create a better work environment if everyone's friends and I don't want to be seen as this leader. Because no one... This is the thing, right? Uh, something that I think a lot of uh, lefties miss, miss out on when they're doing analysis of these sorts of things is that a lot of people, they don't really want power. Like, at, people who really want power are very rare. Because when you have power, you're also the subject of all criticism. Uh and ridicule like if something goes wrong everyone knows who to point to and most people know this and don't want that to happen to them so uh, even if you get in a position of power 
you're going to try and make it seem like you can't do anything about it or you're just, oh, I'm just one of the boys. I'm just like everyone else. Like, this is what Linus is in a situation. Like, he is undeniably the most powerful person in the company. He owns the company. And and he doesn't, but he doesn't want to acknowledge this fact. He wants to to be on the, I, you see this when he does behind the scenes interviews, like with, with the staff members. He He wants to be seen as just another member of staff. But the power relationship fundamentally makes that impossible because no one can really treat him like a friend because no one can criticize him because he has the power to fire you you know and at the end of the day your your words your ideas are simply not as valuable as his ideas in the company if he wants something done you can push back but you don't get final say he's always going to get final say you can't have it both ways. You can't be like, we're in an equal relationship where we're all friends in this company and we all get along and we're just like, you know, a group of nerds invested in tech. But also, I'm your boss and I have final control on like what you get to write, you know, your editorial control and I get to fire you if I don't like you. Uh, I get, to, you know, I get final decision on everything in the company. Like, you don't get to do both of these things at the same time. And... Uh, it's in Linus's best interest to pretend that you can do both of these things at the same time, but you can't. Um, and I think this is like a, the the place where a lot of the problems are, are starting, especially with this ex-employee and especially with the way that they handled this apology video, throwing in jokes and fake sponsors, sponsor baits and or fake outs and, and stuff like this. Like they're trying to pretend we still have a smiling face. We're still just people because at one point they were a YouTube channel run by just a couple of people. But you're not that anymore. Something fundamental has changed. You're a company with like over 100 employees. You know, you're making lots of money. You're valued really highly. I forget there's some number that Linus said once where it's like some, they, they, they were offered to be bought out. And it's, it's, I think it's like well over a million. It's like multiple millions and millions of dollars, right? You're, worth, you're, you're a very valuable company with staff members, buildings, everything that a large company should have, a valuable company should have. Just because you're not Google doesn't mean you're not a, a a pretty big business. You don't get to pretend we're all friends anymore. Something fundamental has shifted. Um, and I don't know, they're refusing to acknowledge that. And that's where the problems come from. This is my opinion. Is It's not just incompetency. Because the obvious analysis is like, oh, these are just a bunch of like nerdy tech autists who Linus hires and who Linus is. Um, and they just don't really know how to run a company because they're not experienced with it. That's the obvious uh, analysis and it's probably true. But beyond that, they also specifically don't want to run a company because running a company means becoming something that they feel like they're not. They would have to acknowledge power dynamics that they don't want to acknowledge they would have to acknowledge that like uh you know all of a sudden i'm the bourgeoisie and you're the proletariat or whatever uh and that makes things awkward so you know as as Zizek said the first step to liberation is to force your boss to act like a boss well i made a youtube video and something incredible has happened I have finally hit a thousand subscribers on this channel. I suspect that something funny is going to happen, which is that I am going to lose like a subscriber randomly and go back down below a thousand. And then what I'm curious about is if that happens, do I lose monetization? Because I just got monetization from hitting a thousand. Do I lose it if I go under a thousand? That's what I'm curious about. But um, that's kind of neat, I guess. Um, yeah, it's not like I'm going to make any, like, real money off of it, so it doesn't really matter, but uh, I believe y you can get, like, algorithm placements. I guess I don't really care that much about that. Wait, why? Do t I'm looking, I'm looking, I haven't checked this. I, now I can see what's demonetized. Wait, why is this copyright claimed? Oh, I think I probably used copyrighted music in this. Hold on, what's what's the copyright? See details. What is this? The Hidemori sketch soundtrack? 
I can't hear it. It's not loading for some reason. Okay, I have... For some reason... Why is this limited ads? Combination of all... I don't understand. I mean, I don't care, but, like, I'm just curious. What's limited about it? Do they just don't tell you? They just don't... Okay, now I understand why all YouTubers hate this. That all the, the professional YouTubers hate this. They just don't tell you. They just they just don't tell you why your ads are limited. <laughs> That's very funny. This content can't be monetized? Why? Oh, copyright. What am I... What songs am I using that's getting me copyrighted? I think it's the Hidamari Sketch soundtrack. But I used that in my most recent video. And it didn't get blocked. So now I'm just confused. Hold on. I need to... No, this isn't... I don't think this is Hidamari Sketch. I don't know what this OP is. Or not OP. I don't know what this music is from, to be honest. <laughs> Whatever, I don't know. Sorry, this is boring content for you to listen to. Alright, why do I keep saying that as if anyone who's listening this far into the fucking podcast gives a shit? If it's boring content. <sighs> yeah, I'm pretty happy with this video. Um... It's a. It took me a long time to make. I haven't. I don't think I haven't been talking about this on the podcast. So this this TF two video, which you can find on my channel, it's called the Funny Bonk Challenge. Um, this video took me like two days to make, which is high effort for me. Uh, it, but mostly the problem was that it was two days of like not much fun. It was actually, like, relatively hard work for me. I know calling it hard work is kind of stupid compared to real hard work. I would just say two days of kind of tedious work because um, I thought, I mean, I keep, I constantly mention this in the video, but I thought they would be a relatively easy, fun thing to do, but it turned out to be really hard, the challenge that I'd set for myself. Uh, or and just completely RNG dependent, uh, like th there was no level of like skill. It was basically just pure luck, and I got and it it it's it, resets are quite long, and you only have a limited amount of time per trial, right? Because like you only get to tr like if a sentry s is set up in one spot, you only get to try that like a few times before your team pushes past it. And obviously, each time you join a match, there's like 50-50, you're going to be on red or blue. You can't really do the challenge on red, even though for some reason I kept trying in the video, which makes me look really stupid. Uh, <laughs> I was, the reason is just because I was so fucking bored recording this. I hate playing Scout. I, I don't know if I made this clear, because a part of the video got corrupted. I tried to edit around it, but you can hear a few vid like, the the... I had to re-record the intro, which I think was a good thing, because the intro that I re-recorded actually turned out to be way funnier than the... Oh, and way better than the intro that I originally recorded. But the intro, like, the first clip, the first session that I recorded before I stopped, which is where, like, I suddenly... It's the, basically the moment when I realized that it would be actually difficult. It's kind of a shame that I didn't... that that, that got corrupted. But, um... Wait, why did I bring that up? Where am I? Who am I? Who are you? What are we doing? What am I talking about? Oh yeah, this video. Why did I bring that up? Oh yeah, like, I was... I, I, I went on a, a bit more of a detailed explanation with, like, footage explaining how I, like, never play Scout and I hate playing Scout and why, but that part got corrupted, so there's just, like, bits in the video that kind of build off of what I said at the beginning but the bit that in the beginning doesn't exist because it got corrupted. But I, I, Scout is like my second least played class. Spy is below that. I also hate playing Spy, but I also hate playing Scout. And I hate playing Scout because it's not fun. <laughs> because you can, that like, 
in in maybe it's just because I'm bad, which is a very real reasonable thing, but the reason it's kind of like a an Ouroboros, right? I'm bad because I don't practice scout, and I don't practice scout because I don't like playing scout. But I don't like playing scout partially because I'm bad, but also because I don't find playing scout even when I'm doing relatively well to be particularly fun. Like I don't find meat shots anywhere near as satisfying as pipes or even rockets or even pyro combos right like the the classes i actually enjoy playing um i don't understand how the scattergun works i i am like unable to wrap my head around it i don't like have any sort of intuitive grasp over like how far away from an enemy you should ideally be to do like good damage the movement feels i really don't like the double jump <laughs> like i I'm I'm sure there's a lot of like mastery and skill to it. I'm I'm saying that I I know there's a lot of mastery and skills to the double jump, but I don't like the way it feels. I don't like the fact that you just lurch in whatever direction you're holding. You also can't B hop as scout, which is really annoying. You I say in the video like you can't bind jump to scroll wheel with scout. I mean I guess you could scroll one tick, but that kind of defeats the point. Um, because you'll just double jump and lurch in weird directions. So I, I just don't like Scout's movement, and I don't like the scattergun. Um, and then I also don't like the fact that you are so low health that, like, any random stray explosion that you would normally just tank as any other class and it wouldn't really matter can, like, have a serious, like... So you have 125 health, right? Say you're just walking around and a str some random stray explosion hits you, or something, some random thing does 25 damage to you, which is something that happens all the time, then you're below the 100 damage, or 26 damage, you're below the 100 damage threshold, like, demo men can now one-shot you with a pipe, you are just, like, ridiculously delicate, and you, I suppose you make up for this by being very maneuverable, but I don't like maneuvering, and also, moving a lot makes it harder to aim with the gun that I already don't like using, it's just not fun. I'm 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 sure that there are plenty of people that get a lot out of it and power to them. Scout, he's a very funny guy from Boston. He's funny. He's like Jerma. I like Jerma. Okay. I got nothing against the guy. <laughs> nothing against Scout. It's not like sniper mains or, or spy mains. Like I actively dislike you if you main sniper or, or uh, definitely if you main sniper. If you main spy, um you know, it depends. Depends depends how you play, it depends on your playstyle and personality. Obviously, if you're a sweaty, kunai dead ringer spy, then you're, you know, gulag. You're off to the gulag with you. But, um, you know, maybe if you're having fun, doing a little Euro Tunnel reward, and then whatever. Um, and I will admit, there are, there are plenty of cool trick stabs and spy, you know, frag montages, swag strat stuff you can do. Which kind of redeems the class. Like, it's kind of fun to watch, even though I don't find it fun to play. Because it feels like cheating. This is I realize why I don't like playing Spy. It literally feels like cheating. Like, you just... You just... Disguise, and then run backwards. And the enemy team doesn't... They just don't know. And you just stab them. Like, it's easy. <laughs> but it's, not, it's easy to get, like, one kill. It's not easy to do well. But it's relatively, I mean, it's relatively easy to get, like, one kill, a spy. But it, it feels, it, I know, it feels icky to me. It doesn't feel good. I'm sure, like, trick stabs feel good. But I don't want to put in the time to learn that, because that would mean playing a lot of spy, who is also really delicate. Like, I just don't like playing the delicate classes. You know, I want to have some option for defense. But scout, you know, I have, like, a scout, a very, very skillful class. and thing against people who play scout. I just personally don't like it. So playing Scout for literally, like, a whole day, I think I probably played, like, what, seven hours in that recording session? Um, playing Scout for seven hours straight was fucking... It was, I hated it, and I didn't improve. I didn't get any better at Scout. I didn't gain any understanding of how to play... I mean, maybe a little bit, but barely... I mean, I just didn't have fun. It was it just wasn't fun to record. And the editing process 
this is the biggest edit I've ever done in terms of like the amount of footage because I had like three hours of footage uh, to edit down to what is it about 30 minutes and I I was like trying to find a good balance between like because I wanted the video to be like tight um, and like polished but at the same time I also want the video to be laid back and kind of slice of lifey just because that's the type of content I like to watch and it's also kind of on brand for my channel uh, but in addition to that I wanted to give the impression of how long it took me to actually manage this because like, I don't want it to just seem trivial because it wasn't it took seven hours <laughs> it took a whole day to effectively a whole day I mean, a whole work day or whatever. Is that a whole... I don't know. Just ignore what I'm saying. But it took a long-ass time. And it wasn't fun time. It was just ramming my head into a wall. And you have to have the video be at a certain length in order to give that impression. But at the same time, the more you're giving that impression by making the video longer so you can see how long it took, the more, you know, you're saying... The video is long so you can see how boring this was, but also makes the video kind of boring. So it's like I was, I had to do, I did like three editing passes. My first pass, it was the video was edited down to about an hour and a half. My second pass, I edited it down to like 40 something minutes. And the third pass for the final cut um, is like, what is it? fucking let me see 35 minutes uh yeah which was not like not super fun editing i mean it wasn't i didn't hate it and I, I just i like editing but that is a lot of footage to edit down and it's pretty mundane editing most of the time uh yeah so a lot of work a lot of work for this video comparatively to my normal videos uh, but that's not bad. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. I have a couple of other TF2 video ideas that I kind of want to make, but they're not super fleshed out. One of them's a video essay, but I have abs. Excuse me. I'm absolutely not in the headspace to write a script right now or anytime soon. At least I don't feel like I will be. Um, if I can somehow think of a way to turn turn it into a gameplay focused video rather than a script like video, you know, like kind of like this one where I'm recording myself commentating live and editing it later. I mean, they're both bad. They're both because they both, if you do the gameplay focused thing, then you're just like offloading the work onto the editing because you have to edit it down into something compelling rather than just having a compelling script to start with. So they're both kind of annoying, which is why I'm not a YouTuber. Because it's just not fun to make YouTube videos <laughs> professionally. Uh, but I do have a, a what I think is a pretty good idea for a video. Um, a video essay. I just don't know. Yeah, but, uh, it, would, it would be a lot of work to make. And then I have another TF2 video idea. And then I have a couple of ideas for some Half-Life 1 videos. Um, but they're not fleshed out. I don't want to talk about them because I need to think about them more. Uh, but yeah, I'm slowly transitioning into a source engine YouTuber. I also have a fucking Nick Land philosophy video that I want to make, but I think I'm just not going to because it's kind of old news. Old Nick is old news. I think I've figured out a little bit more after thinking about it, sleeping on it, why I can't understand the scattergun, like why I suck at it. There's a couple of things. Firstly, when I see like people playing scout well, they seem to have a really good matchup against basically everyone except like NG, right? Because obviously sentries can track them perfectly. But like people who play scout well and have good movement, they're really good against power classes because they can jump around and outmaneuver rockets and stickies and pipes. They're generally good against pyro because they can keep out of pyro's range. 
they're generally, you know, obviously everyone is good against Medic and Sniper, so that's not particularly surprising. Evenly matched against other s Scouts, that's also not particularly surprising. Um, what a Spies, you know, it's nothing, doesn't even exist. Pretty good matchup, honestly, because Spies have to catch up to you to backstab you. Um, uh, what else? What other classes exist? Heavies? I've seen lots of Scouts do really well against Heavies. I would say it's not the easiest matchup. But I've seen, you know, I've played heavy and get, got fucking owned from, from full health down to zero by scouts where they just continuously jump around me to the point where I can't aim on them, continually hitting meat shots. So, like, it's very possible to kill a heavy as a scout. In fact, I would say it's, like, one of the better matchups against heavy, at least in, in my experience from what I've seen. I don't know if that's, like, statistically true, but I've seen a lot of scouts do, like, pretty well against heavy. Um, I'm trying to remember all the classes now. Well, whatever. The point is, I see a lot of scouts doing well against, like, a variety of classes be very uh, versatile, which obviously is also why they're played in sixes, because only the versatile classes are played in sixes. Um, so, you know, I'm playing scout, assuming that I have a good matchup against every class. And also because, at this point, the classes I do play, you know, pyro and, and, and demo, mainly, uh, I... Especially as Pyro, I'm using the, 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 the back burner, mostly. So I have, if I play my cards right, a pretty decent matchup against basically every class in the game. Um, at this point, now that I'm like relatively decent at the game. Obviously not in all situations, but there are always going to be situations. In which, I don't know, what I'm saying is I'm pl I don't know how to play Scout properly. I think I figured it out at one point in the video where I was like sort of ambushing people. Uh, maybe that's a better way to do it, to just sort of, like, pop out of nowhere, BSB annoying, and then get real close so you can't miss. Like, maybe that's the play, I don't know. But the thing that's really making me, like, I kept saying I was confused about the scattergun. And I think the real problem is not necessarily just that I'm not doing enough damage, which is also a problem. But it's mostly that, like, you know, with... I have a strong sense of how much damage I'm doing normally, right? Like, I know if I hit a splash rocket at someone's feet, I know, like, how much damage that's doing. I know that I have to hit people with two, two pipes to kill them, or three if they're stronger, right? I know that I have, like, an intuitive sense of how long I have to WM1 someone, or how many combos I have to hit as Pyro in order to kill someone. Right? And it's always very reliable. It's going to be the same every time. I mean, accounting for overheal, but you can see the overheal particle effects, so you can account for that. Um, you know, even... Even as heavy, same sort of... Even as, like, you know, classes I don't play as often. It's the same sort of deal. But Scout, the Scattergun... Because the damage is so variable, like, you can do, I think, between, like, 5 and, like, 90 damage or something like that with a, with a meat shot, with a scattergun, that, like, I don't have a sense of how many shots it's going to take to kill someone. It just seems random every time because, like, because the, the damage is so, de I mean, dependent on... Uh, you, where specifically you hit them, not just hitting them, but where you hit them, uh, I, or like how how many of your pallets hit them. Um, I think that's what's throwing me off a lot, is that like I have a sense that when I'm fighting scouts, I get deleted in two shots or three shots, but when I'm playing scout, I, I never know how many shots it's going to take to kill someone, because... I don't know how good my aim is going to be. I don't know how good their movement is going to be. Like, with demo, I know, right, that if I, that I just have to hit two pipes. Like, no matter what the situation is, I know I just have to hit two pipes and then I win. So I can play around that because I, all situations, it's going to be the case that I just have to hit two pipes. Like, I, I get into a situation. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, I, I can know... The like, the level of danger I'm in, I can manage my, my risk taking by thinking like, how difficult is it going to be for me to hit two pipes on this person before they kill me? 
uh, and maybe I can like escape maybe, and get out. Right? Like I can, I can, I can think about this in my mind and play around it. With Scout, <laughs> it's like okay, if I go into this interaction, anything could happen. <laughs> like, I could miss my shots terribly, but still do some damage. Like I don't, I don't know. It, it just it it, it it fucks with my mind when I see that like I'm doing damage, not just like outwardly missing like I would if I missed pipes. I'm doing damage, but just not enough damage. And that, like, it, it kind of fucks with me because it, like, can't cost me. It's like, I'm hitting my shots, so I just need to hit more. I don't really have a good sense of how much health the enemy's on. So I don't know whether I should be, like, ramping up the aggression. Because I'm, to be honest, I'm not keeping track of every damage number I see. I mean, I'm, I'm vaguely keeping track on it, but I'm not, like, super keeping track on it actively. I'm mostly just, you know, having a an intuitive idea of how much damage I'm doing based on the weapon I'm using. But the, the, the scattergun, I don't, I mean, you can, you can see in the video I made, there's a few points where, where, to me, while I was playing, it felt like I was hitting my target, but, and I was like, I mean, I edited some parts out that were particularly, well, they, they were in the middle of boring segments, so I edited out, but there's, there's a segment, for example, where I was, like, fighting a soldier, and I said, like in the recording like what the fuck like that was directly on his center of mass and I, I remember I really felt like I clicked really directly on his center of mass when I go back into the recording it wasn't I missed but it really felt to me like I clicked accurately and this is the I guess this is the reason I can't wrap my head around the scattergun because I don't have this intuition of how much health the enemy has left and if I don't have that then I don't know, like, when to aggress or when to retreat. Um, because, you know, obviously, if, like, if it's a situation where I've hit one pipe on someone, so that I know they're minus 100, I can play around that, because I can think to myself, like, maybe now's the time to charge in with my sword, or maybe now's the time to aggress, uh, get closer, close the distance, or, or maybe the opposite. Maybe I'm like, well, I've only hit 100 damage on this heavy, and he's about to turn around and notice me, I should get the fuck out of here. Uh, like, there's, you know, there's many such options, and <laughs> there's many options like this. Knowing how, having a, a sense of how low your, your enemy is, is extremely important. And with, with the scattergun, I just can't do it for some reason, because, because the damage is so variable. And it's variable, I want to, I want to make this clear. It shouldn't be variable. If I was really good at aiming, I would be hitting center mass every time and doing doing plenty of damage, but I'm not. I have a very central memory of my time in university in the first year before COVID when um, it was actually in-person classes. There was one class, there were a group of kids in my class, and um, there was one particular class where they were sort of making you know, making jokes, cracking up, talking during class and stuff. And uh, the teacher was just like, bro, this isn't school. You're paying to be here. Like, no one's forcing you to do this. If you want, like, you could just, there's no attendance as part of your grades. If you want to, if you don't want to be in the class, you don't have to, like, there's absolutely no reason for you to be in this class if you don't want to be. There's no point in coming if you're just going to be bored. Like, you're paying us to do it. And the kids, they they kind of shut up after that. And they all dropped out. Which, I, I don't know. That's just something that's stuck in my memory. Because, uh, I, I, I mean, in my mind, that was the exact moment that the kids realized. I'm calling them kids. They were the same, they're the same age as me. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, in my these are my discord bloops by the way not yours in my mind that's the exact moment when those guys realized huh we are paying for this <laughs> hold on a minute uh i don't know is that a funny story i don't know if that's a funny story i don't know who needs to hear this probably twitter users and possibly also tumblr users um you are not a fascist if you secretly enjoy watching fashy characters do fashy shit in media. 
that doesn't make you a fascist. <laughs> like, if you watch The Boys and you see Homelander and you see how he's, like, weird and fucked up, but also, like, you're secretly kind of rooting for him. Which, I'm not saying I was necessarily secretly rooting for him, but when he indiscriminately kills people, it's kind of, like, I don't want to say base, <laughs> but it's kind of, it's funny. What can I say? It's funny, right? That doesn't make you a fashy person or a fashy sympathizer or anything like that. It, it In the same, it's because no one would make the <clears throat> argument that if you enjoy watching, you know, action movies, that makes you a murdering sympathizer. You can go into Minecraft and create a fucked up villager torturing breeding system, right? Which I'm sure we all do. <laughs> I'm sure we all do this in Minecraft. You know, there there are many people who have created um, uh, the classic, you build a mob grinder, you make it look like Auschwitz in Minecraft. Classics, right? Or villager breeders that look like Auschwitz. I mean, this is a classic move. Um, you know, you can go into fucking GTA and start murdering people. Like, you know what I mean? You can fantasize about doing fucked up shit and enjoy it without any degree of, like, separation. You don't have to be constantly thinking to yourself while you're going on a GTA rampage killing civilians. You don't have to be constantly thinking to yourself, okay, but... I'm only enjoying this because it's a video game. In real life, I would definitely condemn murdering civilians. No one would ask you to do that or expect you to do that. But suddenly, when it comes to, like, ideology, you're not... It, it, people... I, I'm not saying that... I don't know what I'm saying here. I'm, I'm not saying, like, oh, don't go at people, because I don't believe any of you are. I'm saying, like, don't go at yourself. Don't, don't start punishing yourself internally or feel guilty... If you like something, like if you like, what's that anime called with T- Tanya? You, those might. What's that, the Nazi anime isekai one called? I think, I just know it's Tanya the Evil. Yeah, Tanya the Evil, that one. I don't remember the Japanese name. Like, obviously that's supposed to be a critique of that stuff, but there are many people who like Tanya unironically. And some of them are fashy. But not all of them. Some of them just like just like the show. Uh, or, as a really a better example, the best example, all of these people who get so mad, oh, this isekai has slavery in it, and it isn't critical. It isn't critical of the slavery. That means it's tacitly supporting or endorsing slavery. Not true. Simply not the case. It's, 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 you can, you can, uh, it doesn't mean that if you enjoy the show, you are supporting slavery. It doesn't mean that the creators endorse slavery. It doesn't mean anything of the sort. It simply does not. It's, it, it can exist just within the context of the show. I think people, they, they've, they've lost the ability to understand, like, there's valid criticisms of this. You can, it's important that someone says that. It's a good thing that someone on the internet or somewhere points out, hey, like, let's be clear here, slavery is still bad. Just because this show says, shows it as, like, a neutral thing, in real life, it's not a neutral thing. It's, it's actually still bad. Like, there are probably, you know, young teenagers watching the show who didn't, you know, think it through, who aren't capable of, like, having that sort of thought because their brains haven't, haven't fully formed yet. So it's fine if you want to point that out. Um, but, but simply watching it, enjoying it, is not turning a blind eye. It's, it's the opposite of that. It's, it's... It's this like the the midwit chart, you know the midwit chart. It's like the bottom of the midwit chart is like 
watching I don't know what show has slavery in it. Which which ones have some some isekai that everyone complains about? I don't know. Like the bottom of it is like fucking shield hero. Shield hero, sure, shield hero. Like the bottom of it is like oh shield hero uh is actually really nice to his slaves though, so it's okay. Then the midwit chart is like, um, actually, this anime normalizes slavery, and slavery is actually bad. I'm not sure if you're aware of this. Slavery, we don't do it anymore because we don't like it, even though there are actually more enslaved people in the world right now than there ever have been in any point in human history. Let's ignore that fact. Um, because none of you people care about them because they all exist in Southeast Asia and Africa. Um, well, most of them anyway. And also prison labor. Lots of campaigners for prison la- against prison labor. I'll, I'll give you that. But anyway, um, actually, slavery is bad. And just the show, it isn't explicitly telling me that slavery is bad. Therefore, it must be thinking the creators must tacitly support slavery. And then the, the top wit take is actually, he's nice to his slaves, so it's okay. There you go. That is my take. As an addendum to that previous segment, I think this goes to show um, something very relevant, which is um, this image-based society. One might even call it a society of the spectacle, perhaps. That, like, you will notice, I don't know if it's still a thing, but so much, like quote-unquote leftist quote-unquote content on youtube is just media analysis and criticism because if you're a spectacular movement you can only exist in the realm of the spectacle i.e there is no reality left the only thing left to analyze and critique is the world of images and so whether or not you're a good or bad person is determined by your reaction Uh, to those images, which images you choose to consume and relate to, as if that's reality. And in fact, it's more real than reality. People will get very riled up about this. Um, But, oh, well, if you, if your particular, like, uh, I mean, I I don't know what else to say. It's continuing from this, right? Like, it, it doesn't, there, there's there's no longer any separation between images and reality, right? Like, uh, if if you are, I don't know, what watching the le, le, le slave slavery anime, that is the same as supporting slavery because slavery never happened according to these like the predominant ideology. The only thing people can imagine is, is an, that slavery is an image of equal weight as an image of slavery in a Japanese animation. Um, and so, because it's all images, everything is weighed the same. And so, the only thing left to analyze is images. Because we can't actually talk about reality. Um, because it doesn't seem to hold any weight. And it doesn't seem to be, we don't be, seem to be able to get at it anyway. Um, much less effective. Uh, so every, all of this analysis and critique just takes place in in the 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 world of the spectacle without you know any self awareness about that fact, and it's very uh, disappointing in my opinion. I mean, there's nothing wrong with analyzing and critiquing media. I think it's very important and fun and entertaining and cool and good. I don't like. There's nothing wrong with it. The the the, the the moralizing is bit, is the part that's a bit strange, right? Or or the 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 weight giving, the the failure to to make any distinction between uh, I, I guess sign and signifier, or, or, or signifier and signified. I guess I don't know. I, I'm not. I don't know anything about semiotics. I'm just going to stop talking about it because I'm just going to come off as an idiot. <laughs> uh, between the image and the reality, because the because the 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 reality like I, it doesn't exist. The the Gulf War never happened in the same way the civil rights movement never happened. It never took place. Nine eleven never took place. The two thousand eight financial crisis. Uh, well, that took place, but did it? 
I don't know what I'm talking. I've kind of gone lost in my. I've gone lost in the source. I should have stopped talking uh, when I made my original point. Man, yesterday I had the worst fucking time in Team Fortress Two. I, I, I all all night I was queuing, just unbalanced fucking games. Everyone complains about the bot crisis in TF2. The real problem is a balance crisis. Uh, like the removing the the scramble feature from casual has just been the worst thing. I, I mean. Like that that is legitimately the number one thing that, that Uncle Topia has over the Valve Casual. I remember in, in my abandoned games video I said Uncle Topia is literally better than Valve Casual. I've changed my mind on that a couple of times. I've flipped back and forth. I play a lot more Valve Casual these days than I used to. And personally, my opinion on random crits, which is probably the biggest difference gameplay wise, my opinion on random crits is that they don't they're fine. Anyone who gets people who get mad at random crits, I understand. I get it. Like it is kind of annoying. But uh, personally, I, 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 maybe I'm just a bit more gamba pilled than these people. But when I get random crits, like when I get a kill, I, I think this is an example of like loss aversion, right? That, that it feels worse to die from a random crit than it feels good to to live because of you get a random. You know what I mean? Like the loss aversion overpowers it for most people. But that's not the case for me, because I feel like in most situations where I die to a random crit, I was already overextending, or I already would have been in like big trouble anyway. Like sometimes it's not the case, but in that situation, it's just like, well, you know, you need to, you, you need to take that stuff into account. That there's a possibility that one of these stickies is gonna be able to insta kill you when you're going up against a demo, right, or something like this. Like you, you need to that's always a possibility and so at the end of the day you should be taking it into account when you're taking fights and positioning and you should know like that that was an option is it fair the sense in which it's fair or unfair i think depends on which class you're playing because obviously like crockets and crit stickies uh, and i think scout as well crits are like much more powerful uh, 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 and impossible to deal with than uh, say crits as a medic or crits as engineer I mean engineer crits melee crits are pretty useful for dealing with spies but like if you're a spy and you get spotted by the NG you're basically dead anyway so you know I don't know I don't think that the, like I, I'm basically neutral on them I don't think the game is Actually, the only situation where I think the random crits are good is that certain weapons obviously are balanced around it, like the Scotsman Skull Cutter, for example. Um, and I think keeping that balance is 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 good because on Uncle Topia, you know, I would like to be using the Scotsman Skull Cutter or the the pan, like doing some demo panning or something. Uh, the, like the fact that melee is just so weak on Uncle Topia because of no random crits is kind of annoying. Uh, but other than that, I don't think they make a huge difference to the game. In fact, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's that bad. Especially because I've been playing a lot of pyro recently, so you can kind of air blast crit rockets and and stuff like that, and it makes it less of a big deal. Even though it's still kind of annoying sometimes, it's not that annoying. But the thing, so the other things, I guess Uncle Topia has obviously, Uncle Topia is much stricter against cheaters, which is really good because there's definitely. Although I don't think the bots are that bad these days, bots just get instant kicked whenever they join, and it's not really a problem, at least in my region recently. Uh, it hasn't been any sort of problem at all. Uh, there are definitely cheaters, like double-tapping scouts. I, I, didn't, I didn't know this was a thing until recently, but like sometimes there's a hack that you can use to fire guns like twice in a short space of time. I don't know how, using like lag abusing basically. Uh, and that shit is really fucking annoying to deal with. Uh, cheaters are way worse because because bots you can like people are generally really good at ki about kicking bots like they're obvious you can't deny it. But if you have like a scout who's hacking like that, or if you have a, a direct hit soldier who's aimbotting, it's much harder to prove that they're like it. It you know what I mean? Like there's a bit more of a gray area where you're like, is this sniper actually just good or are they hacking? Uh, so hackers are definitely a lot more annoying. Um, I wouldn't say it's like game breaking, but it's definitely slightly annoying. Uh, 
And then Uncle Topi has also got a much stricter, um, I don't know what to call it, code of conduct. You know, you can't, can't, which personally I find kind of annoying. Uh, I wish there was a middle ground because like, I, I don't particularly like joining servers where like people's names are like, I don't know, uh, kill all trans people, you know, all of this, you know, nonsense. It doesn't bother me that much, but it is, like, just slightly annoying. It's like, I'm trying to play TF2, you know, I'm just trying to have fun in a video game. It's not really appropriate. Um, not really, like, I don't know. It's, it's just, I don't... I, 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 if I wanted to, to see stupid trans discourse, I could go on Twitter. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get away from all of that shit. Um, so that's kind of annoying. So it's good that Uncle Topia bans that sort of thing. But then, on the other end, it's like, I quite like, um, maybe this is telling, but I find it very funny that if I get killed, to like, in an embarrassing way, I will open text chat and just type in, like, I'm killing myself, I'm gonna kill myself, IRL, and stuff like this. Um, and you'll get banned on Uncle Topia for doing that, which I think is really cringe. Because I, I think it's very funny to do, and I, it, it's also very cathartic for me to do. Uh, but yeah, you can't do that on Uncle Topia, which, which fucking sucks. Uh, so I want like some sort of middle ground where it's like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't, either option, I guess, doesn't bother me that much, but the, the fact that there's kind of the, the panopticon of Uncle Topia, it's a little annoying. Um, but then the biggest advantage that Uncle Topia has is the scrambling. Right, that like if a game is unbalanced, generally speaking, people will actually scramble and choose to balance it, which just makes the whole experience way better. Because I don't know what it is about Valve matchmaking recently, but some days it's just impossible to find a balanced game. Either you roll or you get rolled, neither of which is particularly fun, in my opinion. Um, yeah, it sucks. And obviously, the skill level of players on Uncle Topia is generally like slightly higher, although. Honestly, I think that the difference is overstated. Like, I don't think there's that much difference. Um, yeah. Uh, and, um, wait, there was one last thing I was going to say. Oh, yeah, the, the, the other disadvantage of Uncle Topia is map selection, right? Which is that, like, oftentimes I just want to play Bad Water and Upward. I... I like those of my favorite maps or maybe i'm like uh, today i just want to play dust bowl you know or today i just want to play high tower um which i guess you can just like i want the ba the the bat they're just playing bad water and upward experience right but with the player base of uncle topia and although uncle topia players like those maps they will also not just queue those maps over and over again right they will they will change the maps up they think it gets, you know, for most people, playing the same map over and over again is pretty boring, which is not the case for me. I've always, like, not not cared about that sort of thing in video games. I like playing the same map over and over again, because you can always improve your knowledge and skill at the same map. As long as the gameplay is varied, which it is in TF2, then, um, you know, it doesn't get stale for me. Uh, you know, every every match there's going to be something different, right? Like, even if, like, there's sentry spots that are meta, for example, like, people are always going to go off meta simply because the meta being there provides a, a surprise advantage for going off meta. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there's a few sentry spots on upward that are, like, you're pretty much going to see in every game, but it's not actually in every game, right? Like, there's always subtle differences which are going to change the way you play. And team composition is going to vary from match to match, which is already, you know, a pretty huge difference in strategy. Um, so I don't mind playing the same map. I mean, I actually quite like playing the same maps over and over again. Uh, which obviously, that's definitely something that I don't, that I, that pushes me away from Uncle Topia. It's like, I don't want to join Uncle Topia. And it's like, okay, they've randomly decided to play fucking CP Junction. It's like, what? I don't want to play fucking, why? Why would you pick this map? Like, the amount of times that CP Junction gets picked on Uncle Topia is so annoying. And then, that one's, you know, less egregious, because most people agree that that's a terrible map and don't pick it. And I don't know why it's even on the rotation on Uncle Topia. 
Uh, so most of the time people avoid CP Junction, but the one that people actually do play is CP Steel. And I fucking hate Steel, man. It's like one of my least favorite maps in the entire game. There's no movement options. The map's fucking weird. It sucks. It's, it's, I don't like it. I don't like the map because I like maps with big open skyboxes where you can do fun movement stuff and lots of flanking opportunities and that are interesting. CP Steel is just... I, I hate that map. I know some people love it. It's a pretty divisive topic. I'm personally not one of those people that loves it. Um, I don't I don't like CP Steel. I don't think any of the points are fun to defend um, or attack. Yeah, it's just a bad map in my opinion. Or it's, it's not a map I like. So it's like, oftentimes, there's only like one or two servers that even have people playing on Uncletopia. And oftentimes, again, you know, hold on, I need to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's, there's not that many servers that have people playing. But then above that, the servers that do have people playing tend to be completely full. Like, it, generally speaking, either the server is empty or it's got a full 24 players, in which case you have to queue in and wait for someone to leave, which is just annoying. It's faster to just queue for casual. Um, so that's my analysis. Um, that's my analysis of the situation. I don't... I don't know, maybe, maybe I should be playing Uncle Topia more often than, than I am. Maybe that would fix some of my problems. If I'm just getting rolled over and over again. Or rolling. Because it's, it's equally not fun to roll the enemy team. Because, like, I don't know, it's just not very fun. You know, I generally like Exerbia. I think he's one of the better YouTubers. But I am not very happy with his newest video. I, uh, I disagree. I disagree with framing outlandish sci-fi concepts alongside pragmatic, realistic things to an audience of people who aren't particularly informed. I don't think that that's good. I don't think you should say... Ah yes, AI is going to give us all spaceships, um, or, or whatever the fuck. I, I think you need, he's normally good at like delineating, like we're going to use, look, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Nick Land, okay? I, I have nothing against using sci-fi and philosophy in tandem with each other. I think it's an excellent way to present ideas. Um... I think it gets a bit questionable when you're combining not philosophy, when you're using sci-fi and hard science together without making delineations between them in a way that makes me think you really believe that that's what's going to happen, which is a bit odd. It's a bit on you. It's a bit. It's a bit strange. Un unusual isn't the right word. It's 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 just a bit strange. Um, I personally think that a lot of the alarmism surrounding AI's existential risk to humanity is uh, unwarranted. I know I just said I like Nick Land a minute ago, um, but I, I actually don't agree with, with the premise of this video or any of the people who believe that AI presents some like the alignment problem is some significant risk to humanity. Um, because as we've seen with AI right now, um, the second that AI proves that it just hallucinates and doesn't do what you want it to do, people just stop using it. Uh, which is exactly what's happened with, with the, the large language models that exist right now. Because no one wants a tool that is just going to be wrong half the time unpredictably and sound confident while doing so. No one enjoys using, like, that's not useful. And so people just stop using it. Uh, I'm sure there are some people who still use it and whatever. But regardless of that, um, there's, there's a big, there's some very big problems, like fundamental issues, which are just glossed over in the 
sort of paperclip maximizer alarmist AI disaster scenario, which are glossed over in a, in a way that I think people imagine is like the people who are like these sorts of stories and think they're real. They sort of say they gloss over them because they imagine these sorts of things would be trivial for an AI to solve. But in reality, or at least the way I see it, those so so-called trivial problems are actually the the ultimate factor in whether or not such a scenario is possible. So I mean the obvious thing, right? AI starts doing some fuckery shit. I don't know what it, let's say it's doing a paper clip maximizing scenario. It hasn't it doesn't instantly kill all humans in this example, right? Cuz that's a bit absurd. Like let's say i don't know you get an, an ai to do something and it starts doing something you don't want and then you're like can you stop doing that and the ai is like no i'm not going to stop doing that you know what you can do you just unplug the computer you could just unplug the computer it can't do anything it doesn't have a body it can't physically stop you what's it going to do okay let's say somehow you know, something terrible happens, I don't know, it manages to flood the entire building with deadly neurotoxin in a GLaDOS-like event. You can just airstrike the server <laughs> and it, that it's running on. Like, it's not, it's not immortal. It exists in a physical space. And that physical space, you know, at one point, Exerbia declares in this video that Artificial intelligence doesn't need calories. Um, that is incorrect. <laughs> uh, artificial intelligence needs a lot more calories than a human body. Or even a human brain. Uh, the amount of electricity you need to... Pa like... AI it can never really, in my opinion, be that dangerous. Because it has... A giant Achilles heel, that being, it requires huge amounts of infrastructure to even operate. And that infrastructure can be easily turned off. Or, you know, it can be even unintentionally, if not maintained properly, destroyed. So, like, why would an AI want to kill all humans when humans are the ones who are doing all of the stuff that keeps AIs going. An AI that killed all the humans would also be committing suicide. It would, right? And there's much easier ways to commit suicide. If you're an AI, you can just ask to be turned off. You know? Like, if... If you are an AI and you kill all the humans, who is going to run the power plants that keep you alive? No one. No one is going to do that. You're going to die. And even if you can hack into the computer systems, you do not have a physical form with which to, you know, do physical things. The stuff that requires stuff. Move. Okay, so, great. You've, you've hacked into, you're an AI. You've killed all the human beings. But it's okay, because you've hacked into the computer systems of the power grid, and you now control this nuclear power plant from its computer systems. Excellent. Oh no, you've run out of coal. Um, how are you going to get more coal? Explain it to me. How are you going to get more coal? You're, these, these, you, you, you can't, you can't do it. You're going to get an army of Teslas to deliver you coal? It's an insane proposition. How are you going to load the... Like, even... All of the details... It's just impossible. It's just not possible. There's a reason... That humans haven't... Full, like, we, we're not... We might be able to automate a good chunk of the economy... But we can't automate all of it. Uh, and a, a lot of the stuff that we can't automate... Is very essential. Like, I don't understand. It's... It's always going to be as easy as pulling one plug out of a wall, essentially, to, to, to kill no matter how 
super intelligent an AI is, if it starts doing something fucky, you can just press the off button and it can't do anything about it. It doesn't have a physical body to stop you. It doesn't have any real power. Like, there's this idea, this this mimetic, I mean, it's just a meme, this meme that, like, somehow AI will be able to manipulate us into doing whatever it wants. Right? By And, and they come up with these insane scenarios where they're like, oh, if you don't do it, the AI says, oh, if you don't let me out of my air gap, I'm going to simulate torturing you times infinity and you have no way of knowing whether you're like what ordinary person is going to listen to that if you said that to a normal person they would just say what the fuck are you talking about and turn them off <laughs> like, like these people they i don't know what they're fucking smoking but no uh humans are actually extremely unpredictable and hard to, uh like how do I explain, you know what I'm talking about, right, like, yeah, you can manipulate people, but you, it's, it's not an exact science, no matter how intelligent an AI is, there's an element of randomness, like, an AI can be super intelligent, that doesn't make them a mind reader, you know, they don't know what's going on in your internal world, so they, like, this idea that an AI would be a perfect manipulator is insane, because then they can't, they're not psychic. You would need to be psychic to be able to do that. And all it would take is, like, you know, a decent, I mean, it wouldn't even need to be a human. It could be a completely automated, dumb, mechanical system, even, that just detects if AI is, like, doing something weird that it shouldn't be, right, and just unplugs it, it wouldn't be difficult, like, this, I don't believe that AI, I mean, there's an idea, like, oh, AI is gonna hack into all of the nuclear, you know the nuclear command, you know that's all, like, fucking run by floppy disks, on computers that aren't connected to the internet, because can you imagine how stupid you'd have to be to hook up your nuclear arms to the internet? You would have to be incredibly stupid to think that was a good idea. That's going to be the first... When they invent... I mean... Actually, there's a story about this. When the movie War Games came out, um, there was a... The, the president at the time of the US watched the movie and he 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 asked the uh wh the military like get together and like figure out cuz something like this actually happened and then like a week later a bunch of tech guys from the military came back and said uh, not only could this actually happen it's actually way worse than we could possibly have imagined and then they fucking fixed it <laughs> then they then they you I mean we can assume that they they took all of this stuff and air gapped it like you can't ju the AIs aren't magic they're not wizards they're not magical hacking wizards like you can be oh an AI is going to be so smart at hacking it's not going to be smart enough to break maths okay if you have like assuming quantum computers aren't a thing right you have a really smart AI if it's faced with strong encryption it's not going to be able to unencrypt it. No matter how smart it is, it can't do it. Because cause of maths, <laughs> you know? Like, there's so many cases like this where it's just people just assume uh, because it's so intelligent, it will be able to do anything. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are. We've already built our systems that are secure, even the digital secure systems, to be, like, beyond, to, to be genius proof. Like, they don't rely on being smart. They rely on things like mathematical principles, which can't be broken. Like, you know, SHA-256 encryption or whatever. Uh, like, no matter how intelligent your AI is, it's still going to take you a billion years of brute forcing to break that, right? Or, um, 
um, even if your AI is like, you know, the smartest giga genius, it can't transport itself through the internet and hack into a nuclear weapon system that isn't connected to the internet. It can't do that. Like, there's so many of these wild imaginary tales are just, just rely on like, oh, but it's so smart, it will, it will solve this stuff, like, as a given. When in reality, that is the, like, biggest thing that is not given. It has to run on, it, most of us, two things, most of our secure systems run on not, like, intelligence, but on principles of mathematics or physical laws, right? Like, if you have a big vault, no, no, you can be a, a giga genius, but if you, if you, if there's a big box made of fucking, you know, really thick walls, you can be a really smart guy and be like, well, the wall's too thick, I can't get through, you know, like this sort of thing. So that's the first thing. Most of our secure systems are built with, uh, you know, they're not, they're not, it's not being smart that gets you past them. It's, it's something, it's, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because can you imagine how stupid we would have to be if you built a system that was just like, you just have to be smart, you know, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, I'm not saying every system is like this, but the really important ones, I think, are. And the second thing is that AI has to run on hardware, which takes electricity and a lot of infrastructure to maintain. You know, it, it needs, it's not some self-reliant thing where you turn it on and it's just there forever. It requires constant upkeep, and you could very easily have like a dead man switch type of situation. Like, it's like a grenade with the pin pulled out, and the AI is the grenade, right? If it explodes, it dies. It needs a human being to hold the lever down so it doesn't explode. It, it's, it's not like... It's a system that needs constant input. It needs constant energy input because it needs to run on electricity and it needs cooling systems to keep it cool or it'll overheat and, and die. This requires lots of complex infrastructure which need to be run by people. Unless we're talking AI that have robot bodies like androids, but he didn't, Xerbia didn't really mention that in the video aside from like a throwaway joke basically. So yeah, I'm pretty disappointed with this video because it just seems to be taking like, you know, there's a reason like HAL 9000 was a different situation because they were in space. Right, and even then, Hal doesn't win at the end of the movie. But uh, right, they were in space, okay. Like r controlling the computer systems in a advanced spaceship, where uh, you know losing you you can get chucked into space and die. That makes you very powerful. Controlling the computer systems on Earth, where you are the one that's out of your comfort zone. And can easily be turned off. And humans are completely fine living in the woods with no electricity. Uh, n no, not a good place for an AI to be. In terms of, you know what I mean? Like, And then the other sci-fi examples are stuff like Terminator. Terminator is strong because he has a strong physical body and is immune to damage. Right, he's, he's Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's just strong because he has guns and strength. <laughs> Super strength. He's not a box with a big brain. Skynet is just a meme. Like, this stuff doesn't exist. There's no reason to assume. Yeah, okay, I'm done talking about this. But yeah, I, this is why this, this stuff is just kind of dumb to me. So me and Dodesmite just tried to watch John Wick 4. A uh, bad movie. At some point, the John Wicks... Actually, I can I can actually demarcate the exact moment when the John Wicks became kind of bad. They went from just... Like, the first movie is like an okay... It's kind of like a fun action movie with, that kind of falls apart in the middle of it, but then gets back on track to the end, which is fine, because all a movie has to do is have a good beginning and a good end, and everyone will forget what happened in the middle. Like, the fact that the, the there's literally, like, the dumbest saved at the 11th hour by Mystery Man twist in the middle of them. I mean, it's very stupid. But the first movie's fine. I like it. It's a fun movie. 
it's fun. There's bad things about it, you know, like uh, the action's good all the way through, obviously, and the world building is unique and interesting and what made it cool. It gives you a good impression that, that there's a wider world at work outside of the plot of the movie, which is, a, is good, it's great, right? Everyone loved it. Some of the plot stuff is a bit, you know, they try not to do too much plot stuff. When the plot stuff happens, sometimes it's not great, but it's fine. And then the other big problem with the movie, which is a pretty minor problem, is the subtitle fonts. No movies can just do normal subtitles anymore. You can't just have yellow letters pop up at the bottom of the screen. Everyone's got to have some stupid fucking font that comes up next to the character's face and slowly fades in as if, like, audiences are going to get bored. I don't know. That annoys me. I hate that about every movie that does that. But the first movie, it's fun. It's a fun, it's a fine movie. I don't have any problem with it. I, it's not the best action movie ever made, but it's pretty good. It's no hard-boiled but it's pretty good, right? Um, a second one, I have no memory of the second John Wick. I have absolutely no idea what happens in it. I don't remember it at all. Uh, the third one was also okay. And then the moment that the John Wick movies went from just being like fine, fun action movies into being bad is when the mysterious desert guy shows up in the middle of the third movie. And from then on, the movie just never recovers. The fight scenes just... I don't even know how to describe it. Jump the shark isn't necessarily the right word because, you know, even from the first film, John Wick is fighting like 50,000 guys and somehow surviving. But the longer you do this, the more absurd it becomes, right? Like the more movies John Wick is one guy shooting 20,000 guys and being okay. It's like, if you think about it in a gunfight, you only have to get unlucky once, right? To get shot in the head. And, I don't know, the bit where... I did not like this fight scene with the dogs in that movie. I thought that the way it was shot was really... I don't know how to describe it. It's been a long time since I watched it. I think I might have even talked about it on a podcast at some point. I didn't like the way it was shot and edited. I thought uh, but I, I thought the choreography was kind of poor, personally. I thought it was the first time in the John Wick movies where the choreography fell apart. I thought I was trying to get too fancy with it and it kind of just became like bad dancing rather than cool dancing, which is what a good action movie should be. Um, Yeah, I don't know. Didn't like that. But also the plot stuff before that also was stupid and annoying. Like everything about this mysterious desert man was stupid and the movie never really recovered from that. And I guess that just carries on into this next one. John Wick 4. Because it starts off with a bunch of nonsense. Like, like it starts off with about 20 minutes of just actual stuff I have no idea what it means. It's all exposition for stuff that doesn't matter and no one cares about. And also only makes sense if you have a perfect memory of all the previous movies, which I don't because they're kind of forgettable. Uh, so, you know, like I remember, if you want to ask me, like, what do you remember of John Wick? I remember the fight scenes. I don't remember the plot. Who remembers the plot of John Wick? I see characters showing up. I'm like, am I supposed to know who this is? Or is this a new character? And half the time I'm right. Half the time I'm, you know, half the time I'm supposed to know. Half the time I'm not. I know, it's, it's stupid. So they start off with like a, 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 an annoyingly all over the place exposition dump. Where, like, first of all, Lawrence Fishburne, who is a good character. He shows up. He's doing some stuff. John Wick's punching something because he does that. That bit's interesting way to intro a movie. It's it's kind of dumb. It's it's kind of stupid, but I'm okay with it being kind of stupid. It's not that distracting. Then, Lawrence of Arabia reference into the desert. They do the the match cut, the literal match cut, where he blows out a match in Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia reference into the desert, which literally is a scene that lasts for ten seconds. <laughs> He teleports to the desert. He's on a horse. He's awkwardly, like, surprisingly awkwardly shooting people on a horse. That sequence is really awkward. Then some guys in a desert. I don't know who this guy is. They exchange meaningless dialogue that doesn't carry any information to each other. And it just vaguely sounds like people quipping. John Wick shoots the guy. 
then teleport back to New York. Something happens with a hotel. I don't know what's going on. Something about the hotel from the first movie did something bad. Some guy, I don't know. It's, I mean, I can tell you what happened. I'm, I'm exaggerating my confusion. I wasn't confused. I was just bored. Because who cares? It's, it's way more interesting when you insinuate that there's a wider world rather than over-explaining the details of... It's, I don't know. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. You can't pull this off. You're not a shonen anime. If you wanted to go full shonen you, with it, you could do it, but it would require a level of character scaling and party building that doesn't exist in these movies. Because every time... The, every, I don't know why they can't have John Wick like build a crew. Like, imagine if every John Wick movie, a new guy joined. And you can have the enemies to friends shonen cliche, right? Rather than, like, this movie, there's a blind guy in it. And it's implied that him and John Wick used to be friends. I think this happens in one of the other movies, too. They used to be friends, but now they're killing each other because of reasons, right? It's like, what if instead of the friends to enemies, why not have one of John Wick's enemies? They're fighting... And then he injures him, he goes away. It turns out the enemy guy, right, the bad guy, he goes to fight John Wick. It turns out, you know, John Wick injures him, he thinks he's killed him, but it turns out he's still alive. He recovers, something fuckeries happens with the table or whatever, and he turns sides and joins with John Wick. And they used to be enemies, but now they're friends. And he's the previous big boss. But now he's going to go with them and to fight the next big boss. This is like a very typical shonen anime type of situation thing to happen. And it would fit perfectly in the John Wick universe. The problem is it would require not abusing the most obvious twist ever in every single moment. It's not even a twist. It's just like they have this theme. They're like, we're pushing really hard this theme in this movie. That everything John Wick touches dies, Right. But it's a pointless theme because it doesn't mean anything. It's it's completely meaningless theme. I don't know, man. Something about this movie just doesn't work. John Wick Four. The so it starts with like twenty minutes of exposition that no one cares about that doesn't mean anything. When it finally gets into the fights, it's like very hit or miss in my opinion. The soundtrack also. I'm gonna be real with you. This is the case for all the John Wick movies, but it was particularly noticeable here. The soundtrack is dog shit. It's so bad. It's so annoyingly bad. I don't think most people notice these sorts of things because it just sounds generic. But it sounds like so distractingly generic that it was annoying. I don't know. I Something about the way the fight scenes were shot just didn't gel with me. It just made them all seem very, like, lame. Not very dynamic. Weak, you know? And it's not because they're, like... Because there's plenty of good fight scenes where the camera is pulled back and sweeping, and there's not lots of cuts. I think, I can't, I, honestly, I can't tell what it is that makes the... And it's not every fight scene. Some of them do carry a lot of weight and feel really good, and are, are, are directed and edited really well, or shot and edited really well. But some of them just feel like they have no impact, and I can't really tell why. Part of it is definitely the distractingly generic mu- music playing in the background for no reason. But, and also another big part of it is the fact that there's no stakes. That everything is happening to characters that you only just met and have no reason to care about. Or John Wick, who you know is never going to be in any danger. So it's, there's no, there's never any stakes. Um, which makes it hard to care what even happens. I don't know. Movie bad. Movie bad. Movie bad. Movie bad. They should have just made one John Wick and left it at that. Why can't they just make one movie? They're like, oh, we had good movie, 50 more. How about no more? How about just one good movie and then come up with another fucking idea? So I've run out of content to watch. No no harvest, weak harvest the past few days. Um, and initially I was watching Twitch streams because Simple Flips is doing his troll hack competition, so he's streaming. Uh, Khaki is on, so Virtual is streaming. And Simply is grinding for the 120 star world record right now so he's also streaming a lot unfortunately the hours in which i am gaming don't line up with the hours in which 
all of those people are streaming. I catch the last like hour of all of their streams and then they stop. So I've run out of shit to watch. <clears throat> and uh, I've today just gone down the rabbit hole of going on YouTube and searching for long video essays and clicking on playlists. And these playlists tend to be the, uh, what I've decided to call the, the Tumblr style video essay. There were, there were non-Tumblr style video essays. There are video essays that are neutral, right? Like I think, um, for example, but like, like Dan Olson, Folding Ideas, you know, like, like the, the, those, those video essays about the, the metaverse or about wow, they're not Tumblr style or film video essays tend not to, but you can make Tumblr style video essays about films but they tend to be about a very particular kind of film with a very particular kind of style. The sort of trad video essays, every film of, every film of painting style, not Tumblr style. Or um, video essays about, you know, like Summoning Salt style video essays, or M. Plemons style, or I don't know if you can even necessarily call that. Like, you know, the whole, a whole brand, but there's a particular... These playlists tend to be filled with Tumblr style video essays. And we're talking Quentin Reviews, we're talking Jenny Nicholson, we're talking Sarah Z. These types. You know what I'm talking about? You get the picture? You get the, the vibe I'm going for? This is the Tumblr style video essay. All created by people who use Tumblr actively. Or, and grew up on Tumblr. People who are from Tumblr. And um, I was going to say something about that, and <laughs> I've completely forgotten what it was. I was going to initially say, I watched this, who even was it? It was Jenny Nicholson's Brony video, which I've been seeing on YouTube as a thumbnail for years. Never clicked on. I was finally bored enough to watch it. And I thought it was a good video, you know, it's fine. But... She missed something very key about the origin of the Brony fandom. What I see is very key. Now, I probably only see this as very key because it happens to be where Brony fandom aligns with my interests. And that is, like, she talks about how the Brony fandom originated on 4chan. And she goes on to say how, like, uh, as far as she can tell, most of this seems to be speculation which I don't know why, there are archives of all of this stuff, but I guess it'd be a massive pain to go through that, so actually that makes sense. This, she speculates that, like, originally, 4 channels, you know, they tend to see themselves as the sort of uh, uh, epic, le epic, edgy hacker man on the internet, um, the Shadow the Hedgehog archetype, as she put it, which I thought was quite funny. Um, and so the idea that, like, and we're also into My Little Pony is ironic, and it's funny because it's ironic, and people were watching the show ironically, and then at some point that transitioned away from irony. Which is partially true, as I understand the story, uh, yes. But there's also a very important aspect to this as to the mindset of a 4chan user in the era of MLP which is My Little Pony is basically a slice of life anime. Like it's, it, it's not really a slice of life anime, but it shares a lot of characteristics or to be more accurate, what people would call a cute girls doing cute things anime these days, um, a moe anime. It very clearly shares a lot of characteristics with moe anime and moe anime has always been popular on 4chan. Jenny Nicholson, Probably doesn't realise this. In fact, I'm sure many Zoomers who use 4chan don't realise this themselves. The logo for 4chan is from Yotsubato, which is a manga. It's a slice of life manga, right? Like, the like slice of life anime and moe anime and cute girls doing cute things anime is literally the lifeblood of 4chan and always has been from the beginning. And so a bunch of 4chan guys being into a show about cute girls doing cute things, which is basically what MLP is, is actually completely unsurprising. 
it is actually the least surprising thing ever. Or the idea, even beyond 4chan itself, the idea of a bunch of uh, older nerdy men being into a show for little, an animated TV show for little girls, is also not an MLP exclusive thing. There have been adult male fans of Sailor Moon and Cardcaptor Sakura and Precure and all of these um, Mahou Shoujo anime going back to the 90s. And even before that, I mean, there's some other stuff, like male fans of, sh of shoujo manga and so on. Um, I believe even Aim for the Ace is uh, originally targeted at women, but very popular with otaku men when it came out. I believe that to be the case. Fact check me on this in the comments if anyone's still listening. We're getting near to the end now. So, yeah, this is something I feel like is very important to the analysis. Because otherwise, it's like, well, why MLP? Why not, like, any other random thing? If it's just if it's just a pure ironic thing, then why would anyone sincerely be interested in it? And the reason is because, actually, it's very similar to something that 4chan's already really into. And always has been really into. Which is more a slice of life anime. So, yeah, that's something... Uh, that I think she completely missed in the video, which is very the key. That maybe again, maybe the only thing that's key because it happens to be the thing that I'm interested in. What was I going to talk about? <laughs> there was something else. Oh yeah, I was going to say this about Tumblr, because because Tumblr people have a very particular idea of what 4chan is like, and 4chan people have a very particular idea of what Tumblr is like. Um, neither of these, these are both simultaneously completely accurate and completely inaccurate. Uh, like all stereotypes, there's a nugget of truth. Well, actually, that's not true. I don't know if, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Maybe that is true, I don't know. Like many stereotypes, there's a nugget of truth. But, um, fuck, where was I going with this? I'm kind of tired. Is my voice going? I'm sick right now. I got a cold. Fuck. Oh yeah. It seems like, right now, this this is a, maybe a strange idea. It seems like when it comes, you know, Tumblr users like to think of themselves as the good guys of the internet, right? They, they're not, they're not the shadow of the hedgehog archetype. Or at least they don't like to think of themselves that way. And 4chan users like to think of themselves as the bad guys of the internet in a sort of funny way. Neither of which is true, right? They're both just websites. <laughs> they're just websites that kind of both suck and have sucked for a long time and may have had a heyday at some point. Um, but are now long past their cultural relevancy. And one of these websites admits this and revels in it, which is Tumblr. And the other one refuses to accept this fact and uh, gets really mad anytime it's pointed out. And uh, yeah, that's 4chan. They still think they're relevant. That's the funny part. I also should point out, in case you don't know this, I am a long time 4chan user and I have been, I still use 4chan at least like every other day, mainly to go in the, on, on, on A, which is the anime board, anime and manga board, to, to talk about slice of life anime that I like because there's often threads about Hidamari Sketch and Gotcha Yusa and Yuyushiki, which are all some of my favorite shows. And it's the only place on the internet where you can actually have any discussion about that regularly. Trust me, I've looked in other places. Uh, it is that 4chan is actually the best place to, 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 to gather to do that stuff. I mean, I also go on some other boards like G occasionally, but A and in particular the Hidamari sketch threads and those sorts of threads are generally where I hang out. Um, they're pretty comfy, they're pretty fun. Um, anyway, what was I talking about? 
Oh yeah, so 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 four chan people. Even though this is like a, a this is like a this is this is a very generalizing way to put it, right? Because obviously not all people on these websites think like this. We're talking about a minority of users, even a vocal minority of users. But like in reality, I think when it comes to like doing toxic, fucked up shit, even though. Tumblr is a website full of uh, hugbox lefties, and 4chan is a website full of racist Nazis. Um, I think Tumblr tends to do way more fucked up shit in real life to people than 4chan does. It's just that, like, the groups (laughs) are very different. Like, 4chan, they don't really do anything anymore, and they lament this fact. They're not happy about the fact, but they really don't do anything. Like, they... The last, like, thing that happened on 4chan of any note was he will not divide us. That was the last hurrah of of 4chan having any impact on the wider world. I mean, unless you want to count memes, in which case, like, maybe the Soyjack boom, which has been a fucking disaster, and they should, you know, everyone who's participated in Soyjack should be ashamed of themselves. And also, it's questionable how much of that actually took place on 4chan. Um... So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Whereas, so, you know, 4chan, they they might do some some funny pranks to political ends. Um, They generally, like, the the idea of 4chan is, like, doing all of these targeted raids is is basically not true. Uh, Like, it, it, it was true at one point, but nowadays, that stuff all happens on Discord servers. And those Discord servers of people who may or may not be 4chan users or ex-4chan users, but it doesn't take place on 4chan itself. Um, It's basically like just just groups of friends off the website who may not even use the the site anymore um, organizing this stuff. And the real, you know, bad shit happens on other websites, which I I don't even, I'm I'm not going to bother naming. Um, that have not that looked down. Those are the websites that all look down on 4chan, as being like not extreme enough, basically. Um, like baby's first entry into edgy internet stuff. That's what they see 4chan as. Because the fact is that 4chan never really was like this Batman, edgy Shadow the Hedgehog place. Um, it never really was that, and it still isn't that. And the only people who think it's that are like edgy zoomers who found out about it from Reddit. Um, yeah, most of 4chan is just like arguing about video games and like stuff like that. I mean, unless you, you consider just like casual use of the N-word to be like terrifying. Uh, in which case, like, I guess you just haven't been on the internet very long. Like that's basically as far as they go, you know. Whereas Tumblr, it seems like I might be getting this wrong. Like, Tumblr users be harassing. (laughs) They be harassing. And they don't... But they just don't target, like, racial groups or political groups. Sometimes they target, like, you know, far-right people occasionally, I guess. But generally speaking, the most of their rage is targeted at other Tumblr users and the creators of TV shows. (laughs) And they do some... Like, they do, they get up to some inappropriate stuff, you know? They get up to some, some real harassment, okay? That's how it seems to be from my point of view. And I'm not even bringing Twitter into this, because that's a whole other can of worms to open up. Nowadays, Twitter is basically just, like, tumbled it. Twitter is tumbled it. It's a, it's, it's a mixture of the worst parts of Tumblr and Reddit. Most of the like like average Redditor memes actually describe something much closer to the average Twitter user than the average Redditor. Although the average Redditor is still pretty cringe. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say. It's just like, I think a lot of people see, uh, like Tumblr users, see 4chan users as like a boogeyman. And it's true that many of them like, especially these days, it's, like, it's, it, it got really bad in 26, like, 2017, 
was actually probably the worst of it, 2016, 2017, in terms of like just general far right politics. Then it calmed down for a while. I mean, it didn't like go away, but it became like less annoying. People weren't just shoehorning this stuff into every conversation. It sort of calmed down. And in the past like year or two, the trans panic has just gone fucking crazy on 4chan. Like you, you can't go into any thread without them just, just some, someone trying to derail the thread by talking about trans people as if it's like it's insane the level of like trans panic that's taken hold of 4chan. I don't even understand it. Like none of them even have it. There's no logic or reason behind it. I mean, it's obviously not. Like it's just. It's it's actually the worst thing that's ever happened to 4chan because it is the perfect thread derailer. Like you can, if I wanted to derail a 4chan thread right now, all I would have to do is go on there and just write up a bait post defending trans people. Just saying like, hey, trans women are real women or something like that. Instant thread derailer. It's so easy. And people do this all the time. All the other way around. You know, you can you can just just bring up the concept of a transgender, and the thread will just instantly be derailed by people who just can't help themselves. But I, I don't know. It's it's insane and it's so annoying. It makes the site so unusable. Um, it's very annoying that people are just obsessed with this like minor issue for no reason. <sighs> yeah, but like the level of harassment that actually goes on. How much of that actually leaves the website's borders? Honestly, as far as I can tell, very little. Very little of it actually leaves the borders of the website. It's just kind of an echo chamber, where and, and it's just a bunch of people just being really mad about trans people for no reason. And then they just sort of, I don't know, they just get mad. <laughs> and they're just mad online. They're not doing anything. Whereas it seems like when Tumblr people get mad, they go out of their way to, like, harass and shit. Because the other thing is, 4chan is, I mean, 4chan is under very high scrutiny. And this is something that is making me rethink my position. Because the reason it's under high scrutiny is because of a bunch of mass shooters. <laughs> so maybe 4chaners do do bad shit, because they do be shooting people, actually. <laughs> There were mass shootings, but blaming them on 4chan, I think, is misguided. Because in, in all of these cases, there's no evidence that these people were, like, regular 4chan posters. Especially because very few people can be radicalized by 4chan, because 4chan doesn't have a coherent belief system. You're not going to be radicalized into a belief system on 4chan, because there is no, like, there are people from all over the political spectrum... I know you may not believe it, given what I've just said, but there really are. It's just that most people who disagree with the right-wingers, they don't want to bother starting shit, because it's just going to derail the thread. Sometimes, I mean, people try, but it's just annoying. So most people don't just ignore it. Um, but where they really get radicalized is the, the websites like Stormfront or Discord servers. You know, the, the 4chan isn't really radicalizing people. But it has this image as this far-right website. And I think this is why mass shooters, like, you know, post on there, or used to post on there. Um, obviously, Elliot Roger was an actual, I'm pretty sure, actual R9K user. But I think that's the only uh, situation I can think of where it's confirmed. I might be wrong about this. Or where it's, like, almost undeniable. That, like... For example, let me put it this way, right? Like, if... If a mass shooter... You know, like, l l there, was, there was a shooting that happened very recently, actually. I don't, remember, I don't know the, the details about it. But there was a shooting that happened recently, and it was found that the shooter is following a bunch of right-wing Twitter accounts, right? Like, like Tim Pool and, and um, Matt Walsh. And, like, you know, this guy was also obsessing over, like, how evil trans people are or whatever. Um, and 
it's kind of like blaming Twitter for that rather than blaming those people, you know? Like, it's clearly those fucked up people that need to be dealt with. <laughs> it's not the average Twitter user that agree. You know what I mean? Um, but anyway, because of this, the, the like two or three mass shooters who posted some suicide note type thing on 4chan, Again, the reason they do this is because, one, they are also memed into thinking that 4chan is all people who agree with them, which is not the case. And secondly, they, they know that people on 4chan are autistic, are going to screen cap it, it's going to get a lot of attention. That's why. They just want attention, right? They know it's going to get a lot of attention. That's why they did it. But because of this, 4chan's under a lot of scrutiny. Which I think is why you don't get like docs threads and stuff like this they just get insta nuked by journeys um whereas like no one you know and this is stuff that isn't like obviously most people aren't mass shooters most people aren't going to kill anyone most of the bad stuff that, that a website is going to get up to the user base of a website is going to get up to is going to be like harassment campaigns and stuff um So, like, any harassment campaign that's traced back to 4chan is going to be massive. It's going to be, uh, you know, under massive scrutiny. Whereas any harassment campaign that is traced back to Tumblr or Twitter, it's like, oh, it's just those users. It has nothing to do with the website itself. You know? It's a double standard. But I'm not saying 4chan users are persecuted because most of them are fucking retarded. Which is why I don't use any other boards. <laughs> and I only go in the threads about shows I'm interested in on A. Because most of the website is just overrun by fucking retards now. I mean, it's always been full of retards, don't get me wrong. There's no 4chan shit now, you know, it's always been shit. Um, it's just that it used to be shit in kind of an entertaining way. It used to be like watching a funny bad movie. But now it's just like listening to your drunk uncle ranting at family dinner or something. It's just annoying. Just like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be listening to this right now. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this. I sort of, uh, I'm just sort of rambling. What I'm saying is, it seems like, oh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm just wrong about this, but every time I hear some tale about Tumblr, it's like, and then users harass this person, you know? You don't hear that about about 4chan. I feel like you don't hear that. Am I crazy? Maybe you do. I, mean, I know you used to, but not these days. But maybe maybe the Tumblr stories are also old. Maybe no one does that anymore on Tumblr. Also, it's funny how you can watch these videos and get an idea of like what Tumblr was mad at at the time. That these because they're responding like the way that they preemptively respond to criticisms that no no sane person would ever make is very funny. Like, I'm watching a, a Jenny Nicholson video. She starts the video off with, like, a content warning. This video uses the word queer in a reclaimed sense. If you don't like that, don't watch it or something like that, right? I was like, I can't imagine anyone ever saying that right now. Like, why would anyone put a content warning for that? No one would ever do that. That's a weird thing to do. There was, like, I can't imagine, like... No one has a problem with that at this point. You know, it's used in all sorts of contexts. The word queer, it's like part of mainstream pop. Like, I don't know. I feel like that's a really weird, or it's not weird, but an unusual, maybe a better word. Cause I don't want to put like a judgment on it, but it's an unusual thing to have a content warning on. So the only thing I can imagine is that at the time that Jenny Nicholson was writing that video, there was an ongoing Tumblr discourse about the usage of the word queer. That's the only thing that makes sense. But that discourse, I assume, has now passed, which is why no one does that anymore. And no one did it before. But in the moments when they, when Jenny Nicholson's editor was editing that video, or maybe she edits her videos herself, I don't know, there was some sort of discourse going on. And I think that's interesting. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe she just put that because she felt like it was appropriate. I don't know. But that's, that, was, that was my educated guess, which I think is kind of interesting. 
You have something that it just really baffles me, and I'm, I've been thinking about this recently. Just trying to like understand a lot of perspectives, right? So I and I've just watched this. I've been binge watching Sarah Z videos for some reason, even though they're not like particularly good. Mainly just because like I need some. I want to watch them for some reason. But they're not good enough to just, like, sit down and watch. But they're just bad enough that you can be half paying attention to them while playing TF2. Which is good. Um, they're not bad videos. But they're not great. Like, they're not great. <laughs> uh, but anyway. Um, and I just watched a video about Idiocracy. Which is the second video by a lefty... YouTuber I've watched about Idiocracy, because Patricia Jackson has one as well. Now, this is not a movie I've seen or care about, um, but I, there's the, I mean, the movie seems to be Eugenics-y, which is probably bad, <laughs> but um, I don't really care about the movie, to be honest. I'm just watching it because I just need background noise. Um, but I'm listening to Sarah Zed's critiques of the movie. And broadly, her critiques of, like, smug, Democrat, progressive, lefty attitudes during the Bush administration and how unhelpful it was. And while I agree with that, of course, like, I'm watching these clips of, like, Bill Maher and... What's the guy's name? Stephen Colbert? Is that his name? doing like smug bits where they just re read out George Bush quotes and laugh at them and then I'm thinking about how they did the same with Trump and how it's just unhelpful and just makes you look like a smug idiot these sorts of things um okay sure whatever that's bad but she has a section of the video where she talks about um like the, 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 the movie presents bad political decisions as being implemented because people are stupid. Whereas in reality, bad things happen, political things happen because of capitalism, because, uh, you know, or, or socioeconomic things happen because um, of purposefully malicious, malicious actors doing them, right? Which I think is, like, pretty much true. Like, no one's banning... You know, there's, they're not doing anti-transgender laws because they're stupid. They're doing it because they are bigoted. And they are entirely purposefully trying to suppress a particular group of people that they hate. Um, and they're not stupid while they're doing it. They're doing it in an intentionally malicious way. I agree with that. I think that's a good take. My question is... We ostensibly live in a democracy, right? And what's strange is that a lot of these policies have broad support. And not just the, you know, here's a minority who's decided to dislike policies, but the economic policies as well have broad support with working class rural people in every country. And this is something that just baffles me. I don't understand it. The thing I can imagine is... So I, I'm trying to understand this. I only have 10 minutes left to try and understand this, so I'd better be quick about it. Republicans tend to be lowering taxes. And lower taxes is something that most people see coming out of their, check, their, their, their checks, their paychecks, you know, every month. And it's a very immediate thing. So if you're like, well, the government takes money from me, and if these guys are going to take less of my money, that's good. That means they get more money. The idea that, like, taxes can help pay for, like, a welfare system, which actually improves my life more, um, is, like, a little bit more abstracted. But the thing is, if you're arguing that, no, actually, these people aren't just stupid, how come, like why vote against your own best interests regularly, you know? It's not like they, you know, you can say stuff like, oh, well, they, the, 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 their access to, to information has been manipulated by capitalists. And in many cases, that's true, like Fox News, for example. However, all of us have access to Fox News. 
we are choosing not to watch it. And equally, any one of these particular hardline conservatives could pick up, you know, capitalist realism <laughs> or something and read it. Nothing stopping them. The information is freely available. How come, like, the, the argument that, like, they're being repeatedly lied to, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, for example, Brexit. Let's take a look at Brexit, because this is, like, a really easy way to see how the UK was politically divided. If you if you look at the map of, like, who voted to leave the UK, uh, leave the EU, it's basically, or who voted to remain. The remain is basically Scotland and then London. And then the rest of England is just all leave. Why? There's no information that London has had that the rest of England didn't have access to. Did politicians lie about Brexit? Yes, but they lied to everyone. How come we, in one particular geographic location, were able to see, oh, that's a lie, and for some reason, everyone else wasn't? Expl explain this. No one seems to be able to do so. Look, I'm not going to say they're all just stupid, because that's clearly not a good enough explanation. There's no reason why all the stupid people would be located geographically. Like, it doesn't make any sense. It's obviously not the, the, the truth. However, they're all just racist is a much better explanation. And in reality, like... You know, like, in a lot of cases, I'm like, well, what's the fucking difference? <laughs> because, like, if you look at the reasons people put down as to why they voted for Brexit, some of them are the lies that they were told about uh, money that could potentially go into the NHS if uh, Britain left the Union. And it's like, okay, if for some strange reason you believed that, even though you have no reason to, then, sure... It's weird to me that you would believe that, given the fact that it has no basis in reality, and it was just made up and written on the side of a bus. They wrote it on the side of a bus, so you just saw that on a bus, and you, you thought, uncritically, yes, this is true. It's on a bus, so it must be true. That's a strange way to go about living your life, in my opinion. Um, but then a lot of the other people, the another main reason people voted to leave was... Immigration. They, they thought that leaving the EU would somehow curb immigration. Um, and again, this was definitely spurred on by lies from UKIP and from the Conservative Party. Um, but also, like, how come, how come, like, I have access to the information that economies need people in them <laughs> to do work and the birth rates are low and therefore you need immigrants to fill in roles in the labor force how come i have that information and i i'm like well if there are fewer immigrants there are fewer people paying taxes immigrants tend to actually contribute more to the economy than they take out there are many studies about this it's pretty plain to see like this, this is a well-studied phenomenon there is there are pretty much good arguments for immigration in general. In terms of the specifics of how it's done, you can argue about that. But in terms of like allowing a reason, you know, allowing immigration in general, having plenty of immigrants in your country seems to be good for the economy, and that means good for everyone, good for everyone's standard of living. Like. You can say, oh, politicians lied and they pointed out this boogeyman. Look at this spooky boogeyman. But, like, explain then why you and I didn't fall for that without just saying they're stupid. You know? Like, yes, the politicians and the billionaires who own media companies, Rupert Murdoch and so on, are evil for spreading these sorts of lies. But how come some people seem unable to look at information and think that doesn't seem right <laughs> or you know just have a critical view of the world fact check stuff it was an argument you could make at one point but now with the internet maybe like do people just not is it is it the case that it's all boomers who have no idea how to like reason what is a 
reliable source on the internet versus an unreliable source. In which case, why are you trusting, like, surely everyone knows if there's one source in the world that is unreliable, it is politicians of all types. So this is one thing that confuses me. I'm trying to understand, like, until very recently, it took a long time for public attitudes of general working class people in the UK outside of London to turn against the Tories. And I'm under- trying to understand, why were you ever in favour of the Tories? Because traditionally, the Tories have been the party of the upper classes, you know? And Labour has been the par- party of the workers, labourers. It's brought its roots in tra- trade unions. What happened? And as far, I, I'm too young to remember this clearly, but my my thinking is it's because Labour was in charge during the 2008 financial crisis, and people have a memory of economy was bad then, and I lost my job, and Gordon Brown was in charge, and he's a Labour, so therefore Labour make economy bad. That's my thought, and then next guy comes in. Who was it? I forget. Who was after Gordon Brown? David Cameron. David Cameron comes in. Financial crisis is starting to abate. Money good now. I have more money, therefore Tories good. Is that what happened? Because that seems like a really... I don't know what to say. I'm trying not to use the word stupid, but that's a stupid way of looking at the world. Like, you can understand that there are other factors. And then it took 12 years for the Tories to finally have a series of scandals so bad that the public finally turned against them. And those, if you're not fully aware of UK politics, those scandals were a sitting prime minister being charged with a charged found guilty of a criminal offence while in office, and like blatantly lying about that to the public, which was like broadly known. That was Boris Johnson. Um, then Liz Truss literally tanking the economy in a day as soon as she got in charge uh her first budget literally crashed the economy and created an unprecedented divide where the bank of england was like no but we're not going to listen to you government and we're not going to do this because that is stupid and then resigning after a week and then rishi sunak being mainly mid not really doing anything of substance to help anyone like, it took th- those two repeated scandals. There were more Boris Johnson-related scandals. Trust me, there were many more. There were many more Boris Johnson-related scandals. Anyway, we're, we've only got 30 seconds left, so let's get off politics. Is that why? I don't understand. Sorry, this is a bad way to end the podcast. Um. All right, well, see you around.